You clicked the thing? Sounded like you clicked the thing. I clicked the thing. Oh my goodness. Would you look at that? We're up. Live again for the third time in a month. Can you believe it? I sure can't. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing in chat out there? Having a good Spooktober? I sure hope you are. We're coming to the end of Spooktober. That means the spookiness is ramping up. That's how it works, right? That's what I that's what I hear. I've got a, a full a week of spook planned out. Yeah, what are you what are you, what are your plans? We are gonna take a little road trip up to Salem, Massachusetts. Oh hell yeah, that's the spookiest yeah. place of all. Yeah, I'm excited. Bunch of, bunch of witches. Or maybe they're just women. Either way it's gonna be pretty scary. Yeah. <laughs> Women talking was pretty frightening, <laughs> horrifying. Even. But what are you what are you planning to do in Salem? I've never oh, I've never got been. a whole bunch of stuff to do up there in Salem. We got the uh, we're gonna have a tea time. We've booked a tea time, like not a not a like, golf tea scary. time, but uh, like an actual tea at the Satanic Temple uh, of oh. Salem. So you get to go and you know have tea with freaks uh, and goth chicks. Uh, it'll be kind of fun. Sounds pretty cringe, bro. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, there's a wax museum for witches. Uh, they, they have, like, reenactments of the trial. I don't know if we're going to catch that, but we will catch the ghost tours and everything, so we're going to get to wander around, and we're going to watch the witch before we head up. Oh, nice. Yeah. Have you have you been on many ghost tours in your life? Yeah, I've been on a couple. They're okay. I've, I've, found, I've found that they're entirely dependent. The quality of them is entirely dependent on how good the tour guide is. Oh, yeah. No, if the tour guide can tell a decent story or you know, is yeah. is engaging as a performer, or knows, knows the history, knows the facts. Yeah, there. That's that the best. In, we were in uh, Savannah, which is supposedly a very haunted place, according to people who believe yeah. in that sort of thing. And our tour, we did a, a. It wasn't midnight, but it was nighttime, and it was lantern led. He was dressed up in old fashioned garb, and he had a lantern, and we walked around. It was pretty cool because he was exactly what I wanted out of a um, out of a spooky ghost tour guide. He was like, I don't know if I really believe in ghosts myself, but I'm in it for the history. So I'm going to tell you all the darker, every dark side, every nook and cranny of Savannah's strange history. And then we'll talk a little bit about what people report in terms of ghosts and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, that's exactly what yeah, I wanted. That, that was, so the the last ghost tour I remember going on was in Williamsburg, Virginia. And mm -hmm. it was very similar to that. We had a, a guy who was clearly some kind of actor. He was an older gent. Uh, but he was dressed in, you know, colonial Williamsburg type garb and walking around with a lantern. And he was just, he was just like a really interesting storyteller. And he kind of just brought us all around to each of the different places and just told us the stories of, you know, the history of the building. And yeah. uh, like then every now and then he would throw in something like, oh, yeah. And, you know, sometimes people say they can see her through the window uh, at exactly. night. Yeah. And that was that was that's the, best. the way to do it. It was by far the best one that I've been. Well, and then I went on one at Fells Point once, uh, but that was more like a pub crawl than a ghost yeah. tour. So that's kind of I mean, those are kind of fun, too. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, drinking's always fun. Um, yeah, but the, what was really cool about the Savannah one, it's like, you know, he talked a lot about, you know, like, oh, all the history of, you know, because Savannah is a town built on bones. Because oh, yeah, because... There, there were many, well, I've, there's a lot of Revolutionary War dead, there's a lot of Yellow Fever dead, there's a lot of slavery dead, just kind yeah, of... Yeah, and then Sherman they, happened. Yeah, well, the well, yeah, and then he, he burned down all of the Suck South except South. for... Except for uh, Savannah. They were like, please, for the love of God, don't burn down Savannah, please. And he's like, all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you That's can't have but you don't get Atlanta. Yeah. Spookiest part of Dr. Sleep was no devs episode four. Oh, oh. you got me. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Donald Zangry, for spending money to tell me that. I appreciate you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is the scariest part of that movie for sure. Well, hello. Uh, we got some people hanging out with us. That's cool. Today, we are going to talk about two very interesting films. Interesting, I would say, for very different reasons. We're talking about The Shining, which is uh, one of, if not my favorite movies in the entire world. I love it. 
with all, all my heart. time ever. It's it's so good. It really, I can't really wait to is. talk about it because I, you know, I, I can't stop talking about this movie, to be honest. So <laughs> we'll see how long the stream goes. Because <laughs> there's much to say. And also, we are going to be talking about Dr. Sleep, the much belated, or uh, however you would say that better, a uh, belated sequel, sort of quasi sequel to The Shining, made by Dr. Flanagan, based on Stephen King's book of the same name, Dr. Sleep. Another very interesting movie. Um, I guess the shortest thing you could say about Dr. Sleep is that it tries to split the baby between Stanley Kubrick's The Shining film and Stephen King's The Shining book. Um, Oh, it, how well, it sure, how well it he sure does. does. <laughs> how well he <laughs> accomplishes that per, uh, that task, uh, I guess it, we'll, we'll find out today. When It depends on your perspective as well, because uh, as far as I uh, am depends aware... if you have taste or not. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, Stephen King uh, approves greatly of... Oh yeah, he loves it. ...of the, Flanag the, shenanigan, the Flanagan shenanigans of Dr. Sleep. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much believing that it has redeemed the franchise, I'm sure. <laughs> Odd to call it a franchise, but yes, he uh, he loves Doctor Sleep, and famously, as many people listening will already know, hates Stanley Kubrick's The Shining because he has no taste. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it does kind of it does kind of sound like a, a Professor Chaos kind of situation, and um, in a way, it, it 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 absolutely is, isn't it? <laughs> So, where should we begin? Oh man! So, The Shining, uh, nineteen eighty. Um, just should feels we feels very much. Go ahead. I was going to say, should we begin with the um, the backstory of how this became Stanley Kubrick's film in the first place? Uh, how how he ended up deciding on an adaptation of The Shining as yeah. One of so his there's movies? a there's a fun story about that. So Stanley Kubrick saw. Rosemary's Baby, and he saw The Exorcist. He saw all these like actually very interesting and accomplished horror films coming out, and he's like, "I want to do that. I can do that. Find find me a horror story to adapt. I want to make a horror film. I want to show that I can do it too." And so he starts reading through a bunch of every stacks horror movie, he can get and every, stacks and stacks of horror stacks novels of horror or novels. scripts yeah. or anything he can get his hands on. Yeah. And according to his assistant at the time, he would hole up in his office. And with stacks of these books and every time he would get to a point where he decided he doesn't like that book or doesn't want to adapt it or thinks it wouldn't work he'd throw it across the room there'd be a large thud and <laughs> his assistant would know oh not that one then and so he kept listening and eventually uh it got to the point where he hadn't thrown a book across the room in a while so he's like oh maybe this is the one and that was stephen king's the shining which uh, i suppose yeah. is a compliment to the book though um Stanley Kubrick had some very interesting and blunt thoughts about Stephen King as a writer. Uh, maybe that's part of why <laughs> King doesn't like Kubrick very much. Um, well, it's it's but, also interesting that uh, the co the woman who co-wrote the screenplay for right, The Shining, yes. uh, Diane Johnson, uh, claims that the decision came down to a choice between her own novel called The Shadow Knows or The Shining. And it's interesting that... He, even though Stanley Kubrick did not elect to go with Diane Johnson's novel, The Shadow Knows, he did tap her to co-write the screenplay for The Shining and did not ask Stephen King to do so. I don't know if he <laughs> asked him to. From what I understand, King did write a script, a screenplay, I should say, for The Shining, and Kubrick was like, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who, if he said it. Who asked I don't know you, said... Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if he asked him originally or not, but... Yes, instead of going with Diane Johnson's Johnston Johnson, I think it's I Johnson remember. Johnson Johnson. Instead of going with her book, he decides to go with Stephen King's book and taps her to help write the screenplay with him. Um, there's a really interesting. You can find it online if you're ever interested. Uh, but there's the original treatment that uh, Stanley Kubrick wrote for The Shining. It's very, it's very interesting, and you can see kind of what his thought process was and what he changed and what he didn't. Um, that's a conversation for another day. But famously, very, very, very different in tone, in subtext. In almost in... every 
every aspect in a lot of ways. Yes. It, pretty much everything. Very different from the book. Everything is sort well, of opposite in a way. That's yeah. that's the thing I wanted to get to because I think unlike, you know, because, you know, Mike Flanagan himself, uh, famous for not adapting things very faithfully. Hill House, almost unrecognizable compared to the book. Sh you know. Yeah, <laughs> funnily enough, too, that uh, having just finished that book this morning, uh, we had a little conversation before we got on about that. Uh, Hill House, the novel, was actually a heavy source of inspiration for The Shining. So interest, just an interesting little fact that Mike Flanagan mm, was tapped to together. do the sequel. Yeah, just a kind of an interesting little thing. Um, yeah, so there have been many examples throughout film history of adaptations of books that have strayed quite far from their source material. But one of the things I find most interesting about The Shining as an adaptation is that it's not actually, it's not unrelated to the original. It's almost like a mirror inverse evil twin version of the book, if you can yeah. imagine such a thing. <laughs> what's what's changed is not like oh we introduced something that was nowhere to be found in the book it's like things are inversed and reversed and flipped around and like the opposite of what happens in the book happens in the movie it's very interesting it's like i i keep coming back to this way of thinking about it i've seen this movie so many times now but it's almost like the evil twin version yeah that's a, that's <laughs> an interesting um a mirror reflection. Mirrors play a big part in Kubrick's movie, uh, perhaps intentionally with that in mind. It's interesting. It's a very interesting film. Um, Have you ever heard what Stanley Kubrick, uh, the, what he found so uh, particularly interesting about The Shining, the book? Uh, the plot, right? Uh, well, what, he's, uh, what he said in, a, uh, in an article an interview in 1980 was as the supernatural events occurred you searched for an explanation and the most likely one seemed to be that the strange things that were happening would finally be explained as the products of jack's imagination it was not until grady uh slides the bolt slides open the bolt of the larder door and allows jack to escape that you're left with no other explanation but the supernatural so that that yeah, was I, what I, he I... said was the most uh interesting thing to him uh, about adapting it was that it mo for a long while it felt like it was going to be sort of a delusional paranoia until mm -hmm. that moment happens yes it's interesting because oh i have i have thoughts on that because i don't even know if i agree with kubrick in that way but <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that so the shining came out in 1980 um it, it was not a smash hit at the box office like the thing, uh, it was panned by some people. It was even nominated for a few Razzies. Oh, really? That's, yeah, hold on. I want to look it up because I can't remember like what the Razzies were for. One of them was for Shelley Duvall, um, <laughs> which is which is a little mean. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. Stanley Kubrick was nominated for a Razzie for The Shining for worst director. Can you believe that shit? You, you're okay. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that yeah. that's um something else man that's uh <laughs> yeah the razzies wow, talk never about been... the, the king of bad takes jesus <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty bad one not everyone loved this movie at the time like i said it was not a huge box office hit i think in total in the box office it like barely scraped a profit or maybe you know just barely didn't scrape a profit eventually it would make up that money in dvd sales and rentals and all that stuff because it is eventually it, it has cemented itself as kind of a cult classic. I would argue, if it isn't number one, it's in the top three of most iconic horror movies of all time. Oh, I'm I'm with you on it's that. The one. Most it's the most parodied. It's the most homaged to. It's it's so visually iconic. It's it it's really like kind of clawed its way up from being kind of a eh, film in the popular consensus when it came out to like, wow, this is one of the most interesting and strangest horror movies of all time. And I think it's absolutely incredible. I can't wait to talk about it. Um, I'm at a little bit of a loss trying to figure out where to start. I suppose we'll start with what the broad strokes of the story are. Uh, I imagine everyone in the chat will have seen The Shining already, but if you haven't, uh, now would be a good time to stop the stream and go watch it. Because it's yeah, great. I mean, even if um, you, even if you have seen it already, uh, you might want to just revisit it. At some no, point. don't tell them to leave. They're supposed to stay and, and listen to us talk about it. Oh, true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. never mind. Don't uh, go anywhere. 
I only say that that if you don't want it spoiled, um, we're going to spoil it. So go check it out. It's a very simple story, kind of deceptively simple story for how like rich and dense and strange the film is. It's very simple. A man gets a job as a caretaker in a remote uh, mountainous hotel. And his job is to stay there with his family and take care of the hotel. And over the course of the winter, he loses his mind and tries to kill his family. That's that's yeah. the bare bones, and it's very simple, and it's so straightforward that it it allows for all the surreal, kind of esoteric and strange imagery and scenes to play out. It's like it's it's got such a great, simple and effective skeleton to hang everything else on. I I really admire that about it. It's very straightforward. Yeah, great. I, yeah, it, I, that's it, I, there's like one of the little twists is that his son is psychic, has a little latent ESP ability, uh, and that kind of drives a lot of the surrealist stuff, uh, yes. which is it makes for some very interesting uh, shots and scenes and compositions and just all kinds of cool, iconic imagery uh, all throughout the hotel. And, you know, it's a Stanley Kubrick movie, so it's got some incredible camera work and some oh, very stunning. meticulous Just, set design. Yeah. Uh, excellent performances from pretty much everybody involved. So um, There's that, that that's something that not everyone agrees with. But I I, I, I believe everyone's great in this. Movie. I, yeah, I I've you know, I used I used to be on the it. side of Shelley Duvall is kind of um not good, but uh, f- upon further rewatch, I- I've come to appreciate her performance a lot more. Oh, she's so good. She's there's, very there's good, yeah. So much to say about why she is the way she is in the movie. Um, but yes, that's the broad strokes. Um, let's also talk a little bit about the broad strokes of Dr. Sleep. Yeah, um, let's do it. Let's get into we're, it. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to like, like we did with The Thing and The Thing, we're going to sort of try to give this conversation a little bit of a structure we're going to talk about the filmmaking the technical and aesthetic side of things and we're going to get into the story and we're going to assess both stories um looking at the four i guess pillars of of storytelling and writing that being plot character world building and theme and kind of see how they stack up how they compare um so dr sleep came out in 2019 so yeah, Almost 40 years later. Based on a novel written in, what, 2016, 2013? Something, it, it's something like that. A, a very long time it. after the both The Shining novel and the film. And with plenty of time for Stephen King to allow his hatred of the movie to stew, which he <laughs> most certainly has done. Uh, yeah. He's still very petty about it um, to this day. It's kind of kind of funny. So uh, he he wrote a he ended up writing a five hundred and five hundred and thirty something page sequel to The Shining, uh, I I for the reasons behind which it almost seems like he was hoping it would get made into a movie. To me, I'm not going to speculate too much on his intentions uh, with yeah. with the story, well, we don't have but to do it, that. It, it does seem like he kind of did it in order to uh, you know correct the record in his favor. Well, he he tried that with the miniseries, which someone in the chat mentioned yeah, already. Yes, they did. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Stephen King made a miniseries version of The Shining uh, because he hated Kubrick's version so much. Uh, and I've not watched it. I'm kind of curious to at some point. We should we should cover it at some point because that yeah. could, that could be pretty fun. But what I've seen of it looks terrible. It's <laughs> it looks well, it looks terrible. terrible, and it's funny because. Despite his ostensible hatred for Kubrick's Shining, that miniseries apes off of it so hard. Yeah, it it rips it off. It's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny that, that Doctor Sleep does that a little bit too. But I did learn today a little bit about the background of how Doctor Sleep the movie gets made. So Mike Flanagan, um, he had, he had just come off the success of Gerald's Game, and he has a meeting uh, with the Warner Brothers people. He goes into the meeting, like, you know, to talk about, like, you know, he's he's made a couple successful films, and they're, and he goes into a conversation with Warner Brothers, specifically to talk about DC and what he might 
be able to do oh, gosh. with like a DC movie, um, specifically horror related. I think Flanagan said he was interested in. Oh God, I'm blanking on the name. What's the DC character with? It's got like a more of a horror. Constantine. Are we talking Constantine? No, it's not Constantine. Like clay face. Is clay? that a thing? Yeah, that's a yeah. That's like a Batman villain. I I'm pretty yes. sure. Okay, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, he was, he was gonna it, do a he, Clayface movie. That's a weird. Well, he he was interested in that and wanted to talk to them about like what he could maybe do with in a DC film. You know, give it a sort of horror spin. Interesting. So, Interesting. That's what that's what the that's what he was thought he would go into the conversation about, but they didn't really talk about that instead. And eventually, they started talking about more Stephen King stuff because Gerald's Game, an adaptation of Stephen King as well, and um. Eventually, the conversation turned to Dr. Sleep. Both he and the person he was meeting with at Warner Brothers, one of the head guys, I don't remember his name, uh, were talking about how much they liked Dr. Sleep. And he's like, oh, maybe I could do something with that. And the head guy says, like, I don't think that movie's going to get made, you know. And um, so he was like, oh, it could be interesting. So he wrote a treatment. He wrote, he had some thoughts about how you could go about doing Dr. Sleep and so he, they sent them to Stephen King. At first, he was like, "No, I don't want, I don't, I don't want you to make a Doctor Sleep movie." And then he he wrote the pitch and sent it to Stephen King and convinced Stephen King that to give it his stamp of approval. I don't know if they needed his permission because they had the rights to the book as part of a deal from uh, the Shining deal that they made back in the seventies. So I don't know if they needed his permission, but they got it. Mike Flanagan won Stephen King over with his pitch for how he was going to adapt Dr. Sleep. Part of that pitch, uh, as Flanagan put it, was to adapt the book as faithfully as possible. We'll talk about whether he did that or not. Um, but to sort of use the visual language of The Shining, his words, I think he fails utterly at doing that, but we'll get to it. Um, to use the visual language of uh, Kubrick's The Shining, but to adapt the story of Dr. Sleep as faithfully as possible. And uh, part of his pitch was to change the ending. We'll get to yeah, the ending. Yeah, okay, he, I was so going to... Yeah, that was Mike Flanagan's idea, to to change the ending of Dr. Sleep slightly, such that it more aligns closely with the ending of The Shining. But instead novel, of what yeah. happens to Jack, it happens to Danny as an adult instead. We'll talk about the details of that. So it was all his idea. This was not something that they, they had the rights to, but they didn't think they were ever going to make this movie until Mike Flanagan was like, oh, I have an idea for how to do it. And then Mike Flanagan himself has said that like, well, while he was writing it, it made him really nervous because he's like, everyone's going to hate this movie. Because uh, <laughs> he was like, uh, fans of the movie aren't going to like it. Fans of Stephen King aren't going to like it, but, you know, I just tried to do what what felt true and right to me. And so he made Dr. Sleep. Um, now, this movie is relatively well-reviewed. Yeah. Especially, really? especially, yeah, relatively. I did not look that up, but um, uh, well, let's look I, it I guess up. I let's should not up. be surprised, but... <laughs> I Dr. Am. Sleep, the movie, has a 7.3 on IMDb, um, 78 Rotten Tomatoes, critic score, 89 audience score. I remember at the time it got some decent reviews. It's certainly, for a legacy sequel to come out in the last 5 to 10 years, it's certainly one of the better reviewed ones. You know, it's no Top Gun Maverick or anything, but people seem to like it. I uh, hate it. I hate it. I think it's terrible. I'm excited to talk <laughs> I, about yeah. why. I hadn't seen it until we uh, had had planned to do this for the stream, and uh, oh boy, do I have some thoughts about this movie. <laughs> oh, I think I think in every way that's important, it utterly fails to live up to the original. Which, um, despite despite trying to split the baby between. Uh, the the book of The Shining and the movie of The Shining, it is very clearly a sequel to the movie in all the, all the important plot and character ways that matter. You know, he he's changed some things, right? But for example, one one big difference between the book and the movie of The Shining is Wendy as a character. Um, yeah. The, the Wendy that we see in Flanagan's Doctor Sleep is the Wendy from Kubrick's movie, right? So like, we've not... 
This is a sequel to the movie, and as such, I think it's one of the worst sequels of all time. I, I posted on Twitter that I think it deserves to be in the conversation for the worst legacy sequels ever made. And some people are like, really? You think it's that bad? I do. I think it's that bad. I think it's got character assassination levels of bad, and so I can't wait to talk about it. But at first, I suppose we'll talk about the broad strokes of what happens in Doctor Sleep. Yes. Doctor Sleep. It yeah, takes go place, ahead. It takes place, uh, you know, many years after The Shining. Danny is now uh, a, a broken alcoholic adult who must repair himself. Uh, he doesn't really shine anymore, and he ends up stumbling into a... Um, uh, he doesn't uh, shining and he doesn't shine anymore in quotes. Yeah, <laughs> it, it hard quotes. Uh, but he um, he ends up stumbling into a it, it's sort of like a like a weird supervillain story with a, with another girl who shines. Um, and yes. it's a it's a shitty X Men ripoff. Yeah, like, in, it, in many ways. It, it's really, it's kind of bizarre in how absolutely, like, little it has to do with anything from The Shining as a sequel. It, it's very much, it's big chunks of the movie are just kind of, like, un, they feel unrelated. They could be, they would be a mediocre kind of horror film almost any other way. Like, if it hadn't been connected in some very loose way to The mm -hmm. Shining, it would just be some mediocre, you know, super-powered, supernatural horror movie that doesn't... Yeah, I, I would say it's... I would say it's worse than mediocre, even if you don't look at it as a sequel, I think. Well, I, 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 I have lots to say about the, the, the superhero and the supervillain conflict in this film. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, I'm being... I'm trying to be... I don't even know if I'm trying to be generous. I'm just <laughs> just saying. It, it, I, take, it, I take your point, though. I think it would have been it. like it would have been a very middling movie that did not get garner nearly as much attention had it not been tangentially connected to The Shining in some That's true. way. Um, yes. I want to respond briefly to a couple things. Um, JJ Hayden says, "All I remember about Doctor Sleep is the horrific scene with the boy. So we had one scene I found gross, and the rest was forgettable." That is exactly how I felt after the first time I watched it. I felt that there was one scene that worked. Uh, and I'm, ex I'm, in, I'm excited to talk about that scene because genuinely that scene is pretty good. Um, yeah. Like, and very effective. And I'm like, oh, man, if, if this is what the whole movie was, we might have something here, but we don't. Um, it, well, it, 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 I, I, as good as it is, I still I think that there are... Uh, some bits about it that I, I mean that still feel like a first draft in a way like it could have used okay, well, some serious refining yes we'll get to that yeah um have y'all heard that the reason for the change of jack's car color in the opening scene scene was a stab at stephen king because they drove past the car from the book having been crashed yes did you know this Hugh? no i don't uh no i did not so I, as far as I know, this has not been made explicit by Kubrick or anyone else. First of all, he didn't do a lot of interviews at all. So he didn't. He, I think that's part of why as a figure and as a filmmaker, he's so mythologized to an absurd degree. It's because he just didn't do a lot of publicity. So <laughs> yeah, you don't have a lot of. So this isn't necessarily explicit, but it's it's part of the evidence that he is doing a mirror inverse of the book in his film. Uh, one such example is that when they're driving up to the Overlook in his uh, VW Bug, he's driving a yellow Bug. And in the book, it's red. And you're like, okay, why well, change the color? Well, there's a scene when um, Dick Halloran is driving a snowcat through the storm, and he passes red. by an accident where a red VW Bug has been crushed, utterly obliterated by a, <laughs> like a Mack truck. Oh my god, that's so funny. Wait. And so, <laughs> one of the reasons to point to that not just being a coincidence is that that scene is entirely unnecessary. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's when I was watching it last night, I, I was kind of sitting there thinking, like, why is this scene even here? 
<laughs> it's, it's, I mean, we, we, we're seeing that he's traveling through the storm. We're seeing that the storm is really bad and that he's on his way. You know, that's all fine. It's not necessary. It's not but... necessary. We got, we did get but that information they... in other places. So, you know, yes. but that but they is spent really the funny. Money. They spent the money to have the truck and the car crashed on the side of the road. Like that wouldn't have been a cheap or easy day to film. But they took the time to put it in there as like, a, look, this is what happened to your red car. This is a different movie. <laughs> this is my shining now, Stephen. Which, I am yes. the one who shines. Which I think, I think it is an indication of something that that that, that was done deliberately. Yes, that's funny. Have, have I watched Room Two Three Seven? Have you? No, I haven't. Have you? So I have. I have not. I saw a trailer for it, and I said. Fuck that. I have no interest in that. The Room 237, from everything that I've heard, is a documentary about the, the symbolism and all the various crazy interpretations people have of The Shining. Oh, and I suppose okay. what's remarkable about the film is that mixed in with rather well-supported, well-substantiated interpretations and reads of what's happening, there's just absolutely wild nonsense that doesn't relate to anything. You know, it's like, oh, this this movie is him acknowledging that he helped fake the moon landing. I, I, well, that and, one's kind of a famous little conspiracy theory, right? Because yeah. he uh, he has Danny wearing an Apollo Eleven sweater. Yeah, uh, yeah, because which is him acknowledging that he uh, faked the moon landing and not him just you know playing in, yeah playing into the joke a little bit. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, that's well. There's uh, so the, many there's, other things about. But there's like Holocaust de not denialism happening here. Yeah, because his typewriter is a German one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen all, that. It, that's that's like the worst excesses of just absolutely kooky, terrible film interpretation. That the that Room Two Thirty Seven, from what I understand, just treats as on the same level as much more reasonable and well supported interpretations. So I'm like, no, thank you. I have no interest. Yeah, in have, that. have you seen? I, I since we're bringing this up, have you seen the one about uh, how the theory about how The Shining is Kubrick's metaphor for the Native American genocide by the white man? It's Be because yeah, because I've heard because that. the hotel yeah, has heard it all. <laughs> you know Native American sand paintings and stuff, and then uh, the it was made on an Indian burial ground. Yeah, and fight off Indian attacks when they built it. Yes, and then there's uh the the baking powder in the pantry is a fake the brand. Yeah, cal yes. that means peace pipe or something like that. <laughs> yeah, um, a little far fetched. See, Interesting to think about, but a little far fetched. If I'm you ask me. I, I'm excited to talk more about that as we go because one of the things I think I think this is probably the best case in point for like how to and how not to talk about themes in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> because to imply that there's any sort of like that this is an extended allegory or metaphor or that you know the treatment of Native Americans in America is just absurd. There's like nothing really to support that. Like the, the reason that it's built on an Indian burial ground is to establish why this place has psychic energy that other places don't, because this was sacred ground and a lot of, you know, people have yeah. died here. You know, it's just to imply that this is some, like this hotel was built on a sacred place. That's why it has some sort of, some sort of psych, yeah, ex, sacred extra power, psychic yeah. energy. Yes, that's, that's, that's all it's there for, guys. <laughs> like, I mean, and that like that they've incorporated some of those designs into the building you know, to make it feel authentic or whatever. And that this is kind of like a, I don't know. Like, I, just, I, I think this is allegory brain this was, and I hate allegory brain. <laughs> allegory brain is like, oh, this is a metaphor. This whole movie is an extended metaphor for the, you know, the trail of tears. And then you have to look at everything to be like, well, how does it fit into the trail of tears, you know, mold? And if it doesn't, then we ignore that part. You know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. so sick of people interpreting movies this way. It drives me crazy. Yeah, no, I mean, the mo <laughs> yeah, the we, we'll get into that, of course, as we move forward. Uh, so, yes. um, um, where were we? Oh, we were talking about the broad strokes of Dr. Sleep. Well, uh, he falls into some some supernatural uh, superhero bullshit. Um, well, I want to I want to I want to I want to frame it a specific way because I want to draw attention to just how simple and just how needlessly convoluted they are in comparison. But like I said, in, in The Shining, it's oh, he takes a job as a winter caretaker. He brings his family and over the course of the winter, he goes crazy and tries to kill them. 
right? Yeah. It, it, there are more complicated aspects in terms of the existence of telepathy and even telekinesis, arguably, in this film. And there's surrealism and all that sort of stuff. But that's the story. You can you can really sum it up that simply. Yeah. Whereas, and if I'm trying to be as charitable as possible, if I'm trying to sum up Doctor Sleep in the simplest way, it's that adult Danny um, is still dealing with the trauma of what happened in The Shining uh, when he was a kid, and he forms a psychic bond with this young girl a who Pokemon. has incredible who has incredible psychic powers who is being hunted by a group of quasi-immortal psychic vampires, and he has to fight them off and save the day. By using the shine. Yeah, it's, it's kind of incredible to put them side by side in that regard, I think, because it's like, man, what happened? <laughs> what I, happened? Didn't Kubrick fa kind of famously say The Shining is about a, a family quietly going insane together, and then this this Doctor Sleep is about Danny saving the world, basically. Having a psychic, having a psychic mind battle against a quasi-immortal psychic vampire to save a little girl. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Sending sending a <laughs> sending a quasi immortal psychic vampire to the shadow realm. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, before we start talking about the plot um, and the characters and all that sort of stuff, I, I want to talk about the aesthetics because I think The Shining is one of the best looking movies I've ever seen. It's a good enough I, I, uh, I am point to love... swap over to the trailer footage. So let's do that. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. I I'm inclined to say that The Shining is one of the best looking movies. Oh, I, seen, I'm with you I, on that one for sure. I, I am mean... in love with the way this movie looks. And I love the way it's shot. I love the symbolism. I love the kind of slow, methodical, kind of floating camera work. I love the, the, the use of like bizarre camera angles and things like that. But I think what I, what I love most about The Shining, and I think what, what is undoubtedly part of why it's so iconic for people, is that most of the film doesn't look inherently scary, right? We're in a brightly yeah. lit, you know, very pretty hotel. And the content of the story is what makes it scary. There's a few, you know, visuals that are obviously uh, macabre and frightening and all that sort of thing. But for the most part, the movie just looks really nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not of... dimly lit. It's brightly lit and everything's clear and in focus and everything's well decorated and all that sort of stuff. One of the things that really I, I find so fascinating about this is that it kind of flips the idea of a, a generic haunted house story on its head. Where yes. the haunted house isn't some decrepit, rundown, dark, you know, brooding, mm -hmm. wood-paneled thing. Gothic old house. Yeah, where, uh, you know, that's one of the long things. Abandoned. That's one of the things in uh, that actually, ha like in the Hill House novel, that she describes it as being like it's it wood pan dark wood panels that sap the light out of the rooms and make everything very dark, and all of the all of the walls and everything are, you know. Uh, deliberately askew uh in order Tim to Burton yeah in order to, well in order to like like they're deliberately like just a half a degree off of the uh like nine of perfect angles in order to like kind of drive people nuts uh is yeah. the the thing and this kind of takes it the exact opposite way and does the, sort of the um like the perfect level joke like from rick and morty or like you can't handle perfect <laughs> level like everything is <laughs> Very yeah. symmetrical, very bright, almost sterile. Uh, and that is, in a lot of ways, that's just as disturbing, but in a mm -hmm. different way. You know, like People are afraid of hospitals, not because hospitals are dirty, but because they're so sterile and, and bright mm -hmm. and, and quiet. And that's sort of what the ho Overlook gets at. At yeah. least I think the Overlook gets at that. And uh, how empty it is and how massive it is and how... Yeah, devoid um, of life. It, it's just... Yeah. Uh, Shelly describes it as a not Shelly, sorry. Wendy describes it as a ghost ship. And yeah, he's, yeah. He's that's... it empty for the first time. Yeah, and yeah, it's, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, like it has really subtle use of like. Oh, I mean, I just I, I think the camera works incredible. It's got some great snap zooms. You guys know how much I love snap zooms. <laughs> <laughs> it has. It's one of the first movies to make such a prominent use of the steady cam. 
Um, the Steadicam work, as many will know, was done by the inventor of the Steadicam for this movie. Um, there was the main cinematographer, and then the inventor of the Steadicam did a lot of the Steadicam operation because it was such a new piece of technology at the time, which allowed really long tracking and what would normally be dolly shots, but you know they can make impossible turns and go over ground that they've already been on where you would normally see rails and things like that, that allowed a sort of free floating movement through these corridors that would just wouldn't have been possible before. And that's certainly an aspect of what's so effective about the visual presentation. Yeah. Like, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is one of the most iconic movies of all time. It's really kind of insane to me how like memorable certain visuals are, you know, like, like yeah. even if they're like really small elements of the story, right. You know, it, it's really quite impressive. And then I, the other thing I wanted to mention about the, Oh, so well, yeah, before I continue on gushing about The Shining, let's compare that to Dr. Sleep. I think Dr. Sleep is ugly as sin. Uh, I Dr. Hate Sleep the way looks this movie it looks. looks just like every Mike Flanagan yes. production that's not even ever just been him. Made. It's it, it's like there's so much of this horror sludge coming out these days. It's all dimly lit. The color correction's terrible. It's like all like sickly bluish green. Everything's like blue and teal where, you know, The Shining is like, it's very colorful. It's a very bright, colorful movie. There's lots of vibrant reds and blues and yellows and greens um, and all that sort of stuff. And then Dr. Sleep, it's all like orange and teal, blue and like blue and green and orange. And then it's like, that's the whole movie. And it's so dimly lit, like low contrast. There's no like, yeah. nothing's brightly lit highly and, saturated just like pushing the, pushing the that sick blue green color to like the limit every time they they make everything in the overlook very yellow uh oh, when they get there don't fucking get me started on that so uh, we're fast forwarding a bit but the, the uh doctor sleep the climax of doctor sleep takes place at the overlook Ooh, but now it's abandoned and dark and dilapidated and decrepit and dimly lit. And, and there's spooky. cobwebs everywhere. And, and the, lights, like, oh. lo the lights only come on <laughs> when Danny walks around. And it, there, It's yeah. like everything that was good and iconic and effective about the original, we're doing the lame version now. Everything that made this movie different, we're just undoing. So in that oh, way, it is a little like the thing 2011. <laughs> it, it is, because it really feels like they took something unique and interesting and reduced it to the same sort of generic horror sludge that we've seen a million times. And I, not even, like, even, even if the story was really good, I think the visual pr presentation is, like, unforgivable. I think it's ugly as hell. I hate the way this movie looks. I'm I mean I'm with you it doesn't it doesn't have its own unique stamp to it it the only iconic oh. imagery that it manages to have it apes off of Kubrick and even when it's doing that I mean like the opening shot the opening helicopter shot of the shining over the mm -hmm. over that bright lake and the island with the trees they recreate that uh you know towards the climax of Dr. Sleep but uh, this time it's dark and it's at night time yeah. so you can barely see anything so it's like, what are we doing <laughs> so and I, I i i i wish that they had the balls to make a sequel to the shining that was just more like the books you know more like what stephen king originally wanted because the idea that he's going to do that ostensibly but then he's still going to do a really like cheap and lazy job of aping the visual language of the original movie by like while missing all the important stuff and making it really ugly instead like that's so that's so bad it's so lame there's and, and there are plenty of comparisons to make you can just look i mean the, the the thumbnail of this stream is one place but there's so many shot for shot recreations of the original movie because they understand how good it was at least visually but everything's lame now Everything's poorly lit. They're not using the same type of wide angle lenses. They're not, it's not colorful. It's not bright anymore. It's not clean and precise. And, and the only times either. that they do attempt to do that are very little bits where they kind of just, where they do, like, they're either recreating scenes later and making them dark and gloomy instead of, you know, paying, mm -hmm. you're paying homage to the brightness or, 
they're very briefly recreating little snippets of stuff that happened in the original movie just with different actors you know why it's so it's so it's so unnecessary i hate i hate that they did that too that they recreated some scenes but just worse now oh there's there's even one example where they just change how it plays out it's, it's, it's because it the they one don't where act- he's riding down the he's riding down the hallway and he turns to look at room yep. 237 and it actually the door actually just opens on its own yeah. as a yeah i noticed that when i rewatched the movie i'm like why would you do that like you're deliberately removing some of the most interesting ambiguous well i know why they'd do that cuz it's stephen king and he doesn't like it but they're deliberately removing the ambiguity of that event in the original movie yep yeah, they, they they just change the way certain things happen. It's terrible. I just like from a visual perspective. I mean, one of the reasons for for the stream background you can see right now that I just went with like kind of like a sickly orange and blue to, to pair with you know the Doctor Sleep trailer is like that's just what it looks like. It's so anytime it has any more interesting color in it, it's when it's recreating something from The Shining. It's so it's uh, I just it's it. Oh, nice. I hate it. I, I just noticed that it actually changes to like a, a more interesting like red and blue color palette when it goes to the original, to the actual yeah, trailer. That's pretty I, I interesting. To, That's nice. I tried to have it reflect the visual language. Anyway, visually, I just think it's such a downgrade. Downgrade doesn't even feel like the right word. It It feels, I keep coming back to the phrase ugly as sin, because I think it is something of like an aesthetic sin. <laughs> did did Danny have a high Terrible. level of midichlorians? Oh boy, are we gonna get into that? Essentially, <laughs> you yeah. You joke, it, it, but yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> you joke, but unironically, it is that sort of level of demystifying the force in the prequels. It's the same sort of thing. The same yeah. they they demystify the shining in this movie in the exact same way that George Lucas demystifies us demystifies the force in the prequels it's really bad um but, uh, while we're on the subject of aesthetics though uh, the other big thing i want to mention is the music the music in stanley kubrick's the shining is incredible Fucking great man it is one of uh, the best soundtracks too. and it i mean the way that he employs the music in certain uh in certain scenes just absolutely like on rewatches can blow your mind with like stuff that you didn't notice before but like mm-hmm. the 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 musical cue for when somebody starts shining will appear in certain scenes that you didn't notice it the first time through but yeah. like all of a sudden now you're starting to question all of these different kinds of things that are happening right like uh that Find connections between scenes yeah. that don't have obvious connections except for that the music is is indicating to you that there's something about them that's the same yeah You're like ooh, what's what is that hmm yeah um yeah so uh the shining i think also rather famously uh has a has a title sequence and i think two other pieces of music in the film uh one is it there's another piece of music that comes for another helicopter scene later this is after he gets the job when they're driving up as a family there's that piece and then the piece that plays when Jack walks into room 237 and finds the woman in the bathtub. Those three pieces of music were written by Wendy Carlos, famous uh, composer. She also worked on um, uh, uh, Clockwork Orange. Yeah, with, yeah. With Stanley Kubrick. But uh, she she wrote more music for this film um, that was not used because... Stanley Kubrick realized that he there's because he's a big classical music guy. I think that shows in a lot of his work. And he was like, man, some of these pieces are already perfect. I'll just I'll just use those instead. He's kind of famous yeah. for not being everyone's favorite composer to like a uh, director to work for as a composer. Um, uh, famously, he hired Hans Zimmer for for Full Metal Jacket and then fired him. <laughs> because he wasn't because he had a very specific Kubrick that is he had a very specific idea of what he wanted and he and Hans Zimmer is like he basically wanted me to just be his like musical dictation person because he knew exactly what he wanted exactly where he wanted it and so there wasn't a lot of room for him to play or invent things and so Hans Zimmer is like I had a lot of respect for him but I'm just like I'm not your guy for this <laughs> you'll want to find someone else yeah uh, 2001 Space Odyssey famously also had a score composed or commissioned 
uh, that he didn't use at all. <laughs> it sucked to be that guy because he went with classical music instead. I think in all of these cases, it was the right choice because I love his use of music in all of these movies. He's maybe one of the best people I'm aware of at using an existing piece of music in a film in a way that makes it feel like it was like perfectly crafted for the scene. Yeah. Um, there's the one in... piece in this one is Oh my goodness, Hugh. That's my favorite one. So there's a there's a piece by the, the I think the Hungarian composer. He's Bela yeah, I think Bartok. Bartok, Bela Bartok. He's he's Hungarian. Hungarian. Yeah. Yes. He's a Hungarian um classical composer, I guess you could say, uh of the sort of like modern he was contemporary the, like the he, one of the, the founders of the humanist him and Janacek guy like because especially with this one I think he went and studied um the like uh native music the 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 folk music of native the folk music of native Hungary, Hungary. And, yeah, and, yeah and he kind of you know rearranged it and organized it and composed it into uh classical pieces which was re revolutionary at the time you know one mm -hmm. of those things that like the the civilized world didn't give much credence to the peasant music, and he kind of went out there and tried to bridge that divide. Uh, and the, um, so the sorry the, the 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 piece in particular that's used in this movie is called uh, "Music for Strings, Percussion, and Celeste." Uh, it's a very famous piece of classical music. It's atonal, uh, kind of classically atonal, not in that like there's no pitches at all, but it uses all specific like twelve notes chromatically. Um, very, very effective piece of music in this movie. And he, uh, there's, there's one, it's my favorite, it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie, which is saying something. It's the scene when um, young Danny walks into, he get, to go get his fire engine and, and Jack is sleeping, is like sitting up on the bed, not sleeping. You know the scene I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. The way the music is used in that, like you'd swear it was orchestrated specifically for the movie. Like the transitions between sections, like aligning with changes and what's happening in their conversation is so perfect like uh, it, he's so good at that like he makes these pieces of music that were written i don't know 30 40 years before the movie feel like they were designed specifically for the scene really quite incredible yeah and he Love uses music he throughout. uses penderecki for that musical oh yeah uh, that musical sting that i was Few talking pieces about by him yeah, yeah. where um the shining with the one that cues you in that shining is happening is a Penderecki piece. That's just like, and I, I like Penderecki a lot. There's a lot of stuff yeah. that he's done that a lot of directors I like, like David Lynch has used Penderecki in a very effective way. Yeah. Uh, I, su I suppose what's really interesting to me about, because I think a lot of that stuff, you know, it comes from like the very sort of like avant-garde atonal era of classical music that many people look back on with like the same sort of disdain that people have for modern art and not for no reason i yeah, think a lot of people, like it can be quite unpleasant you know <laughs> like... oh yeah well i think i think a lot of these pieces are rather unpleasant on their own but what's really interesting about finding their way into a horror movie it's like ah we we've, we've contextualized them in a way that like that makes them make sense whether like you wouldn't I don't think I'd particularly enjoy listening to a Penderecki piece, like just sitting in a in a concert hall for like yeah. forty minutes or however long they are. I'd be like, ugh. I could not. Crazy. I could not deal with the Threnody <laughs> for the victims of Hiroshima. It like no, sitting in, on its own, but in that little art or you know visual poem that David Lynch put together in that one good episode of Twin Peaks three, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I am perfectly fine with listening to that. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 it provides a context for it that really works. Um, yeah, music, incredible. Um, now, we move to Dr. Sleep. What's the music like in Dr. Sleep? Well, instead of using those original pieces, uh, he's t uh, Mike Flanagan has told the composer that he works with on basically every, every project, the Newton Brothers. I don't know, I, I looked them up. They've done most of his movies and a couple Not other random else, right? things. Yeah, yeah he's... They're his go-to guys. Um, and he told them to, like, do a lame job of aping the music from The Shining. <laughs> and then, well, and do a lame job of aping the music from The Shining, and then he just uses it in the way that any regular horror movie would use music. I think it's even... Uh, yes, yes, but I think it's even worse because... Okay, so th there's a piece that Wendy Carlos did for The Shining that has a heartbeat in it. Yeah. It only shows up once or twice. It shows up uh, when Jack goes into room 237, and I think the heartbeat 
plays a really interesting role there because it's almost like we're going into the heart of the hotel. Like we're going into like the deepest, darkest, mm. weirdest place. And or I'll, I'll talk the deepest, more about... darkest, weirdest place of Jack's own heart, which is interesting. Yes, yes. And it really, it really it works. Really works. And that's like one of the only times I think there's one other scene that has the heartbeat thing in it, but it's not super common. Um, Mike Flanagan uses the heartbeat thing like almost throughout the entire movie, Dr. Sleep. It's really incredible. He overuses that score, that little piece of music to death. Like, I swear to God, it's like every five to ten minutes that stupid heartbeat comes back. And it's like the heartbeat, using a heartbeat in like a horror movie, you know, uh, soundtrack or, you know, sound effects background sort of thing. It's kind of an kind of old hat already, you know kind of played out yeah <laughs> and he he manages to take something that's used simply and sparingly and effectively in the original and just turn it into the most generic played out thing ever i i, I hate the way he uses music in dr sleep it's terrible I yeah I was getting very annoyed when I was watching it because it would just it, it, like any time he wanted what would effectively have been a, a, like a jump scare somewhere else he would use oh, the like God. the string the sting on the strings uh as if yep. as if that like doing that gives him you know the same feel as the shining which it's not like that's not how the shining did not have jump scares like this you know like the shining didn't really no, didn't. do that it it yeah, let's talk about jump scares, fear flashes. <laughs> let's talk about them. Mike Flanagan, still to this day, though he's I I I want to say I do think Mike Flanagan's aesthetic sensibilities have improved since the time of Hill House and um Doctor Sleep. I think uh Midnight Mass and Fall of the House of Usher, though I don't think they're stunning visually in any respect. I think they're I think they look fine. Um he's gotten better. They're a little less generic, yeah. They're a little less generic, but he is still addicted to jump scares. And I hate it. It's like, dude, grow up. I I, I can't... He's... He loves jump scares so much. He still uses them. Follow the House of Usher has so many of them where, like, hard cut to something and a loud musical sting to make you go, ah! Startled you, didn't I? Isn't that scary to be startled? It's like, man, I thought... I I it it bothers me when people act like it, at least in in an aesthetic sense he's really any better than your average horror movie slop director because he's not no he... not in terms of not in terms of visual presentation not in terms of the use of music even in the fall of house of usher which you know I think is better than some of his worst stuff for sure like the use of music is so unbelievably on the nose it's just like, and, and Dr. Sleep, it's the exact same way. Oh, something sentimental is happening in the story? Let's play sentimental music. It, everything, like, oh, scary things are happening? Scary noises are happening. It's so one-to-one. There's no subtlety to it. There's no, like, clever misdirection. There's no ironic use of music. Well, and there's no, there's no evidence that he understands why the music worked in the first place you know like what we were just is like kubrick was very good at making you know taking pieces of classical music and creating scenes that make sense in the context of the story but that also somehow feel like the piece of classical music that he used was written for that scene you know yeah. he understood yeah. the importance of the uh, and he understood what worked about that music he's clearly very right when it came and passionate about it and just very insightful uh when it came to the use of this music mike flanagan kind of just throws it in as if it could be like you could replace all of the the music that sounds vaguely shining-esque in dr sleep with music that sounds more mike flanagan like you know from hill house or Mm -hmm. or house of you know any of those and it would fit it would it would fit probably about the same. It's it, he just kind of yeah. put a like a skinwalker face of this classical music <laughs> over his own generic yeah, musical there's... tendencies in his movie, and yeah. that's what we got. Yeah, I think the use of music is uh, it's not. I mean, sometimes with those jump scares and stingers, like it's actually pretty awful. But for the most part, it's just he doesn't seem to understand the opportunities he's missing here. 
or the scenes he's ruining with music. Uh, one thing I should mention is that The Shining has many long dialogue scenes with no music in them that we just sit in the conversation. I don't know if there's any. <laughs> I could in, not tell you. Yeah. There's very few because music is always there to as um if I'm being uncharitable, I would say manipulate you into trying to force you to feel a certain thing. If I was being more charitable, I'd say it's always there to guide you in how you're supposed to feel in any scene. Like there's no room to let you make up your own mind is how it feels when I watch a lot of his stuff, but especially in Doctor Sleep. Music is right there to hold your hand and say, now you feel sad, and now you feel inspired, and now you feel scared. And I just, I hate it. One of the things I really like about The Shining, in terms of how, it's, how the music comes in and how it's edited, is that he'll, he'll, he'll uh, arrange these pieces of music to highlight certain moments. So it, in, when, when you're talking about adding music or score into a movie, there's kind of like two approaches, right? You could have it be that the music, I guess one extreme might be something like Baby Driver, where like everything's happening on the beat, right? We're cutting on the beat, important actions are happening on the beat, people are shooting gunshots in rhythm to the song behind it. You know, that's, this, that's kind of an extreme example, right? And then the other extreme might be that you have a piece of music, but like nothing about the music like we're not cutting along to the rhythm of the song important actions aren't falling on important beats in the music like if you have those two extremes i think what a lot of master filmmakers understand is that the the best way to use music is to find a balance in the middle right where you have some important things where you cut right on a big hit and that that's impactful and other times big important uh moments are happening in the music but nothing changes on screen like, for example, um, there's, there's that, I think it's a Penderecki piece, uh, when Danny is riding on his tricycle, he's riding down the hallway, and we're, we're far away, we're not following him directly behind. Oh, there's, yeah. a big, there's a big dun that happens, but nothing has happened on screen. He's still riding his tricycle. And that kind of like jolts you and keeps you on edge, and you're like, oh, what are we doing? But then he's riding around, and then as he's riding around the corner and reveals the twins, there's another big gong hit that's like, emphasizing that moment so like right in a very short span of time we have a big jolting hit in in the music that doesn't align with anything to make you go like oh it, to keep you off balance and then when something important happens it emphasizes that moment too so it does both in short succession yeah. and this movie is really i think a master class in how to find that balance there's little fun things where uh in, in the biz that sometimes called mickey mousing when things are happening exactly on the beat. So Jack will be like throwing his tennis ball around and when it hits the ground, it hits a note in the music too and stuff like that. There's a little bit of that, and, but we, we keep you off balance because one of, the things, one of the things that happens when if you only do one extreme or the other, if you do the extreme where nothing in the music is lining up with actions on film, it feels like it's, it, it's, not, it's not connected to it. You know what I'm saying? It's like... Yeah. It's like the two are separate and they're just go happening at the same time, but they haven't connected. They haven't congealed into one thing. And then the other extreme was something like Baby Driver, which I think as a gimmick, it's interesting, but it gets old really quick because partly yeah, because things Driver are so predictable. Sure. It's so predictable. Like, you know, things are going to happen on the beat always. So nothing is, is startling as it would be if like, you're not sure whether it's going to happen in rhythm or not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Think, and, and, it's interesting to mention Baby Driver because both Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, which are like in, in my in my you know view, are immeasurably better movies than Baby Driver. Yes, uh, they both close, do. I agree. They both do something similar to that, where they'll cut on you know cut things or have you know the the camera work and you know certain things happen on beat, but they save those either for the climax, you know the the big ending. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. for, you know, like, s small moments, you know, that it's not every scene, right? Yes. So yes. Uh, it, it is, it is, it, it's a less is more sort of thing, except you're working mm -hmm. with me. And one thing I did want to mention particularly about that scene where Danny's riding his bike and he turns the corner and we get the little, you know, the little uh, hit, uh, and then he does it again, is uh, not only 
is Kubrick very good at selecting pieces which fit the scenes and everything, but he knows which parts of the pieces to use in order to sort of drive that, uh, that feeling, that yes. imbalance. Uh, it all feels very deliberate. And, and the right? contrast between the imbalance of, of the musical, you know, stings telling you what's going on and the just almost uncanny sort of smoothness of the camera motion works very well too. Yes. Uh, to kind There's of... a contrast. There's a contrast there between, the, you know, the content of, you know, some of the scariest stuff in The Shining is like very simple like that. It's a very, like, you know, because when, when like, like you were saying, when he goes around the corner and sees the twins, it's, it's so kind of uncannily symmetrical and got that like single point perspective look to it. Yeah. And everything's flowing so smoothly and perfectly and lands so symmetrically like that. And it's just two little girls at the end, which isn't inherently scary, but the music is like, and you're like, Oh, I don't know what to feel right now, but I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know he uses I mean? a lot. So this is a, th a theme that comes through a lot in the shining. That is almost entirely, if not completely, I would say lost uh, on Dr. Sleep is he uses the, 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 inherent fear of the double right of the of doppelganging of doubling of yes, mirrors I, and reflections I can't wait to talk about that in the themes section yes there's a lot to say there yeah and uh, but... we'll do the super chat real quick uh, which director do you think could have made a proper sequel to the shining do you uh, do you have any opinions on that i know i he adds personally i don't think anyone could have achieved such standards i think in an ideal world there's no sequel made but if i were to who would I be most trusting of to do a sequel to The Shining? Um, if he's not writing it, then I would say someone like Yorgos Lanthimos because yeah. um, the, the killing of the sacred deer was the most aesthetically Kubrickian, if you'll <laughs> allow such a term, movie I've seen in a long time. I was like, oh... This guy is going for something very similar. There's a lot of extreme wide angles. There's a lot of very smooth, perfect, symmetrical dolly and steady cam shots. People act, talk a little strangely. There's something uncanny about it that isn't like, isn't explicitly gruesome, but is strange and makes you feel uncomfortable. I think he could do a really good job. Uh, Killing of the Sacred Deer turns awful in the last act, completely ruins the movie. Um, but I think he, he has some better films that, that stick the landing a little better. I think if someone else were writing the script, someone who wrote like a, if, if there was a really good story to tell about an adult Danny Torrance, or if someone were to take Dr. Sleep, say, and adapt it in, this, in the same sort of twisted mirror inverse way that Kubrick did with The Shining, I feel like Yorgos Lanthimos would be a good person to direct it yeah that'd be that'd be interesting I, you know i think if his heart was in it steven spielberg could probably do a good job um when yeah when his heart because yeah. he finished ai for kubrick after kubrick passed uh and it, ai is okay right like, it, it's it, it it does feel like a kubrick movie and it, he does feel like he did it justice it, i i'm not not a huge fan of the movie but i think if like if mm. If you if Steven Spielberg really felt like he was doing it for Stanley Kubrick or like to honor Stanley Kubrick, he probably could have made a good run at it. He's going to be doing of, that with the Napoleon yeah, he, series. With the Napoleon series, which I'm excited for. Hopefully that uh, success isn't in any way marred by the fact that there's another high profile Napoleon thing coming out <laughs> before. Yeah, that actually that confused but, me a little bit when I saw yeah, that but, the first couple of times. But I think he, yes, could, so he famously, could probably do something. I think he, I think he could. Yes, I, I, th I don't think. And perhaps yeah. at at a at a earlier time, uh, David Lynch might have been able to handle something like that because, as we're going to discuss uh, moving forward, there's a lot of dream imagery and Freudian yeah. dream imagery that happens in Surrealism. the Shining. The surrealist oh. dream stuff that happens. This in might the be Shining. A, This might be a fun time to bring this up. I don't. Hugh, you might know this. You might not. But um. Stanley Kubrick, big fan of Eraserhead. Yeah, I did know and, this actually. Yeah, and he famously championed Eraserhead to like fellow Hollywood executives and producers and stuff like that. And he's like, "Oh, you got to check it out. It's great." And would hold private screenings for them. And Eraserhead was a big influence on The Shining. Um, I think part of it 
part of what he saw in Eraserhead was that you could get really strange and abstract and surreal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Finding like new and interesting ways of doing that. I think The Shining is a much better film than Eraserhead because oh, Eraserhead, Eraserhead is very, very thin, if entirely non-existent in the story department. It's almost <laughs> all, it's, it's one big nightmare, which has its interests. You know, there's something interesting about it. But what, one of the things that I'm what, one of the things that I love the most about The Shining is that it's so strange. It's so it's such a weird movie, but it's very straightforwardly understandable and compelling at the same time, right? Yeah. It's like the 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 central drama at the core of the story is very simple. It's 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 about a deranged husband trying to kill his family, right? And so you're rooting for the family to not be killed. And you understand the stakes and you understand the, the escalation and what's happening and what the dangers are. And, you know, that's all very simple and effective. And that allows him to get super weird and weird as hell. Like, I, I, I think what I've always found most fascinating in general, in terms of the arts as a whole, is when something's very, like, strange and unique and unexpected and just utterly bizarre, but also manages to captivate an entire culture, right? Yeah. I really like, uh, you know, because certainly there are weirder movies than The Shining. There are more abstract movies. There are more surreal movies. Um, there are more straightforward, straightforwardly scary films than The Shining. But this manages to be surrealist and abstract in a way that is understandable to the average person. And yeah, compelling and captivated, you know, the imagination of people around the world. And that's that's what that's that's what's so magical about it, because that's yeah. a really hard thing to do. You know what else? Uh, so I didn't consider this until uh, just recently, but I, I if I was going to pick a more modern director, le less of like a legacy guy like Spielberg or Lynch, uh, you know, I, I, I would think. Robert Eggers might be able yeah, to do something. I knew you were yeah. going to say that. I agree. Be, yeah, I think that he could probably do something quite like a good spiritual successor to The Shining. That I, I think The Lighthouse kind of proves that he can yes. handle that. <sighs> Thank you for saying that. The Shining and The Lighthouse have a lot in common. I really like The Lighthouse. It's 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 one of my favorite movies to come out in the past. I, you know, it's funny. The Lighthouse came out the same year <laughs> as Doctor Sleep. Yeah. Oh, and, oh my God! Which, it did. Which is oh. the better spiritual successor to The Shining? Oh, it's got to be The Lighthouse, obvious. Like, it's oh, got to be yeah, The Lighthouse. Exactly. It's got to be. Um, the Lighthouse oh. is similarly simple. It's two guys alone and stranded on a lighthouse and they go crazy and we see a whole bunch of surreal shit. And I think that's, that's the best kind of surreal, strange, abstract, artsy type horror movie where it's like, the bones are simple and effective and it's a good foundation to build everything else on. And then you can hang all sorts of weird kind of opaque, esoteric and enigmatic imagery on top of it. And, you, and people can be like, I don't know what that means, but I'm just, I'm here to see what happens to these guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's yeah. I, doc, he, if he were tasked with it, Robert Eggers, that is, I think he would do a good job. It would I be guess. different because he's got a different sort of style. Oh, you know what? I'm, uh, Although I, the, I the lighthouse talk... does have a lot of very interesting sort of symmetrical, smooth imagery yeah. in, that go, like I, that goes True. along, and it has a lot of thought put into the set design and the, the background stuff. So it, it, like there, there is definitely a lot that could be done. You know, he's probably the best answer because I, I am more inclined to like if Robert Eggers has a new movie out or Yorgos Lanthimos has a new movie out, I am much more inclinned to trust that the story will be good. In a Robert, Robert Eggers, Eggers movie, movie. Yeah. yeah. I think he's the only correct answer, honestly, the more I think about it. <laughs> okay, well, there we go. I hope that answers your question, Nick S. Robert Eggers, he's great. If you haven't seen all of his three movies that are out, Highly encourage go. it, honestly. Yes. They are all very, very good. Uh, I enjoy. I enjoyed every one of them immensely. I've seen The Northman many times. It's one of my favorites to come out that year. So, Good stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's a rough comparison of the aesthetics of the two movies i it's night and day man it's oh last thing to talk about before we finally finally start talking about the plot um is let, let's 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 call this tone right so i was lucky enough to see the shining on film 
in a theater full of people um, on my birthday, maybe five or six years ago. It was incredible. It was one of my favorite theatrical experiences I've ever had. One of the things that was really cool about it was that uh, the people hosting the screening asked for a show of hands before we started the movie. How many people here have never seen it? And it was about half of the audience had never seen it before. And I, that shocked me because I thought, oh, I thought everyone has seen this movie. So I got to see The Shining on film in a theater full of people, many of whom had never seen That's it before. That's fantastic. And <laughs> oh, it was so... So what I found most striking about it was how many laughs the movie got. See, I knew the movie was funny. I've always kind of known and I've always suspected that the best way of understanding almost every Kubrick movie is that it's a very, very dark comedy. Some more obvious than others. Obviously, Dr. Strangelove is supposed to be funny. But I don't think a lot of people appreciate how funny like Full Metal Jacket is, for example, <laughs> or A Clockwork Orange even in a, in a, clock a dark. Yeah, sort of A Clockwork song. Orange That's... is one of the darkest, like the dark, blackest comedies. Like it is so, yes. so dark, but it's it's funny as hell, man. Like it is funny. I think The Shining is a hysterical movie. Jack Nicholson that... is objectively fucking hysterical in this movie. He's, he is so uh... Funny. There are so many things that happen in this movie that are straight up comedy beats, right? You know, like that there's a big giant music cue when he rips the, the, the paper he's writing out of the typewriter. You know, like when when she's talking to her traumatized son on the couch and there's like the Roadrunner music playing in the background going like, meep, meep, like <laughs> intercutting, <laughs> like the very serious things that are being said. Jack Nicholson is hamming it up in honestly the best way possible. I, I've heard some criticisms that he's overacting in the movie. And my gut reaction is that, like, wow, he must have no taste. He's so, he's so funny. He's so compelling, and like, he grab, like, he just grabs your attention. It's, it's so obvious why they picked him for the Joker based on this movie. It's with like, the, <laughs> with the <laughs> eyebrows going, up, words of oh. wisdom, Lloyd. Words, words of, of wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> yeah, he, he's. I always liked you, Lloyd. <laughs> Best goddamn. Oh, here's another example of the like the mirroring thing. Um. Uh, I think the line in the book or a similar line in the book is like your best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine. Right. But he says like your best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine or Portland, Oregon, for that matter. Just like a mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Inverse. Like, you know, there's little, little things like that. A lot of mirroring things happening. Mirror, um, mirror on the other side of the car. Yeah. That, I, the that's Shining is really very funny. It's a very funny movie. And I think it succeeds in being funny and scary and uncomfortable at the same time. You know, I, I, I think it, it it's so it, it handles that balance so deftly. Like th there are a lot of laughs, you know, like when he's like, when, when you come in here, you're breaking my concentration. I don't get time to get back to where I was. Like the way he says things is great. You know, there's you know, there's some of the snap zooms are very funny. Oh, my God. Like, they're <laughs> fucking hilarious. man! Like, yeah. oh, my God. The snap zoom on the on the red rum and Wendy's face yes. is, <laughs> is so funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and, like, and you and know, like that's, that's a big failing of Dr. Sleep, is that I don't recall a single snap zoom once no. in that movie. Yeah, he, he claims to be using the visual language, which all that really means is that he directly mirrors some of the exact shots from the original, and he uses dissolves. That's really about it. There aren't really long like twisty steady cam sequences. There's not a lot of dead center framing. There's not a lot of, um, Oh God, I there's a specific word that describes this, but like, if you're looking at a scene, you're looking at a, like two a characters up against like a wall or something like that. You look straight on so that the wall is like perpendicular, perpendicular to where the camera is. In most movies, you look at scenes and stuff like that, it'd be more like 45 degree angles. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he'll do a lot of stuff where it's center framed and it's dead on. You know, uh, there's like a sort of proscenium quality to a lot of his stuff. None of that is really present in Doctor Sleep. He doesn't really make use of the visual language at all. He thinks he did, but he didn't. And so there's no snap zooms. Snap zooms are hilarious and incredible. They're, they're, they're funny, and, and I love them. I just I just love snap zooms, Hugh. It's just, you, you know, I don't think a good snap zoom is any... make or break a movie. It's, it's true. I don't think that, well, there definitely wasn't anything in Dr. Sleep that made me laugh. But I don't even think there was anything in Dr. Sleep that was supposed to be funny. Oh, at, no. What? 
Well, no, there was definitely some stuff that was kind of, like, they kind of played some stuff as jokes, I think, mostly. Like give, me, give me an example. I can't give a direct example, but I think it was supposed to, like, if you had seen it in a theater, did you see it in a theater? Because I didn't. I did. Okay, yes. if I had seen some of these things in the theater with a group of people, some of the scenes between Abra and Danny, I'm sure were, like, as the dialogue stuff between them, I'm sure were designed to get a chuckle, like a Marvel chuckle out of people. You know what I mean? If like, you think of a specific example, I can't, let me know. I really because I, 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 well, as we talk about it, um, because I saw it in the theaters, you know, I've seen it a couple times since. I, I have not found anything that even felt like a genuine or sincere attempt at being funny in the film. I think it's incredibly okay. unfunny. And, uh, okay, so it totally misses the tone, obviously, of the original. The original is kind of... I don't know if camp is the right word because it's strange and the performances are heightened. Um, Jack Nicholson. It's very said, uncanny is like, yeah. I, you could put it that way, you know, you like, definitely could. So say, Jack Nicholson talked about working with Stanley Kubrick and he talked about, you know, a lot of actors, you know, especially idealistic young actors. They're like, Oh, I'm going to give people the most real performance they've ever seen. I'm going to, I'm going to show them real life the way like they've never seen it this real before. And Stanley Kubrick would say things like, yeah, it's, it's realistic, but is it interesting yeah. about people's performances and line deliveries? It's like, yeah, you know, like, no, that feels, you know, real, but like, it's not, not interesting though. And you can definitely tell that all the performances were chosen out of uh, no doubt a myriad of options and takes because he liked to shoot things a million different ways. Uh, I want to talk more about that approach later, but like everything was chosen because it's like strange and there's something oddly compelling about the weird way they say things or the weird not way that, every... that people like not that every all of it works but like there's something kind of i i always remember the the strange way that Shelley Duvall is running at the end of the movie with the knife in her hand where she kind of just waggles her arms around for no <laughs> real reason but it like it just, it's just sticks... kind of She's kind of like pathetic, yeah, in a way that like actually makes a lot of sense with the character, honestly. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Uh, it, the movie's very funny, and I'm sure there will be more examples as we go through it that I'll remember and just gush about how funny it is. But yeah, that tone is utterly lost in Doctor Sleep. Doctor Sleep is miserable and like cloying and sentimental and like. <laughs> remarkably sober not like and i say that deliberately because it's very much about sobriety and all that which is fine well, we'll talk i mean about... you could talk about the shining sort of being a bit about sobriety as well yes you could but uh in in the shining it's you know it's more subtextual than it is just plainly stated but of course yeah. as we all know stephen king knows writers who use subtext and they're all cowards so true <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, that's the, the tone is terrible. So I suppose now is as good a time as any, you know, we're, we're over an, an hour in. I think we should finally start talking about the plot. So sure. let's start with The Shining. So we start the movie. Jack is interviewing for a job as the caretaker. We get a scene where he talks to the head of the hotel. Yeah, and the head uh, of Mr. The hotel, Omen. And this is Mr. an interesting Omen. change from the book as well. In the book... Uh, Mr. Ullman dislikes Jack initially. Uh, he mm. really, he's really not a fan. He's kind of snide and rude to him. But in the movie, he deliberately makes the choice to have him be, you know, very polite and even, you know, he likes him already. He likes yeah. him already. Like, oh, for the first time in a while, our Denver. I agree with our Denver office. I think he's <laughs> the man for the job. Yeah, it's like he, he makes a decision to already deliberately change do it. the opposite. Yeah. Yes. But to already change it up, and, and it already gives a little bit of insight into, you know, Jack's character through that, is that he likes coming to a place where people are treating him, you know, respectfully, where they're, you know, kind of mm -hmm. blow, even, you know, maybe blowing a little bit of smoke up his ass. He's he's enjoying yeah. it. He's enjoying that oh, yeah. kind of uh, treatment. Got an ego on him. He's a... Uh, I, I think it's actually quite fair to say that he's an actual narcissist. Oh, um, 100%. Yeah, like diagnosably narcissistic, um, and it, and it's interesting because to Ullman, he's kind of outwardly charming. Jack Nicholson, well, of course he is. He's, he's a very charming person, just in general. He's very charismatic, right? And that shows in this initial scene. He he seems 
pretty normal and everything is shot like it's very normal. This is all deliberate. I, one of the things I hate about a lot of modern horror movies is that they look and feel scary from the very beginning. And like, like they don't, there's nowhere to go then. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everything already looks kind of dark and dingy. And it's like, well, what if things looked really normal? And then you could allow the content of the story to be what gets more fucked up. Anyway, just an aside. Everything looks very normal. He comes in. He's asking questions. He's describing him what the job entails and all that sort of stuff. Um, he finally, you know, he describes, you know, the, the cabin fever. You know, like, you know, it puts a lot of people off. You know what I mean? Being yeah, isolated the, the, here. yeah, the isolation yeah. and yeah. solitude um, can be, uh, it can be trying on some people. Yes, and we learn. We well, learn and, Jack, and another telling uh, little bit of character development there is when Jack says, uh, well, it's totally fine. Like, that's totally fine by me, basically. Like, that's actually exactly what I'm looking for. And yes. Ullman is the one who asks, you know, and what about your family? You know, he mm-hmm. doesn't even mention his family who's going to be coming no. with it. You know, it's just, just it's just no. great. He only cares about himself. I think one of the things that uh, that's probably the biggest change or arguably the biggest change from the book is that the book is about a guy who's a struggling alcoholic who's had a history of, of, of anger issues and abuse um, who comes to this hotel and like is influenced by ghosts and other sort of mysterious forces to become kind of evil. He's possessed, you know? He's, he's possessed, uh, and, but he's also sort of haunted. By, so one of the things that the book has that the movie deliberately o- omitted is Jack's backstory. Uh, mm-hmm. Because Jack, in the book, it's made very clear that he had an abusive father, and he runs, yeah. he chases Danny around the hotel screaming a phrase, I like, come and take your medicine, which mm-hmm. is reused in dr sleep uh you know, they they oh. brought that iconic line back you know <laughs> um but he chases danny around with a mallet instead of an axe screaming come and take your medicine because that's what jack's father used to do mm-hmm. um so it, the the whole the whole uh thing with jack is, yeah the that. whole thing with jack is that the the evil is externalized you know uh, yeah. it, it's it's the face of Jack's father is really like where the evil within him comes from in the novel. And Stanley Kubrick, I think rightly so found that a lot less interesting than the idea of the, you, the, you know, the, I joked with you uh, a little while ago, the duality of man, you know, the Jungian thing. Decide who you on soldier. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, Stanley Kubrick clearly found that, much more fascinating. I think there's actually a quote from him at one point. Uh, he says, the single improvement one might hope for in the world, which would have the greatest effect for good, would be an appreciation and acceptance of this Jungian view of man by those who see themselves as good and externalize all evil. That was a, a quote from him in an interview that he gave about yeah. Full Metal no, Jacket, I, I believe. But uh, yes, that, Which I is very was... much about that, yes. Um, yeah. More explicitly so. No, but it's, it's totally true. There's a there's a funny video you can find of Louis C.K. talking about The Shining. He says some things about The Shining that I don't necessarily agree with, but one of them is uh, one of the things I do agree with. He goes like, you know, a lot of movies like you've seen it a million times about a person like oh who who changes, who becomes more evil and angry, whatever. He be- becomes possessed or like the good father who gets possessed by a demon or something like that, whatever it may be. And, and Stanley Kubrick was clearly not interested in the in the dad who changes. He's in, he's like this movie is about the dad who already has these problems. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's already kind of abusive at the beginning, and I think that's totally true. Um, I think Jack. What I find so much more interesting about Jack in the movie than Jack in the book is that like. One of the reasons I think it was smart to omit his backstory, though you can totally plausibly believe that he was abused by his dad when he was a kid like that's not an impossible thing to assume based on what we see of him is it's kind of like a reveal of how fucked up he is over the course of the movie you know he seems a little strange but he's a little like he's charismatic he's kind of funny he's compelling to watch as an audience member he's kind of rude or whatever and he's struggling with things but then you kind of realize just how fucked up he is but there're clues all along the way clues like the fact that he's like 
oh, well, a little bit of peace and quiet and solitude is exactly what I need. And Allman's like, yeah, what about your family? And it's like he didn't even think about them. You know, there's clues about his like kind of malignant narcissism right from the very beginning. But it's kind of like a slow reveal of how fucked up he is. Oh, well, and one, of one of the I mean, another clue that you get right in that opening scene with Ullman is when he details him the uh, the the story of Charles Grady, as he says in the uh, in the interview, not Delbert Grady, as he says later on. Uh, that's I'm, I'm uh, yes. Yeah. Go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, the story of Charles Grady is that, you know, it, Jack kind of like just lets it wash over him. And you could definitely read that as that being sort of the incident that plants the seed for, you yeah. know, any particular plan that he has, you know, going well, he's forward. outlining a new writing project, you see. Yeah, it, well, so. exactly. <laughs> Uh, so that you could read that as it planting the seed, you know, he hears about what happened there before and kind of like now it's just it's in his head, right? It lives in his head. Mm -hmm. But uh, when Ullman asks, like, how will you, you know, will your wife feel OK about that being there? And he says, no, she's a certified uh, what, uh, like she's a ghost confirmed story ghost and story horror and horror film fanatic. nut. And then we go yeah. and look at her and she is absolutely not that at all. Like, well, <laughs> I, 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 have a, I have a sort of question about that. Um because so she's the one who, when they're driving through the mountains on the way to the hotel, is like, isn't this where the Donner, Donner party got snowbound? She asks about that. She makes a reference to, oh, this is like a ghost ship. I do think there's some logic to the idea that she's the, she, if, if it were nowadays, she'd be a true crime fan, like a lot of, you know. <laughs> Yeah, like middle-aged women are like that. She's that kind of person to a degree. It could be that. Um, it's just that when we see her, you know, when we see her, what she's doing, the like first scene, she's reading Catcher in the Rye, right? Like, you know, the the thing about preserving innocence and in children. Yeah. Uh, it famously, you know, the the story with that. Uh, she's reading or she's watching cartoons. There's, you know, she's dressed, <laughs> she's dressed like a statue of Goofy that Danny has in his bedroom, <laughs> which is really funny to me. Um, yeah. She's like, she's portrayed as sort of this like almost cartoonish, you know, like cartoonishly naive person, right? Yeah. Or, um, which just kind of, it doesn't strike you necessarily as the type of person who would be like, you know sitting there a watching horror, horror fanatic, films yeah. and listening to ghost stories and all that. And yeah. when, when Jack explain, you know, explains to Danny, you know, they ate each other, you know, the cannibalism, she does kind of reprimand him. She's like, Jack, you know, gives him that yeah. little look. You know, like, don't, don't, talk, don't, don't yeah. talk about the, the dark part. I was just curious, historically speaking, you know? You know, I think, I think that, is, that is a more plausible interpretation. And what does that indicate that he's kind of like projecting that onto her? Like, he doesn't, you well, know. That he, he's, he's just sort of not probably that he isn't even going to mention that story to her, you know, like uh, that, yeah. uh, you know, he's kind of just saying it in order to, you know, put Almond's mind at ease yeah. uh, and make excuses is what I would think, you know, it's like he, cause we don't ever see him. We don't ever know if he tells her that story or not. No, he, he doesn't as far as I know. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you to Kibikins for 10 Euro. You got a great voice cap. Oh, thanks. Uh, the shining is great. It is great. Let's talk more about how great it is. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So after the interview scene with um, with Ullman, this is when we get the first scene with Wendy and Danny. Uh, uh, well, I I, I want to hang on the scene with Ullman because oh, okay. there's a few things, few points of interest here. One thing that we'd learn is that he uh, used to be a school teacher, but he, he considers himself a writer. He introduces himself as a writer. Um, but he says, uh, writing was always, sorry, teaching was always a way of making ends meet. He wants to be a writer and he used to teach and now he doesn't anymore. Um, and there's a, a, a school teacher, I believe, is what Ullman says, which implies a sort of younger student. I always yeah, liked Wendy that idea. Yeah, Wendy does say he was teaching that, school in Vermont. Yeah, I always liked the idea that it's just a little, it's just a little clue that he doesn't really like children at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one well, they deliberately again omit the backstory of what happened at the like so in the novel Jack loses his job at the school because he assaults one of his his students who's underage because yes. it's a high school, it's a prep school. Mm -hmm. uh, and he assaults in a drunken rage one of the students and they just they just I think to the betterment of the film they completely omit that Kubrick completely mm -hmm. omits that little detail. <laughs> but I think I think part of oh yeah, that thank you for saying that. It, it ties back to what I was getting at before is that I think one of the things that this movie does 
is sort of let it be a slow reveal of just how much of a monster he really is, right? One of the things that I think is really interesting because I I've watched The Shining years before I ever finally got a watch finally got around to watching The Omen. You've seen The Omen, right, Hugh? Yeah, yeah. Well, famously, uh, uh, there's a little evil kid on a tricycle riding around in that movie, and it's and that came before The Shining. And the, the fact that Danny has these weird sort of powers and visions of things and he speaks to a little um, imaginary voice in his head who's got a disarmed, gross, like, guttural <laughs> voice. All, there's all these clues to make, like, to misdirect you into thinking Danny's going to be the one who's evil or possessed, right? Yeah. Like, that's very, like, that wasn't quite obvious to me the first time I saw it without some of you know, some of the movies that came before it and you know what might have been expectations at the time that's interesting because i wouldn't have, now, i would never have put those two together actually i like it wouldn't that wouldn't yeah. have lined up with me i it seems to me like what sort of what he's playing with is that uh like it's like oh well you know something's up with danny right is he going to be possessed by something who's tony is it going to be the little voice that tells him to do things you know like a like a demon whispering in his ear type thing yeah. then it ends up being jack and Jack is the monster, and not because he gets possessed, but just because he's an awful person who resents his yeah. family. <laughs> yeah. Um, or at least that's one interpretation. So we learn um, there's a lot. Of, I I love these scenes because they 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 seem so kind of um, banal, but until you really dig into what's being said. So like a lot of important things when you when you go through some of these long kind of expositional conversations that they have at the beginning of this movie we're we're establishing a lot of really important things one that we're establishing that Jack only really cares about himself and he's not really thinking about his family at all we're establishing that he's charming and people are kind of inherently trusting of him even though there's something you know there's something slightly off about him we're establishing uh, that one of the reasons that he has this job in the first place or that, that they shut down in the winter is because there's one road called Sidewinder to the Overlook Hotel. It's a 25-mile stretch of road, and it averages about, oh, God, it's it it something like 20, 20 feet. feet. It's 20 feet of snow. Yeah, yeah. It's 20 feet of snow a year, and it's just not feasible to keep the road open for this to be like a ski resort town or anything like that. It was chosen for its scenic beauty and remote location right because winter so, sports weren't a big thing back when it was built you know <laughs> it's, it's like a lot of interesting little details that just kind of very like... interesting little details establishing well for one how trapped they're going to be there yeah but also that you can't just drive out of there easily with a car <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> let's make a point man. of establishing that uh remember that i don't know why but just keep yeah, it in the back maybe, maybe we just maybe we just uh keep that in mind you know moving forward that uh this yeah. is supposed to be a road that is incredibly difficult to to traverse once the snow starts falling you're basically in until may to the like i mean we're gonna i'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit but like to Mm -hmm. the point we find out later that uh during the winter uh the phone lines routinely will go down and the they just go down until april because there's just no way of getting people out there to put them back up yep (laughs) <laughs> press x <laughs> <laughs> so yes none, none, i agree none your business none your business sorry correction i never understood the shining as a horror film that's i i want to highlight that especially because that's not an uncommon thing i've definitely seen people say they don't think the shining is scary and one thing i would say to that is that, like you know there are plenty of movies that like I think are, I, I think the exorcist is a very good movie it, i never found it frightening or scary myself one of the things um, I would say, if, if I was ever asked the question, like, what makes a good horror movie or like a good rule of thumb or like what a good horror movie is, is I think a good horror movie is a is a movie that's still good even when you don't find it scary or don't find it scary anymore. Like if it's obviously if it's about macabre, like gruesome, horrible, dark things, it's like part of the horror genre inherently. But I think... Even if you don't find The Shining scary, I think you'd be hard pressed to say that it's not good movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I think yeah, there's something to that. I see what like, you're saying. Yeah, uh, I, 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 none of your business. I know you're definitely not alone in thinking that it's not especially scary. Um, yeah, I mean, well, so it's interesting because I like I, I rewatched it last night, and then I, you know, I've never particularly been frightened by the shining but then last night i was having you know, started having some interesting dreams very similar to <laughs> you know 
the the yeah. sequences that are very dreamlike in the movie. And yeah. I you know I woke up and I'm kind of looking around. And, you know, this could also have something to do with the fact that I stayed up until two in the morning reading the Hill House novel, which has some similarities to The Shining. But there's just mm-hmm. something very uh, off putting, maybe a little bit unsettling is a better word than scary yeah. about th- especially as Danny goes through, you know, doubting reality, not knowing exactly what is going on with the mm-hmm. ghosts, not knowing what's real and what's not. Um, not slowly realizing that his dad's a monster, slowly yeah. realizing that his dad's a monster, but also seeing these images of like an elevator gushing blood and not knowing why, you know, yeah. it, it, there's a lot there that's that's more unsettling than anything but i i found especially it. if you put yourself in the character's shoes as uh someone mentioned in chat yeah i i, I think i so the the movie i've seen the movie so many times i i still love it it doesn't like frighten me in the same way it did the first time i saw it though i will say on on the most recent rewatch whatever number it's been dozens at this point um the scene where Danny goes into uh, to get his fire engine while while his dad is supposedly sleeping, but his dad's just sitting on the bed and he stares at him and he, he's like, "Come over here." And he sits him on his lap and he has that conversation with him. That yeah, for my oh money, my is one of the one of the most uncomfortable scenes ever put to film. Partly because like nothing explicitly like horrifying happens, but the implications of everything that's happening it's just like you're just watching like a, a kid. Like it's just it's so uncomfortable. Well, I, I wanna it's I wanna so, uh, play off of that a little crawl. bit too, yeah. because I, I know someone who absolutely for a very long time refused to watch this movie because she knew what the story was about, you know, and a father who resents his family and who's prone to like I mean, when you see him with Wendy with you know, all she does in that one scene where he's typing, you know, right working on his stuff is come in and ask him how he's doing. You know, yeah. and he just loses his mind on her and starts like yelling at her, like being very like funny, but cruel. Right. To yeah. The... Oh, he's just so rude. And the whole time. <laughs> she my this this person I knew I know she could not bear watching it because her father is similar, like it mm-hmm. has a tendency to fly off the handle and lose yeah. his temper in a very violent and threatening way. And it's just when you're watching those scenes, like when Danny walks in and he's sitting on the bed or when Wendy comes in and he's clickety clacking away on the typewriter and you can <laughs> see the irritation, the pass it like the, the, as, the, you know, barely contained frustration at her, that you know, is going to spill out. It's like, yeah, no, that, that is horrifying for, especially yeah. for somebody as, you know, n- presented as as naive as Wendy or as young as Danny it's like they could they could trip at any like at any moment they could activate the the landmine that is Jack's temper and yes. you just never like and you just never know what's going to happen so it that's one of those one of those things that like it makes everything very tense and uh yeah it makes you fearful for the safety of the characters in a, in a way that I don't think a lot of other a lot of other things do just because Jack is not a supernatural being. He's just a, like a, he's just a a mean man who doesn't like his family. Yeah. But that's, that's worse. Yeah. No, I, yeah, no, I, I I agree a hundred, but no, I think it's, I think it's worse. I think it makes it worse knowing that it's the horrors of the family, you know, and like, those are almost like the worst ones in a lot of ways. Um, so yes, getting back, getting back to the plot. So, uh, we, we, then he is told about the horrible happenings that happened at the Overlook Hotel some number of years ago. I can't remember how many, uh, in which he mentions Charles Grady, uh, snapped and, um, killed his family with an ax. And he and killed Jack... two girls, his two daughters and his wife, his two daughters who were t- about 10 and eight years old. So two years yeah. apart and his wife. Interesting. Interesting. In you know, you know, little detail. Little detail. I'm excited. Wonder. talk about that so and, and uh he tells jack that story and jack is like intrigued by it in a sort of like dark fascinated sort of way and it has this like yeah there's a little gleam in that in his eye there yeah. like yeah yeah like he's the real horror story fanatic um 
And he accepts the job anyway and assures Mr. Ullman that that's not going to happen to me. Ooh, ominous. Um, then we see Danny. He is um, talking to himself in the bathroom in the mirror. He's talking to Tony. No, imaginary... no, no. I think what we've seen, uh, isn't it um, Danny talk, eating the sandwich and Wendy's asking Tony oh, why he doesn't want to go to the hotel? Yeah. Was, yeah. I mean, true. we can skip over that a little bit, but like that's one of those ones where she's reading yeah, Catcher it's... in the Rye and they're watching cartoons and... Danny kind yeah, of reveals it's, it's, that he's alone. Uh, there's not anybody should, to play with. Yeah, we should probably take a little bit broader of a view instead of going scene by scene, so we have time to talk about. Both yeah, well, of these I, very just long for movies. the characters, I just want to like. Yes. So, the, yeah, it, I think it's important yeah. that we see that Wendy's Absolutely. reading, you know, the book about preserving childhood innocence, it, like that yeah. broad theme. Clearly, not an accident, and that Danny yeah. is shown as sort of being a lonely kid. Who... Yeah, they just moved here from somewhere else. They're new in town, so he doesn't have a lot of friends. And then he's a little reticent about going to this hotel. And his imaginary friend, Tony, is the one who's, like, telling him, like, not to trust it. And that to be, like, the, he, he's the one who's, like, I don't want to go there. I just don't. I don't know why, but I just don't want to go. And she's like, oh, come on. It'll be fun. Don't be silly. Um, eventually, he'll, we'll, we'll have a scene after he after Jack gets the job. Or ja uh, Danny is alone in the bathroom. He's talking to Tony. He's like, "Come on, why don't why don't you want to go to the hotel for the winter? Tell me." And Jack's like, I, "I just don't." He's like, "Come on, tell me." And then so like he's looking in the mirror. A lot of mirrors in this movie. Um, talking so talking to himself. He's doing the little thing with his finger while while Tony talks, which I I just think that's a great I, yeah, detail. it's a great. I love that. I love the little so, detail. Yeah. So so uh, Danny has an imaginary friend named Tony who he will describe soon as a little boy who lives in his mouth, right? And he tells him things. And he's, and he's like, Tony, why don't you want to go to the hotel? And he says, I just don't. And he goes, come on, tell me. And instead of telling him, he shows him. So Danny, who I think gives maybe one of the best act child acting performances I've ever seen in a movie, I think he's yeah. absolutely incredible in this movie. And he's got a lot of heavy lifting to do, honestly. Yeah, he, no, he's on he screen himself a lot of the time and he is yes you know, for kids that can be really difficult and especially yes. you know to be a compelling actor at the same time and this kid just nails it man he is oh he's so, so good. good and i mean I, i'm gonna just talk a little bit about that little finger thing i don't know well because in the in the book right that tony is a, a like a futuristic projection of danny is the way that Stephen King has it. It's like yeah, a, isn't it like a like a person he sees outside of himself? Yeah, it's, it's an external person that he sees walking yes. around, and it's, it it does end up being that it is Danny from the future. Is basically like what oh, that's like, such like lame Stephen King cringe lameness. I yeah. Hate it. So like, I, so they decided I mean, to like, make him an internal skip. voice, like a conscious voice, which yes. is really in that's so much better. That's so much better. Okay, so this is this is the seed I want to plant for our discussion of The Shining, is that The Shining more so than almost any other movie I've seen like this, has a very plausible, literal, and psychological interpretation that both work, right? So, like, there's, there's a way of reading everything that happens from a very, I don't know, sort of, like, Jungian psychological perspective, right? Where everything's yeah. internal. It's like we're, we're seeing external visualizations of what's happening in these characters' psyches. And then the other, the more literal interpretation is that there's literal ghosts of minds and agency of their own and all that sort of stuff and one of the things i find really compelling about the movie is that for the most part like both interpretations are kind of equally plausible and so you can kind of live in the ambiguity because both work both uh, whereas, work and uh, some combination of both tends to work yes. too like there could be yes. real ghosts but also it could be all in the characters heads you know like, or, or a lot of it the yeah. substantial stuff in the characters heads Whereas Dr. Sleep, we'll talk more about this, only one interpretation is plausible, and it's the literal one. There is no sort of, like, psychological, internal interpretation of events that works at all. So yeah. all of that subtext and subtlety is gone. <laughs> so uh, none yet. Uh, doesn't a ghost let Jack out of the out of the freezer? Well, he lets him out of the, yes. uh, the, the pantry, and... Um, yeah, we're gonna get to that. Yes, uh, we're gonna get to that. There is there is a um, non ghost way of interpreting that. There is, uh, yeah. There actually we'll after Doctor Sleep, there's even like maybe two. Uh, so although I'm not a huge fan of the second one, but we'll talk about that when we get there. 
Talk about it. So, uh, yes, I think it was very wise to have Tony be something internal to him. One of the one of the best yeah. little lines indicating that is when um, um, I'm skipping ahead, but he he faints, um, and when he wakes up, he's being interviewed by you know like their primary care physician, whoever it is, and she's asking him questions, and she's like, "Oh, who's Tony?" Like Tony's a little boy that lives in my mouth, and Wendy says, "Like, oh, it's his imaginary friend." She's like, "Oh, if you opened your mouth, would I be able to see Tony?" He says, "No." Like, why not? Because he hides. I'm like, where does he go? He goes down into my stomach, right? So Tony's a little boy that lives inside of him that speaks out of him, who tells him things that he needs to know. It's just, and then, like, when he gets scared, he retreats to his gut. Like, it's such a perfect, like, gut instinct yeah. sort of like, It's a thing perfect way of, of, of sort of, like, showing the way a kid understands this sort of like it's like it's a sixth sense that he would interpret pretty much as a gut instinct right like as something yes. like inside him telling yes. him things it's yeah it, it exactly how a child would explain it and i, I just want to real quick so Perfectly. the little finger yeah. the little finger thing works really well visually you know like in, in the mm -hmm. but it also gives the kid something to play off of while he's talking yes. to it Yes. And that is so, so important that he's able to do that. Like that, like it gives him just a little thing that he can look at and, and imagine as being something that he's talking to. And he manages yeah. to like, it. it's whoever gave the kid that note. If the kid came up, if the kid came up with it himself. That's just like some kind of unbelievable genius. I, I, doubt I, that, I would, I, I would, I know hi, yeah, it's just, it's a fantastic direction. Yeah, Perhaps worth emphasizing that like what this little child actor has to do is imagine he's talking to a little voice inside of himself. Who's trying to warn him about something like there's so much like, but like he doesn't quite understand what he is and he's trying to get more information out of him. And so the idea that like, he can like look at his finger and talk to like the finger as it moves up and down, like a little puppet, little finger puppet sort of thing that he gets to interact with. It gives it really gives him something tangible to like look at and work with. And oh god, the kid is so good. The voice he does is incredible. Man, yeah. he just knocks it out of the park. And it's it's his only film role, which is also funny. He's just like an accountant now or something, <laughs> all grown up. Um so yes, uh well, well he's asking Tony, you know, come on, why don't you want to go to the hotel? He's like, Tell me, tell me, tell me. And then his eyes go wide and it's got this great look on his face. And he sees a couple of things. One thing he's, he sees a couple of flashes of imagery. One is the blood coming out of the elevators, iconic image. Another yep. is the twins in the hallway. And another is his own kind of shocked, scared, frightened face in this, what we think is a black void. Later we'll learn that it's a, it's a kitchen cabinet type thing. Um, those are like the three main things he sees. And then he faints and he collapses. When he wakes up, there's a doctor there who's checking on him, trying to figure out what happened. He asks Tony, she asks Tony what happened, and he doesn't remember, yeah, right? Yeah, so he yeah. doesn't remember what he saw. He felt it. Um, we don't see what it looked like to an outsider, to Wendy's perspective, for example, while he was in that trance. Um, but from what we understand, it was horrifying. We'll see a scene later of what that looked like. Perhaps I'll just jump ahead now. There's a scene later where he's uh he's sending a message to Dick Halloran and we see what's happening with him while he's shining or he's in that sort of deep trance state and he's like having a seizure yeah essentially yeah he's having he's a seizure frothing and he's... at the mouth and he's shaking and he's having a seizure seizure yes yeah and he he actually kind of resembles in a way uh the iconic shot of Jack from the end of the film where Jack is sitting you know, frozen and he has his his mouth, his eyes turned up, and his mouth like his mouth a little bit, yeah, a little bit. So basically, what we understand to have happened here is that he has a seizure, and so that's quite frightening for Wendy. And the doctor's like, you know, after inspecting him, I don't think there's anything. Oh well, there's a couple of questions she asked Danny that are interesting, that are important. Is she's like, uh, does Tony tell you to do things? And she, he's like, yeah. And he's like, what what sort of things does Danny tell you to do? And he stops and he goes. I don't want to talk about Danny anymore. Or, sorry, Tony. I don't want to talk about Tony anymore. It's like, oh, that's a really interesting thing, too. Like, it, it, and that kind of plays into the, like, oh, should we be worried or suspicious about Danny and Tony at first, right? Yeah. Because he's being secretive about it. But, but it's because he's scared. Because, like, he, he doesn't quite know how to explain what it is. He recognizes that when adults talk to him about it, they don't understand it either. And they're a little worried about what this is and who he's talking to. So, like, he doesn't talk about it, which is really interesting. 
but he he um can we we also learned that he can well based on the visuals we learned that he can see the future but also when um when he's in the bathroom before he faints he's like he's like do you think dad like dad's gonna get the job and tony says he already has he's about to phone wendy up and tell her right now and then he calls immediately to say he got the job it's like okay he has some sort of he has some sort of premonition powers here though they're manifested as like his gut instinct essentially this thing that isn't really him, but it's inside of him, and it tells him things that he doesn't quite know how to process. So when he sees those visions, he doesn't really remember them, but he experiences them like a big sort of like a uh, um, seizure-induced trance thing. But he can he Tony tells him things that are about to happen as well. So that's important. Um, so Jack gets the job. Yeah, there's a, there's also a um, there's just a, a kind of an interesting little n- note in the background of this scene the sequence so when we come into the bathroom and see danny uh on the on the counter at the counter talking to tony in the mirror uh there's a a bunch of stickers little cartoon stickers on the door outside Mm -hmm. and one of them is dopey one of the seven dwarves is dopey okay and then when he after he's revived basically after you know in the rest of the scene that's the dopey sticker is the only one that disappears which is interesting because there's a lot of fairy tale imagery uh, mm-hmm. in in the movie, and I I can't remember in the where background, yeah. in the, in the background, but also in some of the dialogue, like Wendy says something about this place is so big, I feel like I'll have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs, and yeah, uh, yeah, 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 there's there's a lot of fairy tales and cartoons that get used in the backgrounds of scenes or in you know dialogues, like throwaway lines or seemingly throwaway lines, and yes. there's I can't remember where I read this, but I thought there was something. A, that uh, Kubrick was fascinated by the idea that kids don't really get the um, the the sort of like darker or the what we would consider the scarier version of fairy tales that involve incorporating uh, challenges into an uh, you know a con a resolution of an internal conflict sort of thing like a Freudian sense uh, they they end up they, at this particular moment uh they were you know spend more time watching cartoons where it's more of a uh you know like a, a meaningless mindless sort of violent thing you know like oh the coyote after the roadrunner never quite catches him right you know that kind of thing so it's it's just interesting that the only i think the rest of the stickers are like bugs bunny or other you know other generic roadrunner other just generic cartoon characters but the one that directly relates to a fairy tale image is the mm-hmm. one that disappears from the background when after this happens and that's interesting uh, i'm glad you brought that up too because there are other examples of things disappearing from the background that i think are very important yeah uh, uh, we'll talk more about it when more prominent ones show up um because immediately after uh the the the, the doctor talks to danny she goes and sits in the room with wendy and says i don't think there's anything physically wrong with them i know it was probably scary but i doubt this will keep happening don't worry about it. So I'm like, okay, she's not maybe the best doctor because if he's having some sort of seizure disorder no, thing, yeah. she's just like, ah, it's just a face. <laughs> it is kind of funny. You know, late 70s doctor just kind of like, ah, don't worry about it, kids. They'll scare you half to death sometimes. Um, she's asking him about his imaginary friend. And he, uh, she's like, well, you know, he's been talking to his imaginary friend for a while now. It's like, did his uh, imaginary friend show up when you moved here and it's like no it showed up before that when did it show up wendy reveals that it showed up after um he had an accident had to be kept out of school um and what was the accident well she kind of is slow to reveal it but the doctor eventually gets out of her the one time her husband jack came home from work and he was drunk and he came home late and he showed up and Danny had taken a lot of Jack's school papers and kind of scattered them around the room, you know, just kind of gotten into them, and made a big mess. And so he went to pull him away from the papers and he yanked him so hard that he broke his arm, which you imagine that physically. That's a pretty hard yank. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I, it's it. The way that they but talk she, about it, she, you know, she she downplays it a lot. She says the yes. thing like, oh, well, it's just the sort of thing you do a hundred times with a child. But this time he just accidentally, he didn't, you know, he used too much strength and he just, you know, dislocated his shoulder. And the doctor gives her this look like, I, what? <laughs> Which is, <laughs> it's just really interesting. It's really fun yeah, to so watch it's it. Such, it's such good character building 
So, you know, sometimes people talk about show, don't tell, right? So, like, one of the, one of the things that's really effective about this character writing scene for Wendy is what we learn about how she's trying to minimize it and make excuses for Jack. Yeah. Like, this is going to be really important because from what I understand, one of the other major changes from the original book is that Wendy is much more assertive and self-confident and competent in uh, the original book. And uh, 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 Stephen King did not like how meek and kind of naive and pathetic she is in this movie. She's, she's even like, more so than that. She's like a former... I, I can't remember. She she might be like a former rodeo queen, and she's this like... <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't remember if this that's her or that's another another um character from a different Stephen King book, but I'm pretty sure she's like she's a blonde bombshell, like former rodeo queen of some kind, like from Denver. And that's okay. yeah, that and so she's, you know, confident very and different. assertive. It's a very different dynamic. And it's it's interesting the change that's made because one of the one of the things about Jack's character that we'll get into and we'll see evidence of is that he is a very arrogant uh person who believes that his family's holding him back from yes. what he deserves that the kind of success that he is entitled to and the yes. the prestige and he wants to live the high life with the beautiful wife and the outgoing and, and, you know, confident son. And what he has instead is this sort of meek, doe-eyed, uh, you know, soft-spoken kind of naive w woman who's, you know, not, per like, she's not conventionally, you would probably say not a conventional bombshell beauty, right? She's very, she's, a, yeah. you know, she is an attractive woman, but she's not, you know, some, she's not I know drop said, dead yeah. mod gorgeous model. Right. Or she's no. not the woman who comes out of the bathtub later on, which will, you know, that's one of my favorite scenes in all of cinema. But um, <laughs> she's not that character. Right. And so Jack believes that he has wasted his life with these people. And yes. by seeing. It, it's a lot harder to get that across if the character of Wendy is it's the kind of amazing, trophy wife, yeah. amazing, yeah. talented, yeah, yeah. blonde, uh -huh. beautiful successful rodeo queen with a great ass i think he describes it like it's a lot harder to get that that aspect of jack's character across when you've got that as the main character right like essentially as like the the character of the thing so yeah sorry to, to dave in chat uh hugh does think that she is hot the the bathtub lady oh god uh, he, was, he was he was describing uh uh, uh wendy in this yeah. particular yes but i um no i i agree and i think if you think about what the change to jack torrance being that he's more evil internally and inherently than just a, a guy with alcohol problems possessed by external forces yeah, if you think a about a bad that, relationship with his father like yeah yeah if you, if you think about that that's the major change a lot of things have to change to follow that one of them is you have to change the wife because you have to answer the question, who on earth would be married to this guy? If he's this rude, if he's this dismissive, if he's this abusive, if he's this resentful towards you and your son, like who would be married to him? And it's like, well, she would be. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's very meek and kind of like nice and excuses for him. Non-confrontational. Yes. And is always trying to see the best in him sort of stuff like that and she puts up with a lot like one of the things that becomes clear is that like he took this job as the caretaker of the hotel she's the only one that ever does any of the caretaking work <laughs> i don't know if you noticed that yeah no yeah she's, like, she's the only one who's ever like actually she's checking the boiler in the yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and so like if you imagine what kind of person would be married to him it's like she needs to be like this and that's why it always really bothered me when people are like, oh, her character is so pathetic. And it's like, well, yeah, she has to be like, like, this is so believable. This dynamic is so believable. Like for anyone who's never noticed this dynamic in real life of someone who keeps going back to an abusive partner or something like that. it's like, well, yeah, they're a bit like this. They're kind of naive and they're always kind of looking to make excuses and they don't want to own up to just how much he doesn't love me. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's like, that's what this story is about. It's not someone who becomes evil because a ghost possesses them. It's about like the slow unraveling of a person and like a reveal of just how fucked up. And like, she has to like realize and learn just how much of a monster he actually is. Like that's, that's a very different dynamic. And I think a much more interesting one, especially with how it's executed. But like, yeah, she needs to be like this and it makes total sense. And we get great scenes establishing this like the the scene where she makes makes excuses like oh it's the sort of thing you do 100 times with a child you know in the in the streets and it's like no y he yanked him so hard that he broke his arm and when we see jack talking about this event to lloyd in the bar we see him show like how he did it and it's like yikes that's a really violent yank it's dude you know what i mean you extra it's... pounds of pressure per second per second boy per, per second, second. And he does the little hand oh, yeah. gesture of the breaking. Yeah, like, but he's like, all I did was try to yank him up. And the way he does it, it's like, you can picture the scene. And you're like, holy crap, dude. Like, that's pretty aggressive. And it's, you know, like, <laughs> I, I, I like the scenes with her. I think she's actually a very, very compelling character. One thing that drives me nuts when people talk about, well, Kubrick's movies in general, but this movie is that it's like, cold and distant and you don't really get the characters and i'm like what are you talking about i think her and danny are like very believable and endearing and i like them together you know what i mean like like her and her son like they're they're cute and she's a very good mother she just like doesn't won't recognize or face up to just how shitty of a husband and a father jack is but like it's totally believable and like i i i find them really compelling as characters wendy and danny and i'm like rooting for them and i i don't like or understand when people are like, oh, it's emotionally distant. You don't really get to know the characters. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. It's, it, it, yeah, I agree. 100%. So, yeah, uh, yeah. we'll move. She's, yeah, she's kind of a, she's kind of a naive, uh, meek, battered wife. Who, who, yeah, well, and who I goes, think, like, you kind of get everything you need just from the fact that, like, the, that little goofy statue. I didn't notice this until recently, but that little goofy <laughs> statue in the uh, in Danny's bedroom that she is dressed like in this this scene that we're talking about, where she's making the excuses with the psychiatrist, kind of sums the whole thing up perfectly, right? Like, she's got the long black hair that looks like the big floppy ears. She's got the big <laughs> eyes and the yeah. you know her teeth look kind of. I mean, she could she could pass for. I mean, I think she did play olive oil. In a Popeye movie, you know the uh, Popeye's wife, which <laughs> yeah. you know makes perfect sense. So she like is, that tells you everything you need to know about her character is that she's you know kind of cartoonishly naive. She's like she's something out of a out of a cartoon. And Jack is this a uh, mean, spiteful, abusive guy who just kind of takes advantage of that, and yeah. she sticks around. Yeah, it seems. Well, what I've noticed so far is that right now we're having a conversation about characters. So I say let's focus on that, right? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. So we have a dynamic that makes a, to a ton of sense, and we, you know, he's one of the things that my friend um, talked to me about when he watched the movie once is is that he said that he got the impression that Danny was an accident. That's an interesting. I mean, that makes sense, honestly. That makes a ton of sense to me. Like uh, he he got the impression that like he knocked sh uh, uh, Wendy up and then like they got married as a result and that he never really wanted to be married. Yeah, or especially I, that not makes to her. that makes perfect sense. It's like it doesn't yeah. need to be in the movie, but it no. makes perfect sense as like a headcanon kind of thing. You know, like that's yeah, and yeah, because that's the vibe, right? Because he is made entirely clear throughout the movie is that like he resents them, he resents having a family. He wants to be a writer man and have like a like this sort of romantic idea of what being a writer is, and his family just kind of gets in the way of that. Yeah, you know. And with, I mean, when they so we've already touched on the Donner Party thing where he kind of like tries to tell Danny about the cannibal as they're on the way up to the hotel. But when they get to the hotel, uh, and Ullman is describing, you know, the jet setters before the jet set was a thing are the ones mm -hmm. who used to stay here and all, all the, the best, best people. people yeah. Right. And then just a scene or two, like as soon as we get into, you know, where they are, where they are a month later. Right. Jack is waking up at 11 with his wife bringing him breakfast in bed. And he's like, I feel I fell in love with it the minute I, I set foot here. Yeah. I really, you know, like it's like, yeah, yeah, this is where I belong. I've never felt more happy or at peace anywhere else it's like yeah because he yeah. thinks that he deserves that kind of lifestyle yes. he thinks yep. he has earned 
living in this lavish, luxurious hotel and having where all people, the best people have stayed. Yeah, yeah, where people wait on him hand and foot, and where the bartender mm -hmm. doesn't charge him for the drinks yeah you know, that he's bound yes. to consume, and where yeah. everybody knows him, right? You know. Mm. Yeah, and she does all the work for him so he can be a shit writer and like <laughs> lays around and do nothing. Yeah. Essentially. Well, and yeah. I think in those scenes we all like he's not. I I love that note that we you know in the script about how when I, when we see him writing, it's like the note in the script is Jack is not writing. So yeah, it, to, to make to, to to put a fine point on that, um, in the original treatment that Stanley Kubrick and Diane Johnson wrote, not even the original treatment. Sorry, the working script they had while they were filming. There were scenes that just read, Jack is not writing. Like, that's the whole scene. And so he would come to set and he would talk with Jack Nicholson and be like, I don't know, what, what do you think he should be doing? It, Stanley Kubrick gets a lot of, like, he has this reputation for being a kind of insane perfectionist. But I think if you really dig into it, you'll see that he was a lot more kind of improvisatory than people give him credit for. Yeah. And that he, he, he often came to set and it's like, we'll figure it out on the day kind of thing it's like i don't know what i want to do i don't know what i want here but i know what i don't want i know it's got to be good so we're gonna stay here until we figure out something good wasn't so the, the wasn't script... there a story with clockwork orange where he just, he didn't really have a script he just showed up with the book and said all right how do we yeah. film this part exactly <laughs> yeah exactly the, the everyone had the book on set instead of a script which is an interesting detail yeah but yeah and so like for example he'd be, uh, the, the scene says jack is not writing and so for, uh, he was like, okay, Jack Nicholson, what do you want to do? And he's like, um, well, I feel like if I was in this giant place all by myself, I'd do things that I would normally only be able to do outside, like throw a ball around. He's like, okay, cool. Let's do that. So that was Jack Nicholson's idea. You know, yeah. anyway. Um, when I like that yeah, scene too, because we see all the, uh, like the newspapers and the scrapbooks and stuff just like piled on the sofa as we zoom in on him bouncing the ball. So it's like, he's been, yeah. he's spent like 15 minutes looking for an idea in the newspaper and then he got up with a tennis ball he's like ah, i've done enough work for today and now he's just bouncing the ball off the off the yeah. wall so we, we get we get great scenes where jack is like you know in and he has a writer's block quote unquote where he's he's not even fucking trying you know the, one of my favorite things and i think this is a great little thing to remember if anyone in listening is a writer uh an, aspiring to be a writer or is already one you know, and you've, you've struggled with writer's block. There's a great scene. It's one of my favorite scenes, favorite little lines in the whole movie uh, where, where Wendy comes to bring him breakfast in bed. And he's like, oh, how's the writing going? Have any have any ideas? And he goes like, lots of ideas, no good ones. And then Wendy says an obviously true thing and a really good piece of advice. She says, well, it's just a matter of getting back in the habit of writing every day, which is true. Absolutely true. But Jack goes, yep, that's all it is. And he gives her this really disdainful look like, oh, you think that's all there is to it? Just writing every day. Like, you're not recognize she's not recognizing that it there's genius involved. You know what I mean? He's so egotistical. But it's like, no, she's right. And you're just being a little, you're just being a little prick. You know what I mean? Like. If you're, so if you're ever struggling with writer's block, uh, watch The Shining and learn how to not be a writer. Um. Yeah, this is a master class. Jack Torrance is a master class in how to not be a not be a writer. Yes, he absolutely <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah, just just get down at like write. I think one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten is just you know if you feel like you don't have anything to write, just write one bad page. Like just yeah. say you're gonna write one bad page. Who cares? Mm -hmm. You don't have to show it to anybody. But like most yeah. of the time, if you sit down and just write one bad page, you'll start writing more and more. And like if exactly. and then you'll get you know one bad page and a couple good ones. But that's you know, it, it of course Jack doesn't understand this because he's not a writer. He's he wants to be a writer, but he's more involved in the idea of being the romantic idea of what it means to be a writer. He's in love with that image for himself. Yeah, he's 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 in love with the idea of being the one who like the writer who goes to parties, right? Like the one who goes to the ball and who goes. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. And he's he has this idea of himself as like the tortured artistic genius who like ooh goes to a, a hotel for the winter and comes out with this with the next great American novel. Like that's his sort of yeah. romantic view of himself. And Wendy is like saying very obvious things like, oh, how's it going? It's like, oh, maybe I'll come back later with some sandwiches and you can show me something. 
Yeah, and, and he I, like blows up at her for that. You know what I mean? We'll get to that scene, but yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and what I, this is another change that's made from the novel to the movie is that in the novel he's actually working on a play the whole time. Like he actually has a play and he's actually working on it, which is like that's ah oh, the the movie's so much better. <laughs> the movie makes it like the movie has a better understanding, I think, of who he is. Because like, oh, here here's the thing where I pointing out i think is that like well what is he doing instead of writing instead of writing a horror story clearly that's sort of like what he's mentally invested in he becomes fascinated with uh with the story or at least how he remembers it of charles grady murdering yeah you know, he, he, he likes that idea and so instead of writing a story he uh, hatches his own story, murder plot that's yeah <laughs> he enacts it out he plays it out and he psychologically tortures his family instead it's like because like you know he has these dark desires and instead of writing them into fiction or something maybe more constructive he's just taking them out on his family instead yeah and that's so much better that's so much better than oh and also he has been working on a play <laughs> yeah he, he has been working on a play and the hotel is giving him ideas to write and uh yeah that's basically like the hotel is feeding ideas into his ear which is letting it get closer and closer to possessing him and all that kind of stuff i'm pretty sure is how that's that was the impression that I got uh, from reading the as, novel. That's not as well, interesting. because because the hotel is externalized evil. It's not about Jack's laws uh, yeah. and and the the problems with him as a as a duality of man type thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about the internalized capacity for both evil or good inside a person. It's about oh, this is a good man who's been brought low by, you know, trials and tribulations and this hotel, which is an external evil entity, is working its foul magic on him, right? Yes. And turning him into a monster when he really isn't. And it's just not anywhere near as interesting. I think so, too. Uh, you entertain the chat for just a second. I'll be right back. I can certainly do that. How are we doing today, folks? Stephen King is not a great writer, despite his notoriety. I, you know, I, I agree with you. Although I have come around a little bit on my general impressions of Stephen King having I've been doing I've been working on a uh, a little project. I'm not really sure exactly where it's going, but I've been reading the top the reader poll top 10 Stephen King novels uh, of all time, because Stephen King, when asked what he thought his greatest book ever written was, he without missing a beat in his interview with Rolling Stone, said a book called Lizzie's Story, which is... Most people haven't heard of that one. Um, so the Rolling Stone took it upon themselves to ask the readers of Stephen King uh, what their favorites were. And I believe... I, I, I replaced one of them in my reading order. Uh, the, the number 10 book was one of the Dark Tower series, which... Given my general, uh, you know, distaste for Stephen King uh, in some of his incredibly on the nose textual uh, writing, I didn't want to struggle through three six hundred plus page books of the Dark Tower series to make it to the fourth one. So instead, I read Carrie. Understandable. And uh, Carrie, Carrie, I actually enjoyed the book a lot more than I thought I was going to, despite the fact that a lot of it is very cringe to me. There's a lot of, like, very, um, there's a lot of very, like, it, it feels like a, a decent first draft that definitely needed an editor to come through. Yeah. Maybe, like, one or two more, maybe even three more rewrites. It probably would have been a very good book. But, uh, it, as it stands, it's fine. Um, it's interesting that you talk about Stephen King and his like chronic lack of subtlety. Um, yeah, because Kivo uh, mentions Mike Flanagan, and and I feel like they are two peas in a pod. Those two are made for each other, <laughs> which yeah, I suppose I, makes I a lot of sense that. as to why Mike Flanagan adapts so many Stephen King things because I think they have all the same problems. Um, Kivo, I agree. I don't think he's actually a very good director, or at least that I don't like a lot of his work. Certainly, uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Sleep is among his worst, and we'll talk about all the reasons why. And he has some stuff that I would happily call good to decent, but even then, I don't really like it. And part of it is this like chronic lack of subtlety. 
Yeah, but, you know. well, the chronic lack of subtlety and then his seeming allergy to an editor <laughs> or to somebody, yeah. like, to rereading his own work and, like, noting when things aren't adding up. Like, one of the one of the things that I mentioned early, and this is, I don't mean to go off on too much of a tangent here, but uh, Carrie, right. the book, has a, a scene at the beginning where um, Carrie's mother, known around the neighborhood, having a little twinge of the tism, and her and Carrie end up getting in a fight and some stones rain from the sky down onto the house. And that's sort of the first revealed incident of um, of Carrie's psychic abilities. But materializing stones from the sky is a very far cry from what ends up happening later, where she's just sort of able to move and manipulate things with her mind. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't. It never comes back anywhere, the Reign of Stones. And it, funnily enough, the Reign of Stones is pretty much, as far as I can tell, absolutely aped off of the original Haunting of Hill House novel, which Stephen yeah. King cited as his inspiration for both Carrie and The Shining. Um, so it, it's, just, it's just interesting that it's like, it clearly was a springboard to get the story of Carrie off the ground. So like, you know, you use it as a little writing prompt you know, something that mm -hmm. you like and you move, you kind of write your own story off of it. But m I think most writers in that instance would get, you know, a little bit further in and realize that they've kind of left that springboard behind. It's sort of developed into its own thing once you get to the end. Stephen King does not do that, it seems. He, he kind <laughs> of just lets the springboard sit. He'll get to the end Maybe he'll polish up some of the grammar. I don't know. I, like Maybe an editor will polish it up, but nobody ever seems to sort of just go back and be like, well, you wrote this, but that doesn't really connect to anything later. So maybe we can rework that. Nobody seems to want to say that to him. And It doesn't seem like he redrafts. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like anybody encourages him to. Even in Carrie was his first novel, so you would think that maybe somebody would have, but he was also kind mm. of a successful short story writer at the time. But uh, yeah, he just, he's very prolific. And the one thing that I can say about him is that at the very least he writes, you know, like he does understand yeah. what it takes. Unlike to get, Jack. Yeah, unlike Jack, unlike George <laughs> Martin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I will be right back, back to, now. My turn to oh, uh, right. step away. We're back to The Shining. We talked about the three main players, Jack, Wendy, and Danny. Um Another major character uh, is Scatman Crothers, who I, I'm always tempted to call Scatman Crothers. His character's name is Dick Halloran. He is the chef at the Overlook Hotel. And uh, we meet him when they're getting a tour around the hotel, and he goes with Danny and Wendy. He's a very friendly, genial old black man. He's great. He's one of the best characters in the movie. He's just such a nice guy. He's showing them around. And as as he's walking around, he we we discover that he has the shining too. He communicates telepathically with Danny. He says, "Hi, like, like some ice cream, Doc." <laughs> Just really, so like, uh, this is another great example of how funny the movie is. So, like the 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 tense string music plays while he's talking, and Danny kind of goes into something like a waking trance. And then he looks over at him, and then while his lips are saying something else to Wendy, his mind says, how do you like some ice cream, Doc? And we cut back to Danny, and there's like a jolt in the music. And stuff like that that I really like, because it's unnerving and strange, but also funny, kind of rides that tonal line very, very well. It's great. You, Eric, I like him, but I don't understand his character much. Oh, Danny. Sorry, not Danny. Uh, Dick Holleran. I think the one of the most important scenes in The Shining is 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 the scene where he's sitting across from Danny talking about what The Shining is. That's where we get the most character for him. Um, obviously, we we reveal things about what he's willing to do to save Danny by the end of the movie. But uh, one of the most important movies, sorry, one of the most important scenes in the film for establishing what this world is and what powers are and how they work and how. Uh, world building for lack of a better word all that stuff is really really crucial so i want to talk about that scene because i think it says a lot about dick halloran so you know the scene i'm talking about right hugh yeah he um so after they've he, gotten the ice cream and they've, they've gotten the ice cream and they're sitting down and he says um like do you want to know how i knew your name was doc 
which is the nickname. Yeah, the nickname that, um, and Nunya, that uh, that is, uh, they directly, I think, uh, say that it's yeah, because, because of the, the Bugs, Bugs Bunny cartoons. Yep. Dick Howard even does Looney a, mm, 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 what's up, Doc? You know, kind of thing to him. Yeah. He, and, he intuits telepathically or by some other supernatural means that his name is Doc, even though he never hears it said. And he says to Danny, like, oh, you want to know how I knew your name was Doc? And he, Danny gives, like, the smallest of little shrugs ever. It's, it's a great yeah. little detail. <laughs> um, and he's like, why don't you want to talk about it? And he says, I'm not supposed to. He's like, who says you ain't supposed to? Tony. He's like, who's Tony? Oh, I, I, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. One, one of the things he says is that um, uh, my grandmother and I... Are, used yeah. to be able to have conversations entirely without ever opening our mouths. And he's he's presenting it like for him is that he can speak telepathically to his grandmother. Um and is it kind of like a wholesome memory, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a that's an ability he has. He says explicitly that um there are very few people that know they have it. There are some that realize it, but like that they have it, but they don't realize it. And that mm -hmm. most people mm -hmm. don't have it, which I think is important. It, it, very so, important. It also indicates that it is passed down hereditarily. So yes. Yes. And then he says like, how long have you been able to do it? And he, he doesn't answer him. He says like, why don't you want to talk about it? And he says, Tony told me never to t like, to talk about it. So who's Tony? Tony's a little boy that lives in my mouth. It's only to tell you to do things. And he's like, yes. And he's like, does he ever like show you things? And so we're, we're learning that he's like, Tony shows him things, but sometimes like when he, like he, he falls asleep and yeah. he, when he wakes that, up, he can't remember that. This is, that's very, I want to touch, like touch on that. Cause that's very important to understanding how the shine affects Danny because mm -hmm. he, when he's shown things by uh, by Tony, it's like he goes to sleep, and it would is the line that he uses, which is sort of like a like a signal to to the audience to understand some of these visions in terms of dream logic or dream yes. interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so when Danny saw the elevator of blood and the twins and the scream. Uh, earlier on when he passed out that that's sort of think of those as a dream right like yeah. as he as he had a, a a dream that could be symbolic of something of an event happening not mm -hmm. necessarily as a literal as in the novel not necessarily a literal prestidigitate or not prestidigitation that's like magic premonition. premonition that's the word i'm looking for yes well, some of them are, some of them aren't. It's it, it's it's interesting. The things he says in his original, he sees in his original vision, uh, a kind of a combination of a number of things. Which yeah, is interesting. We'll return to that. But what we what we seem to and I, it's interesting because apparently this scene took like a hundred and sixty takes total between all the different camera angles to film. And I, a lot of people are like, oh, he just made him do. They made he made these poor actors do it over and over and over again, but. I watched that scene and I'm like, man, what he manages like through that conversation, he weaves together some very important points and some very interesting subtext, right? Yeah. Like, I, I think he just wanted to do it over and over and over and again to get it right, like to get it exactly how he wanted it, because there's some very, like very specific, subtle details, right? And so he's talking to, um, talk, talking to him about Tony and he's, um, learning that like he he tells him things but he's not sure what it's like does tony ever did tony ever tell you anything about this hotel about this place he's not really sure and he says like are you scared of this place and he's like no i'm not scared of this place but one of the things we're learning is that okay clearly dick halloran has the ability to shine yes and he's like like no i'm not i'm not scared of this place i've you know i've worked here a long time this place isn't too scary you know, but sometimes, you know, when bad things happen in a place, it can leave traces of themselves. Also, some places are like people. They shine. Yeah, some, some shine, shine and some, some don't. don't. Yeah. And so, like, clearly he, he's aware that some bad things have happened here. So maybe he himself has even experienced some visions of, like, some of the evils that have happened here before. But overall, he doesn't consider the place to be a threat. Right? Yeah. Please, please remember this because this is going to be absolutely ruined in Doctor Sleep. Well, and it's it's <laughs> absolutely ruined in 
the novel because this yeah. this conversation does happen in the novel like he mm-hmm. does say these things yeah. to Danny in the novel it's just that it, it, it's like it, it's more of Dick Halloran trying not to scare the kid because he knows that he can't get him out right and, and it's because he understands like the version of Dick in the book understands that there is a malignant spirit or m- several in the hotel that's so much worse yeah it's way worse it's so much worse. yes it's and way fucking this, worse this is what dr sleep will do as well that i think actually amounts to character assassination um we'll get to it because but I'll, first i want to establish what dick is like so dick is like you know like oh i'm not scared of this place there's nothing to really be scared of sometimes you know you might see something that something horrible that happened here you know because a lot of things happened here not all of them was good i really like the way he says that um and he's like what happened and then danny says what happened in tomb three room 237 he's like what he's like, you're what scared you of room 237 <laughs> aren't you and he goes i ain't scared in no room 237 and there's this look on his face where I, I think this is part of why he had them film this so many times to get exactly what he wanted, because it seems very clear based on his body language and how his eyes are moving and stuff like that, that he's not sure that he has he has no experience of room 237, right? He's like, I don't know what this kid's talking about, but clearly this kid's seen something, right? And yeah. he's like, what well, do I tell this kid? You know, because uh, I'm assuming if he saw a vision of it, probably something bad happened here. So he goes like, no, I'm not scared of room 237, but you ain't got any business going in there anyway, all right? So you stay out. Well, and okay, so it, it could be that he doesn't know, like, because the look on his face could say, like, I don't know what this kid is talking about. That's definitely one read of it, and he's just kind of being like, God, don't, just don't go in there. You saw something bad. Like, he understands how the shine works. And so he said yeah. it, it could be that. It could also be that, like, he knows that's where the, the grossest ghost is, right? Because he might have been in there at some point, and he, like, it, it, so... The character, yeah, the ca- it's well, and, plausible. Yeah, okay. and well, and, uh, so the character in the book is like Miss, Miss I don't remember Miss Massey or something like that, who who drowned or killed herself with painkillers in the bathtub and like rotted before, mm-hmm. you know. So it, it they kept that visual right for, and I think they kept it for a different reason personally, but it could be that um, that Dick has seen this kind of gross thing, and he's like, oh the. You don't need to go in there. Like, it, just don't go into room two, three, seven. You won't have to go in there. And he's probably he could be that he's just like he knows that the kid could be tr- that Danny could be frightened by yeah. the sort of nasty, gross looking bathtub corpse yeah. woman, right? So I mean, I'm that's plausible. I'm inclined ba- based on how he plays it in the scene to believe that like he doesn't know specifically what he's referring to, but in order to try and keep him from snooping into something unsavory and, and he might uh, yeah, find. and accidentally, you know, triggering yeah. some kind of future event. That that makes more sense to me. I like that better. It's just like you could definitely you could definitely read it either way if you wanted yeah. to, you know. Yes. The point the point worth emphasizing here is that Danny, sorry, Danny, Dick doesn't think that the kid is in danger. And that is very clear from his behavior in this scene, that he's not thinking this kid is in real danger <laughs> from some malicious threat that could kill him. Because he doesn't know how fucked up Jack is. And he's worked at this place for a long time, right? That's very important because that will be completely undone by Dr. Sleep. <laughs> um, the last thing that we learn that is said in this conversation, we learn later when, when Danny rides around the corner and sees the twins, he says, it's just like Dick, Mr. Halloran said, it's just like pictures in a book, Danny, it's not real. So that's clearly something else that was said in this conversation that just wasn't seen on the screen, which is interesting. You don't see a lot of that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Implied things that were also said that we didn't see. Anyway, so that's what we learn about The Shining. Most people don't have it. Some people do, but they're just not aware that they have it. And a very, very small percentage of people are aware they have it. And it manifests in different ways to different people. Another thing that kid, will be important. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> little kid little kid Danny uh, treats it like a gut instinct sort of thing. And, and Dick Holleran, you know, used it to have nice, pleasant, telepathic conversations with his grandma. Uh, there's also no indication in this scene that he also had a tragic backstory. Uh, that involved abuse of any kind. And based on the way he delivers his lines, I'm inclined to think it's 
That's the, 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 it wouldn't make a lot of sense if he did, based on how he describes all this stuff. That will also be undone in Doctor Sleep. Oh, God, I didn't. Oh, no. I must have not been paying attention at that point in Doctor so Sleep. I didn't even notice that. Ah, Jamie, why did so, you do this to me? <laughs> so that's, that's the gist of all the characters. Uh, so the basic plot is, is rather simple. They, they get to the hotel after being introduced to everything, and then they're alone. Wendy is doing all the actual work and Jack is pretending to write. But meanwhile, he's daydreaming about some of the worst things that happened here over the years and just goofing yeah. off and sleeping too much and just living high on the hog, doing whatever he wants. And I, I, one of my favorite, uh, favorite points that I noticed this time around uh, that I didn't before is the the Penderecki piece that signifies when somebody is shining plays uh -huh. in that like that scene where like that very famous one where jack is staring out of the snowy window with that mm -hmm. yeah that one that just showed up on screen right there <laughs> <laughs> that one uh the penderecki shining piece is playing at that point when we see jack doing that uh it, yes. it starts at that and then it ends immediately after that scene which is very interesting um yes it is i'm uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to that yeah uh, so we're going through the rough plot here. Now that they're alone in the hotel, he's not really working like he should. Danny and Wendy are, you know, Wendy's doing the actual work and Danny's just kind of trying to figure out ways to entertain himself. Um, we see the uh, one of the first visions that Danny has while he's here is he's playing darts in, in the game room by himself. And we have one of my favorite like camera moves in the movie because oh, yeah. we start kind of wide and we slowly like like we start no we start zoomed in and then he's playing darts and we're slowly very gradually and deliberately zooming out and then we dolly along and then move up and then snap zoom in on him as the music's coming in once he realizes what's behind him and it's the two twins yes the two twins and there's like the grating high pitched music playing and he's just kind of petrified and the twins just stand there and look at him and then look at each other and turn around and walk away one of the things I really love about this movie is that there's a great and very deliberate and very effective escalation in the surrealism and the visions that people have. It starts off very simple. It's uncanny and strange, and we don't know what it means yet. We don't know whether that's supposed to be scary. You know what I mean? It's uncomfortable and weird, but like he, he Danny doesn't know anything about the story of the the family that was murdered here, right? And yeah. also the fam also important to note that the family the, the, the girls weren't twins in the original yes, story but I, yeah I, I, exactly we're gonna come back to that so things are going along uh, well and but and I, before we before we jump ahead real quick because I just want to like, that's it brings up a really interesting point right is that the audience is told this story about you know a caretaker who murdered his two daughters and mm -hmm. then we see two girls we you know like we obviously we know they're ghosts because we know they're not we've we've all we've all seen that yes. part of the movie we all know that that little uh that little thing it's kind of a very iconic image but there's nothing in the movie that tells us that they are the ghosts of the girls you we just kind of like if you're not paying super close attention you just kind of tend to assume oh that must be that must be who that is right like that must yes. yeah but that's you know it not not necessarily not okay, I let's you know what we've been teasing this. I just want to jump to it because it's interesting. Um so Jack later on in the story, when things aren't going well, he, he goes he goes he goes to the party and then he'll end up in the, the bathroom with uh the butler, right, who spilled yes. something on him. And has a conversation with him and he says like he the guy says his name is Delbert Grady, that he used to be the caretaker there. And we'll eventually learn that he, the, the, the implication is that he killed his family because he, his family didn't like the hotel and they tried to burn it down. So I corrected them. Yeah. <laughs> that guy's performance is incredible, by the way. Yeah, I love um, that. yes. So he, his name is Delbert Grady and he killed his two girls with an ax. And, but Delbert Grady wasn't the name of the guy who did that. It was Charles Grady. Yeah. And when, and when that's Ullman a... tells... That's a change from the from the book. It's all it's always Delbert Grady. He deliberately changed the name to Charles in the in the opening uh, yes. interview. He, so when Ullman tells the story, he's the owner or the operator of this hotel. He knows the story well. The guy's name was Charles Grady. He killed his two daughters, who were eight and ten, 
with an axe, right? And then he shot himself with a shotgun, right? And then as the story goes on, we, we will learn that Jack has misremembered the story. He has mis or mis he's misremembered the name as Delbert instead of Charles. And also the implication is that he misremembered other aspects of it too, like the fact that the girls were twins instead. So there's there's what does that imply, Hugh? What does that imply about the visions that Danny sees? That Jack is also shining. Yes. That Jack Absolutely. is the one projecting these visions into Danny's head and using them to torture his family while he sleeps. It, because it, there's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of shots of, of Jack in a sort of like trance or there's Im- implied that he's sleeping all the time. And so like while he's asleep, he's like projecting psychologically or telepathically however you want to look at it this like horror story he's dreaming up in his head onto his family and so when danny sees the visions of the little girls it, killed with an axe and all that sort of stuff like well, that well and when yeah one of the uh, one of the it really the things that really ties that together right with a neat little bow is that the first scene uh, that the girls spe- when Danny rounds the corner and sees the twins in the hallway, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they say, "Come play yep. with us forever and ever and ever." And then the very next scene is when he goes to get the fire truck, and Jack is sitting on the bed, and Jack says to Danny, "I wish we could stay here forever and ever and ever." Yeah, Re- repetition ja- of the dialogue because Jack's projecting yes. the, the girls. Yeah, Jack is is telepathically and unconsciously torturing his family with his shining powers and it's like it's like instead of writing the story he's playing out the story with his own family it's like he's he's the author and he's terrorizing them like their their characters in his horror story really interesting and i think the little clues like the fact that he misremembered the name of the caretaker and like likely misremembered that the fact that the girls aren't even twins in the first place like lends credence to the idea that what Danny's seeing isn't like what objectively happened, but what what uh, Jack is projecting. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and and it's a, like the the blood gushing from the uh, from the elevator is basically symbolic of the fact that Jack is going to try to murder his family at the hotel, right? Like that's what the that's, oh, that's what part, the yes yeah, part of it yeah part, part of it, but it, the, it's uh, an omen. Yeah, it, it it's yeah. You know, and that's what the red rum on the door, you know, there, that gets added to the visions later becomes is Tony warning Danny like this is like and they, they tend to happen at moments of like crisis between Jack and Wendy when yeah. things start. Oh, and there's, a, there's a little detail that I that I really like that like he writes red rum on the door and he um, and so what, uh, we're jumping ahead, but uh, when when he he's in a trance because uh, he's become so traumatized that it's just Tony at this point, and Tony writes red rum on the door, and when she wakes up, she's like, "Danny, what's wrong?" Because he's holding the knife and he's screaming red rum. He she hugs him and then sees behind him in the mirror reflected it say murder, right? Yeah. So like when he saw that the words red rum on the door in his initial vision, this is like. It gets strange because, like, that's that's something that he wrote that way specifically because that's what she sees. Well, and, you know what I mean? It's what she, like yeah, a... it's what she sees, but it's also that, like, so because Danny is talking to Tony in the mirror, and because the mirrors are so important in the movie. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I mean, at, at, and I can give some other examples of that movie now, but because because Tony sort of comes from a mirror place in a yeah. way. It's like Tony natu- Tony naturally writes that out that way because he's sort of yeah, it's an interesting yeah. idea. I also like it, 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 I, drew, I sort of like drew a connection to that because what, when he sees the the gushing of the blood, the only person who sees that in a waking state in the movie is Wendy. Yeah, later on. So there's like a like a sort of psychic connection sort of they have, you know what I mean? Like an emotional connection they have that he sees things that she sees as well. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. So. As the plot progresses, uh, Jack is becoming more of a big meanie head. He's just so rude the whole time. Um, <laughs> and, I've got, I've, and you know, I've got a, that. A up storm, here. There a we go. storm. That's our favorite review of this movie so far. Yes, uh, that that is one of the best movie reviews I've ever seen. I love it so much. <laughs> one out of five. Dude is just rude. 
whole movie. He's man. just rude the whole time. Um, a storm comes rolling in, and we we see the 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 score that plays when Danny is first having his waking vision. He sees the twins. That same score plays when Jack is looking out the window as the storm's rolling in. Now, um, there's kind of so this. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll we'll get back to that. But the storm is a storm. I don't know. They don't say storm of the century, but is unseasonably strong. This is a, a bad storm. It's accumulating feet and feet of snow, and it's causing power lines to go down and all sorts of stuff yeah, like the that. Phone, the phone lines phone go down. Phone lines are down, so they can't call anybody. Yes, and so they're even more stranded and isolated now. The road's definitely closed at this point. Um, Wendy tries to contact uh, the the forestry service, whoever those people yeah, are. Yeah, the forest rangers. Yeah, and says so like, hey, our phone lines are down. And they're like, yeah, uh, fortunately, when that happens, usually they're down until spring, I'm afraid, because we just can't get up there to fix them. Uh, by the way, you should leave your radio on all the time now, but uh, there's not much I can do to help you. And there's a great little character moment because Wendy is talking to, to this forest ranger on the thing, and you can tell she's lonely, you know, because she has yeah, no one else to talk to. And she clearly wants to talk longer, but he's like, uh, is that all I can do? Is, like, is there anything is there I can anything do for I you? anything I can he's, do for you, ma'am? She yeah. goes, well, it was real nice talking to you. Goodbye. Yeah. Over it's and like, out. Aw. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, poor Wendy. She's lonely. Um, storm rolls in. And Jack's uh, uh, condition is declining rapidly. His mental state is declining. We're seeing more and more horrific things. Eventually, it gets to a point when... And this, oh, this is a great scene. So while Wendy is in the boiler room uh, doing her thing, uh, oh, doing the actual work, I should say. Before, well, before we get to that, um, the, 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 fir- the scene that comes before that is the one where uh, it's immediately after... Jack says to Danny, uh, I would never hurt you, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, then he says, I, I wish we could stay forever and ever and ever. And then we show Danny playing in the hallway and Jack's tennis ball rolls up to him yes. while he's playing. With More his further cars. evidence that everything that Danny sees that's surreal and horrifying is like at Jack's hands, because the while he's playing with his little toy trucks in the hallway, the ball that rolls up is the same one that Jack's been playing around with. Well, right? And, and I, I, I like I like this a lot because when when he get he come he, the tennis ball rolls at him and he gets up and he thinks it's his mom at first and he kind of puffs out his chest uh cuz he's you know a little afraid but he's putting on a brave face and he walks up to room 237 and he sees the door is open and there's a key in the lock right there's a the, the key mm-hmm. has been used to unlock the door yes cuz earlier the first time he went by room 237 on his tricycle the door was locked he yeah. had this weird sense that there was something weird about that place he tried to open the door and nothing happened but now the door is open with yeah. the key in the lock and yeah. the door is open with a key in the lock and we sh- we show danny's perspective as he's walking into the room and then that's when we cut to wendy in the boiler room yes wendy's in the boiler room and she hears jack yelling going ah, bah, bah. And she's like what the fuck so she she runs to him and he's in his 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 writer's room that colorado lounge i believe is what it's called and she wakes him up and's like, Jack, are you okay? And he's like, Oh my god, I had the most horrible dream. I had a dream where I murdered you and Danny. And he's like, he's feigning like he's horrified by it, but he keeps doing this thing, which is like, for all the, you know, the sort of over the top acting he does, you know, like he's very kind of hamming it up in a way that I find really compelling. But you know, some people think it's overacting. There's a lot of subtlety to his performance. Yeah. So like when he when he's saying like oh I had this dream I I I didn't just kill you I chopped you up into little pieces and he's like pretending to, he's pretending to be upset by it but he keeps yeah, but looking he, he at l- her keeps to looking see, like to see yep. if she, yeah well he keeps giving to her see a how it's landing eye. yeah he keeps looking at her to see how it's landing because this is like a manipulation thing he's doing he's just being cruel he's just like tormenting them well yeah he's and like, I, I this is a, one one of my favorite sequences <laughs> this whole little. Uh, what what we're talking about now is like one of my favorite sequences in almost all of film. So I'm uh, yes. yeah. So he he's doing this like side eye glance at her to see how it's landing, and she's she's saying you know oh it's okay you know he he, he does a little thing he goes I must be losing my mind you know, um, <laughs> yeah. and then Danny kind of walks in uh, mm-hmm. in almost not in a trance but he's like sucking his thumb and his you know his shirt is torn he's walking in very slow uh, and his neck is all bruised up. Uh, yeah. And 
Wendy tries to get him out because, you know, she's trying to you know, avoid making Jack angry at this vulnerable moment because she's <laughs> because that's how she is. Uh, yes. And then she runs over to Danny and she sees the, uh, the the strangle marks on the neck and he doesn't say anything. And she immediately looks at Jack and says, uh, you did this to him. How could mm-hmm. you? Oh, oh, it's you? like I, I, I want to emphasize the the shot they cut to this like wide shot of her across the room when she looks back at Jack and you and like she's putting the pieces together that like yeah. it couldn't have been anyone else. Yeah, no, it's yeah, like but, that's that's such an incredible shot. Well, and and it, the thing that I really love about the the mentioning of the key in the room is because it's it'd be so easy to assume right that it's a supernatural thing right that's mm-hmm. luring Danny in there, but. Uh, and this is one of the things that Dr. Sleep that you can see in the trailer as it comes up. This really pisses me off about Dr. Sleep. Uh, why would a ghost need a key to unlock the door of the hotel? <laughs> yeah. it, it, it was Jack. It's his tennis ball. Yes. It was Jack. Yes. Like, he he was waiting in the room and he lured Danny in with the tennis ball. <laughs> and, or, uh, well, he was he wasn't physically waiting in the room. Because he wasn't in the room. I, he was I, the... I, well, I, I, I am of the mind that these scenes are cut uh, out of chronological order. But um, well, yeah. hold on. There's a there's there's an important thing. Uh, this might be the good time to bring it up uh, because well, well, later when he says to Lloyd, is like I never laid a goddamn hand on him, and it's like, well, I think he's actually he's literally telling the truth. Well, okay, yeah, but he can be doing that and have convinced himself that he didn't do it. Well, that's 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 the other interpretation. So, the the the, the interpretation you're going with is essentially he was in the room and he uh, Danny was seeing things that weren't there, but what was literally happening was that he like tricked him to going into the room and then like like choked him out essentially okay so i my you know we'll we'll get to the end of the the whole sequence to the part where jack go because the part where jack goes to you know quote unquote well, there's investigate a, um we'll, well there's a big scene that. in between this yeah, yeah we'll go to the bar lots. we'll go to the bar for, we'll, i'll wait until we well, get to the investigation hold on because i i think this is a good time to bring up um the idea of telekinesis because what is clear so far is that people have uh, the people with the shining have telepathy, yes. right? They have the ability to read minds and project and to communicate telepathically. Also, Danny has some ability for premonitions and be able to see the future. As Dick Holleran says, you know, well, sometimes you can see things that haven't happened yet. Sometimes you can see things that happened a long time ago, like the remnants of things that happened in the past, classic ghost stuff, right? Yeah. So. There is evidence in this movie, though it is never made explicit, that telekinesis exists as well. That, but like, it's is that not is a... like like the things disappearing from the backgrounds of shots? Is that what? You're... Yes, okay. there's a couple. Okay, there's a couple, I get you. There's a couple. There's a couple thing. There's a couple pieces of evidence to this effect. Right throughout the movie, there are things that, though they have not been touched, just disappear between shots and then reappear again. These are, I, I suppose you could call these deliberate continuity errors. They don't make any sense because as like in, in the logic of how the scenes are filmed, like for example, um, when Danny comes, sorry, not Danny, when Wendy comes in to be like, hey, how's it going, honey? And he's like, you're distracting me. That scene, well, we're looking over, we're looking at Jack and behind him, there are chairs up against the wall. And then we cut back to Wendy and we cut back again and the chairs are gone. They're not there anymore. It's the same angle. It's the same field of view. The chairs are just gone now. Why have they disappeared? No one in the logic of the story would have sat on them, so it doesn't make any sense for them to have moved. But even though we're looking at the same angle, they were there before, now they're not, and then they're back again. And when they disappear and come back again, have relations to specific lines about when he's getting agitated, right? Ah. There are a few examples of this. Like you mentioned before that uh, the stickers on his door, one of them disappears. Yeah. Why? It wouldn't have been touched. Why is it gone? When Wendy is talking to the doctor in, uh, about you know what happened to Danny, when she starts talking about what happened to Danny, there's a chair that has moved slightly. It's it's a subtle thing, but if you look at the shots, there's a chair that was I angled like that one better, way that's actually. now angled the other way. I, li- I like that um, a lot better uh, interpretation-wise uh, than, than the one that I was working off of before, because I, yes. I never put that together as being telekinetic. 
Uh, that makes yes. a lot of sense. There is a, there is a line in the novel that's kind of a throwaway line where someone, I think, whoever the narrator is for this point in the book, says something to the effect of people like things seem to move when no one's around, and like find themselves in different places and rooms and stuff like that. Like someone's been moving things. Ah, and so okay. There's an imp okay. there's an imp I clearly I think clearly. Kubrick was like, ooh, that's an interesting line. I'm going to take that and run with it, right? That, so yeah, there, that makes sense. There's, here's a couple other weird ones, right? The, the, one of these is, is, is especially jarring, is at the end, Danny is running away from Jack, and he runs outside, and he runs into the hedge maze at night, right? Famous yeah. scene? Well, he runs into the side of the maze where before there was no entrance, but now there is. Well, and another one that's really interesting from that is that... Um... The door is just when Dick Halloran comes in at that point, the door is very slightly only cracked open. And then when Danny runs out into the snow, both doors are wide open. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's another another good little good little yes. bit there. Here's here's another one. When Jack is breaking into the bathroom later when he's trying to kill Wendy with an axe, he hacks just that one narrow slit in the door, right? So we can yeah. open it. He does that with the first one. He does that for the second one too. He puts his face in and says, here's Johnny. And then Dick uh, Halloran is showing up in the snow cat. They both kind of stop in their tracks, right? Well, now if you look at the door, yeah, there's- Yeah, both of them are missing. I did notice that yesterday. There's a pain. There's both of them are missing now. Well, Why? I, I mean, it's also, it's also interesting too, how um, red rum is erased off that door. Yes. In that point, yeah. Yeah, some some of these, some of those you could, I could, I could see a skeptic saying, well, some of these are just continuity errors, but some of them actually don't make any sense as continuity errors, as in like something that was just a mistake while filming, like that there would be a second part of the door that was also broken down doesn't make any sense that the that the hedge maze that has been established as to what it looks like on a map doesn't have an entrance there and now it does, like that yeah. that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, like these chairs disappearing, even though we're looking at the same angle and they like no one's touched them in the scene. That doesn't make any sense. So when we think about the scene when he's locked in the pantry and he can't get out, but then something lets him out, there are two interpretations. One is that it's the ghost manifesting itself and pulling the lock and letting him out. The other is that his his sort of like well, latent? I, yeah, I, I always so I assumed that Delbert Grady is like Jack's version of Tony at that point. Well, yeah, he is. Yeah. Like, and like from the from a psychological perspective, that is absolutely his like deep kind of evil, nefarious desires and unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. So and so like yeah. So then the telekinesis part that actually makes a lot of sense. Because uh, there is another, in so what, the other interpretation that I was working with before is that it's more of a, um, like a, a classical, almost like a kind of like a, a crime and punishment sort of thing where Jack is is, uh, he's acting out on his desire to kill his family at this point. Like he's decided mm -hmm. to go into that room, into room two through seven, and to lure Danny in there, and then when he he does it he ends up leaving and there's a little there's a gap of time that he like he goes and he passes out on his desk because of the stress of having you know committed something like like attempted murder of a child right he ends up seeing mm -hmm. and and because it's in the bathroom uh he ends up seeing himself in the mirror doing this thing this image of himself you know mur attempted right. murdering his son causes him to you know freak out and leave goes and passes out on his desk and then he has this nightmare, right, that he uses as a way to sort of like, you know, use, he uses it as a way to sort of gather some sympathy from Wendy. May, and I, I always just assumed that he had sort of convinced himself that he didn't do it, especially mm -hmm. at the moment when Wendy accuses him of it. And yeah. so then when he goes to, and the reason that I assumed this is because that scene where he goes into the, which... I'm an, I'm just gonna jump ahead and talk about it because I've been waiting to talk about this all day. Can I talk to you about the bathroom, Jamie? Well, I've been well, dying hold, to talk to you about the finish, bathroom all day. No, finish <laughs> finish your theory because I want to talk about the other one and then we can go into well. Specific. So my the, the my theory is basically that Jack did Jack strangled Danny physically and then yeah. um kind of like passed out at his typewriter after mm -hmm. you know leaving him in there 
uh, seeing himself in the mirror, and then he goes down to the bar and, and you know, convinces himself that it, it was never really his fault, you know, that he didn't do anything yeah. wrong, that kind of thing. Which, I okay. do like that interpretation, but it does leave the problem of who unlocks the pantry door then, and I think the telekinetic one answers that question a lot better. Yeah, well, I think even if you assume it's ghosts, I think... Um... Okay, so so like oh. the the interpretation I'm operating under is essentially that like while he's asleep or in a trance or daydreaming, it's like his darker subconscious desires are like out to play because he doesn't know he has the shining and he only seems to shine when he's like asleep or in a trance or in the end when his waking when his waking persona and his like deep desires for violence are finally on the same page, right? At the very end. So while he's actually asleep in his writer's room working on the thing, and then while he's asleep, his subconscious is tormenting Danny by showing him this horrible thing from, from the story he's writing for them in real time, essentially. There's, there's this ghost based on a story he clearly read from the scrapbook that he has on his table that's full of all the stories, big stories that have happened here, including the one with the twins. Or one with the old caretaker, I should say. Yeah. And so he, um, he, he, he is luring psychically, telepathically, telekinetically, whatever, luring Danny into this room to show him this horrible vision sort of thing that like he's acting this out telepathically. And then he wakes up and he's like, oh man, I had the most terrible dream. Right? And tells Wendy about it, even though like it's cruel to tell her about it, but he tells her anyway. <laughs> And then when Danny shows up and he's abused and she's like, you did this. He's like, what the fuck? I never touched him. I never laid a goddamn hand on him. It's like, well, because he didn't have to. That, you know, that's fair. That is a fair assumption as well. Well, like he, he like literally that. thinks he didn't do it. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I think that either yeah. way, either one of our interpretations yeah, way, would say like he he yes. literally believes that he didn't do it. You know, yeah, like he he convinces himself he couldn't have done that. Right. Yes. Um, so, so, so Wendy is like, you did this. There's no one else it could have been, and you hurt him before. So this is clearly you. He's offended by this. He leaves. He goes, and then there's been lots of talk over the years about the impossible architecture of The Shining. He finds his way to that ballroom, which we never see how it connects to the main hotel, which I always find fascinating. Yeah, like that ballroom. Also, it's too big for the exterior of the hotel. If you look at it in the early helicopter shots and some of the wide shots, there's no place. Sorry, there's no place for that ballroom to be in the building. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that when he walks down the hallway, every time he passes a mirror is when he starts waving his arms around like like <laughs> yeah. an animal, which is yeah. it, 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 as he's passing the mirror, his his natural animistic, mm -hmm. like angry tendencies, his murderous tendencies are coming out of him as he's doing yep. this. It, oh, it's, it, it's fantastic. I love that scene. So he, he comes he comes into the ballroom and it's empty. He sits down at the bar. There's no one there, and he's like, "Ugh, I need a drink. I'd sell my so I, I'd sell my goddamn soul for just a glass of beer." And then he opens his eyes and he's looking dead in the camera, which is fucking great because it's a yeah. POV shot, but you, you don't quite realize it because he's looking at the mirror. He's looking, at a mirror, he's looking yeah. dead in the camera, and he's like, "Hi, Lloyd." Long pause. Looks around. A little slow. slow tonight, isn't it? And like, this is one of my favorite performances in any movie ever. Like, this whole scene yeah. is incredible. He's so funny, but like, it's frightening at the same time because then the way it's revealed is so great. Because then you see Lloyd, and he goes like, "What'll it be, Mister Torrance?" And and like, and then he he steps up, and then as he comes closer to the camera, we zoom out and and see the full stocked bar now. And then he starts talking to him. He pours him a drink. He's like. Like, why don't you give me a like a bottle of whiskey and uh, a yeah. glass? And it's like you can do that for me, can't you? You're not too busy, are you? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's great. I mean, like, yeah, the way he's like just owning the scene with this, like, yes. yeah, it's a it's incredible. And one of the things that I really really like about this, this is this is a very subtle thing for you for the whiskey drinkers out there. But uh, he says bourbon on the rocks, right? Which mm -hmm. is which you know, so a bottle of bourbon. Uh, and a glass of ice and the bartender hands him a bottle of Jack Daniels, which this is a small detail. Jack Daniels is not a bourbon. Uh, yes, it is. No, it's not. It's a Tennessee whiskey. Bourbon is Kentucky. 
I don't think you're right about that. Hold on a minute. All right. To do. I'm going to fact check you in real time, own you with facts and logic. Tennessee whiskey is a straight whiskey produced in the U.S. state of Tennessee, although it is legally been defined as a bourbon whiskey in oh, some international trade. Le agreements. In Most some, yeah, but it's not called it's not called a bourbon. It's called a Tennessee whiskey. It's technically looked, a bourbon, but it's a Tennessee whiskey. Okay, when I when I googled it before, they said it was a bourbon, but okay. <laughs> yeah, because it, bourbon, from what I remember, bourbon is sort of like champagne. In like with France, like it can't tech, you know that that meme is like, oh, it can't technically be called champagne if it's not from the Champagne region of okay. France. Yeah, yeah I, it's, I it's one of those kinds of things. So I just I like that I I like that little note that he gives him a thing of uh, Jack Daniels. Uh, it, it, it's I don't know. I just I like that. Well, I mean, setting aside whether Jack Daniels is technically a bourbon or not. Uh, the, the the larger point remains that he asked for bourbon on the rocks and he just gave it to him neat. <laughs> it's like why <laughs> oh no he scoops he just... ice into it doesn't he no he doesn't oh okay i thought he did we're gonna fact because I, I thought there was some there was some th something rattling around in the glass when he shakes maybe it. Might, maybe i'm just maybe i'm just over for two with the fact checks. yeah hold on <laughs> you, you you keep talking i'm gonna i'm gonna fact check yeah go go check that out real quick yeah so yeah uh i really i really like just the subtle, the subtle. No, little... it's neat. It's neat. Oh, it's neat. Okay. Wait. Oh no, there is an ice. Oh okay. yeah, there no. is an ice. You're scoop... you're right. He scoops an ice cube in there you're and he right. rattles it around. Yeah, because it's uh, a... yeah. I've my credibility has been destroyed. I just misremembered it because at first he pours it and I didn't. I I don't see him. Like I don't think you see him pour the ice. Or maybe I'm just coping now. Either way, I misremembered that. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, because he, he takes that whole drink. thing in one shot at the beginning, and then like, I, God, I love when he just taps the glass, like in that really exaggerated way. After he finishes the first one, and he does a little talking, and then he just taps he the does glass. A little, yeah. Does a little dance while he's waiting too. Uh, it's so yeah, so um, he, he Lloyd, he talks to Lloyd, calls him Lloyd like ten times in the scene. It's pretty funny. He's like, he's like, you're the best goddamn bartender from here, from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine. Portland, Oregon, for that matter. Anyway, so he, he takes the drink and he says, like, hey, uh, I'm temporarily light. How's my credit in this joint? He's like, your credit is fine, Mr. Torrance. He's like, that's swell, Lloyd. I always liked you. You know, yeah. he's like, this is his fantasy of being in this great, amazing, like... This, being being like, in this bar where everybody treats him like... You know, like, nobody's going to treat him like a deadbeat. Everybody treats... Like, the, guy, the bartender is, you know, treating him like a treasured customer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So he, he pours him a drink, and right before he drinks it, he says, here's to five miserable months on the wagon. Yes. And all the irreparable harm it's caused me. And then he takes a drink, and just the face he makes as he gulps it down, or like, honest, like if this is like the his bargain with the devil, and Lloyd is very much dressed kind of like a devil. He's got a red suit on with like very pointy lapels. He's got a kind of an ominous look about him, you know, like mm -hmm. deep jet black hair. He like he, he takes a drink and it's like you can see the soul leaving his body. It's great. Yes, uh, <laughs> like, I love it. And this is also the point where we find out too that uh, so the story that Wendy told at the beginning, right? Like it, it, consistent mm -hmm. here, where she says, "Well, you know, uh, he it, something good did come out of Danny's dislocated shoulder, though, because uh, Jack said, uh, Wendy, I'm never going to touch another drop, and if I do, you can leave me.' And he hasn't had any for over five months. And then in this one, we find out that yeah, five months, even though it has been an mm -hmm. extra month um, since the the hotel started, because uh, it says one month later at the in that yeah. title card at the beginning, uh, but. Yeah. Then he uh, he says the thing with Danny's arm happened three years prior, not five months, which is just fantastic for the character development. Just uh, extra little sprinkles of of learning who Wendy is through yeah. all of this. It, it just you know, he, she he said that three years ago he would have you know said I, I won't touch another drop and you can leave me if you do if I do right and he said that three mm -hmm. years ago and now it's been five months you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it, it's oh, it's great. I love it. I yeah. love the dialogue in this movie. Yeah, it's great. 
And so uh, and, uh, uh, this is something I want to signpost because I do, I do promise for anyone listening, we do plan on talking about Dr. Sleep at some point, yes. but we're just, in, <laughs> we're just, we're having a good time talking about a good movie. Uh, we'll, we'll we don't get, to get to, we don't do that as often as we like. So we're, I want something I want to signpost because this will be relevant for Dr. Sleep. Uh, Hugh, would you say that it seems that, um, <laughs> that Jack really wanted to get, get sober and get clean? No. No, or did no. it seem like he resented everything about having to be sober for the sake of his family? Oh, you yeah. know, un- cla- like very, very, you know, very subtle lines like, here's to all the, like the miserable five months I've had and all the irreparable harm it's done me. Yeah. Like, or they, does, like he... isn't this the part where, is this the part where he says the white man's burden line? <laughs> yeah. I, I, lo- I love that line because it doesn't, like, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, I have no clue. Like, he just says family? white man's burden, Lloyd. White man's burden, but like, kind of apropos of nothing. I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. There's, a, there's, you know, there's a couple little lines of his like sort of, uh, like nascent racism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just kind of lurking there. It's interesting. And so, and quietly stacking and unstacking chairs mid dialogue seems a bit non. Well, they would disappear, right? They would move it's somewhere a, it's, else, right? Yeah, it's it's the stack it's, of chairs it's... moved somewhere else in the hotel, presumably would be the thing. Not yeah. that they just unstacked and nobody noticed that that they just kind and of. And he's like... not, and also he's not doing it intentionally because the, he doesn't know he has this power. It's not a power he's using using consciously. It's something that's manifesting. Most when he's asleep and he's letting his subconscious run wild. Yeah, and like in the moments where in his the in, in the moments where his aggression comes out would be the ones where they kind of it happens a little more frequently, and that's the yes. unconscious him, kind of mm-hmm. moving, um, yeah, yeah, moving stuff. So yeah, uh, so yeah, the, the bar scene, Lloyd, yeah. Yeah. Well, and one thing that I, I, I will give, though they make it lame because they turn it into a superpower, I think Dr. Sleep is correct in identifying that telekinesis exists in this world. Yeah, well, yeah, they because I just assumed that, te- like, when I was, because I rewatched, or I watched Dr. Sleep for the first time before rewatching The Shining, so mm-hmm. I, for some reason, like, I just was like, oh, telekinesis. Yeah, that may, like that makes sense. And then I, you know, I started thinking a little bit more about certain other interpretations, which we will get to in a second uh, mm-hmm. about that. And that's, I, so that's know, one point I will, I will. They make it entirely too explicit and conscious, and just turn it into a superpower. But they, Doctor Sleep, is aware, I think, correctly that in the original, that like telekinesis was implied. But it was more of a like a well the whole thing with it's the more shining of an old and... fashioned kind of telekinesis you know like the like yeah, the sixties or fifties yeah sixties or fifties uh, horror story thing with telekinesis before anybody had really like laid out a bunch of rules about it um, yeah you know, like Aldous Huxley's kind of idea of ESP. objects can move and disappear and stuff like that That's, yeah yeah that happens quite frequently. Um, uh, so, so he's having the conversation with Lloyd. He he sells his soul, you know, for a for a for a drink, and like like that's kind of like a lock in point. Cause it's like okay, he's like committed. He's he's made a bargain with his subconscious, and he's like going down a path of letting that take over him. Whereas like you know in the novel, it's more like oh now that now the ghosts are getting inside of him. It's like now he's letting out, he's letting his demons out more so. Wendy comes, uh, they, 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 there's some great dialogue here, but we, we, we don't have time to get to it now. Um, Wendy comes in and she's like, it's like, Jack, there's someone else in the hotel. Danny said that someone strangled him, right? Because Danny has woken up from his trance enough to tell Wendy what happened. And like that there was an old lady in one of the rooms and she stri- tried to strangle Danny. And Jack's like, are you out of your goddamn mind? And she's like, no. And he's like, go check it out. So he goes to investigate he goes to room 237 now there's a there's a quick note i want to i want to highlight aesthetically here because i think it's incredible we we go into room 237 well actually before before we get to that i just want to um so before we see jack go into room 237 we cut away to dick halloran in his room in miami in his in his house in miami and Dick's watching the news about, uh, you know, Colorado. 
um, in that bedroom, crazy storm, a crazy storm in that bedroom with the t- <laughs> with the two pornographic <laughs> yeah. paintings just hanging around, just lounging in this room. I fucking which I like. I fucking love the set design for his. I just find it oh, so incredible. so funny. To He's me. an older bachelor, and that's how he wants to live his life. Yeah, yeah. it just it, like it cracks me up every time. I'm like, you do you, Dick Halloran. You you're a good, <laughs> you're a good one. Uh, but yeah. as he's watching the TV, he we get the little the musical cue, and he starts to experience a vision. And then this is intercut with the scene of Jack yes. going into room two three seven, and the music does not stop. It goes through no. the whole underneath the whole thing. And in between this, we're going to get scenes of Danny in his, you know, shining seizure. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we also see little snippets, not of what Jack is seeing in room 237, but of what Danny saw in room 237, which is interesting. What do you, what do we mean by what Danny? Oh, yeah, because well, the, we see Danny's hand open up the room, the door to the bathroom. And... Well, no, no, not quite. Uh, uh, let's walk through it. So, okay. um uh like you said dick halloran starts to starts to have a shining vision he's got this terrible look on his face and we cut and we see jack walking into tomb room 237 we're intercutting between dick halloran having the vision jack going in to investigate room 237 and danny having a seizure in his room right all this happening at once with the same shining music cue happening underneath of it and so jack goes into room 237 and uh, just as a quick aesthetic note, I love that this room is green and purple because there's no other room like that in the hotel. I so, like... wanted to talk about the green so like okay, I love <laughs> this is one of my favorite scenes in almost any movie ever. So yeah. the when he go, so Jack goes into room two three seven, he goes into the green this like pale like green almost pastel green, green and purple and yeah. purple uh, bathroom and a beautiful woman. Uh, it you know comes out of the bathtub and you see Jack's like smile like he is just absolutely delighted Ooh, right lady. Hell and yeah. we're again intercut with scenes of Dick getting the vision and Danny having a shining you know moment um, and Jack goes up and starts to make out with the woman at, like pretty much unprompted uh, just walks up to her grabs her and they start kissing and then he looks in the mirror and he sees that she's become a corpse right like this yes. rotting bloated nasty corpse and it is like the makeup is gross and incredible and the, she starts laughing and follow and he backs out very slowly from the room um and just like she kind of like extends her arms and is walking at him and laughing and he backs out and he locks the door and he walks away right and that's yes. pretty much where it ends now this scene my i firmly believe that this is not Jack going to investigate the room after Wendy has asked him to do so. I am firmly on the boat that this is a vision of what happened that Danny is sending to Dick Halloran, asking him nope. for help. Yeah, nope. I, well, hold on. Let me That's let me true. let me explain why. Because You're number wrong. one, number one, the bathroom, <laughs> the green color in the bathroom. I love the use of the green in this because there's an old phrase from like. I think at one point there's like a Shakespearean line in, I think, Antony and Cleopatra about the green sickness of envy. Um, and what Jack is seeing as he comes into this room with the beautiful woman in the bathtub is everything that he has ever wanted. Right. That is it's like That's true. the life yeah. that he is after is right there in front of him. Right. Mm-hmm. And when he looks into the mirror and sees the rotting, the death that is caused by his desire in this instance, he freaks out and backs out and comes and locks the door. So my my idea is that this is a a sort of like a dream sequence that a, a symbolic dream sequence that Danny is shining out to Dick, showing no. him what Jack did in the room in order to try to get what he wanted, where he believed that he would kill his son. Well, uh, I'll tell you why I don't think that you lost me in the last half there, because we specifically intercut what what Jack is seeing with uh, the with the sexy lady who was turned with the, into a corpse. Like she's walking after him and she's cackling, and then we cut to Danny, and then we cut to an old lady coming out of the bathtub as a corpse already, from a different point of view. 
It's not oh, something Jack. Is that saw. okay? And this is all intercut at the same time. So that is what Danny saw. Danny walked into the room looking after the tennis ball, went into the bathroom and saw an old like old like uh, decaying lady in a tub who tried to strangle him. Jack goes into the room and sees what he, okay. he's a pretty lady, which is like, oh, hell but it's yeah, all the creation is... of Jack's mind anyway. It is. Okay. And I think and I think the so, yeah, no. So what what Danny is projecting to to Dick. Sorry, my dog's barking at nothing, I'm sure, because he likes to do that. Um, <laughs> Don't they all? But <laughs> what uh, what what Danny is projecting out to Dick Holleran to try and say, like, hey, I'm in danger. Come save me is what he saw in room two, three, seven which is the, the, the woman in the bathtub who gets up and tries to strangle him. She's already like a corpse, which like that's a, we, we, we intercut in that like to a, like a slightly lower point of view, like it's a kid's point of view of her getting out of the bathtub, which is not something Jack ever sees. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I, okay. But like that's what happened to him. But what happens to Jack that you're, you're totally right is like this is a sort of weird sexual fantasy that he has, but it goes wrong. And what I think is interesting about it is that like it's almost like he's discovering the power of like this is because this is right after he takes a drink for the first time, right? Yeah. So, like he's 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 actively choosing to engage with like letting his own demons out or taking them in, however you want to say it, right? And so then he goes into this place and where he his mind was using to psychologically torment his son. And he goes in there as an active waking person and he sees something. Ooh, this is great. Like an object of his desire. But then it like turns on him almost to suggest that like he's not really in control. You know what I mean? It's like that this is a dream he's having, but he's not in charge of it yet. You know what I mean? It's like this is something still kind of outside of him because it, 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 it like he doesn't get to just have sex with the woman it's like a little trick and, and she laughs at him and then he runs away and then when he goes and tells wendy about it he's like i didn't see anything in there he's not willing to admit it either you know what i mean he's like hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah, uh kind of kind of, yeah i i hmm. i guess that may i guess with the scene i don't remember the scene with the the corpse woman getting out of the bathtub on her own. Uh, I must have missed that part. So I guess, I guess that adds up. Yeah. So yeah, if you look at the the... scene when he's, when he's like backing away from the old corpse lady, who's laughing at him, we cut to Danny and then we cut to an old lady coming out of the tub, which is implying what Danny saw and what he, Danny is projecting what happened to him, which is different uh, to Dick Haller and to try and like, help me, save me, please. Okay. All right. And it's taking all of his strength to do it. My resolution was not as firm as I believed. So, you <laughs> that's, know, okay. they, that's fine. But yeah, no, it's, I really I really like that scene because yeah. uh, it, it, I do like the symbolic, the symbolic significance of Jack entering this envious state where he thinks he's about to like realizing the horror that he's going to commit in order to get what he wants, you know, like mm-hmm. all he's ever wanted is to Im- basically share this embrace with you know, death in like to, yeah. Oh, that's definitely symbolically a big part of what's happening. He has a little bit of a, a a moment of repose here where he leaves. Right. And he tells Wendy that he didn't see anything. Uh, cause he goes back at, you know, explains that all to her. And then, you know, he, he kind of tries to fudge it by saying that Danny must've done it to himself. Cause when you rule out, you know, his version of events, there's no other explanation. explanation. Um, and then she says that they need to leave and then he freaks out and then that's when danny has another vision of uh like the red rum or the murder or you know something he has another little that's when he he can like hear their conversation i think there's another part of it too yeah there's another part where that he does that also but he he has another like but that's that moment where wendy tries to get you know to be like well all the same i think we should leave and get danny some help is the moment that like solidifies jack's decision to mm-hmm. to kill his family and try to get away with it basically like yeah. to to do away with them and, and try to have what he wanted so like he he yeah. had a little bit of uh realization when he looked in the mirror which is where i drew a lot of the um the idea that he was the one in the room from right is that like he yeah he well, sees i mean what that's, he, that's what he's doing that's a way of interpreting it, and that's definitely part of it for sure. Like the mirror is always a big part of it, right? Yeah. The only the only part that I think is definitely 
not true is the that that Danny is projecting to Halloran what Jack is going through rather than what he went through. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I was thinking more of like a uh, symbolic sort of thing, like is Jack embracing the the beautiful woman in that scene is sort of like I was thinking of that as more of like a symbolic action for mm -hmm. Dan Jack strangling Danny. Mm -hmm. Right. It's because like he's he thinks he's getting what he wants by doing this. And then when he looks in the mirror and sees the decay and the rot and the death, uh, he back, he, you know, stops and backs away. Right. And leaves would have left Danny in there. So I, I would have I interpreted it as a symbolic. Like a symbolic dream like description showing Dick what was happening. Right. That Jack has sort of taken this path. Um, right. Yeah, I think it's just a little, a little bit of a stretch. I think the simpler and more effective explanation is just, he's just showing what he saw when he was in there. I think, yeah. Of the old woman coming out of the tub. Because clearly, when that's what well, Danny Well, it's kind of like the Wendy. telekinesis is a little bit more of a, a better explanation of who opens the... Uh, well, I think, I, think, I think it's than... just straightforwardly more accurate because of, you know, when he wakes up, he tells, um, he tells his mom that an old lady was in there and she tried to strangle me. Like that's what he saw. Yeah, that's what yeah. he experienced. Um, I I gotta argue with chat a little bit about the whole telekinesis thing because there's some there's some skeptics in there, and that's okay. But the okay, so my main issue is when we write is where we write off there being a bonus exit to the hedge maze being a product of telekinesis. It's not a bonus exit. It wasn't there before clearly in the shot earlier in the film, and now it's there, which implies. That it something maybe got moved, right? Like it, it swapped yeah, that it places was... with one of the yes, right? And 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 like asking questions, like surely there'd be tons of leaf litter and broken bush around the newly formed exit. It's like we're talking about magic here, right? This is this is this is a world where people have supernatural powers. I think you're thinking of it very literally. That we're and like need to. Th the we're story thinking about is... it in in terms of like a more modern. The depiction of telekinesis where it's sort of a, a very physical it, process right yeah whereas where, where it's like preternatural instead of supernatural like this this is this is a supernatural story yeah right? it, it's it's more of a uh like a physical process like um like you actually are moving a physical object uh actively with your mind and it, but yeah but even is... even even that trying to explain telekinesis as if it's not supernatural is just cope as well it's like well, yeah you know, it's more of an no x-men thing than like because older yeah. horror stories don't really think about it as they would they don't think of telekinesis as sort of like a uh like a limb like a lot of modern telekinesis yeah, like stories a power do. you have yeah, they they think of it more like as like a, a, like a weird happening. thing, a, a weird uncanny thing that happens, right? Like yeah. something move, something like a painting is now hanging on a different wall than it was before, right? Yeah, something uh, caused it to move, and in and in this story, people's like subconscious wishes and desires and stuff like that that manifests as a result of a being in a place that has a lot of you know, psychic supernatural energy inherent in it and experiencing very, very, very high stress and life or death situations causes things to move and change in ways that they can't control and they're not actively conscious of, but just manifest, right? Yeah. Like, like if it were a power, you might be like, oh, well, why doesn't he just teleport away and dumb shit like that, which is questions <laughs> that arise when you watch Dr. Sleep because they treat it like it's a power you have. You know, but in this, it's it's there. And with with some of the continuity errors, I think it's worth emphasizing that a lot of them, they don't make any sense as continuity errors. Like, OK, for in Pulp Fiction, um, we can see the bullets in the wall before the guy has shot the gun because they filmed the scene multiple times and they didn't have the ability to take the bullets out of the wall each time. So once the bullets are in the wall or the, 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 the charges are in the wall, whatever you would say. Yeah. Um, we can't do it again, but we wanted, we wanted another take. So we just shot it anyway. And you just kind of have to live with it and hope you don't notice. Right. These are things that like, they don't make any sense from a filmmaking perspective, why these would have been moved in between shots of the same angle, looking in the same direction. Yeah. But they have like, the, like the chairs that got moved is a yes. big one there. Yes. That it's the kind of thing that doesn't make any sense unless it's deliberate. 
And that's why I think there's indications of it. There's the, there's the clue of the line in the book that things are moving without people knowing about it. And then there's a lot of other clues of, you know, of the, of the yeah. like sort of well, impossible like, geometry of the hotel. Well, and here's, here's one, like a constant, a small continuity error from a, a bit later in the film. I, well, you know, pretty much right at the end. We, we, everybody knows the iconic ending of this movie, right? We we're zooming out of the gold room and onto the wall with all the photographs. And there's a, Earlier in the movie, when Jack is walking by, there's a sofa there against the wall, and mm -hmm. there are mirrors on the sides uh, of of the photograph wall. And then when they're, you know, coming in at the end, zooming in on that, the sofa's gone, and the mirrors have been it, replaced by tapestries. So, so it's like... When, where you're... The, the scene you're talking about of Jack walking by it, what scene are you talking about? Uh, I think it's a, it's the scene where he walks into the gold room the first time there's a sofa that is that is a different wall oh there's a different wall yes oh. because in 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 because yes it, it has that sign that says the gold ballroom we see that in two different locations we never actually see how the main hotel connects to the the large ballroom but like for example we see that sign when uh there's a whole bunch of balloons scattered all about that's in like the lobby of the hotel Oh yeah, so like, yeah, that, yeah. So that it is, it is a different wall. Oh, okay, fair enough. It's it's strange. The it's like the gold ballroom seems to be in multiple places. It's very strange. Like a lot has been said, and you can find all sorts of articles detailing specifically by showing different shots how the how the logic of the the layout of the hotel doesn't, doesn't actually, actually make any yeah, sense. Add up. Which which you could be like, oh, uh, there's kind of two ways of looking at that. One is like, okay, well, they just wanted the sets where they wanted them because they wanted them to look a certain way. Uh, oh, so here's oh, the big clue for the fact that this was done deliberately um, and not just an accident of building sets is when Jack goes into Ullman's office, right? We see him enter. We see the wall, the outside that he's coming in. He goes up to the counter. He says, I'm here to see Mr. Ullman. He goes into the room and then... He goes into Ullman's office, and there's a window to the outside that light is blasting through. But that's that's not on the exterior of the building at all. There's no outside oh. there. There's just <laughs> light pumping through that window. That doesn't make any sense. Um, you could say, well, he just really wanted an outdoor window for that for that scene, shot. For, yeah, it just for those better. scenes in that office because it just looked better that way. Or you might be like, well, that's a weird impossible design choice that was done because contributing to the overall effect of this hotel as a labyrinth, which there are obviously many clues to that effect is part of the deliberate design choice of the film. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's, it's to Eric in the chat. Obviously some stories have to try to make telekinesis into a thing. That's basically like, like it's not supernatural and it's not magic. It's just like they try to scientize it and treat it like it's just a, an extra long limb you have to, that you can move things with yeah. your brain. Well, yeah, there's like the a lot of Ray old stories kind of thing. Right? Yeah, a yeah. lot of old stories don't. And clearly this is the more along in keeping with older ideas of things like that. That's much more magical than it is. Like this is just swimming in the supernatural, unlike other things that might try to pretend like it's an actual science. It's I don't I can't think of any like specific Edgar Allan Poe story that would include something like this, but you wouldn't really think of an Edgar Allan Poe story where somebody extends their hand deliberately at like a sofa and then the sofa lifts off the ground. It, that That's not really the kind of thing no. that they were writing about at that point. No, um, but you might imagine something like an if not Edgar Allan Poe, pick it up, pick another gothic horror writer where yeah. it's like things have moved without anyone touching them. And it's like, well, how did they move? You know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah, sort of yeah. thing. That's that's what we're talking about here. Like the like the 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 maze that clearly does not, that has a wall and not an exit at one spot that later has a that later has an exit or an entrance, whatever. Like that's clearly something has changed. And like he's he's taken care to show the diagram of what the maze looks like, and then changed it when in a time of great stress later in the movie. Yeah, well, which... and like both doors to the front of the hotel being wide open when Danny needs to escape is definitely an example of something that's like, it, it wasn't, when Dick Halloran comes in right before Danny 
runs pretty much right before Danny runs out of the front yeah. door. It's just, just barely, barely pushed cracked. open. Yeah. Uh, and he comes and in. It's and it's just then... barely cracked when Wendy runs out herself to go check the cat. So like clearly that was conscious. But then later when he needs to run out, both doors are wide open. And the fact that there are double doors as well that are wide open. There's a lot of doubling imagery. Yes, yes, it yes. seems a bit, you'd be hard pressed to say isn't intentional. So like, yeah, so that's, that's, that's part of the evidence for all of that. Um, he goes back and he tells Wendy, like, well, I didn't see anything in that room, so clearly he must have done this to himself. There's no real other explanation. Obviously, it wasn't me. And she seems to start to believe him because Danny didn't say, Dad, do this. Dad did this to me. He made up some crazy... From her perspective, he made up some crazy story about an old woman in there. So if there's no old woman there, then maybe he's just going crazy. Well, we should probably take him to go see a doctor. And then Jack freaks out, like, oh, if we leave, like, oh, like, this, like, I'm not supposed to leave. I made a contract. I've made an agreement, you know. Now I can't leave. Oh, this would, it'd be really great for you. Like, I could really write my ticket now if I lost this gig. You know what I mean? He's yeah, so... this is when he, this is, yeah, he, he just completely loses it on her. And, you know, like, he has no concern for his own child, right? So, like, clearly. Yeah. No, he does, because he, oh, this is something... I wanted to mention when he's talking to Lloyd, uh, this is one of my favorite little bits of subtle performance and dialogue writing Yeah, where he's talking to Lloyd and he says like, I never laid a goddamn hand on him. All right. And then he says, I love the son of a bitch. Yeah. And as he's saying that he shakes his head. No. Right. Now, yeah. if you've ever like, obviously there's some stuff with, you know, body language interpretation that's kind of pseudoscience, but there's one thing that seems to be relatively well agreed upon that oftentimes when people are lying, their body language will betray that, right? Because it's, it's hard enough to consciously like maintain the lie with your language and your face and stuff like that, that like your, your body parts that you're not aware of can like betray that, right? This is the thing that happens. And so when when Jack says, I love the son of a bitch while shaking his head, no. Try that yourself. It's hard to do. It's hard to like say something true while shaking your head no like that. It's actually kind of hard. It's like it's like more complicated than like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. <laughs> like it's hard to do. But he does it. And there's like this and like there's so much evidence in the story that he just doesn't love his children, his child or his family. He doesn't love them. But he keeps like pretending that he does. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he feels like he ought to. But he doesn't. Uh, He's a narcissist. Yeah, and so real quick, um, I, I don't know if we're saying necessarily that this could be equally plausible as literal or supernatural. I think there's definitely... Well, no, no, no. Yes, it, the, the literal interpretation and the psychological interpretation both have supernatural elements. Yeah, because the telekinesis are, is, yes. is... Or the, the, tele, the telepathy in The Shining is mm -hmm. not... At, at least in most reasonable explanations of the movie, is not really interpreted as hallucination or delusion yes. on the part of either of the characters. It's, no, it's more it, just, uh, it's more just less. It's ghost quite simple. Story. It's, yeah. it's quite simple. The fact that they have the shining is a literal aspect of the story and the, the shining their telepathic abilities. That is a supernatural power that they have in this movie that people don't have in the real world. That is the literal interpretation of events here. Where there is ambiguity is in whether the ghosts are manifestations of psychological internal phenomenon or whether they're the actual spirits of deceased people with their own agencies and powers and yada, yada, yeah. yada. And I think, this, I think this movie very clearly is sort of leaning towards the idea that no, uh, there are not. Because with the continuity errors between the stories with the ghosts, right, like... They wouldn't have chosen twin girls and then deliberately said eight and ten, you know, years old, if that yes. wasn't important, right? Like that he's. Yes. This is not a filmmaker who would make that kind of mistake haphazardly. That's so, that's so deliberate, yeah. Especially yeah. when it involves changing the name of the original character from yeah. the book, specifically to make this point. So I'm I'm more inclined to say that the the most plausible interpretation is a combination of both, right? That like drawing on imagery and his imagination of all the horrible things that have happened in this place, Jack is using the images that he's cooking up 
of of what of ghost like figures to like play out this horror story with his family, right? Yeah. So it's like, but they're not like Mr. Grady who just like is, doesn't say he doesn't correct him. <laughs> pun intended he doesn't correct him when he calls him the wrong name he just it's like yep i'm delbert grady yeah so it's there the supernatural powers exist in this movie full stop what is what's amb- ambiguous what's ambiguous though you can make an argument that one might be more plausible than the other is is the literal existence of spirits of the dead or whether this is all like people people with latent superpowers psychologically tormenting each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's ba- yeah, that's basically what we're getting at. And you can I, I think that that's the more plausible explanation, although you could make the it, well, you could make the the argument, you could try to make the argument that there are some spirits in the house and that the that the fact that the, or in the hotel and that the fact that it's on this sort of sacred land gives it the ability to sort of manifest, gives it the ability to sort of manifest certain things a little bit more. Yeah. Um, because like right. people, some buildings shine and some don't, right? So some mm-hmm. can can project visions of the past within it, but they're just, you know, they're just visions of the past. And then, you know, like Jack's influence on this is kind of what is, sort of is what's giving Danny some of the visions, or at least that's, yes. that's the interpretation that I, I'm, I'm more interested in. Yes. So where were we? Uh, um, we're getting, pretty he starts freaking here. out at her and then he's, you know, cause his ego is flaring up and he, and he walks away to leave her alone again. She's crying. He goes back to the bar this time. Oh, what a pleasant surprise. There's a nice party happening. There's a whole bunch of people in suits and stuff like that. And this is like the high life, high society fantasy that he has. Yeah. And he shows up and he goes like, oh, it's really bumping now, Lloyd. And your he, money's no good here, Mr. Torres. Uh, yeah. The, this time it's a little different. This time it's like, hey, how's my credit in this joint? It's more like, oh, this drink like, is well, this no time charge. he has money out of, out of nowhere. Yes. Well, not I don't know. He like brought the money clearly that he had up in his room or something like that. Actually, no, he does. Uh, I guess it is sort of out of nowhere. It just yeah, sort of it just a, sort of shows up in his wallet out of nowhere. Yeah. But what's what's different last time he was like, oh, hell yeah. Like I got credit in here or whatever. They're not going to deny me just because I don't have cash on me at the moment. Now he has cash and they're like, no, this is no charge. And he's like, listen, Lloyd, I'm the kind of guy who likes to know who's buying his drinks. It's not a concern for you. So, like, there's very much this whole, like, who's really in control of Jack? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, the, like, like who's in charge here? And he's like, well, someone's buying his drinks, and it's not him. And he's like, well, I'd like to know who's buying my drinks. And then right after he says that, he, run, the, he runs into the, the bartender, who's like, oh, no, I spilled that on you. Oh, you poor thing. Uh, let's take you into, let's get you cleaned up. And he's like, uh, and... He's like, well, I mean, you got some on you, yourselves there, Jeezy. And he's like, oh, well, you're the important one. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. This, 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 and then this continues. They go into the oh, more evidence of Jack just mishearing and misremembering things. He says, I, I forget exactly how how um, Brady says it, but he's like, oh, it's a bourbon, bourbon and avocado. Or so, he says something, and then yeah, Jack says it wrong something. back to him. He says it wrong because he mishears it. If you listen closely, if you look at the script, he says it differently. He says like bourbon and avocado or something like that, which is not a thing. He just like misunderstands whatever aperitif or like liqueur he's talking about. He, he mishears him, but he doesn't correct him. So he goes into the he goes into the bathroom and he's getting him cleaned up. And he's like, "Hey, don't I recognize you from somewhere, Mister Grady?" He's like, "Oh, I don't believe so, sir." And then eventually he's like, no, you're the caretaker here, weren't you? And he's like, I don't, I don't, sorry to disagree with you, sir, but I don't think I was. And he's like, no, you were the caretaker here. And then there's a great little piece of filmmaking here, a deliberate breaking of the 180 degree rule, which for, for anyone who's not aware, the 180 degree rule is a general rule of thumb for filmmaking, wherein if you're having two people have a conversation, you want to have one person looking one direction on screen, the other person looking in the other direction. 
That way, like, you know, it's clear where they are in the scene and that they're looking towards the other person. You know, you don't, it's generally bad, um, bad practice to have a scene of two people talking and they're both looking in the same screen direction. It can make it confusing as to where they are in the scene. And the general, why it's called the 180 degree rule is that you draw an invisible line between the two people talking and you only shoot the conversation from one half of it, right? Yeah, one that, side of the that line. Uh, and they, that ensures that you're both that both characters are looking in the appropriate direction. Yeah. Now, what he does specifically in the bathroom scene with Mr. Grady is he flips, he jumps to the other side of the line on purpose. Now, this is a, this is something that is is like like many rules of thumb. It's 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 a rule, but it like there that doesn't mean there aren't exceptions. It's more it's of a important. guideline, you know, more of a well, guideline it's, it's, than a rule. It, especially if you have a no, if you have I, a reason on. for breaking it. There, it there that's is, the point. Yeah. Yes. It is a rule for most things, and like the reason it's a rule is that it's jarring visually, but there are scenarios where you might want to be jarring, and you might want to subtextually give the audience the implication that these two are the same, because when we jump the line, we see like, you know, we've replaced where the other was on the screen, right? There's yeah. a connection there. And so... A, it's jarring and like gives you like a oh, holy shit, we jumped to the other side of the room. And B, it, there's there's a in sort of subtextual link between the two of them, right? Yeah. Um, then there's uh, as as Eric points out in chat, the other important thing to notice is that like you could look at this whole thing through like an unreliable narrator lens if you wanted to. You know yeah. what I mean? Like how much of what yeah. we're seeing is literally happening. That's like, these are perceptions of people, you know, like how that gets my, my only problem with that sort of thing is that that can get a little like, well, it's hard to tell if anything means anything. I, I sort of, especially with this movie, there are certainly other movies where that's more appropriate, I think, based on how the story is told. But like the, sometimes the danger is like, well, is any of this real? It's like, well, then why are we even talking about it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Though, well, there is like, you know, like, you like could... Bo is afraid, you know, like we're, yeah. we're everything oh, when at, when when nothing matters, when nothing is real, then nothing really matters. Right. Like there's yes. no grounding. Yes. So um, what was I saying? So but then as they talk, he's like, you know, you were the caretaker here. You uh, you've always you killed. You killed your no. Oh, oh, he, oh. He says you killed your family with an axe. You chopped them into little pieces and then you blew your brains out with a shotgun. And he goes like, and then, like, then, then a flip switches, and <laughs> then, then, like, Grady is like, I like, sorry to uh, disagree with you, sir, but uh, you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. And Jack is just confused at this, and he goes, um, oh, God, I forget exactly the first thing he says, but he says something to the effect of like, your son. Progress, uh, possesses a great talent, one that I'm not sure you're aware of, like how great it is. Because ah, well, he's a he's a very no, well, no, sorry, he, yeah, he's been Import, using it against your will. He's, the first thing yeah. he says is that like, how are things going? Or maybe Lloyd says that. I'm getting confused now. Lloyd, the point Lloyd is, says that, and that's what yeah, he, so, he does the you know like uh, the old sperm bank. The old sperm bank, yeah. And he's like, he's like, well, maybe like I can handle it. Uh, <laughs> talking about his wife, of course. And then Mr. Grady's like, your son has a great talent and he's trying to use it against your will. And he goes, ah, well, he's a very willful boy. He gets it from his mother. She uh, interferes. So what's happening here seems quite obvious to me. Well, if you look at it as a ghost, the ghost is trying to tell Jack what's happening that he's not aware of. The other interpretation, I think the one that's more interesting and more perhaps more well substantiated, at least more thematically compelling, is that this is Jack's subconscious. This is the evil, the shadow in him, the the one who's been torturing his family while he's asleep, essentially. This is like yeah. the deep malevolence inside him that he's not fully aware of, just like his actual um his shining that he's not aware of. This is this is who he's talking to. And he the his his subconscious or his unconscious, whatever you want to say, he's aware of Danny's talent and ability, and he's he's he seemingly has picked up on the fact that Danny has used his incredible psychic power to communicate all the way across the country 
to uh, Mr. Halloran to try to bring him into this. And this is where yeah, he is, he is like, very... he's trying to bring a third party into this. A, um, an N-word cook. <laughs> There's this great look. A basketball cook, the, yes. <laughs> the, 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 a, smoke, a smoke detector cook. And um, there's this great look that Jack gives, like when he repeats the N-word, he's like, really? Like, you know, I just, there's something funny to me about how his subconscious is more racist than him. Even. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he, uh, he try, he tells him like, well, you know, he's a very willful boy. If I may be so bold, sir, he's quite the naughty boy. Maybe something will have to be done about him. And he's like, I can take care of it. It's like, is that so, sir? You know, like, well, you better take care of it, you know? And so yeah. then he's like, and then what, then we cut out of that. And Danny is having a waking, he's kind of like entered a permanent, um, trance now yeah like, uh, he's in the room uh, uh, wendy's trying to comfort him and he's like danny's not here mrs torres and danny's so he's retreated he, he's tr retreated into tony because he's so traumatized and scared of everything that's happening that he's kind of retreated in, in like he's just letting his subconscious like you know take care of him essentially yeah he's, he's too frightened and this obviously freaks wendy out but she she is like she's right there with him she's worried about him but she's very like lovingly like looking him right in the face and like trying to like come on danny wake up it's time to wake up like danny can't wake up mrs torrance then later she's asleep and uh, this, I, i'm forgetting some of the order of this but then danny is in a trance and tony he grabs the lipstick and he grabs a knife and then he writes red rum on the door. He starts screaming red rum, red rum, which is great. I love the yeah. way he says that. And then she oh, wakes wait, up. No, we've, like, we've missed the point, the point where um, Wendy knocks him out with the baseball bat. Cause this all happens as Jack is coming up to the coming that, that when he does the writes red rum on the door and he picks up the knife and is screaming. Oh, I, I skipped ahead. Yeah. I've skipped ahead. You're right. So, um, sorry. Well, it's, it's okay. I mean, we know where we're going. so much. Yeah. There's so much, but she she eventually is walking her. Uh, she's uh, she's uh, she's determined she's like, to go get Danny a doctor because Danny's retreated into Tony, uh, yes. and Jack has basically isolated himself. And he's we see him strolling around the hotel, taking apart the radio, and then sitting mm -hmm. and typing some stuff on the typewriter. Um, eventually, she she finds his, uh, her way into the the typewriter room. She's looking to talk to him about how she's going to take Danny and leave. And she finds all all Famous all that he's been too. writing this whole time, which is just all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, <laughs> all <laughs> over and over again, and all these weird formatting styles and stuff like that. It's pretty funny. And Jack comes in, and this is some of the other fun. I mean, it's really horrifying because he's very threatening, but like the, his performance here is incredible. Yeah, and he's like really funny. He's like, "What do you think?" <laughs> and then he, she's like, uh, "It's like, what are you doing down?" Yeah, <laughs> and she's like, "I just wanted to talk." And he's like, "Okay, what, what do you, you want to talk about?" about? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, That's the thing. It's like I, I just wanted. It's like I, I don't know. And it's like you don't. I, was like, I don't remember. He goes, "You don't remember." He keeps like echoing her words back at her. Yeah, and really. Like anyway. maybe it was about Danny. Danny. <laughs> maybe it was about him. What should be done with it? <laughs> I think we should talk. About yes. what needs to be done with Danny. <laughs> yeah. I don't it's, know. It's like so like, scary. Oh, I don't think that's true. I think you have some definite thoughts, and true. I want to know what they are. It's so <laughs> funny, dude. He's it's, so like, uh, like cruel in a way that like he's just he's totally free now. Yeah, like this is who he really is, and he's like finally free. Like this is this is the real him, essentially. He has been like, only, yeah, yeah. He's and like he's in full effect, and he's cruel, and he's like petty, and like he's just so rude the whole time. He's just so rude throughout the movie. He ch he goes he says some things like like I have like made a contract, like I can't leave now. I've made an agreement, and like this would be horrible for me if we left. Have you ever now. thought about my responsibilities? Yes. Which, of course, bringing back to the narcissism, he doesn't give a shit about his son who was almost strangled. By what, as far as he knows, you know, 
a mm -hmm. a complete third party, you know, or even if it was actually himself, right? Even if he did have an episode and almost strangled himself in the in the room, uh, that he doesn't have any any concern whatsoever for getting his son to a doctor because he just wants to stay here and keep living the high life. Yeah, he's having so much fun. He's he's. He's becoming self-actualized. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, someone asks, have we seen Robert Ager's, Ager, I don't actually know how to pronounce it, videos on The Shining. I have seen them. It's been a while. He kind of talks about some of the more subtle, and uh, I think he had videos about the impossible geometry and maze-like quality of the building. I really liked those videos. I think he has several videos about The Shining. One of them is about some of the symbolism of the gold ballroom being stylized to look like gold bricks. And sort yeah. of implying that the gold ballroom is a little bit like, uh, what was the, it the Fort Knox? Oh, Fort Knox. Okay, I was going to say the like where all the gold is stolen <laughs> and like the, all the stuff about like your credit and the money and stuff like that being no good here, having to do with like moving away from the gold standard because apparently Stanley Kubrick was very against that and had a lot of money in gold himself, and so like there's a lot you can you can talk about there because they designed the whole ballroom and apparently. Um, he had them redesign it with the gold bars because he had that idea and was like, "Yeah, no, it should, it should uh, like look made to look like they're just stacks and stacks of gold bars on the walls." I'm like, "Well, that's interesting." Yeah, yeah he has a lot of. I uh, have not seen those videos. He has a lot of interesting cool. ideas about um, some of the 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 finer points of symbolism and imagery in the movie. I, I found his videos quite compelling when I saw them years ago. I haven't seen them in a while. So, um, but they tend to be pretty well regarded. You want to do a deep dive to some of the imagery here. Um, so he's coming at her with a bat, and it's some of the best stuff in the movie. Where like it, it, he's like, "Wendy, I've let you ruin my life this far." Oh, Wendy, no. darling, light, light of my of life, my life. Yeah, well, one of the best, one of the best moments for like just how cruel he is. And she's like, I just need, I just want to go lay down. I just want a few I'm minutes to think confused. things over. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, you poor thing. And she's like, I just want to think things over. And he's like, you've had your whole fucking life to think things over. What's a few minutes more going to do you now? And it's like, oh, <laughs> he's, he's just so rude the whole time. Um, and she's swinging at him with the bat and they're moving up the stairs. And the way it's shot is one of my favorite scenes of all time. Like that, that steady cam work going up the stairs. Is so like the way it moves and floats in this sort of like floating, gyrating sort of thing as they go up each step. Oh, it's so good. It's yeah. like hypnotic. Really good. She hits yeah. him with a bat and he goes, ah, and he falls down <laughs> and he hits his head. And uh, and like there's a little bit of humor to be found even in, in all of these scenes, which I really I, appreciate. I love it when he like he sticks his hand out as she's swinging the bat and he gets hit and he goes, oh, God damn it. And then like she back bonks him on the head. Yeah, and then he hits it's his so and he fucking goes, um, funny, man. She, she, He's, and then uh, next we see she's dragging him into the uh, the, 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 the cupboard. Yeah, the, and one of my least, cover. one of my least favorite things about the movie is she gets to the door. He's like starting to wake up, and she's like pulling at the door handle. Clearly, can't tell that it's still locked. Yeah, but that... she like she pulls on it for too long. Like I get, I get what's happening here. She's a little frazzled. Also, we're trying to emphasize that there's a lock on the door. Right, because that's going to be important. I get why we're drawing attention to it, but it goes on for a little too long, and it makes me think she's a little stupid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just—it's like if you if you cut like three seconds out of that, it would it would fix all my problems with it. But it's the one thing that every time I see it, I'm like, oh come on, like yeah. she's just yanking at it. Clearly, not, she's not looking at it like closely. Apparently, I don't know. Just it's a little detail I don't like. But anyway, she she locks him in there. He tries to trick his way out, you know, he, yes. it, it's uh, it's great. I love I love how he you you get to watch him from below in that shot yes. as he's leaning up against the door and you mm -hmm. see all of like you see his mind go through all the different tricks that he can pull in that short yes. amount of time. Uh, he's thinking it through and like when he says things because he could because he knows she can't see him, he'll like say things and then like see like he has that face like like he's waiting to see how yeah. it landed you know what i mean it's great because he's being manipulative but we can see it more clearly now because 
he's hiding behind the door so we can see the actual what's going across his face while he's doing it. And at first he's like, I th- think I'm hurt real bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I need a doctor. Yeah, which is so funny because that's exactly what he didn't want to do for Danny. Uh, it's great. And she's she doesn't want to do it. And he's like, listen, if you let me out of here, I'll forget the whole goddamn thing. I'll be like, it never happened. Right. And that's yeah. not working either. And he's like, I'm going to go take Danny down the mountain. I'll call for help. And he's like, when I'll bring back a doctor or something. Yeah. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Why don't you go check out the snow cat and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> and yeah. he starts laughing and it's great. And that, uh, like that under angle shot, another, like this really great video. If you ever want to look it up, you probably might've seen it already of Stanley Kubrick finding that shot on the day. Oh, with his, no, he's got the, his, oh, it's great. He's got the little the little viewfinder and he's like trying to figure out how to shoot that scene. And he's, he's looking at it. He's like, maybe you can play out in a medium. And then you kind of see him look at the floor. And then he like goes up down on the floor and he's pointing it up at Jack. And he's like, try this, Jack, try this. And Jack's doing at it, but he's looking dead on. He's looking like he's looking through the door at her. And he's like, Jack, do you think maybe you could find a way of not looking at her while you do it and look more down the whole time? And then, like, that's the shot, basically. And so this great video of him, like, you just watch Kubrick find that iconic shot in the moment. It's pretty great. That's, yeah. Because it wasn't storyboarded. Stanley Kubrick didn't do a lot of storyboarding. Um, he was the kind of person who, well, part of why some of his movies, they, they filmed for incredibly long hours. And I think uh, Eyes Wide Shut at the time had the longest shoot yeah, in uh, history. You know, because he would he would do stuff like show up on the day and it's like, all right, we're doing we're doing these uh, scenes today. I don't know how we're going to fill them. So we'll like we're going to spend the whole first half of the day rehearsing and then we'll film it in the afternoon because he was like, you know, for all the 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 flack and praise he gets for being like this genius perfectionist. I mean, I think he's very talented, obviously, but like he was just kind of figuring it out as he went. A lot of the times he just had very, very good instincts and like knew what worked and what didn't. So like. Watching him find that shot, looking up at him, it's great. It's such a great, it's such a great little moment. I'm glad someone captured it on film because you see him just like thinking it through, problem solving, and then getting down on the floor and being like, "Oh, this works. Let's try this." And it's like one of the most iconic shots in the movie. Like it's oh, great. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, and then so she goes and finds the uh, the radio and the snowcat have been. Uh, disabled because he's preventing he, them from he leaving. Thought it through. He thought it's premeditated. Yes. This is premeditated. Yes, and then then we get the scene later when 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 Jack is woken up in the pantry by Mister Grady on the other side of the door, and Mister Grady has another kind of continuation of the conversation in the red room. It's like it seems like uh, your wife got the better of you, and he's like, just give me one more chance. Yeah. You know, like, I'll, I'll take care of it. He's like, are you sure? You know, we and the others, the others, whoever the fuck the others are, the other ghosts are like, we, we're starting to think you don't have the stomach for it. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, just give me one more chance. And then, and then I here's fear the fear you will have to deal with this matter most harshly. Yeah. And so then there's the scene where uh, either the ghost of Grady or uh, Jack's subconscious, however you want to think about it, lets him out of the room. Have you heard Uh-oh. the theory of uh, like, so the, there is a, you know, a theory for the ones who believe that there are, you know, either no ghosts or very minimal ghosts in the thing of who, uh, who unlocks the door. Have you heard that? Um, maybe you t- tell me. It, 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 there are some people who think that it's Danny. No, because there it's because it's not That's Wendy, so, so it can't be anybody else. So it, like they they t- so the the thing that I saw that implies that Danny's the one who does it is that um, Danny realizes or Tony, you know, Danny's subconscious realizes that he's going to need to confront his father, so he's the one who unlocks it and then That's runs stupid. back to nope. the. No, that's so dumb. It's so dumb. It's that's so, pretty dumb. It's like the one thing that kind of makes the whole, um, the whole like, oh, there's no supernatural stuff at all. Like, there's only minimal supernatural stuff going on. It's like the one thing that the kind, like, you can kind of get ambiguous with some of it. 
But that's yeah. the part where I'm like, you lost me completely. Yeah, either uh, either there's a ghost. I believe Danny did that shit. <laughs> yeah, either there's a ghost that lets him out, or like he used a sort of telepathic shining power to like subconsciously let him let himself out of the room. And by subconsciously, I mean he externalizes it to someone else because he's still not aware that he has this power. Yeah. Right. So he gets let out of the room. Well, and this because is we never we... actually see the ghost of Grady. We just hear the echo. And so like, it's, it's pretty, it, you can, because it's disembodied for us and for Jack, we can, yeah, we don't just, see him on yeah. the other side, which is but, cool. I think that's very it's, smart. It's good. It's a good thing because we, we can just sort of imagine that this is like what's happening internally with Danny and Tony at times. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's good. Okay, so someone says, uh, pretty sure those locks are only to keep people from getting in. The door has a push release that he's holding that opens the door. He tries to press it to get out, but it doesn't work. Like The implication is that he's locked in. Otherwise, he would have just pressed that thing to get out and then go assault his wife. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like That, that push release, he, he's he's like holding on to it. Like He tried to press it, and it didn't work, and now he's just holding on to it. It's something to hold on to. Like, I think if, if that was all it took, that's he would have just gotten out and killed Wendy. That lock, it, it must be that that lock that they've emphasized with the close-up shot is enough to, like, prevent him from getting out. Yeah. I think it has to be that way. But I, in general, yes, usually there's a push release inside to prevent that sort of thing. Um, but apparently the, the lock has made that impossible. Uh, thank you, Kevo, for the super chat. I appreciate it. Um, Yes, uh, there's been some talk about how charming the film is in a way that like doesn't feel dated. It feels like timeless because yeah, I think I would agree with that. Because I, mean, I mean, everything is everything's done practically, so there's no CGI to be like poorly done. You know what I mean? Like like they actually poured a bunch of blood out of that elevator shaft. You know what I mean? And yeah. Like oh, well, not blood, but you know what I mean? Yeah, they, like, yeah, they, yeah. It they, looks like blood though. It's very good blood i think yeah you know all the stuff is done and there's a lot of precision as as was mentioned in the chat and the camera work and stuff like that like they took the time to get it right you know with the dialogue with the camera work with the set design it's like a lot of thought and care went into every aspect and it shows and it holds up because you can pick at it for like years later and be like oh that's a great detail i never noticed before that's a great detail oh look at that that's a nice deliberate choice yeah you know, like it was all it was all thought through um Danny, this is when Danny has the thing where he's screaming red rum yeah. and she wakes up and she's, she wakes up, hugs him like, what's wrong? Looks in the mirror, sees murder in the mirror. Oh my God. And it snap zooms and she goes, ah! and there's a great like musical cue to accompany it. That's really funny. And then, but like right when that happens, the ax comes on the door. And so it's like, you know, it's a nice, it's like, he's trying to warn her that it's coming. Right. Yeah. And so he comes in he goes, honey, I'm home. And he's quoting sitcoms and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> they go into the they go into the bathroom and uh, she gets Danny out the window and he kind of slides down the snowbank to the ground but the the window's like kind of stuck from yeah. the ice and so she can't get out of it and she's like run Danny run and so she's trapped in the bathroom and he comes in and he does uh now he's like really hamming it up it's great and he's he's like little pigs little pigs <laughs> yeah he does the like he's he's kind of reverting to all these childlike things in terms of saying nursery nursery rhymes and like he was kind of like dismissive of television earlier when he's like oh it's okay he saw it on the television you know he thinks of himself as yeah. this writer not interested well, this in is, childish this is things. one of the one of the interesting points is that this is one of because the, there's a lot of television there's a lot of cartoons and everything but this is one of the points where the the fairy tales come back yeah uh, and and the, the way that, yeah yeah, yeah and, well. No, that's the three little pigs. Right? Oh, the three little, yeah, blah, 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 you know. What yeah, I'm but like, it's where the fairy tales, you know, come back uh, mm -hmm. into play rather than just like the cartoon. Although I do love when, uh, when they're watching the, the Roadrunner cartoon before she goes to talk to Jack and it, it's saying, uh, you know, the coyote's after you. If he catches you, you're through. Is yeah, is great. Like I like little yeah, details. Little just details little like that detail. is just really, really yeah. good. Um, but yeah, I like I, the fairy tales come back into play here, which is interesting because I think one of the points that was made about the in the, the article that I was reading about the fairy tales versus the cartoons is that the cartoons don't really tend to have a um like a like a over o an overt danger. 
that is surmounted by, you know, something like, you know, the three little pigs surmounting the danger of the wolf or Little Red Riding Hood, come, you know, tricking the wolf. They, they more have like the cartoonish kind of violence. Uh, and this is sort of like a, uh, a return to that idea that Danny can kind of make it out of there. It's just it, it's an interesting little note about yeah. the uh, the but introduction of it. I'm not sure if it's, you know, like, Probably Donald's not angry entirely. In the chat, says he used the safety handle to open the door. No, he doesn't. We don't see him open the door. We see the lock get lifted from the pantry, but he doesn't press the release. We cut before he opens the door. So, yeah, um, we, we hear the lock from the pantry get. Released. Yeah, His but we, we, yeah. he doesn't press the release on the door. We cut before that happens, um, and then so he he starts hacking at the door with the axe, and she's screaming, and oh. it's going to be terrible and then he pokes his head through and he says here's johnny fun little fact about <laughs> that iconic moment is that uh stanley kubrick didn't understand the reference when he did it that wasn't like scripted but he like yeah Jack he, he added lived that in the in. uk stanley kubrick he yeah and uh, he yeah. didn't watch enough tv to know that that was a johnny carson reference and so he was like what is that what are you doing he's like oh it's like johnny carson he's like Oh, it's like it's a reference, and he's like, "Yeah," and he's like, "Well," and then he like looked into it, and once he realized what it was, he's like, "Oh, okay, we'll keep that take." <laughs> it's, it's just it's a funny, it's a little bit of improv, and I, I like the idea of Stanley Kubrick. Like, it's one of the more iconic things from the movie. And I just like the idea of him being like, "What is that? I don't get it." Yeah. <laughs> well, why'd you say, "Here's Johnny"? I don't. What, what's that supposed to be? <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, and so I, like then she cuts him with the knife. Uh, he, because he reaches in to try to open the door and then yeah, she slashes him and then right before he's about to get in and kill her dead um the 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 snow cat from dick Holleran shows up so I, we should mention that from the time when danny sent him a message uh across across the country saying help i'm in trouble look at this horrible thing that happened to me uh he's been working his way back he flies back to denver and though the storm is crazy he he finds someone a friend of his who he knows in town who rents who he rents a snow cat from and he's like while we've been intercutting with all this other stuff he yeah. finds his way back to the hotel and he arrives just in the nick of time uh they kind of stop in their tracks and he's like what the fuck is that sound because you know they haven't heard anything like that in a long time which i, I like that detail they're like yeah. holy shit people you know <laughs> like if you have it's like they've been alone for so long that it like it like they freeze in their tracks so he goes to to see what that is uh, Danny hides in a like a kitchen cabinet in the kitchen area of the yeah, hotel. Yeah, like underneath the the one, yeah one of the little um, rolling things for room service or something like that. Uh, right. Yeah, but this and so this is interesting because this is when Dick Halloran comes in and spends some time. You know, very mm. very uh, I don't know what's the word not casually but not he's not really like on guard when he comes in uh, but he's just asking yeah, he's like, just like Hello? is anybody here and this is yeah. a scene that apparently pisses off a lot of people who are fans of the novel so I'm just gonna real quick tell you what happens in the novel with Dick Halloran sure. when he shows up Go for it. Um, Dick is attacked by topiary animals. The the animals yes, the I, animals I outside the maze come to life because uh, there's giant like rabbits and dogs and lions or something that are you know trimmed into the hedges and mm -hmm. they come to life and attack him. Well, there's no maze in the novel, right? There's just the hedge animals. Is it? I, yeah. There's no maze. There's no yeah. maze. Yeah, it's just the hedge animal. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Which is so, such an improvement. I can't even begin to describe it. Can you imagine if, if there, there was, was no maze. maze in this movie, but there were giant like CGI topiary animals running around? Oh, it, it, they'd be puppets at this point, wouldn't they? Like in 1980? Uh, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, and it, they would look. I mean, it would look so fucking stupid. Stop motion, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they attack Dick, and um, Jack but attacks him because Jack doesn't use an axe in the uh, book. He uses a croquet mallet or it, I much think it's, scarier it's called yeah. a roke mallet and roke is just american croquet um so very yeah, cool very cool but he and lives he he, he, he lives. gets injured but he lives because presumably because hedge animals don't have teeth like or because the, the plot wants it to. That's yeah, how a like, lot of Stephen King stuff yeah, works. I, because because uh, in the in the novel, I do know this that um, uh, uh, Jack is after Danny and he has him cornered. And then like right before he's about to kill him, possessed as the hotel, he like 
miraculously and out of nowhere regains control of himself long enough to be like, go, get out of here. And then yeah. he like runs away. So it's like, oh, so just for no reason at all, he just doesn't kill him. Like that's that's Stephen King for you right there. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, so yeah, people Jack, are quite Jack lives. Uh, yeah. Jack, I'm sorry, not Jack. Uh Dick Halloran lives because he lives. Dick Halloran lives because uh Jack doesn't finish him off. Uh and he assumes the the giant hedges will do that for him, I suppose. But either way, people are um very pe- there there are people who are very upset, who get very upset that Dick Halloran uh is not it, it does not but survive dies, yes. the film. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, you know, as an ad, like, you know, they're welcome to be precious about the Shining book, but the Shining book is lame compared to the movie. And I'm sorry. I, 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 no, I'm with, I don't so have I'm with you on that one. But like, so I just want to well, point the other out thing is, that in the novel, um, nobody dies except Jack. Yeah. There, there is no real consequence for any of this stuff that happened. Danny, Wendy and Dick all make it out perfectly fine and and jack kind of sacrifices himself yeah so. he redeems himself at the end and blows the hotel up with the boiler <laughs> so yeah so um but a pin i understand one. being upset that dick halloran dies because he's like one of the best characters and he came all this way to try to save this little boy he's a very no, I, I understand being upset no, that I, dick halloran is dead I, like I, as hey, a good yeah, character it's, you know what i'm I, saying is Yes, I know what you're saying. I'm saying something else. Okay. So, like, clearly it, it makes sense. Like, you know, like, it sucks that he dies. It's, he has kind of, he has a very tragic ending. And it is kind of, like, abrupt. He came all this way and he just gets killed. But one of the things that it helps the movie out with is that now the movie has fucking teeth. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. like don't you want that in your horror movie? Don't you want, like, there to be, like, consequences and, like, horrible things that happen? You know what I mean? Like, th- now the movie is like, oh, fuck. He, he came all this way. For, like to try to do something heroic and he just got fucking murdered it's like now i actually like first time watching it i remember thinking oh like maybe they don't survive maybe like you know maybe wendy dies or something like you know what i mean it's like it it it, it shows you that like it, we're we're willing to go there and i, I think a lot of horror, horror movies make the mistake of not actually going there and not actually having the teeth uh, like letting it be as horrific yeah, no, I, I'm with you. And I just, for me, I just don't really, um, the loyalty to the character from the book is, um, it, it's, it's a straight, like, I, I, you're welcome to be that way. It's just, it seems strange to me when, like, I, I just, narratively, it seems to serve a much better purpose that he doesn't survive, right? Like, because yes. now, now we have... Well, now we're setting up, you know, Danny's just seen the only friend that he really knows, right? Like, he hasn't had mm-hmm. very many friends. This is the no. only guy who's ever really explained what's going on. He's just seen him murdered. This is the only guy he's ever been able to talk with about his shining. Yeah. But like, he gives him a name for it. He explains that, that like, there are more people like him in the world and that, like, you know... Because from this point, Danny has been like secretive about it because he feels like it's dangerous. Like his gut instinct tells him not to tell people about what Tony tells him because it's dangerous and like people will see him as weird and all that sort of stuff. This is the only person he has that sort of connection to. And he's nice to him. He's friendly, gives him ice cream, kind of like tells him all this stuff like that, tries to give him some advice. And then he's like, help me, Mr. Holler, and I'm in trouble. And he comes all this way to try and save him and meets a tragic end for it but like he's like the most heroic character in the movie he's great i i I love him he's such a great character i mean it's simple it's not complicated and we don't get his entire backstory we don't get backstories for the characters really outside of jack and a little bit of like what happened a couple months ago or years ago right yeah like but like it's it's enough for halloran to be like a really kind of he's a He's an you know, endearing it's, it's, guy. He's an endearing character. Yeah. yeah. And he's he's I, he's got a uh, you know a twinge of the heroic in him. You know, like he yeah. he didn't have to come all this way to no, check up on this kid, he and he did. Yeah. And it is it is sad. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, and horrifying. In horror, yeah, horrifying. It's like that's really what it get, boils down to is that in the the version in the novel is pretty much the same, except that he doesn't, like, there's no bite to it, and he doesn't, you know... Mm -hmm. He gets chased by animals, he gets wounded, but He gets incapacitated by animals, and then, like, he's fine, and they get out of there. 
And yeah, it's just it's just so, not quite as good. Anyway. He, he walks through the empty hotel. He's calling out to people, and Jack comes around the corner and goes, ah, and he stabs him with the axe. And there's something really, there's a really interesting detail about Jack's performance in that moment where, like, he's got his tongue sticking out in, like, a like oddly playful sort of way. Yeah. And then, like, that's really scary to me. You know what I mean? It reminds that me of, like, um, so if you've ever watched doing it with Ovechkin, Lee. like, play hockey, he does that sort of thing. It was like Michael Jordan that used yeah. to do this, too, where he would have his tongue yeah. hanging out when he would do stuff. They'd make it, like, make plays and all that. It's, it reminds me of that, you know? Yeah. So he kills Dick Halloran, and when as soon as he gets stabbed with the axe, Danny screams out. And it's the same shot we see from his original vision. Uh, when he was in the bathroom at the beginning of the movie, which is an interesting little detail. And then one of my favorite shots in the whole movie, after after killing um, Dick Halloran and hearing Danny scream not too far away, the camera's stationary and Jack stands up into frame really slowly. You know the shot I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, it's, it's so, good. so good. And that's when we get the first time we get the Penderecki piece with like the choir going like, like speaking in like whatever that like... The uh, parcel tongue is that what it's called in Harry Potter? Where yeah, they speak like yeah, snakes. Yeah. It's like they're all speaking like that, and that's the first time we hear that. It's like this chorus of demons now that it's like finally been unleashed, sort of thing. And the way he stands up ominously into the frame, oh my god, it's so good. And then he runs after Danny, and we're chasing after Danny. Meanwhile, Wendy is out out of the bathroom, and she's running, trying to catch up with him, you know. And on the way, she's seeing all sorts of weird shit. This is when she sees the flood of blood from the elevator. She sees uh, an old man getting a blowjob from someone in a bear costume. A bear you costume know, with like a... As you do. With a butt flap that's like wide open. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just, um, I mean, you know. That's odd. I like... like a, she this sees is a little a, appeal a whole... to Stephen King's uh, novel and his weird sexual kinks that he works into almost everything. But that's one of the ghosts from the novel that I always take issue with, who chases Danny around talking about how much he wants his little boy cock. Like, Wait, what? That's in the novel? Yeah, that's in the novel. Oh, that's weird. I don't yeah, like that. that's one of the ghosts who chases Danny around in the novel. Is is yeah. like it's, it's like I think it's a, a man. He calls him a dog man. Um, yeah. And he talks about how he can smell his, you know, like it, it, it's it's gross. It, it's really fucking gross. And so that that, that character gross. stays in the movie, but is used in a much more uh, abstract. Sort yeah. Of way. Well, then the other people like to point out that like when Danny, after he has the initial fainting spell in the very beginning of the movie, when he's laying on the bed, he's laying on a um, like a stuffed bear, big stuffed bear. And then there's the bear guy later. Yeah. People like to try to draw comparisons because Danny's also not wearing pants in the scene where he's laying on the bed talking to the doctor. So I don't know if there's any sort of connection there. I didn't know that that was a thing that happened in the book. That's oh, I, I could have sworn we've talked about that before. Yeah, no, like that happens. That happens. Well, I know. In the book. Like I'm aware of the the child sex orgy in it, so it, it doesn't surprise me that he's capable of such things. But I didn't know that. Yeah, was the thing he in the he planning. has a real problem with the sexual uh, crap in almost every single one of his books that I've read. Anyway, like Carrie has mm -hmm. some weird shit with that too. It's yeah. like like the the full circle at the end of the book of Carrie is that the girl who lent her boyfriend to her for the night gets her period over Carrie's grave or something like that. It's it's yeah, it's weird. weird. It's really, really weird. Um, <laughs> Someone said distant wood chipper noises. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I I do wonder when I hear about some of the more unsavory side of Stephen King's works, why he's quite earned the kind of almost wholesome reputation he has in the broader culture. It's just like, oh, he's made a whole bunch of horror movies. I mean, horror books. And everyone likes him. And it's like, he's a fucking weirdo. Yeah. Like he's, he's in a yeah. in a not good way in a lot of ways. Also, like, I don't know. if he <laughs> That he hates the Shining movie and sees nothing of value in it is kind of like, man, I don't really trust your artistic taste, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah, I... I... Anyway, I uh, they're, they're, everyone's running around. He's chasing after Danny. Uh, somewhere in this point, he runs into the maze, and then we see the, the the magical entrance to the maze that wasn't there before. He runs into the maze. He's chasing after him. Eventually, Wendy sees Dick Halloran's body, and there's another snap zoom on that, which is pretty funny because we already got that reveal, but <laughs> he threw a snap zoom on it. 
when she sees it, which I don't know, it, it just lands comedically for me, but I always like it. Then we're in the maze and he's running around and then we get probably one of the more interesting resolutions, I think, of this type of story is that Danny, every, people have supernatural powers in this, but how does he how does he get away from his dad and he survives? He just outsmarts him. He did, I love that, dude. When I was watching it with it's Bob, cool. with my girlfriend last night, and I, she was just like, smart kid. When she when he starts going back over his own mm-hmm. footsteps, I'm like, mm-hmm. exactly. And this is yeah. why I like the fairy tale shit comes back here, right? Because like this is straight out of a out, out of a fairy tale kind of thing, you know. The kid outsmarts the evil monster, and mm-hmm. you know, sort of lives to you know lives to become a full grown person. Is so good i love that he does this it's i'm I'm glad that he doesn't rely on some sort of supernatural ability like in a lesser movie it'd be like he's finally becoming more powerful and he uses Uh supernatural powers to kill his dad or or like stop Uh his dad that would be kind of lame if a movie did that if a a movie Mm, yeah just hypothetical hypothetical, a hypothetical movie it's a really smart move the kid makes and um it's very impressive and i like the way the actor danny lloyd plays it Really good stuff. He outsmarts his dad. And uh, this is another thing that's going to be very important because we are shortly coming up at the point where we're going to finally talk about Dr. Sleep in depth. Uh, But the last thing I want to... One of the last things I want to signpost before we move on to do that is as he escapes his dad and outsmarts him and and, and, uh, Jack's running around going, Danny boy! And he's just he's he's kind of devolved into just guttural yelling at this point. And he's yeah. swinging the axe around, and it's shot very like German expressionisty. He finally, Danny works his way out of the maze, and he sees Wendy, and she says, "Danny," and he yells, "Mom," which means he's back. Yeah, right. He he's he's come back. Like it was Tony before, but now the resolution to that is that after that he's like he's finally emerged out of it. He's escaped from his evil father. And he's returned to his normal self so he can reunite with his mom. And then they embrace. Then they get into the snowcat and leave Jack to freeze to death in the maze. A uh, little little tag at the end with him always being in the hotel aside. We can talk I, more about that when we talk about themes. Yes. I love that ending. It's great. Oh, yeah. It's great. I like that it has something like a happy ending. I think it works. I, I mean, it, it would have been pretty fucking brutal if he killed his kids his yeah. kid and his wife you know what i mean but it's got the kind of happy ending that feels earned and i like the resolution of of like danny retreating into tony and then coming out at the end it's really good it would be a shame if a sequel to this movie implied something to the opposite effect and kind of undid <laughs> that arc that we experienced at the end of the movie it'd be a shame if that happened well wouldn't it just she i think good thing they never made one right <laughs> Oh no! They, I think four and a half hours in, maybe we should finally start talking about Doctor Sleep. What do you think, Hugh? Oh boy, let's do it. Let's get so. into it. Let's jump right on in. Doctor Sleep opens, sort of With, where The Shining left off. <laughs> well, the Doctor Sleep opens um, with no interesting helicopter shot, no sequence, none of that. Um, it opens, and we see a little girl in a trailer park. And her mom's like, where are you going? She's like, I'm going to go pick some flowers. And it's like, all right, well, don't be too long. The year is 1980. And I the girl... Did, yes, significant the gir- year. Yeah, that's when the movie came out. Oh, my goodness. And so uh, <laughs> the girl is walking along, and she runs into Rebecca Ferguson, who is wearing a stupid hat. She will wear the stupid <laughs> hat for most of the movie. She will wear the stupid um, hat for the whole movie, and she'll even introduce herself by saying, it's a magic hat. In fact, you know, my friends call me Rose the Hat. Oh, my goodness. Oh, That's wow, I'm so spooked. From the book. Oh, my Rose God, the... I'm so spooked, Jamie. Oh, dude, she goes it's a by stupid Rose hat. the Hat. It's a stupid hat. And I feel bad for Re- Rebecca Ferguson because I think she's a talented actress, uh, given very little to do or good direction in this film. But she, she, she's been getting she, the, the the shaft a little bit recently. You know, the most recent Mission Impossible movie kind of did her dirty, I think, too. So she, she's not had a great uh, stretch between Doctor Sleep and, and that. But Fallout was pretty fun. So at least there's that. <laughs> Rebecca Ferguson it, it says to this little girl, hi, little girl. And she's got like these big flowers. The girl was picking little baby puny flowers, but she's got some big, pretty ones. She's like, oh, look at these awesome flowers. 
and she's a little hesitant and she's like oh no don't worry i'm, I'm your friend um and he and she's like oh it's a magic cat and then she's like oh like oh what color do you think this flower is and the girl hesitates and she's like no it's okay like you can say i know you know and she says violet and it's like very good so it's like oh this little girl has some sort of nascent shining ability and then uh and very clumsily she's got some friends who are approaching but instead of just walking up normally and actually acting like normal people you know like trying to make the little girl feel at ease you know they just instead of approaching like friends would they just stand ominously at a distance and she's like oh don't worry those are just my friends ignore them it's like well they're being really fucking weird <laughs> like <laughs> anyway and so she's talking to the girl and um the the the, the ominous friends the, an, an eclectic group of weirdos are gathering closer and she's like and then uh R R rose the hat eats one of the flowers and um and she's like no you're not supposed to eat them and she's like oh but you do and like the, the prettier the flowers the the more special the flowers the better they taste like oh my gosh what's gonna happen and then you know she grabs... i know it's a stephen king thing but that's just like that's another one of the because he has another line with her or she, like another weirdly sexual line involving an underaged girl in this mm -hmm. exact movie and it's just like i know he took those directly like i know he took those directly from the book because i it i know stephen king you know <laughs> like i i just i don't i don't like i don't like it there is a sort of weird sexual energy uh in this movie especially with regards to these uh psychic vampires as they turn out to be um they're they're kind of hedonistic and sexual in a way that's not really the same in the shining at all except for when he goes into room 237 but setting that aside oh my god they they grab the girl and oh my god what's going to happen it looks like they're going to eat her or do something scary to her that's that's scary that'd be awful <laughs> and that's our cold open uh Man, my, uh, old old movies didn't rely on cold opens, and it's nice. I wish <laughs> I wish modern horror movies didn't rely on that so much. Instead of like, you know, it's the, it's the like, um, oh, what's his name? The guy from the Rick and Morty, Dan Harmon. He's like, oh, I oh, think yeah. I, I think our story should start where they begin, not where they get interesting. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's our that's our cold open, and then we cut to Danny. And he's, and he's. He's Ewan McGregor around. now. Wait, did we? I, okay, so. Oh no, no, the, we're not. No, he's not Ewan McGregor yet. No, now he's just a weird-looking kid who doesn't look very much like uh, Danny from The Shining. But that's okay. It's hard to do, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, well, I'll probably get the scene order for a lot of this stuff mixed up. But uh, the the general gist is that we see Danny riding around in his tricycle. And this is a recreation of the scene where he's riding around and he goes up to room 237 and instead of either the doors being closed like they were the first time he does it or the door being open with a key in it playing, and the lights on. The key in it, like the, the door is like slowly opening by itself like by itself and there's just a darkness, a dark abyss and it's like, oh, cool relying on darkness to be scary something that the original movie didn't do like we're just gonna do a lot of this where it's just like oh let's do the generic thing instead um yeah. so they've rewritten how that scene goes oh, a spooky lady from the bath is there and he wakes up and he's like oh my god that sure was a scary dream then he goes to the bathroom in the middle of the night and there's a there's the spooky bath lady is in his bathtub as well so he has both a waking uh like a sleeping nightmare and a waking nightmare not really sure. Yeah. Uh, what, what uh, to... So what do we, what do we think? So that, but the... then he sees her and he gets freaked out and he goes into the hallway and she's turning the door like she's gonna come out and get him and he pees himself, which is like, I guess adding insult to injury. <laughs> <laughs> and then his his mom shows up and she's like, "Daddy, what's wrong?" Uh, it's probably a good time to highlight that I think the woman they got to play young Wendy is good at the part. Like I, I believe yeah. her. Yeah, she's... Like, she she gets the voice down. She doesn't look like Shelley Duvall, but few people look like Shelley Duvall. Yeah, she gets the voice and the cadence and the energy right, and I'm like, okay, that's good. Yeah. The little kid playing Danny is just kind of a wet blanket. You know, he's not yeah, nearly he's, as good. He's as... very. Yeah, he's he's not 
He's not bringing the same energy, man. He's, yeah. He just doesn't have it. No. So we, so we learn that essentially he's been having, um, he's, he's, he's still traumatized and recovering from what happened so many years ago, right? Yes. Which makes a certain enough amount of sense. But he is experiencing waking visions of the old lady from the bath for some reason that's not entirely clear. One of the next scenes we see is of young Danny talking to Dick Halloran on the bench at some park somewhere. And we're like, Dick Halloran, aren't you supposed to be dead? So he's talking to Dick Halloran, and Dick Halloran's like, oh, how's it going, Danny? And first of all, his actor is not doing a good job of conveying Scatman Crothers' energy either. No, <laughs> not particularly. It, he, he does seem like he's trying to be fair mm. to him, he's, he does seem like he is at least putting in the It's effort. not the actor, it's the directing. It, it, it's yeah, all the directing It's the, and the directing, writing. and it's just... It, the directing, the writing, and it's just... It, it's not easy to recreate somebody who had such an iconic personality, you know? Yes. Like, it, it's, not, it's not an easy thing to do. So I, I don't feel... I, I don't feel uh, like it's the actor's fault entirely no. and he, he does I'm, more he and more can. i'm inclined to, to to blame bad performances on the director than the actors because i've seen enough i've seen this enough times where an actor like kind of sucks in something and you see him as something else and they're really good and it's like oh that was probably just the director then yeah with exceptions for people like gal gadot i think in general she's just well yeah jason momoa even like he's not <laughs> he, he's um, not particularly good at uh delivering lines or um emoting <laughs> Great, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't have called him bad. I don't know about you. Who the scat man? No, guy? no, um, no. I'm talking about a uh, uh, Jason Momoa. In wait, in what? In general. I, you haven't seen Fast and Furious X. No, but I've seen other things. You you implied like he's bad in everything. So I I have not it. seen. I, I liked him in Game of Thrones season one where he barely talked. That was that's okay. pretty much the only one that I've ever seen with him that I've enjoyed his performance. Fair enough. Anyway, he is talking to Dick Halloran on the bench and Halloran's like, Oh, how's it going, Danny? You know, like you still having, you're still having recurring dreams and nightmares from that place. Are you? And he says things to the effect of like, well, you know, that, that place was feeding on your light. You know, your dad, it, it fed on your dad's dark and it fed on your light. And they're, they're starving. They closed down the Overlook. That's what we learned. The Overlook is closed now. They closed it down immediately after the, the happenings of the original film. And now those ghosts are starving because they don't have people's energy to feed on anymore. Now, I, I hate this already. Because there is nothing to imply any of this in the original film. <laughs> and I think already with how this conversation plays out, we're starting to character assassinate Batman Brothers. Because okay. uh, Dick Halloran, I should say. Because I don't remember every line, but what Dick Halloran basically says in this scene in Doctor Sleep is that that place fed on people's shining energy. And it fed on yeah. people... The shine. It was especially dangerous for a place like you. And it's like, oh, well, then how come in the original movie you acted like the place wasn't dangerous at all and didn't give him any warning at all, really, about what he was up against? Yeah, here? well, because so the reason there is that is because that's from the book. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. But yeah, you no, know what I'm saying. Though. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you're saying. And it, it's even it is a bit of a problem in the book because Dick Halloran in the book does say the same basically the same things that he says to Danny in the movie right so he said mm -hmm. like even if we're going off of this is a sequel to like let's just reimagine the original shining movie but if it took place like the novel right dick halloran yeah. still told him not to be scared and not to worry and just stay mm -hmm. out of room 237 and you'll be okay it's like, well, if you believe that this is a place that is especially dangerous for you and it's going to try and suck your soul, you think you might say something more than that. So, um, yeah, he's that kind of undermines his heroic, heroic qualities already off the bat, because now the Overlook was a place that was especially dangerous for people who have the Shining and it fed on your 
light, good energy. And it, and uh, and I so I watched the director's cut. For those who don't know, there is a three-hour director's cut of Doctor Sleep. I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it because essentially everything about it that was added is worse. Um, one of the things that was added is there's a line when they're on the park bench where little Danny says, my dad tried to kill me. And he goes, oh, you got to understand that that was just the place. You know, he had some good in him, too. Wow. Now, how does that how does that strike you? Hugh? Oh, my fucking God, dude. Oh, my God. I like I knew you had to know that that was going to happen because he's doing Mike Flanagan is doing his absolute darndest to, you know, make Stephen King feel good. Right. He wants mm-hmm. to he wants to keep this project alive and he needs he wants Stephen King's approval for it. Right. So, of course, he's going to include that scene where he corrects the. He corrects the record as far on as Stephen Jack, King yes. on Jack, as far as Stephen King is concerned. That is nowhere present at all in the in the Well, I guess you could interpret it that way in the original movie. If you read the book and did that, like did that extra work, but that's not really what the movie is getting at. It's clearly not what Stanley Kubrick found interesting no. about the the no, I, I think of the original Shining. This is this is though he is clearly trying to do more justice to the book. What this is is a sequel to the movie. There's, there is so much evidence to that that you can't pretend it isn't. Right? Well, he, he wants like, to have both, right? Like, he wants to have both. And he so if you're familiar with the phrase splitting the baby, this is the textbook example of that. Because by trying to do both, all you end up with two halves of a dead baby. Because that's what Dr. Sleep is. It's two halves of a dead baby. So <laughs> if you think about it as a sequel to The Shining... Now, Dick Holleran is a terrible person because he told Danny that it's not real. It's just pictures in a book and you don't have anything to worry about and there's nothing to be afraid of. When actually that this place is trying to suck his life force out of him and it could cause all sorts of evil things to happen. Just doesn't give him any warning about that at all. Even though now he's like, no, it's very dangerous for people like you. It's like, well, yeah, maybe you should have said that last time. And then also in the original, Jack... It's made so abundantly clear he doesn't love his family. He doesn't love him. No, he's he not a good person. He's not. No, in he's the, not a good... The he resents version his... of this story, he is not a good person. He resents no. his family for what he perceives as bringing him low, right? And he could achieve so much more. He says this many times. He could, he could achieve anything he ever wanted if only he didn't have Wendy and Danny dragging him down. Yes. Yep. He resents having a family because it's ruined his life prevented him from being all he could have been you know he so there's something i want to bring up um i don't know hugh if you've ever seen this but there's a stand-up comedy special i believe it's on netflix from neil brennan who was the he's a comedian he was also the co-creator of the Chappelle show with david Chappelle. he david Chappelle. i don't know very formal um he directed a lot of those classic Chappelle show skits neil brennan that is he has a stand-up special called three mics and the, the, the general gimmick of the show is that he has a microphone for one-liners. He has a microphone for like normal stand-up or classic stand-up. And he has a microphone for personal stories. And they're spread out along the stage. And he'll go into a section of the special where he's at one of the microphones and he's doing one-liners or whatever. And then when he's at the end of like whatever, seven minutes sequence, whatever it is, the lights go down. And then he comes, lights come back up and he's at one of the different microphones. And now he's in that section, right? It's a very yeah. interesting kind of dramatic device. But what you learn about him in the course of telling his personal life stories is that he's spent a lot of his adult life suffering from like clinical depression for which he takes medication for and all that sort of stuff. And the way he describes it, it's like he doesn't have the shelving in his like in, internally for happiness. Like he has nowhere to put it. Like he... He can't experience <laughs> happiness itself, right? He just doesn't have okay. the in, he doesn't have the infrastructure for it, is the way he describes it. And he's talking about his childhood, and his dad was a like diagnosed narcissist. He has narcissistic personality disorder, like in the extreme. And he had all these negative experiences growing up with his dad for reasons that are not hard to imagine. Um, but throughout his life, he would be told by people 
that like, oh, of course your dad loves you. He'd be like, I don't think my dad loves me. And everyone would be like, no, of course he does. He just, you know, he has different ways of showing it or whatever, or, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. And when he was an adult, he, he, he hadn't talked to his dad in years. Finally talked to him. And he said to his dad, he's like, you know what? When I was a kid, I never felt like you loved us. And he was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, that's, and, that's Neil, not... <laughs> and Neil Brennan says, like, honestly, that was one of the most freeing things to hear. Because I spent my whole life thinking, deeply suspecting that he didn't love us. But, but to yeah, have everyone tell me sense. throughout my life that, of course he does, of course he does, of course he does. Because all parents love their children. And it turns out, like, no he actually didn't and like it's like oh well i wasn't crazy for thinking that and it explains a lot honestly yeah and i when i think about that and i think about this scene where scatman where he's like my dad tried to kill me and my mom and he's like oh well you know that was that was the that was the hotel you know he had some good yeah. in him you gotta you gotta remember of like of course he loved you he was just you know possessed by a hotel and it's like man if if we're treating this like a sequel to The Shining, I think that's either just well, first of all, he doesn't really know his dad. If we're meant to believe that this is actually Dick Halloran and not just um Danny's subconscious, like he doesn't really know this. Yeah. And no. also like this just well, isn't help it's like it's not true and it's not helpful, is what I'm getting at. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I I, I see what you're getting. So the only thing that is, you know, maybe, Jamie. Dick Halloran, uh, Dick Halloran's spirit, who he's speaking to, uh, while living in Danny's head, has um, cycled through the file cabinets that Danny keeps of all his memories and, and okay. such, uh, and has, has determined that actually Jack did love Danny all along, um, and it was just alcohol in the hotel and the evil spirits of the hotel that made him into such an asshole. M yeah. Maybe. Maybe that's what happened. Don't know where, don't know where I would get such an idea. Yeah. So from. when he's like, "Oh, you know, uh, it it just it feels like unhelpful cope. Like you probably shouldn't tell the kid this. I mean, you don't have to be like, no, he didn't love you. He was evil, you know. But you can like, I don't know. You just it seems like telling him something that just flat out isn't true. Um. So yeah. I didn't like that. And then when he's describing The Shining and stuff like that, it's we're going in this direction. It's all about like energy and life force and like. Feeding, feeding on other people's life force and stuff like that. So the hotel is something that feeds on people with The Shining. Um, eventually, we will learn that the people that killed that kid are like quasi... I'm getting ahead of myself, but we've already mentioned it. They're quasi-immortal Shining vampires who feed on the spirits of kids with The Shining because that gives them life force and that allows them to live near infinitely, assuming they get enough of it. And so already we're 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 trying to set the record straight, as you said. We're trying to like clear the record on what The Shining is, what the hotel is, what Jack was like, you know, what you know, all this stuff that it's just it's There's totally no under. It's it's and undermining the entirety of the original film in order to recreate some kind of it's it's almost like to wear the original film's identity as a mask for Stephen King's sequel, which builds upon the crappier world building and, and mythology of the original yes. novel. So, yeah, it, it's and, yeah, really annoying. It's, it's very it frustrating. Tries to, it tries to do both, and but like it's, it's, in, like it's incomprehensible as a sequel. It doesn't make any sense as a sequel. It ruins so much of what worked in the original. And it's just not coherent as a movie because it tries to do both. We'll get more into it. But Halloran is like, yeah, it's just uh, so what you got to do, you see, because the, the demons, the ghosts in the hotel are like tr people who feed on your energy. And because there's no one at the hotel anymore, there's no one to feed on. So now they're they're They followed you here. It's like fucking OK. Yeah, sure. Whatever. That, yeah, That's because that makes sense. Yeah. The ghosts can just leave the, the hotel. <sighs> So, and follow you. Even, and they're just the, trying to even they're trying the, to suck sorry. their soul. <laughs> yeah, even trying to suck this boy's soul. Uh even okay, but even in the context of like so if the Overlook Hotel was the entity, right? And this is what I always interpreted when I was read when I had read the book, I was like, okay, the hotel, the ghosts in the hotel aren't 
their own entities, right? They are facets of the hotel that can be used by the hotel, like, you know, like a limb or a tooth or something, right? That mm-hmm. In order to devour the people with the shine, right? So, like, the hotel itself was the sentient bit, not the ghosts of the people who died there. The ghosts of the people yeah. who died there become essentially the slaves of the hotel. Well, uh, it, that was that was what I interpreted yeah. it as. This is throwing that away and basically saying, no, actually the ghosts are just like, they were living in the hotel and now that their home is shut down, they're they have no just... One to feed on, they have no one to so feed gotta... on, so they're going to follow you somehow, Danny specifically? Like Also, but yeah, so it rejects... Everything about the original, which, as we spent four hours talking about, is pretty compelling, um, and replaces it with something incoherent and contradictory. It's not even just that it's different or that it contradicts the original. It, it, what this is doesn't make sense because he says, on the one hand, that these ghosts are like basically equivalent to the vampires. They're like they're like demons. They're like forces of evil who are sucking the soul out of people. But then later. The implication is that, like, you know, when people die, they become ghosts. So, like, are these just the ghosts of people? Or are these, a, like, a different kind of malevolent energy that feeds on the souls of the living, kind of like the, the vampire people do? Like, it, it, you can't do both, man. <laughs> yeah. It drives like, me crazy. Yeah, it, and it's like Eric is saying in the chat right here, it's like if the spirits move, they should never have been held to a location in the first place. Yeah, exactly. The overlook should have no bearing on this whatsoever. The ghosts. Yeah. Are just and also in evil. Yeah. It, they, they shouldn't be able to just go anywhere they want because in traditional sort of ghost lore, and this is very much affirmed by the first movie, it's like their spirit and their, the traces of bad things that happened to them or whatever you may call it linger in the place where they happened. And also so much of this psychic phenomenon is enhanced by the fact that the Overlook is a super special psychic place, you know, built on an Indian burial ground. So there's all sorts of special sacred yeah. psychic energy and all sorts, all the things that have happened have kind of built up this place where like it brings it out of people because the implication in the original is that Danny doesn't have like he is, he's got this little gut instinct he talks to, but he doesn't have visions all the time. You know what I mean? Everything is brought out more. Like Wendy, it's made clear in the original, has some sort of latent ability to shine. But she's saying things like she's probably never seen anything in her life before. You know what I mean? More happens at the Overlook Hotel because it's... Because it's the center. It's like it's like on a piece of magical land. It's It's a a hell mouth. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a a hell mouth. And so the fact that the ghosts are basically equally powerful and they're not constrained to the overlook. And as we'll see throughout this movie, everyone basically has the same level of power in terms of their shining abilities everywhere they go all the time. And there are no special places really, except for the fact that there are ghosts who live there. Like it, we're just yeah. undoing everything well, and about like, the, like the mythology, the world building of the original, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's weird that the, ghosts are even a part of this right because really the main antagonists of the of dr sleep are rose the hat and her boyfriend craw daddy and the rest (laughs) the rest of the little manson family cult that follows them around which we'll get to that because i have some serious uh questions especially regarding the you know the usefulness thing that she uh hits the the 15 year old with right Mm -hmm. but um they are the main antagonists they are spiritual vampires they're not ghosts like they're not ghosts that are wandering around they're tangible they're tangible people uh have shining powers but are kind of they're vampires they're spirit vampires (laughs) they're spirit vampires But, but there's there's no the ghosts are following danny around right like he he talks Mm -hmm. to dick a couple times about how he's like the the bath lady he found her in his bathtub right and mm-hmm. then the guy who said great party isn't it to wendy in the uh original movie danny never saw yeah. that guy you know um <laughs> I, all all of those people uh are following danny around for some reason right um but there are no ghosts out there trying to eat the shine of the vampire people or like there's no ghosts like no, moving you think around. they like, would but yeah, no, and like, none of the ghosts, is... yeah, yeah, none yeah. of the ghosts from the hotel are following Abra. 
Yeah. Like, Even though she's the fucking mecha, like, golden egg of, of Shining the, kids. The, 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 yeah. You'd think that they, if they are, if the ghosts are basically like the vampire people, right? Because they eat the shine, right? That's the whole thing, is that they also eat shine. So yeah, if the so ghosts are I... now cut loose from their home in the hotel, why would they only go after Danny if he yeah. went anywhere that he went? Like, he's in New England now. Right, like we're all the way back in New England, this typical fucking Stephen King setting for every goddamn yeah. book, apart from, <laughs> like, apart probably from The Shining, right? Yeah. It's like we're back in Vermont or wherever. Why would they follow him all the way across the country? They're surely, with the amount of people that we see who shine and the amount of travel that Rose the Hat and her little buddies do across the country, there surely have to be some people who shine out there in the West. They don't have sure, to come I guess, all the way to Vermont. I, yeah, I guess all you all you can really assume is that well, they know Danny, so I, that's it. Yeah, that's it. They know Danny. They, they know so about they can Danny's. find him no matter where he is, of course, because none of this matters and the rules are stupid. Uh, to the person <laughs> who asked, do the psychic vampires refer to it as the shine? No, they call it something even dumber. They call it steam, because yes. you see, when you die, um, if you have the shining, uh, and you can. If the person dying has the shining and you have the shining too, when they die, you can see like steam spirit come out of their mouth as they die, but also as they're dying, which is not quite the same thing, but the movie kind of plays fast and loose with it. Um, no, so they call it steam. Uh, the shine only comes from Dick Halloran, like you said, and they at least they keep that <laughs> they, they, they keep that detail at least. So, um, yeah, let's let's just sort of jump around. We've already sort of talked about it. We're gonna see that Rose the Hat. Uh, actually, no. We should we should we should, now that we're we've we, uh, he finishes talking to Dick Halloran. Who uh, there's a really cringe moment where he goes like he <laughs> he says, "You remember when I speak to you for the first time in your head?" And then he gets this dumb look on his face, and then telepathically goes. Made you feel good, didn't it? Yeah, I, it's yeah. so cringe. I'm like, oh, Mike, what are you doing? What uh, are you doing, buddy? Uh, he, again, he knows writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. Okay, <laughs> like so. So <laughs> he's talking to. He's saying, you know, like I'm, I'm being haunted by these spirits, and they're like, well, that makes sense because. They closed the hotel down, so they're starving. So they're after you. What you got to do is what I was what I always did when I was a kid is I um I I I, I build mental lock boxes in my head, and then I just put the spirits into those lock boxes. And you're like, um, okay, uh, that is there works. more to it, or is that the whole technique? And later we'll see. This is still young Danny and Wendy. They're watching cartoons. And then he, apropos of nothing, because Mike Flanagan doesn't know how to direct, he just gets up and walks to the bathroom. He sees the the, the bathtub lady, and she's like, I'm a spooky ghost, I'm gonna get you." And he closes the door, and you hear, like, I'm a demon being put in a box sounds, is the only way I can describe yeah. that. And he opens the door and comes back out, and he's like, Humpty Dumpty Dum. And he sits down on the couch, and um, Wendy's like, are you okay, Doc? And he's like, "Yeah, Mom, I'm fine." Oh my God, dude! So they overuse the Doc at like the at the beginning of this. Like, I know that they call him Doc a lot in in The Shining in that first scene, but it's like every other time that they ref they talk to him in the opening part of this movie, they mm -hmm. like they have somebody saying Doc, Doc. Like, I, it really started to get on my nerves, and maybe it's just because yes. they weren't quite as good at delivering it as it Shelley yeah, maybe. But it, it was just really. <laughs> Ty Cobb mentions them. also the lockboxes screw up a lot in the world building because Halloran had those in the in the events of the first movie, but he doesn't tell Danny anything about them at the beginning or doesn't use them to help stop the ghosts. Yeah, you wait, know, why? He yeah, this... he's been there in a hotel full of hungry ghosts that want to eat him and his shine, and he just never locked them like, up. No, or he never locked them up, nor did he tell Danny, "Hey, by the way, if you see anything, here's a box." Because it turns out it's really easy. You know, it's not like there's any psychic concentration necessary. He just walks into the room. He's a kid. He doesn't even need practice. He goes in and he's like, la di da you're in a box now. And I come out and I'm fine. It's really stupid. And it's going to be even stupid later because uh, we're like setting up something with locking up the ghosts in boxes, by the way. Yeah, we're setting something like, <laughs> yeah. Yes, we so, are indeed. 
Um, um, another thing I find really annoying is that uh, uh, Dick Halloran says explicitly because he says that like, oh, you're not really talking much. No, no, it's not him that says it. It's Wendy that says it. When they're in, uh, after he has the first nightmare, he's like, Danny, are you okay? And he's sucking his thumb again. And she's like, it's like, man, you haven't you haven't spoken since. She, it's really clumsy, but they're trying to establish that he still hasn't spoken since the events of the first movie. But he did, and he I did find the... that so annoying because they're undoing the final like resolution of the first movie. The first movie, he he goes away and he's not speaking, and he's only Tony now. There is no Danny. Danny's gone away. And then at the end, he's like, Mom, because he's come out of it. And he's like, obviously, there's going to be trauma associated with all this sort of stuff. And like, I get that. But to have him do the same thing again that he hasn't been talking since and he's still sucking his thumb and all it takes for him to come out of it this time and is to like get be given a box and be told, hey, just put the ghost in the box. And he's like, all right, you're in the box now. OK, cool. I'm over it now. It's awful. It's yep. so bad. Sometimes I just uh, bottle up my emotions and stuff them in a tiny little place right inside my stomach, and then I don't feel anything. <laughs> so yeah, now he has the ability because it takes no practice or effort or mental energy. Okay, I can't believe that like all it takes to like these ghosts who are trying to suck your life force out of you and have been haunting you and are trying to scare you to death or whatever they're doing. All it takes to like trap them is to just imagine a box and imagine putting them in the box. You don't even need to break a sweat. Nothing. No. Meanwhile, in the original movie, like when he's trying to send a message deliberately, when he's trying to use his shining actively in the original movie, he's having a fucking seizure. <laughs> it's taking a lot out of him. Yeah. You know, it's scary. It's hard. It's difficult. It's it's like it's it's almost impossible to like do actively for him because yeah. he's a child and yeah. he's still a child when he all it takes is like la di da i put you when in the box jack goes into trances when he's doing it and now gr granted jack doesn't know what it is he doesn't really understand that he's doing yeah, he's it. not doing it actively yeah but but he is going into trances or you know like having those moments like he does it when he's asleep because that's mm -hmm. when it can come out right dick halloran doesn't need to do that necessarily but he's all he's using it for is to like think thoughts at Danny and ask him if he wants yeah. ice cream. We don't know. Like we, when we, Dick Halloran is, is seeing that also, the, the messages yeah. that Danny's transmitting, he goes into a sort of a trance with that. You know, and he like, looks terrified. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, it, it requires no mental energy really in this movie, essentially very annoying. It, about as much energy as taking a dump. Cause you know, like <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now he has now he has the lockbox technique so he can put the ghosts away and now he's speaking again because we've completed that arc again. Now we fast forward to presumably the current year. Well, it's not quite the no, current it's, year. No, it it's says 2011. flash up 2011, yeah. And and adult Danny Torrance played by Ewan McGregor is kind of a he's an alcoholic and a drunk and he's sleeping with random women and he's doing drugs and he's you know, not living his best life. He, he, he wakes King up writing what he knows. Yeah, he wakes up next to a woman <laughs> who is uh, naked in the bed next to him, but she's thrown up. Ew, gross. Um, and so he puts on his like clothes to leave her there. He realizes his wallet is empty, and he's like, "Oh no, I should rewind because there's an interesting detail." in the director's cut that's left out of the theatrical cut. In the theatrical cut, we get a little bit of flashbacks of their, like, crazy night that they had before. In, in one scene, he, like, gets into a fight oh, with someone. Oh, yeah. That, well, that's, I saw that in the theatrical cut. Well, you missed what caused the fight. Oh, I did. I did miss that. Yeah, what, because what... In, in part of the, the, the drunken, debaucherous night he had the night before, he got into a fight. But in the director's cut, we see that all that really happened to cause the fight is that... um the big guy he gets into a fight with went up to the girl he was talking to and it's like, hey, babe, how's it going? And he's like, I was talking to her and he punches him. <laughs> so oh, like, boy. he totally instigated the fight. 
which if we're going to do the whole thing that he's he's kind of like Becoming he's his... got anger issues and stuff like that too that's fine actually you know like it's kind of weird that they cut it honestly yeah you know what i, I mean i'll say i'll say this the most interesting concept because i i don't think that it's impossible to do a sequel to the shining right like it, it's it, it wouldn't be an impossible task no and the most interesting thing character wise about this movie with Danny is how they do try to parallel the alcoholism. Mm -hmm. um, it, yes. it would be a shame if the movie resolves that in the blink of a fucking eye, wouldn't it? Uh, yes. <laughs> gee, it would be a shame. <laughs> I wonder so how he, we'll go. How we'll do with that. So he is an adult now. He's not living his best life. Uh, he, as he's leaving, he's like, fuck, I don't have any money. So he steals money from this lady's wallet. And then, as he's about to leave, Scatman Crothers shows up as a, as a force ghost to be like, no, you're not going to steal his money, are you, Doc? I'm like, are you just his conscience now? Like, what is happening? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're eventually going to learn that he hasn't shined in years and makes a deliberate, deliberate effort not to. But now Dick Holleran just shows up whenever he's doing something bad to be like, oh, don't do that, Doc. Like he's Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, it's kind of a lesser use of, of ghosts, I would say. Also, it kind of makes me wonder, like, is Dick Holleran just a normal person who's in the afterlife now? Because they'll imply that later. Or is he just like a manifestation of... I, is subconscious. I thought he was he just a ghost that follows him around like the ghosts from the Overlook. Like he died on the Overlook grounds, so now he's a ghost too. He just I doesn't want to so lock too. him up. But it's just weird that he functions like his conscience kind of sometimes. Maybe. Yeah, no, no, it is weird. It, it, of course they were going to do that because that's what the character sort of does for him at the end of the novel is that the, when they finally run away and they're free. Dick is like talking to him on a dock and is basically like, hey, doc, we're going to, you know, work this out together. And I'm going to make sure like he. Yeah, he basically is going to raise Danny is the thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's like his new his new good father figure, you know? Yeah. So, of course, they were going to do that. It's just like it doesn't it doesn't make it doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, <laughs> Not a lot of sense. No. As he's about to leave, he puts the money back or uh and he sees, actually, I got the order wrong, but it doesn't really matter. He sees that this woman who's just living, you know, not in great conditions. She's like Jesse Pinkman, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he he sees that he has a child that's clearly being neglected. And he's like, oh, fuck. Um, and so he puts her on the bed next to the the passed out naked woman in her own vomit. I'm like, I don't know if that's any better, dude. Um, yeah. But then... And then it, it's like, oh, that's fucked up. But he just kind of leaves her, right? And I'll I'll just fast forward now. Later, there's a there's a payoff to that where he sees the ghost of a lady, and I'm not it, like it's not obvious who she is at first, but we'll discover it's this lady. And she comes up to him in his room and is like, "They haven't found us yet. Like that they haven't found the bodies. Like that she died there, and uh, presumably the baby died too because no one was there to take care of it." And they've just been lying there dead in that apartment for a while now. Is I'm that like, oh, who that was? Oh, that is who that was. Fuck me. That is. And of course. Oh my god, dude. So they're. So the movie's definitely going to hold Danny accountable for that, right? No, no, it isn't yeah, actually. Yeah. It's like it's going to be dropped. He never even. We never even see him call the police to report the bodies. He sees a vision of their so wait, she, Was dead she dead, body. though? Like, was she dead when he left? Is that what that's implying? Dead or going to die soon is the implication, yeah. So he left them. He <laughs> left the baby with this woman. He didn't even, like, check to see if she was awake, like, try to wake her up. He just left. And then it's like, okay, so, like, <laughs> I, you know, that's not, like, oh, clearly no. he's, not a, he's not a good guy. And clearly, like, his alcoholism has driven him into a bad spot. I'm okay with that as an idea. Ignoring, you know, how it connects to the original because it, it, it is kind of shitty to see that he's a terrible person. Like, the Danny from the original Shining is a terrible person now. Not a good feeling. But if we're going to do that, it's like, oh, man, that's fucked up. And then when he sees their dead bodies in his bed as a vision they're a ghost now and she's like they haven't found us yet like the kid died too because he just left them there and no one's even found no one's even known that they're dead 
Um, we don't even see him call the police to report the body. We don't see him being especially guilty about it. It never comes up again. Yeah, it's just a, I it, I couldn't I couldn't even remember that that I didn't recognize who it was when the I saw it the first time. Hard to tell who it is. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I had a difficult time realizing who that was, and the, it was when it was done, nothing came from it. So I just kind of wrote it. I was like, okay, Hard whatever. To, yeah. yeah, it's just a scene so, that goes uh, that's nowhere. Not a good look. Um, because the movie is going to pretend that that he's turned his life around, but um, he's he's still not a great person, um, and in a way that the movie doesn't seem to be aware of. In other ways, he is like clearly that setup isn't terrible, but like no, I I think the, the like anyway. I said, the most interesting character idea with Danny is that this struggle, like we know alcoholism can be inherited hereditarily, right? Like mm -hmm. Shining, so it's kind of and interesting he had a like fucked that. up childhood where he was raised by a narcissist who tried to kill him and his wife, and yeah. his mom. So, so I, I I like that as a concept. Um, if it you know, if it plays out and that turns into his overall arc, uh. No, his overall arc will be helping this little Mary Sue black girl kill a, 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 a stupid vampire in a dumb hat. Like, that's his overall arc. And her it's dumb terrible. cult that follows her around for it's some so reason, that she lets follow her around for some reason. But Lurch is After there, so isn't that nice? After being introduced to adult Danny, we are then introduced to... It's um, Child well, Abra, right? Child Abra, I believe. Well, the director's cut. There's an extended scene where, like, she plays the piano at night from the other room. Really bad. But either either way, what they her introduction scene that is Child Abra, uh, in the theatrical version, is that she's having a birthday party and there's a magician there, and she's being a little brat and she's like, "I could do magic too, you know." And the and well, like, the magician's just like a really, like clearly not a very good performer. No, for kids. he's just, just like, like that's I, nice. I can do sweetie. that. I'm a I'm a good magician. And well, well, uh, her parents go inside when they're cleaning up. And earlier, he did a gag with spoons and making spoons disappear and all that stuff. So now all the spoons in there in the silverware are floating on the ceiling. They're like levitating and like telekinetically floating on the ceiling. And then the character whose whose name is Abra, let that sink in. Let's swim and simmer in that for a minute. Look, man, Abra her comes dad's up. a millennial. It's his favorite Pokemon. Yeah, they're coming up with some weird <laughs> names. We just gotta let it go, you know. <laughs> and she's like, does she say Abracadabra? Or does she say magic? She says Abracadabra like, is like yeah, the magic okay, word is fine. Abracadabra, but I think she says magic when the spoons are up on the thing and they all come crashing down. And they all come crashing down. So already we got a child prodigy. I am the avatar. You got to deal with it type. And she has incredible shining abilities like we've never seen before. Oh, my goodness. And she shines her parents, so bright, dude. Her parents are aware of this. Keep that in mind. But they are aware of this. They've seen it firsthand <laughs> that she has magical She's not powers. exactly fucking shy about it. She put every no. spoon in the kitchen on the damn ceiling and then let them all fall down making one of the like i mean that is a crazy noise you know like for that to happen right mm -hmm. it's not it's not subtle you no. know no and uh they'll be kind of rather bizarrely either indifferent or like willfully ignorant about her magical powers in a way that doesn't make sense based on how explicit they've been especially in the director's cut is in the director's cut the first scene we see of her is like she's playing piano and they're like oh very nice honey but it's time to go to bed so she goes to bed and then in the middle of the night they hear more piano playing and they go down expecting her to be at the piano oh my god but she's playing it with her mind what that's the introduction scene in the director's cut can't imagine oh why that was God that was with that. her mind. This is yeah, a and special it's... child. Oh my God! They should take her to Xavier's school for the gifted. They should. Um, she looked yeah, at the so it... before she stuck them to the ceiling. Yeah, that's the only way that works. Actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that makes sense. So, actually, then we are introduced because, man, I think it's it's probably worth mentioning so far how like comparatively convoluted this is because now we introduce. 
in Long Island, New York, this little blonde 15 year old girl who's alone in a movie theater and an old man comes up and he's like, Hey, are you, what's her name? It's like, yeah. And it's like, well, you want to go somewhere else? And she's like, don't you want to watch the movie? And it's, and then. But there's, uh, hold on. I really just want to, uh, just want to illustrate some, some more of the awful, just plain spoken text that could have easily just been subtext here is he looks at her and goes, you're prettier than your picture. And she goes, you're older than yours. And it's just it, it, cause just in a couple of minutes, we're going to get this point where she hypnotizes him to fall asleep. And she explains the whole situation, right? Yes. Like she's going to would have been subtle, but then he ruined it. Yeah. Yes. So we had the subtle thing right there at the beginning. You're prettier than your picture. You're older than yours. And then she hypnotizes him to fall asleep while while Rose and Crawdaddy watch from the back and talk over the movie, which is <laughs> frustrating. Talk me. over Casablanca, too. You fucking of bitch. Movies. Of over Casablanca. You're going to lure One this guy ever. to Casablanca and then do him like that at this. <laughs> like, but so and she then just talk over the movie, talk like over that. the movie, whisper in his ear. But so she she hypnotizes him to fall asleep. Right. And uh, then she starts carving, like she steals his money, and she starts carving into his face, right? And she illustrates, I can't remember the exact overall thing. It's a good long little monologue that she does, a real yeah, Flanagan shenanigan right there. Uh, where, she, But eventually it, we get to the point where she says, uh, basically every time you uh, this mark is seen and somebody asks you how you got it, you are going to answer, I'm a dirty old man who likes little girls. Because, yeah, so uh, yeah. She has super-powered hypnosis, because she has The Shining, of course, and she's conscious of it, and she uses it to hypnotize people and f go on internet chat boards and meet pervy old men like to catch a predator and then lure them into her trap where she... Uh, hypnotizes them, steals their money, and then scars their face and hypnotizes them such that anytime they're asked about it, they have to, because she's just this magical about it, tell everyone that it's because they got caught trying to fuck a little girl. Everyone following that? Yep, The Shining can do some pretty incredible shit, bro. This is... Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so already we've just exploded the level of, like, conscious, like, waking awareness and power people have over their abilities and what they're capable of. We've just blown it out of the water already. We're not even um, in the realm of like prevision of, you know, like of futuristic things, right? Like Danny has, but it's like <laughs> symbolic prevision, right? Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Fed Zeppelin, great name, by the way, uh, <laughs> points out snakes don't even lure prey. The metaphor doesn't even work. True. Yeah. She's a rattlesnake biting, she's a snake bite or whatever. They, they call her Snake Bite that. Andy because Rose the Hat, Snake Bite Andy, Craw Daddy. And yeah, but she, but like she does, she, she's, she's not like a, she, it'd be something more like a Black Widow or something, surely. You know, yeah, if we're going to yeah, go. One of those trap door spiders or something, like something that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good point. Yeah, the metaphor isn't even functional. So if, if, if anyone is wondering, because I've talked before, um, I, I've, you know, with people who like Mike Flanagan's work, um, we did have a super chat I've, about that earlier. So this is and good. I've tried to uh, try to, to illustrate for people what I don't like about his writing style, and the the big sin that I really hate is his like allergy to subtlety. Like as everything is so on the nose, and so I, I just want to circle back to the point Hugh already made, where she's where like you said the setup is like uh, you're prettier than your picture, you're older than yours, and it's like okay. There's the subtlety. And then like not even a minute and a half later, she's like, maybe next time you'll think better about trying to meet up with young girls online. And it's like, okay, really? Yeah, so, you know well, what I mean? So there's that. And then immediately afterwards, she starts cutting his face and saying, now you're going to tell everybody that you like to meet up with young girls online. So we got the yeah. same thing three times, worse mm -hmm. each time. And to yeah. make it worse... Rose the Hat and Crawdaddy are sitting in the back with popcorn and Crawdaddy looks at Rose and goes, now just watch right before yeah, she gets started. So it, she, he has to like signpost like, here's the important thing. This How is cool. She is like, yeah. this is when this is going to happen. Yeah. And it's and, and then she goes, now that is interesting. It feels so very like, man, I wrote something so cool. I'm going to have another character describe how cool it was. 
so everybody should know how cool what I came up with was. So it, it, it's it we've crossed the line from the sort of earlier ver like the Kubrick version of what ESP would look like with like dream mm -hmm. sequences and and stuff like that or or fantasy subconscious yes yeah subcon the 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 projection of the subconscious desire into full on just horror X Men yes that, yeah, that's what we're at we're at horror X Men and it's as unsubtle as it could possibly be. For anyone wondering, uh, this is exactly what all of Mike Flanagan's work is like from a subtlety level. He, he, he is incapable of it, as far as I'm concerned, routinely, chronically. I, yeah. I can't stand it. Even when the plot is better, because this is one of the, this is, the plot is awful, the themes are awful, the characters are awful in this movie. We'll get into all the reasons why. Um, certainly not all his work is equally bad in those respects, but in the lack of subtlety regard, they're all this bad. I, and I can't stand it. I, I've only, I have only uh, finished Hill House to completion. Uh, Bly Manor, I did not make it through. Uh, and then I did not watch Midnight Mass uh, on your recommendation, actually, Jamie. I, did, I ended up not watching Midnight Mass. No, uh, don't bother. The ending is awful and it ruins it. Yeah. It ruins all, all the potential it had. Because there's some good stuff in it, there. It, but it, it bugs me a little bit because I actually really like the actor from Midnight Mass. The the guy, yeah. uh, he's in a show called I Zombie, which I find quite charming and uh, humorous. And he's probably the most charming and humorous part of that show. Uh, mm -hmm. And it made me a little sad when I watched the first episode of Fall of the House of Usher and realized that he is indeed one of the uh, Mike Flanagan. Really disappointed me. All right. So moving on, we are, uh, he is, she, she, oh, she, she sure got that guy. It's like that movie hard candy where she's punished, punishing to catch a predators. And so then she goes outside and, um, Rose the hat and craw daddy approach a crow daddy, craw daddy. Craw daddy. One. It's craw daddy. I think, isn't they, it? Or is they, it crow daddy? I think it might be crow daddy, but either one is stupid. So it doesn't matter. They approach, and they're like, hey, and she goes, you, uh, she says to Crow Daddy, she says, you want to let me go? And he stops and lets her go. And it's like, okay. She has is very, <laughs> very intense powers of manipulation, e even to people who are psychic shining vampires, apparently. But it doesn't work on Rose the Hat, you see, because she's the big bad of the movie. You can tell by how stupid her hat is. And so she's like, you want to let me go? And she goes, no, I don't think I do, or something to that effect. And she, she, she gets her. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Is she going to eat her? Oh, no. No, she's not. She's not going to eat her. She's going to get the resolution to this problem in just a, just a little while, actually. A very yeah. short while. So that's where we're introduced to blonde 15-year-old girl, Shining Lady. We've learned that uh, Shining powers are even more diverse and there are even more people who are basically horror x-men now so that's fun uh but rose the hats uh she's the big bad so um <laughs> she's said, she's, oh, I she's really... i preferred craw daddy craw daddy's funnier we'll call him craw daddy i'm calling him craw daddy it, it, it sounds like craw daddy when she says it to mm -hmm. me so i'm going with that but either way um yeah, you're right. I wanted to just touch real quick. Uh, Rose the Hat sure is powerful if she can resist that level of manipulation. I wonder if she'll be a particularly intimidating villain uh, moving forward. Uh, I would hope so, because she's the main one of the movie. Yeah, I guess we'll find out. Let's see. Um, we see uh, when, when uh, Abra is doing the thing with the spoons, like, look at me, I'm magic. Abracadabra. Ba-boom. Uh, 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 Rose the Hat feels that from miles and miles away. So, another thing that another new power ability we've added to the world building of The Shining now is that you don't have to have any sort of like personal connection with people with The Shining that you've met and have a bond with, and you use a great deal of mental effort to communicate with over long distances. Now, anyone, anytime anyone uses The Shining hard enough. Uh, other shining people feel it because everyone's just an open radio transmitter now. Um, so that's cool and lame and is the, basically the convenience, the contrivance that allows all of this movie's plot to take place. And raises a everyone... lot of questions about how none of, since you know they were active in 1980, how none of this little Manson cult heard Danny's cry out across the entire country to Dick Howard. No. 
they didn't feel that they even have a line to like lampshade it. it's like how did i not feel you already and there's no reliable answer given uh she should have already uh but she just didn't because that's not how the rules worked then but it is how they work now which is very cool um everyone is every shining person has like a heat signature that every other sufficiently shining person can just feel and sense and telepathically communicate with across hundreds and hundreds of miles maybe across the world even who knows but that's <laughs> that's fun and that's and, and it'll cool. make for it'll make for a lot of um meditation cerebro scenes where uh people just seek Very each other fun. out across the country yeah so after feeling uh, the big shining vibes from Abra, Rose the Hat goes in to meet in the in a very bizarrely decorated trailer with the 15-year-old girl and she uses her psychic influence to be like, "Oh, you will tell me the truth no matter what." So she she can she she has truth serum manipulation powers as well. It'd be a shame if she just totally forgets how to use those later. Um <laughs> Then, uh, this, this, she this she's is, like, go ahead. This, and this is where one of those like weird sexual thi- like th- one of those weird things where like the actors delivering the line, and I know that it doesn't necessarily not make sense coming from her mouth, but it feels very much like something like it, it just smacks of Stephen King's weird perversions that this this bit. dialogue made it in where he t- basically she talks about how life and supple this 15 year old girl is and wouldn't you like to yeah. stay that way forever you know kind of thing and like the yeah lolly it, vampire thing yeah yeah the, yeah the lolly vampire problem creating the lolly vampires uh yeah it's just it, it it's one of those things that like there's nothing inherently wrong with the line of dialogue coming from rose it's no, just but that, it just gives an, a weird icky vibe that is in so much of this movie when it wasn't in the original. It's like, man, what a downgrade. Yeah. Someone yeah. shine Chris Hansen. I know, maybe Chris Hansen has the shine. That's how he knows how to catch all those predators. That would be. <laughs> and so what she tells she tells Abra is that like, oh, you... Andy. Andy? This oh, is right, Snake Andy. by Andy. Yeah, this is Snake oh, by yeah. Andy. Here's something I want to signpost. Uh, I want to signpost the fact that Andy is using her shining superpowers to hunt predators who prey on children. Yes. Let's Please keep that in mind. Just keep that a little what pin in she that is forever. doing, and she's very, like, you know, kind of righteous, like kind of darkly righteous, like a vigilante sort of type. But what she's doing is she's punishing awful people for preying on children. And then Rose the Hat is like, hey, you know, oh, you're yes. special. You're special, just like us. Do you want to join our super secret club? Not even you just can- that, though. because And this is one of the points that I want to highlight. So she doesn't just say, you're special like us. Do you want to join our club? She says, you're useful. So I'm going to give you an offer that I haven't given in 40 years. Do yeah, you want to join of, us? It's like, jo- like, I would kill you, but I'm feeling generous today kind of energy. So like, And you could you be useful. Join she says you could be useful. That that uh-huh. is like, and so I just want to point that make it clear that we establish that Rose, the leader of this little cult, only allows people to join if they are useful, if their powers yeah. will be useful <laughs> to the exploits of, uh, you know, manipulating children <laughs> into their van, basically. Yes. Um, yeah. Let's keep that in mind as well. She says, all right, here's the deal. You'll join us. And you'll, you'll like eat well. Oh, she says something to the effect of, <laughs> I want to make this clear because later Andy's going to be like, wait, you, you told me I could be immortal. But she says right from the very beginning, it's like eat well and like, you know, live maybe long in, or something. Yeah. <laughs> in a, like in a hundred years, maybe you'll, she, cause she's 15 now. She's like, maybe in 50 years, you'll be 16 or a hundred years. Maybe you'll be 17. The impl- it's made quite clear that like you'll age very, very, very slowly, but you will age. Yeah. And then later, Andy, because I'm probably going to forget to bring it up, but Andy's like, "Wait, you said you said we were immortal because one of one of their cohort is so old that he's finally dying because he hasn't been eating well enough." Um, yeah. So for some, so somehow, like, somehow they haven't been eating well enough. I, uh, I guess. We'll get to that because I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, it has to do with the world building problems this movie has. 
But she's like, oh, you told me I could be immortal. And she's like, did I ever say immortal? And it's supposed to be like, ha ha, she tricked you. And it's like, no, she was very clear that you're just going to age slowly. Like, <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's just dumb. It's not well executed. So she she makes that offer to her. Then we cut to adult Danny, who's who's in a small town in New England. And he meets a, a, a guy who's like, hey, it's like, you do it, you fresh off the bus? And it's like, well, man, if you came on the bus all the way up here, then that means you're probably looking for work. And so there's this guy who, like, instantly trusting to him, and they make it very explicit because it can't be subtle. He's like, you know, I just have a good sense about people, you know? And he's like, yeah, like you can't imagine. Oh, oh, he has the shining too. I get it. So yeah, <laughs> he has a connection with Danny. He clearly sees something of him in him. And this stuff isn't like not terrible. He offers him a place to stay and he can work there. I don't even know what his job is to like work with it, the model train town. Yeah, he's building. The, like, the, there's a model train town that started off as an exhibit in the library. And now it's like the model village from fucking hot fuzz, but they need care givers or groundskeepers for the model village. So he offers like, I can't imagine that pays particularly well well right like is that like a po whatever he offers danny the job, job and an apartment and an apartment and you know <laughs> he be, like the apartment's <sighs> rented out by the week you know yeah uh, okay so here's a, here's another one this is another example of like mike flanagan refusing because he's incapable of being subtle at first it's like you know and he's like uh, he's like, oh, you know, I just have a I have a sense about people. And it's like, oh, okay, maybe this guy has the shining. He doesn't really know it. He just is his version of the shining. He just has gut instincts about people that tend to be right. You know, it's yeah. like, okay, that's subtle enough. And then he he gives him the apartment. And then instead of just leave, leaving it be, like Flanning is like, no, we need to make it more explicit. And he's like, why are you doing this to me? You don't even know me. You're taking a risk on me. And he's like, no, I, I see in your face. I know that look. You know, you're someone who I forget exactly how he says it, but everything is just made way more explicit and unsubtle. And it's like, you couldn't yeah. just let it be. It was fine before. It was like, it's fine. So we cut away. He's got the apartment and the job playing with model trains now or whatever the hell he does. Um, <laughs> then we have the scene where Andy gets turned into a psychic vampire. Oh my goodness. So what they do is they lie her down and the, the, the creepy cult chants some stupid, vague, culty nonsense things about how they're the true knot and what is tied cannot be untied, which is important because for reasons that are entirely unclear, once everyone joins the super secret club of, you know, cult of vampires, like shining vampires, they're all loyal and indebted to each other for no obvious reason. Um yeah, but they just are. Well, so, and so I what I want to get at here too is that like we haven't quite gotten around to watching them work. However, we will establish, and I'm just, I'm just gonna jump ahead because it doesn't it doesn't really matter. We will establish that the only three who have any use whatsoever, as per rules, Rose's own rules, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are Rose herself, Rose the Hat, because she is the one, I think, who is able to, like, harness the steam and, mm -hmm. and like, harvest it. Craw Daddy, because he's a tracker, right? And Snakebite yeah, Andy. Sense, yeah, he can sense where shining people are, and so he's tracking victims for them. Yeah, and, uh, and Snakebite Andy, the new one who's just joined, who can um, push people and manipulate them. None of mm -hmm. the others are ever shown actually using shining powers on anybody. No. They, so they what appear do they to do? be useless, like actually useless. Several of them don't even have lines. So I'm yeah. really confused as to why they all had to be there. I don't know. It's as part of the cult, but we never really see them doing anything. So we see uh, she lies on the ground. They chant some stuff and they're like, uh, here is a steam canister. This is the steam from Violet, the girl from the cold open, who they've been still using the steam from for over 30 years. That's rather remarkable. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That was in, that was in 1980. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Considering uh, that in like that one little girl's steam lasted them for like almost 30 years, but in just a little while we're going to establish that um they just they're running out of juice running out of juice. Dying. yeah 
So that's dumb. Anyway, she she's uh, Andy breathes in the steam, soul shining steamness of a child from thirty years ago, and she breathes it in, and it looks like it's painful. And now she's she's one of them, I guess. You know, also, uh, you know what else I didn't even realize, right? But like in 1980, they didn't really have thermoses like that, right? Like the, that futuristic technology would. They wouldn't have had that, right? So, like, no, how did they? They would, yeah. How did they? That's a good. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, because the, the the canister that they're putting it in is not like your average cup. It's like a weird, almost futuristic. It's maybe it's possible go- now. It's like a ghost it's a gaseous, gaseous thing. Yeah, it's a Ghostbusters thing essentially. So okay, <laughs> apparently, that is funny. I didn't think about that. So we cut away from that. You know, when she breathes in and she, her eyes light up blue because that means she's a vampire now this is when you and now you and mcgregor sees the vision of of the the woman and child who died and instead of like immediately following that up with him like calling the police and reporting the body i mean this wouldn't take long to do you could do it in a like a voiceover if you wanted uh instead of doing that we see him like hey man i need some help uh and he's like okay let's go to an aa meeting like yeah okay but there is (laughs) <laughs> there's like rotting bodies are we gonna like, you, address there, that there, do we there, just have to assume he called the police off camera because we didn't see it is that what we have to assume there's a dead woman with your dna all over and or inside her and a dead baby <laughs> like maybe you should be more concerned about this danny i just there's a thought too. just a thought the movie just doesn't the movie just doesn't acknowledge is wrong doing that in that his wrongdoing or like what he could do to help the situation going forward. He's just like, man, I got to get clean. And that's it. No, she's, it's it's just, this character of the, the, like the, the woman the druggy, the druggy mother with the baby, both her and the baby are used exclusively to just kind of push Danny into a, an AA meeting. Yeah. As <laughs> if that's the proper culmination and, and like, and that's all, they're just a prop for his sobriety yeah. essentially. It's like, oh man, that, that that is a horrible thing. I gotta get clean. It's like, yeah, you probably do gotta get clean, but also you gotta sort of probably acknowledge should that. figure that shit out. You know, like maybe maybe just I do don't know something about it. Do something about it, please. So anyway, now he's in an AA meeting and uh, people are getting their chips, and he's like, uh, I've, I got twenty four hours clean at least. And Bruce Greenwood's the AA leader, and he he talks about AA things, and then after the fact, they're talking. And we get useless dialogue that amounts to nothing where he's like, hey, uh, his friend that gives him the job, the AA meeting leader is like, oh, you know, like, how's your brother doing and all that sort of stuff like that. And eventually as he's about to leave, Edward Norton, Edward Norton, (laughs) Ewan McGregor, I don't know where that came from. (laughs) Danny, I'm tired. Danny sees him and he's like, hey, before you go, I noticed that you were like, reaching for your watch you uh you left it on the soap dispenser after you had a meeting with the kid with goucher's disease he's like what how did you know that and he's like you'll you'll find your uh wristwatch uh, in the bathroom at the hospital if you go looking for it it's like wow that's incredible like how does he have that ability now bro i who fucking knows like that's ha- not mind reading it's no that's not mind reading because bruce greenwood doesn't know where it is that's no. experience reading. You know what I mean? Like yeah. He, that's that's the uh, shine. Like, so, like, you know how Dick Halloran says, like, oh, you can see things that happened long ago or things that haven't happened yet, right? Like, mm-hmm. he could, I suppose, conceivably, like, bump into him, right? And then just, like, see a flashback. Like, happen to see this exact specific flashback to where Bruce Greenwood took his watch off and forgot it, Right. Like maybe no, actually, actually no, because I don't know what he would see by bumping into Bruce Greenwood if Bruce Greenwood doesn't know it. I, I he, I'm thinking like he saw the like the moment from a third person perspective, right? Like he watched it happen. Mm, yeah, but I don't, I don't understand how that should be possible based on what we understand. I, I, bro. The Shining can do a whole lot of extra shit in this movie. That's what I'm saying, though. I'm saying all I'm trying to say is that there is no reason to believe this is possible at this point in the story, not even based on the rules established in this movie, trying to like retroactively change the original. Like he just Bruce Greenwood forgot where he left his watch and he knows where it is. 
Yeah. Even though he's never met him before? I, dude, I'm not saying it's not stupid. All I'm saying is, like, given everything else that The Shining has been shown to do just in this brief, like, what are, what are we, like, 30 minutes into the movie by this point? If that, yeah. in this brief little thing, like, it doesn't, it wouldn't surprise me if he's just able to, like, psychic detective his way, you know, through this guy's brain or, like, through his past experiences it yeah, seems like I mean, something that that seems like something this movie would say The Shining is perfectly capable of doing. Yeah, fine. Yeah, so that's just another set of powers we've added to this. And Danny, even though he specifically not made a conscious effort not to shine for a long time, and actually this is something it's for all the talk of Mike Flanagan trying to do Stephen King's The Shining justice and do the Dr. Sleep book justice. I was reading a, a description of what happens in Dr. Sleep, the novel, and apparently like he's only able to start shining again after he gets clean. And it's like, that wasn't a thing in this movie. No. At least that's an interesting detail, you know, cause the idea of like that he's starting to experience it again, now that he's sober, it's like, Oh, because it was like dulling it or like, um, like, uh, uh, so you know, pushing it down, submersing it inside of him. Like, that's interesting. It it's like, I thought you were. Well, it's more interesting than the fact that, like, than nothing, I would say. It's more interesting than nothing. Yeah, it, it's more interesting than nothing, but then it, it is also creating problems with the original one because when Jack is drinking, or, well, he's, I guess he's not actually drinking. It's just a, a hallucination. Yeah, no, I, I'm saying, like, I'm yeah, saying, yeah, no, I gotcha, Mike I gotcha. Finnegan doesn't even do a good job of adapting the book. No, I'm, I'm with out. you. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. And that's, it's like, oh man, like it's, it's not even just that he betrays the original by making it more Stephen King appropriate. It's like, he kind of doesn't seem to really understand the parts that make sense about Dr. Sleep. Now, granted, I read some things about the synopsis of Dr. Sleep that made me laugh out loud with how stupid they were. And I'm like, oh, it's probably smart to not include the bit where Abra predicts 9-11. <laughs> Wait, what? In Dr. Sleep, the book, according to the Wikipedia <laughs> summary of the plot, one of the first signs of Abra's psychicness is that she predicts 9-11. Uh. Yeah, just let, let that simmer for a second. Uh. Plot. Um, let's see. <laughs> in the meantime, Abra Stone, a baby girl born in 2001, begins to manifest psychic powers of her own when she seemingly <laughs> predicts the 9-11 attacks. Oh, She's a baby. She's born in 2001. How does she predict 9-11? I don't know. Maybe she makes a, a, like a, a, a tower block of letters and knocks them down. I don't know what happens. <laughs> she writes That's... George Bush, <laughs> jet fuel can't melt steel beams with her blocks. <laughs> I don't know how that happens in the story. How the fuck story. does she do that? <laughs> I'm just letting you know what Wikipedia's plot summary says. So that's a thing. Oh my god. So, yeah, there are stupid things, apparently, or seemingly stupid things in the book that it was probably wise not to include. Apparently in the description of the book, uh, Rose the Hat has, like, I don't know if it's her only form, but she has a form where, like, she has one giant, like, evil tooth and a really long tongue or something. Oh, um, of, course. of course. Probably smart to just have it be a woman. Um, so clearly some changes... Doug, Stephen King was fine with apparently um, but like the idea that like oh well getting clean is a big part of being able to shine again it's like well that's kind of in keeping with you know some of the alcoholism stuff it'd be weird not to include that but that's fine wait is that wait hold on is that true it, there's okay there's a couple people in the chat saying she solved a Tetris level before the blue bricks fell and that's predicting nine is that really how it happens uh, some if you guys who've read the book in the chat, if there are any of you poor unfortunate souls there, please let me know how this baby predicts nine eleven. I need to know. <laughs> I need to know what was going through Stephen King's mind when he wrote this. When he cocaine put pen to mind. paper. Actually, no, this is he, far he, after yeah. the cocaine. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> this is far beyond cocaine, Stephen. Now, is there much of a difference between cocaine Stephen King and regular Stephen King? At this point, I don't know if we can be sure. Um, <laughs> but either way, okay. So yeah, no. So clearly, some changes are are okay. 
Um, but at least, yeah, at least the alcohol does make sense uh, that it dulls the shine, uh, I guess, on some level. Although I, hmm. yeah, it, don't think about it too much. All I'm all I'm saying is that he doesn't really adapt it. And you know, like there are things he leaves out that I'm like, actually, maybe if you're going to go in that direction, maybe that would be better. But anyway, now he has the power to tell people where they forgot something that he has never met before. He, He's, so he's cool. Sean Spencer from Psych. He, he's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's just very observant. Yeah. And so then he goes to meet with uh, with Bruce Greenwood, Doctor Man, in his office at the hospital, which is the same room as Allman's office in The Shining from The Overlook. Oh Jesus Why? Christ! Do you remember that? Did no, you I that? did not. I didn't notice that. I was. I think I was messaging you about the Flana gang at that point, but yeah. Here is a screenshot. Here it comes. That is the office that he's in, in Dr. Sleep, right. in a different place. This is not at the Overlook Hotel. The Overlook Hotel is closed and decrepit. We'll see that later in the movie. But for some reason that escapes me, Bruce Greenwood, uh, his AA meeting leader guy, who's a doctor, who's about to give him a job because he, he he's really happy to have his watch back, I guess, and because he trusts him. Uh, he's having put this on screen real quick. A meeting in his oh, doctor's office. People. It's the exact same room as Ullman's office from The Shining. From The Shining, I mean, slightly different decorations on the wall, but it's the same color. It's the same layout. If you look behind Bruce Greenwood, there's a window there as well. Why? It's just not as brightly lit. It's it's done like a Haunting of Hill House episode. <laughs> well, yeah, because everything's not as brightly lit. But yeah, that's yeah. um, to call that an Easter egg. I mean, I saw that in the theaters, and I'm I was so confused. I'm like, wait, are we at the are we at the Overlook? What's happening? It's just confusing. Like it's it's that's insane. Yeah, I found it very distracting in the theater. I didn't even but, um, I didn't even notice that when I was watching it, but I was yeah, I was distracted uh, at, at points just by, you know. Yeah, that's that's oh, that's boy. really that's a really ill conceived um, Easter egg, I would say. But anyway, what we learn in this scene is Bruce Greenwood also has the shining because they make a very clumsy line to say that, like, hey, you know, I, I get gut feelings of my own, too. It's like, okay, I guess he also has oh a little God. bit of the shine in him. Um, and he's like, he's like, have you, have you ever um, worked in a hospital before? And he, he like, oh, he says something like, it says here you have some orderly experience. I'm like, when would he, when I guess, on earth I guess, would Danny have gotten orderly experience? Okay. I guess when he was a younger man, he, he had some brief medical training, I guess. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's all, it's all convenient even though it's never been touched on before, he's going to give him a job at the hospital. He works at a hospice care place, and he's like, you don't have any problem with dying people, do you? He goes, no. And then he says some really cringe line about how the world's just a giant hospice, and I'm like, okay, edgelord. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Another Stop. one just smacks of Stephen King sitting at, his, sitting at his typewriter and, like, nodding satisfactorily to himself. He's like, I nailed it with this one. Yeah. And then it's and then there's another one. He's like, you know, because uh, for anyone who doesn't know, AA is like not ex like it's it's a it's a kind of a religious thing. You know, they're all they talk about a higher power. They don't like make it concrete like AA is just like a Presbyterian thing or anything too specific like that. But there is talk of a higher power, you know, in AA. It's kind of part of the whole deal, right? And it's yeah. very helpful. People and it seems to work, and it seems to work better than a lot of other things, right? Yeah, and well, and a lot of it also emphasizes personal responsibility to that higher power, which is something yeah. that you know clearly we're going to gloss over because the woman and her child are never coming back. But yeah, there's that. He doesn't really make amends. We don't. This isn't him being in an AA meeting. Um, we don't really get to see any of the steps of recovery or anything like that. They're not, those are not meaningfully explored. Obviously, his sobriety is an important part of this story, and we'll talk about it as we go along. But the reason I bring up the higher power thing is because in this conversation, Bruce Greenwood says, like, do you are you a religious man? Do you believe in anything bigger than yourself? 
and he goes, he says some really cringe kind of atheistic line where he goes, are, he's like, oh, no, he says, are you religious? And he goes, does that matter? Like kind of really indignant too and petty and kind of childish. And I'm like, okay, that's why did you say it like that? And he goes, well, do you believe in anything bigger than yourself? And he says, our beliefs aren't what make us good people. Our actions make us good people. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah. Shut you, up. Oh my god, dude! Shut up. Like the whole point is that your beliefs inform your actions. Well, you, your actions have made you quite a shitty person so far, Danny. So like something's got to give off here. Your high horse. Yeah, come on, dude. You're a fucking drug addict, alcoholic. Yeah, like the the idea that like merely believing in God doesn't doesn't automatically make you a good person. It's like, yeah, but that's not what's being said here. He's like, do you believe in anything greater than yourself? And he's like, um, actually, our beliefs don't make us good people. Our actions do. And it's like, yeah, well, if you believe in the higher power than yourself that is like inherently good, maybe that would inform you to be a good person. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's kind of the idea here. <laughs> no. It's kind of, uh, kind of what he's getting at because he is the head of an AA club. Yeah. And like, yeah. <laughs> and it's like I know you're new to the whole AA thing. You only went to one meeting, but like this is kind of going to be a big part of it. Yeah, well, and instead of correcting him or saying anything to the contrary, he just kind of shrugs it off. And like maybe you could argue he's just like not trying to make an argument right now. But it the reason I I feel weird about it is like it does feel like the movie's perspective because Midnight Mass also has some kind of like kind of um. What would I say? Kind of like shallow, kind of cringe in terms of like its understanding yeah, I was of gonna, religion I was gonna say and atheism and stuff like that. Well, yeah, that's Stephen King in general, too. Like he's definitely he's got a very shallow take on pretty much every concept that he works with in his novels. And religion is one that I really dislike the way that he he's got a very adolescent sort of uh an adolescent religion, understanding yeah. of religion and of yeah. spirituality and of, I mean, of people and ge- and goodness in general, you know? And also it, this will become, uh, it was already, it was mentioned in the chat that like, this is going to come up later more explicitly, but okay. People have supernatural powers and there's no conversation in this movie about whether, whether Danny believes this is just, like some sort of like thing we don't understand scientifically yet, but we will. You know what I mean? There's no under like he's he's not the guy from Hill House who thinks there's no supernatural. There's just preternatural, as in things we don't understand yet, right? Danny doesn't say anything of that sort. Later in this movie, he's gonna try and comfort dying people by saying like, "Hey, death isn't the end, and we go on." He doesn't explain himself further. But he's like, I don't know much, but I know that we go on after death because he's seen people be malicious spirits. Also, he's seen Halloran be his like conscious on his shoulder as a ghost. So he's concluded that there is an afterlife, though he doesn't know anything yeah. about it. And he's using that knowledge to help people. But then when he asked if he believes in a higher power, he's just like, um, actually, religious beliefs will make you a good person, actually. It's like, what are we like? It's confused. The movie confused, is confused and it's confused. And he is going to do the, you know, do that helping of somebody pass. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, before he gets a little bit further into the before, not even just a little bit. We're going to flash for spoilers. We're going to just flash forward over eight years mm-hmm. of his sobriety and his uh, experience with that. And we are not going to look back at all. Uh, it, it's pretty much just resolved after it, like in a couple of moments, a couple of scenes, uh, all of the struggle that he has apart it is going to be completely thrown out the window minus one scene later on in the in the movie. And that really bothers me because for all the talk about, you know, the, the how the movie handles alcoholism and recovery and sobriety, I think it skips all the all the drama of that story. And I, and I don't just mean drama as in like con, like like uh, like high tense conflict. It's like we we skip over his road to recovery. We see I need to make the decision to get clean. We skip over the part of his recovery where we'd see him doing the steps, where he'd make amends with people, you know, where he'd try to you know all that sort of, all the thirteen steps. We skip all that, and suddenly it's been five months, and 
that part of his character conflict is done and resolved now. And all there is is to take this little X-Men child under my wing and defeat the big bad lady in the hat. And like he'll have one conversation at the bar in the Overlook about sobriety. And he says some things about sobriety that like are true and good and useful and all that. But like it's not part of his narrative. No, it, it doesn't it doesn't play any role in getting him to the overlook at all it's like it, not even not even a little bit the only reason that he goes to the overlook it we will get to that mm-hmm. we'll get to that but he doesn't go there in order to resolve anything that's going on with him that's all no. done right here right at this point in the movie after he helps the one old man die it's yeah. done it's done Eventually. completely yeah and that's kind of lame because you think maybe he'd have to go back there in order to sort of face his fears and his father or something. It's just so obvious that you'd want to do something like that. But the only reason he goes back to the Overlook, as we'll, we'll talk about the specifics of it, but he goes back because, like, plot mechanical reasons. It's the only way to defeat the bad guy, which is just so lame and such a missed opportunity, but among is other it, things. But is it... But is it the only It, it isn't, no, but the movie thinks it is. Yeah. <laughs> so after after talking, he gets the job, and then he we get a scene where um, uh, Andy, Snakebite Andy, is waking up, excuse me, on a beach. It's morning now, and she's like, whoa, I feel different. And she's like, that, you told me that wouldn't be painful. You told me that wasn't going to be painful. It was painful. She's like, well, you died, essentially. Now she has been reborn as like a quasi immortal person. Nothing appears to be different in terms of like her existence. She's not like a vampire where she can't go out in the sunlight or anything. There are no real drawbacks except for the fact that you now rely on steam to survive. And you might think that someone who made it their mission to punish men who are preying on children would have any qualms about preying on children in order to survive. Uh, but as we will see later, she just doesn't for no reason. Now she's an immortal, quasi-immortal vampire, and she's just one of the group, and it's that simple, and here we are. Wow, great. Meanwhile... Uh, and she's one of the mean, only antagonists who's going to get any characterization. All of the rest of them in the background who've been there longer, um, yep. they, they're not going to get any characterization at all so this is this is the thin as thin as we're gonna get yeah so once we get that uh uh, danny is back home at some point and he he gets a oh before we do that he's at the the care facility the hospice yeah and he's he's mopping floors but he sees a cat go into someone's room he's like no stay out of that guy's room but when he's in there he sees a a patient who's dying and the patient says oh no the cat means i'm gonna die soon because the cat always knows it's that sort of uh I, i was gonna call it cliche but that's a little bit harsh the cat seems to have a sense which is feels totally in keeping in this world Right. Yeah, the cats shine that, now too. But fuck it, fuck it. Cats well, can shine. You know what? <laughs> no, but there are there are instances instances of like stories of that in real life of animals who seem to like be able to identify people who like have cancers and things like that. Oh yeah, no, that, yeah. We, so that's a real enough thing that like that in this world we'd interpret that as like oh animals have some sort of ability like that too. Sometimes it's like that's fine. I totally believe that, honestly. Look, man, cats <laughs> cats are the guardians of the underworld in The Mummy, so as far as I'm concerned, this is a tie-in. <laughs> yeah, like, that's perfectly in keeping with me. Uh, so the cat has appeared to this guy, and he's like, oh, no, that means I'm going to die soon. And at first, Danny's like, no, uh, the, 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 don't say that. It's just a cat. And he's like, no, I'm definitely going to die soon. And he's like, I'm scared. I'm scared when I die that it'll, the, there'll be nothing. And at first, he's like, look, I'm not a doctor. Do you want me to get a doctor? And he's like, no, 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 no. I, I think I think you are a doctor. You're Doctor Sleep. Hey, he, said he said the thing. He said the thing. He calls him Doctor Sleep because he was like, when you die, it's just it's just like going to sleep. And he's like, wow, you you're you're no you're not like any doctor I've ever been with. He's like, I can get a real doctor if you want. And he goes, no, you are a doctor. 
You're Dr. Sleep. That's like, how we got a superhero lame. name, man. That's pretty lame. <laughs> pretty clumsy. It couldn't it couldn't be any more subtle than that, guys. What are we? Some kind of suicide squad? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a little Han Solo esque, honestly. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's, how, yeah, it's way more accurate. I'm going to call you Han Solo because you are Han and you are Solo. <laughs> so he's comforting this dying patient. Oh, who's no. scared. He's like, uh, I'm afraid there's going to be nothing when I die. And he's like, no, it'll just be like going to sleep. Like, it's all it is. And the guy's like, no, I'm scared. And then using his psychic telepathy powers says to him telepathically, no, it'll just be like going to sleep. He basically repeats himself, adds a couple extra words, but he's like, it, like true, final, restful sleep. And that's enough to convince him. I don't know why. He says the same thing, only telepathically. And the guy's not more like perplexed by how that was possible. I guess his like gut instinct is like, this is some weird angel who's appeared on my deathbed or something. I don't know how else to explain it. But he tells him the same thing he said out loud telepathically, and that's enough to convince him and comfort him. And he's immediately like, oh, thank you, Doc. Oh, thank you, Mr. Dr. Sleep. Like, and that's all it takes. And then he dies, <laughs> and steam comes out of his mouth, which I guess means he had the shining. Um, well, he, he must have. He must have had because... some kind of shine, yeah, because Danny could talk to him. But is that really, is that, can he only talk to people who shine now? Or is that just, are we just? Yes. Okay. I didn't know if we were throwing that out of the window as well, because like it, I, I, I mean, I know that he could shine, which is weird, because I remember a time where only a very few people could do it. Um, and I mean, I guess Dick did say that you know, lots of there's some people who have it and they don't even know it, but basically everyone who dies in this movie must have had the shine because they. <laughs> They make clear through lines of dialogue from Rose the Hat at different uh, at some other point in the movie that like steam comes from people who shine. That's what the steam is. It's not like ev the and based on the imagery, it's kind of unfortunate because the implication seems to be that like shining people have souls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some implications about everyone else, but they do make it clear. Well, there are plenty exclusive. of shining people in this movie because not only is Danny one, but his alcoholic buddy and bruce greenwood and like pretty much everybody only... he meets shines right except for the girl's parents basically yeah they're the only two yeah speaking of the girl um he comes back to his place after a long day at hospice and he sees hello written on his wall he's like got a wall that's chalkboard for some reason it's because Previous. the former tenant was a math student and he would he painted it like a blackboard sure. so that he could yeah yeah because notebooks aren't a thing it's fine and so <laughs> the message says hello, and then he writes hi. So now he has a telepathic shining pen pal from from like several states away. So that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, somehow she just found him, I guess. I... Yep. Um, it, it, the really cringe thing about the director's cut is that there are title cards that come up that say like chapter three, like oh, empty ghosts sweet and things Jesus. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I hate it too um you remember how the the title cards in the shining kind of like deteriorate the sense of time passing like they mm -hmm. go from being like a month later to yes. like tuesday to like 4 p.m you know like remember how they have like they assist in the storytelling a little yeah. bit in the atmosphere mm -hmm. yeah and and they always punctuate really important moments. Every time the title comes up that says like Tuesday or a month later or 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. Like as, as the story's getting closer and closer to some sort of final bombastic conclusion, every single time the title card comes up, it's right after a very important line as, to, as a way of like signposting like, boom, that was important. Remember that. And like, I feel like that's underappreciated too because there's a lot of important moments that are... Because the titles in the director's cut just kind of come up randomly, and they don't like deline. We're not like delineating like, oh, this chapter is from his perspective. We're not doing anything like that. They just titles come up without really delineating a different break in the story, mm -hmm. and we've just added a, a vaguely poetic title to it. It's really lame. And maybe strange, that's and like maybe that's why they got cut in the first place. 
Yeah, there's a lot of things that I'm like, well, I understand why that was cut because this is worse. <laughs> so uh, somewhere in here, uh, we're, we're five months later now. Actually, I don't even no. know if it's five. No, it's eight years. <laughs> it's eight years. Wait, is it eight years later and he's only five months sober? Oh, okay. no, I'm misremembering. Sorry. It is eight years later. He's eight years yeah. sober. But he starts talking about how, like, I'm up here um, and, uh, you know, I never really knew my father all that well, you know, and all I really know <laughs> of him now is his his alcoholism and all that sort of stuff and his anger, yada, yada. Um, but I know that, like, one time he stood up here with a chip in his hand wanting to get well a uh, chip for five months right before and he doesn't finish his thought because he's talking about the events of the first movie and he's like one well, like it basically he's trying to acknowledge that there was some good in him and that he wanted to get well and now he can which, have a connection yeah which with we know dad, is not true which we which, know is not like, true. i mean it's not impossible but i don't know how anyone could watch stanley kubrick's the shining and think that Jack in that movie was going to AA meetings and wanted to get well. Fuck off. No, he wasn't. Remember that line where he says, here's to five miserable months on the wagon yep. and all the irreparable harm it's done me? Yeah, he. Yeah. that guy strikes me as the type who really wanted to get well deep down. Yeah. And was going to AA meetings. Yeah. Yeah. No, he wasn't. Fuck off. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> off, Steven. <laughs> I wonder if Stephen, like you know, to... I, it's interesting. I wonder if Stephen King is so mad about Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining because Jack, it, I mean, let's be real. Jack in the original Shining is sort of Stephen King's stand in, right? Yeah. He's an alcoholic writer. Cases. Yeah. Who wants to get better uh, and is a good person deep down, but is haunted by, you know, specters and, and, and the evil, the itis of uh, alcoholism. Um do you think he, Stephen King is so upset about Stanley Kubrick's version because he made Jack the bad guy? And, I, I and do Stephen feel like King he took it personally. Just some kind of personal attack or something. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like that. <laughs> I, it would not surprise me at all if the, if Stanley Kubrick saying, "No, this guy is actually kind of a piece of shit deep down, and it's really not external forces acting on him. He really just is kind of a bad person." No, -uh. <laughs> no. -uh. No, uh, I'm I'm a good guy. <laughs> it's like I can I can believe that he took that personally. I do want to commend uh, Eric in the chat for uh, doing some fun like Star Wars Shining combos. Like Shining beings, are we not this crude matter? <laughs> 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 and the other one is if uh, it was if a thousand voices cried out it and were suddenly when we're suddenly silenced. I fear something shiny has happened. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Bravo. Uh, Al me says, hell yeah, dudes. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Thank you, Al me. It's very kind of you. Glad, you. glad you're having a good time. So, where are we? Um, we've learned that Jack Nicholson really we've, wanted to get well, Yeah, we, we've fast-forwarded through all eight years of Danny's 12-step sobriety program, uh, and it's over now. He's sober for eight <laughs> years. We see another hospice victim. He, this is a regular thing he does now, because he's the doctor sleep. And yep. this guy, he helps comfort by helping him relive one of his childhood memories. So he can. The guy wasn't actively thinking it. He just pulled it out of his deep well of memories and is helping him relive it. And when the guy, like when he pulls it up, he's like, oh, yeah, that is a great memory. Thank you. And then he <laughs> goes out on a good note. So he's not reading people's minds. He can like help people remember things from their past. Which is not unheard of or like totally unreasonable, but it's just we're piling up new abilities here. Um, well, and what could that guy shine too? Does that guy emit steam well, it must when he be. dies? Yeah, there's steam that comes out of him when he dies too. Everybody at this hospice is shiny. What, what is this? What's happening here? Maybe he only takes shiny patients. It's just, it's not really as rare as we thought. <laughs> Calls out to Dick. He's like, Dick, Dick, I think it's more common than you said. <laughs> what else were you lying about <laughs> i wish you told me about these goddamn lock boxes sooner yeah you could have um, said so you i wish you had done the lock boxing you asshole yeah yeah there's that too so um he helps another patient out and then we we fast forward ahead and now rose the hat is up on her uh rv and she's like oh, meditating. She's meditating yeah 
Yeah, she's trying to locate other shining people psychically remotely. That's a thing they can do. So she she's looking for this uh for Abra, the the little black girl, because she is oh my god, she's her white whale. She even says something about this is my white whale, in case it wasn't obvious. This is the big one, you know? Yeah, she does say that. And this is this is this is the scene that really, really quite frustrates me. Um, because I, I think it's terrible. So Crawdaddy comes up and he's like, Hey, um uh what's 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 the tall guy's name? What were you calling him? Tall guy? Uh Lurch. It's Lurch. Lurch. It's yeah. Lurch from yeah. the Adams family movies. Yeah, also the fireman from Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Let's, that guy. Very tall. Lurch. I don't Lurch. want to remember Twin Peaks, thanks. No, but he was it's that's from the good stuff in Twin Peaks. It's, it's from the bad stuff too. <laughs> oh, that's true. Fine. That's fine. Lurch. Lurch is getting old and he's he's not doing so well. And Rose the Hat's like, yeah, he hasn't been doing well since Nixon was in office. And they're like, well, he needs to feed. Come on, you gotta open more of those canisters. And she's like, come on, we've been longer without having steam. And he's like, lurching doing so hot. Like, come on, I might need the extra energy if I'm gonna track the boy I'm tracking, because he's tracking some some baseball player kid. We'll get more of him in a minute. Um, and she's like, fucking fine, whatever, you know, we'll open up some more steam. And then they kind of launch into a conversation about how the world isn't as steamy as it used to be, which is, first of all, a really <laughs> lame phrase. <laughs> it was so stupid. <laughs> it oh seems like God. someone lamenting the fact that there's not as many sex scenes in movies anymore. <laughs> that's what, there ain't that's as I'm just saying 70s boobs were different, man. I don't know. <laughs> so... Crawdaddy's like, come on, you've been sensing it too. The world's just not as steamy anymore. We keep getting more of these shining kids, but they're they're less fulfilling every time. It's almost like steam is disappearing from the world. And man, I could hate have this fucking fooled so me. Uh, yeah, it could have fooled me because everyone in this has remarkable powers compared to the original movie. Well, and like the, ev- a- literally every person that fucking Danny's been talking to for the past hour of this movie shines so like where is the where where's the lack of shine coming from yeah well they keep every time they keep killing shiny the, the, the steamy. they don't make Sorry, them like where's the lack of the steaminess all those steamy steamy, just, steamy children really it's it, hugh it's that they just don't make them like they used to all right <laughs> old old steamy kids used to taste better and have have more <laughs> nutrition in them these new ones, uh, they're just kind of thin, empty calories. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not hitting like it used these, to. These man. GMO steams. <laughs> so, and uh, you know what? Talk for a second because I want to look up the exact line because it's really, really cringe. Okay. So, say, uh, say, say something real quick. I gotta, I gotta uh, find the exact line where he's talking about how things aren't steamy anymore. St- oh boy, this the la- the real lack of steam. Okay, I found it. There so. You go. Um, it's like when Rube say 50 years ago, people used to be more neighborly and, and he's like, but it's true, Rosie, there's less steam out there and it's weaker too. I don't know if it's their cell phones or diets or their Netflix or what, but I'm not picking up many cents these days. And the ones that I do, Rosie are just not that. And then he gets cut off. I forgot about that. that. It's their cell phones or their diets. I don't know if it's their cell phones or diets or Netflix or what, but people aren't shining like they used to anymore. Now, this really annoys me because it seems to be this like, oh, like magic is disappearing from the world, which is really annoying. And I think it makes for really lame world building because if we imagined what, what is the world of The Shining, right? The world of The Shining is very, very similar to our world, except for some people and very few have psychic abilities, mostly people don't know it, and they're not aware of it, right? And so you could very easily extrapolate from the world building of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining to the fact that, like, old tales and myths about magic and, you know, other sort of supernatural things, that The Shining had some influence over those, right? That, like, people, like, like magical stories... Uh, you know, The Shining had something to do with the magic of old. Yeah. And so if we if we want to think about the modern world and why, you know, people aren't aware of magic anymore, and the more logical assumption seems to me to be that, like, it's gone sort of into the subconscious, 
right? It's more, it's like people aren't aware of it anymore, but they still have it in the same amount that they used to have it. It's just what was more explicit is now kind of like, uh, it's been submersed in the subconscious and like, you know, it's, it's, it, it comes out in other ways. You could even yeah. say like, whereas before, if, you know, in like very old traditional religious societies that had more magical sort of supernatural world, uh, worldviews, but the shining would have folded nicely into that. Right. But like, you've been touched by God or God is working through yeah. you, yada, yada, all that sort of stuff. But in the modern world, we don't have a way of understanding that anymore. And it's been kind of that the, the knowledge of it has been lost or whatever you might say. So in the modern world, it's kind of lurking underneath things and showing up in unexpected and uncontrollable ways, right? That seems to make a lot more sense to me. And it seems to be much more in keeping with how it's described. Now, it's it's actually like, well, people don't believe in Santa Claus anymore. And so the, you know, magic's, there's no more magic in the world. It's, e it's even worse than that, though, in that it's like, oh, but their diets aren't as like, so first off, I don't think there's <laughs> anybody who can dispute the fact that we like kids now eat better and exercise more than kids in the 70s. <laughs> That's like that's. Uh, have you mm -hmm. seen the shit that people in the seventies used to eat? Like fucking fondue pots and spaghetti jello, like spaghetti o jello at parties and stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like they were animals in the seventies, okay? And they <laughs> ate like fucking animals. The health food craze. There's a reason that that line uh, in that one uh, blue Swede song, or not blue, in that one song, the pina colada song about like I'm not much into health food, right? Like health food to them was eating oatmeal for breakfast. Health, like, health food was gay in the 70s. Yeah, like, like you I... didn't eat health food in the 70s. That's not what, like, you smoked three packs a day, and you drank a six-pack when you got home, and then you did it all again in the morning when you were getting ready to go to work, all right? Like, there's no way you can argue that the diet of people now is worse than it was in the 1970s. That's just, I, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Yes. But True. cell phone, Though, like, I don't mind the cell phone thing as much, necessarily. I mean, it's still so cringe. It's but like, it is uh, cringe. Kids these, these days with their cell phones, because these are, like, immortal beings that have been around for, like, probably hundreds of years. And, like, man, there's no more magic in the world. It's probably these Netflixes and chills that the kids yeah. are doing. Like, that's, <laughs> it's, like, one step away from that. That's <laughs> it, No, yeah, it's it's pretty much exactly that. And so I, I just, I don't like the implication that like, well, first of all, it's not evidenced by the story because everyone in this story has like incredible power compared to the last one. But the implication that like, oh, magic is just disappearing from the world. Whereas like, I think, you know, the same intuitions that led people of old to invent myths and stories and to believe like supernatural things, those show up, especially in the horror genre. You know, you would think a horror writer would have a better understanding of that. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Well, like, you would hope, like magic, but... Oh, like magical, magical thinking still exists. It just, like, when it's not... When it's not properly folded into a more coherent worldview, it tends to rear its ugly head in unexpected places. And that seems like what's happening in The Shining, honestly. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you could imagine that, like, a Buddhist monk or something like that would have the ability to shine and could use it to do all sorts of, you know, more like enlightenment seeking and uh, benevolent things, you know, but like how it manifests in The Shining is like, you know, people's deepest, darkest desires that they don't want to face up to are rearing their ugly head and taking control of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so the idea that like, oh, I guess I guess magic's just disappearing in the world because they don't make shining kids like they used to. Well, this is like we've talked about this quite a lot before, but this is sort of the evidence of like those those paranormal or the horror writers like Mike, your Mike Flanagan's or, you know, your other generic spiritual horror stuff who want to have that without the spirituality. Like, yeah, it bothers me. Yeah, it does. I really don't like it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sick of seeing it, honestly, especially when you watch like a because supernatural horror is like will never go away. It seems it's the most reliable genre of film I've ever seen. You know, Westerns come and go action movies like they're, they're pretty reliable. But even then, they kind of go up and down in popularity, you know, like uh, uh, superhero movies are kind of on the wane a little bit. But supernatural horror always gets butts in seats. 
even even if they're not very good movies, because I think people long to see those sort of things, whether they believe in ghosts, whether they believe in demons or supernatural things, it's explicitly they um they kind of long to see those things embodied in stories, if nothing else. If, if, if for no other reason than to see those kind of supernatural instincts that everyone has to some degree play out in a story rather than believing them to be true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like <sighs> supernatural horror is super common, but so much supernatural horror these days, it's like, oh, there's a, there's a demon that, that, that was created by like a, like a horrible traumatic thing that happened here 20 years ago. And now it's haunting people. And it's like, Oh, so there are demons and ghosts now, but no one ever goes like, "Oh, so are there angels and does God exist?" Yeah, like they, yeah, that would be my first question if I were in a haunted house and there was like an evil demon after me. I'd be like, "Oh, so so angels so, must be real, right?" So like, Christianity is probably real, right? You know what I mean? Like, it's just it's, like, ki- it's kind of like how like so. how in Buffy, right? That like they've they use crucifixes and stuff to stop the vampires and holy water and all that. But like, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of religious like they they touch around the religious aspects of it because Buffy the Vampire Slayer is one of the most religious shows that tries really hard not, not to, be, to religious. be religious. Yeah, it like very goes out of its like because like all these de- there's a hierarchy of demons in the underworld and stuff like that. But like, and and okay, so in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, crucifixes work on vampires, but the show doesn't make god a thing or christianity real or a thing it even tries to make uh, villains out of priest characters sometimes which is not like to say you can't ever do that obviously but like like why why do you think the crucifixes work yeah yeah (laughs) the holy water works you know like (laughs) yeah all you know what i mean it's like especially with vampire stuff like vampires are a christian monster you know what i mean like it's yeah. the power it's it's the power of Jesus Christ that can defeat a vampire. You know what I mean? And so like when you have stuff like this where there's like demons and supernatural entities but like the the light side for lack of a better word of of religious and supernatural belief systems is just ignored because they 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 the people making them aren't religious so they don't want to like treat them as if they're real or they don't want to alienate people who ne- aren't necessarily of that faith. They believe that like, Oh, if we have a horror movie and it's like explicitly Catholic these days, then any- anyone else who isn't Catholic isn't going to resonate with it. Dude, I which do not even true. want like, to remember the exorcist. About, yeah. The exorcist, the yeah, yeah, one, on. they remade that. And I do not even want to think about what, like, I know that there's a line at the beginning from the mother, from the original one about how she wasn't allowed in the room with the demon because of the patriarchy. And... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that clip, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. From what I understand of, uh, I think I watched the Half half in the Bag, uh, where yeah. the intermediate guys yeah, talk yeah, about a believer, and they talk about how they had to assemble a loose collection of like non-denominational religious figures to team up together. Yeah. And it's like, that's so lame. <laughs> and I thought, it's funny because it was very interesting to watch because I, I, I've seen enough of their content to know that like Mike Stoklasa is not like a super devoutly religious guy. I don't even think he is religious at all, but it's so funny to watch him be like, but it's not, it doesn't make any sense if it's not just Catholic. You know what I mean? Like, like that it's like, Oh, all religions are kind of equally good and can be used to fight against evil. He's like, that's lame. And it's really interesting to watch a non-believer. I think recognize. Yeah. That there's something wrong with that, or there's something unsatisfying, or not compelling, or not scary, as he put it after that, because it, you know what I mean. The, it's it's just kind of all loose connection of like vague religious positive platitudes that can defeat evil, rather than like something more, more meat on its bones. Yeah, and like I think I'm seeing this more and more a sort of shift in attitude where people who aren't even religious themselves. Uh, who recognizing that like it's kind of lame to ignore that in stories where you where like for the sake of the story it makes perfect sense you know like why can't that be real in the stories and then we yeah. can explore that uh, yeah, anyway. no i'm, I'm with it, you it frustrates me it's a, it's a big problem i have with a lot of supernatural horror me too uh the shining isn't like it doesn't like go it, out of it. It doesn't way. have any of the religious like stuff. You no, don't, not really. It's not there. 
it's not well, uh, I mean, you might explore it in a in a sequel to it for sure like grown up danny might have some thoughts well, about well if the grown up episode. danny is going through a 12 step program yeah you'd think that yeah. that might have some kind of influence on his worldview as yeah. he's moving through it but um mm-hmm. we're just not even going to bother showing any of that and he's fine now so um let's move on <laughs> yeah let's yeah. move on to his arc uh as being the the weird uncle to the to the mary sue character and i uh i'll be right back uh, give me one okay more. um so I'll, I'll kind of i'll keep inching the plot forward uh after having that conversation about how man they just don't shine like they used to uh he convinces rose the hat to open up a steam canister for uh lurch because he is getting pretty old and he's not looking so good and so they open up a steam canister so everybody can feed and so that's good. And then this is, I think, maybe the second time. Yes, this is the second time that we've seen uh, Annie. I've already forgotten her name. Snakebite Andy. Andy's her name. We see her eating the steam that I assume she knows is from the soul of a child that they killed. Still doesn't seem to have a problem with it. That's strange. Uh, it's almost like she stopped being a character when she became an immortal vampire. You know, you think you might have an arc about someone who was who was turned into one of these shining vampires and then has conflicted feelings about what they're doing and what, what it takes. You know what I mean? Maybe she could turn against them or something. There could be an arc there, but nope, we don't do that. She's just totally fine with eating the souls of children now. When an old man wants to have sex with a child, that's obviously horrible, but eating children, that's fine. <laughs> Literally preach. Oh, thank you, Fed Zeppelin. That's very, it's very generous of you. Yeah, it's, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. It's sort of supernatural horror that just like refuses to acknowledge religion because they just refuse to affirm it. And it's like, well, I don't know. I feel like you're taking, you're taking only the dark stuff from from religious and supernatural paradigms, and just refusing to acknowledge the good unless it's really generic, like. Uh, we got to pour holy water on it or something. Very strange. Not to mention they've been existing for that long in the wealth of tech. They'd... <laughs> yes. Yes. So, yeah, for anyone who hasn't seen the movie, in, in Doctor Sleep, when these immortal vampire demons are um, eating or, or breathing, I should say, the souls of children, they have this weird thermos dispersal gas system, but instead of instead of like using tubes to make sure they get all of it or something or using like, oh, they could use like hookah tubes. That would be pretty funny if they all sat around and smoked the dead children like hookah. That would actually make more sense though because you would lose less to the air. No, instead what they do is they just kind of let it all out and then they just waft it into their faces. And it's like, man, I feel like a lot of that went to waste. You know, especially if this is the only thing keeping you alive and you don't have much to go on. And you got to make this last for 30 years. I would probably, I, I wouldn't just waft. I, I would probably <laughs> make sure I got every last ounce. Can't risk offending any of the other religions by canonizing one. I think that is partly, partly their concern. I think it's a dumb concern. I think the reason that's a dumb concern is that we've had, like some of the most classic horror stories, like uh, The Exorcist, you know, The Exorcist is a very Catholic movie, right? Explicitly so. And it's one of the most highly regarded horror movies of all time. No doubt many people who like The Exorcist aren't Catholic, and they aren't bothered by the fact that, like, oh, it's Catholic instead of, you know, fucking Hindu or something. So I, I, I think there's a, there's a, this ties into a larger problem that I see. It, this comes... With a lot of stuff with like trying to make sure you have diverse casts and stuff like that and that you equally equally or equitably even worse represent all these different communities because every story needs to reflect the society we live in i get really annoyed at that because i find that what people like the most and resonate with the most is cultural specificity so if you take something like parasite Parasite's not a diverse movie. Parasite doesn't try to represent all of the world's populations. It's a very specifically South Korean movie. And it has very specific South Korean uh, class 
politics and cultural issues coming to a head in that movie. And it's so culturally specific that it can speak to everyone, which is partly why, in addition to it being a very competent and very compelling and well-made movie, it resonates with so many people. It doesn't, like, you don't need to see yourself specific, your specific cultural upbringing or even worse, like your skin color on screen have it resonate with people. And I think the same thing applies with religions and stuff. Like if uh, there was a, I didn't watch it because it didn't get good reviews, but there was a horror movie that came out this year. I don't remember what it was called, but it was, it was about a, um, a young Indian woman, I, I assume living in America because they're speaking American English and she's dealing with some sort of like supernatural spirit, but everything about it looked very culturally Indian. You know, it was using like what I assume for like for I don't really know, but like like Hindu imagery and iconography and like vessels for containing it, like like a folk, like an Indian folk story. And it was playing on a lot of those things. I wish it got better reviews. I might have gone to see it, but like I would happily go see a movie like that because it's it's, it's unique and has a specific it has cultural specificity, as I said, and I find that much more interesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't watch that and go, "Ugh, they canonized Hinduism as the real religion." Therefore, I can't watch it. Well, you yeah. would hope you would hope most people would be able to separate those two. Yeah, like it, it's you know for a story. Um, yeah, that's just. A, I think that ties into a broader the the fear of like alienating other people by having it be one specific religion in a story is the kind of same dumb fear that, that, that pushes people away from focusing on specific cultures or specific, you know, specific world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because like they, it has to represent everybody and especially like not no movie, sh no movie should aim to represent everybody. I'm, I'm in my opinion. Anyway, we should probably keep going because we got a whole movie to talk about. So uh, now that they've fed and they're all feeling energetic, Crawdaddy's like, hey, I think I know where to go to find this guy I've been tracking. It's this little boy, and he lives in Iowa, and I'm going to go find him. He's a baseball player, so he goes to a baseball game. Yeah. And there's some very cringe, unsubtle dialogue of two dads in the stands watching this kid who's about to... Uh, little Jacob Tremblay, he's up at the plate, and he's about to... He's about to Hit the ball, and the two uh, the two dads in the stands are like, "Now you got to watch this number nine number nineteen kid. He's great. It's almost like he can sense what what the pitcher's going to do. It's almost like he can read his mind." And I'm like, oh, "It's God. almost like he it's almost like he shines or something. I don't know." Yeah, it's one step away from that. It's like, and it's also these are clearly like bit part actors. They're not especially good, so it just clunks so hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and then this is the part where so he. You know, it's such a useless point because, like, one as soon as we see the kid, we know Crawdaddy is looking for somebody, right? He, he's yes. he's looking for a kid somewhere in Iowa. As soon as we see the kid hit a dinger out of the park, we know it's him, right? We don't mm -hmm. need the dialogue from the two dads being like, "Damn, it's almost like he knows exactly what pitch the pitcher's gonna throw in it." Wow, almost like he can read his mind. You know what you could have done if you if you wanted to have those dads. Say anything, you'd be like, "Now watch this number nineteen, number nineteen kid. He's gonna be really good." And then, yeah. like first pitch home run, it'd be like, "Oh, okay," you know. And then when they go up to him, it's like, "Hey, kid, you know you were really good. You got a real talent," you know. But like they just make it so explicit. Oh, it's even worse because they even they even have him say he hits the ball every time, and I'm like, "Well, does that mean it was oh a good God. throw every time?" I just <laughs> I just wanna I just wanna point out as well. Like, even if you knew what pitch was coming every time, like, hitting a baseball with a bat is statistically one of the most difficult things to do in any sport. Like, there yeah, is which is why even... some of the best players are batting, like, 300-something, like, 350 or something is really good. Yeah. So, like, 35 times out of 100 yeah. is really good. <laughs> so, this is a 100% hit. Like... That is fucking insane. That's more than just shining, okay? Yeah, this, this guy is written by someone Superman. who clearly doesn't understand the sport. Yeah, well, you know? yeah, he doesn't understand he's... much of fucking anything outside of, you know. His own. Anyway, so he's, he's just really, he's just incredibly talented because nothing can be subtle, you know? Everything has to be extreme. 
So they they follow the kid home. He's walking home because I guess his parents didn't come to his baseball game. The kid hits a 100% <laughs> average and his parents didn't come to his god. Maybe they're just like, we've seen it all. Yeah, you're too good, man. Call us when you're like, in the majors. It, yeah, Call us when you, make, when you make the... <laughs> he's walking home by himself from the baseball game. And so I guess that's very convenient for the plot to happen. Anyway, a van pulls up and it's a creepy van too which it's is a creepy fun. van with a big cre- isn't that i want i want to do this part real quick so there's a creepy man with a big fat creepy guy leaning out of the side of it talking mm-hmm. to the kid and he goes hey lucky number 19 why don't you get in basically how don't you get in the van you're pretty good at baseball you know you're pretty cute he doesn't say that he, he he might no, he's, he might as well um and the kid says, no, no, thanks. I'm, you know, I'm, my house is right over here. Actually, I think I'll be okay. And then the back of the van opens and Andy, the snake bite, the snake charmer, she's sitting in there and she does, you want to get in the van. And I'm the only thing I could think when this happened is like, why didn't you just lead with her? <laughs> Good why, question. why did you put the, the creepy fat guy who I Why believe his name it? is like Mike the Chunk or something like that is what they call him. Oh, well, yeah. they. I don't know where they get that from, but she does say that, yes. So yeah. they lead with him for no reason. And then Andy just goes, you want to get in the van? You're our friends. And he's like, I want to get in the van. You're my friends. And that's all it takes. So what that seems to imply, because remember, Andy could not mind control Jedi mind trick Rose the Hat, uh, is that this kid isn't all that shiningy. He's not even all that shiny. He's batting a thousand in little league baseball, <laughs> which like also you have to imagine most of those pitches aren't very good either because they're you know, like, yeah, he's never faced it was, a he, decent pitcher. He, 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 well, no, I know it, it's I don't even mean that. I mean that like the, the younger the the pitcher is, the less they're even going to be hittable pitches. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, oh my god! Anyway, can you imagine, so he's like, batting the, a the thousand so quick. between a, a batter who can shine and a pitcher who can shine. Oh man, it'd be like watching a normal baseball game. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be How really exciting. boring. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, yeah. So then, so they kidnap this kid, and uh, then they go to some abandoned industrial park, and they 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 tie him up. They tie him up to four different posts in the ground, but then they need to hold his limb de- limbs down anyway, so I don't really know why they... It doesn't matter. They, they tie him up, and this is probably, at least when I watched it the first time, this is the only scene I liked. Yeah, um, this one's it's, effective. In, it's effective. In that... it's, got, it's got some problems we'll talk about, um, especially like a lack of subtlety problem, but this is the one, one of the scenes that I'm like, okay, that was actually scary. So they tie this kid up, And they're holding him down, and he's crying and screaming, let me go. And he's a good actor. He's doing a good job, like genuinely frightened for him. Rose the Hat comes up. God, I can't believe her name is Rose the Hat. She comes up, and she pulls out a knife. And he's like, are you going to hurt me? And she goes, yes. And I'm like, oh, that's scary. Like, that that, that was really effective to me. And then they made it a little less subtle by her expositing. I don't know why, like, it's not necessary for him to know this. I don't know why she's saying it to him. She's saying it to the audience. She says, pain purifies steam. Fear which too. Is why, which is why I'm tor- going to torture you alive. And it's like, I didn't need that exposition. The, like, it was ominous and creepy when he was like, are you going to hurt me? And instead of lying, she just says, yes. Because she's, like, getting off on it. Like, you can have the pain purify steam line later if you want. I don't think it's necessary. but. They clearly think it is. So then they kill this kid and they eat his soul. And it's pretty it's pretty scary and effective, honestly. Yeah, I, I like I the scene. Good I scene. actually thought the scene yeah. was pretty decent. And I remember thinking when I first watched it, the first time I watched it, I'm like, man, this is a horrible sequel to The Shining. But it was at its best when it ignored the original completely and did its own thing. Now I'm not convinced of that, except for this scene. This yeah. is the one. This is the scene where I'm like, oh, man. There's a movie here, potentially. You didn't do it, but like that's scary. They're just killing kids. Also notice Andy is right there. She is no longer she no longer has any qualms about preying on children. Um, even though that's what her whole MO was before. So she's not a character. So that's fun. That's yeah. exciting. 
she's just a villain, a superpower. She's she's a plot device, basically. Yep. Um, yeah. So then, Ab- you, turns out Abra more. is spying on this. Oh, she could feel ritual. that. Yeah, she could feel it from miles away. Even though she's never met this kid, his cries out in pain, she could feel. Um, I guess, because all Shining people are just connected now. They don't even need to meet each other. <laughs> they can be yeah. hundreds of miles away, but uh, they don't even need to meet each other anymore. They're all just connected like an open ham radio kind of thing. So, and then they kill this kid, and then they're like, they're like... <laughs> They're sharing the steam from mouth to mouth, which is incredibly wasteful, but they're just going for the like vaguely sexual component. Uh, they all their eyes are all glowing, and uh, Abra wakes up in a cold sweat, like, oh my god, oh my god, and she starts screaming. And Rose the Hat feels that she felt it and is like, whoa. And then Red Rum explodes out of onto the wall in Danny's uh, apartment and it, it, the, the, the explosion or like the big shake throws him off the bed and he looks into the mirror and, and sees red, red rum, rum and he turns around to look at it not through the mirror and it says murder but the funniest thing to, to me about this is that murder has the last R backwards so it looks more like red rum from the original movie but Abra is quite a bit older than Danny Torrance was. She should know better how to write letters. She's like in middle school. Yeah. But it's still, oh, but the letter's backwards because remember The Shining? So all yeah. these, all the major players are telepathically connected sometimes when it's plot relevant. So she, she sends they this shine message now. to her. They sh- <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh. they shine now. So Danny gets this message, this this spooky help message that just says murder um, telepathically from the pen pal he still hasn't met. Uh, Rose the Hat felt her, felt Abra feel Jacob Tremblay's death. So that's interesting, I guess. He writes on the chalkboard, he says who, as in who murder, and she says the baseball boy, as <laughs> And Danny Torrance is like looking at it like, oh, the baseball boy. Like of as course. if he had, of course. <laughs> have any understanding of what that means. So then they they eat most of his soul all in one fell swoop, which is not a good idea if they're trying to save it for 30 years. But then they put the last little tiny bit into a canister. And that'll and last they, him for 40 years, I guess. And then they, they bury him and leave. Meanwhile, uh, Abra is... Um, traumatized and rose the hats like oh man i felt i felt this this girl that i've been going after she was here tonight and let me tell you she's she shines brighter than she shined, oh my, oh she my shined bright like a diamond she shined bright like a diamond and she's she's <laughs> a big diamond i gotta go get the diamond and she's my white whale you don't you don't even you don't, you even, don't even know, know how, bro you don't even you yeah. don't even understand Diamonds are forever, man. They're like yes. a girl's best friend or something. I don't know. So uh, the next morning, Abra is talking to her mom and her mom's like, hey, are you OK? And she's like, I'm fine. And this is going to start the, the steady decline in her character, because at least when she was witnessing and feeling the, the, the baseball boy's death telepathically, don't, you know, setting aside how stupid it is that she felt that. Like, and how it doesn't really make much sense. Setting that aside, she was at least horrified during that scene. She wasn't acting very well, but she was scared. So I'm like, okay, that's good. From here on out, she's the least, she's the most least interesting character I've probably ever seen because she's hardly ever scared in any situation from the rest of the movie on. She's not traumatized by really by all the horrible things that happen. She's just kind of like, sad a little bit sometimes at most and then oh god i can't i can't wait to talk about it but there are scenes where she's facing off against big bad scary people and she's not even scared at all because she's not a character it's almost hmm i'll save it she's she's like something else the next day she is in the library and abra that is and she's looking at the computer and she's looking around her fellow classmates middle schoolers i'm assuming in in the computer library area and she's reading all their thoughts 
it's like, man, uh, we should, we should, I guess this, mo- this movie is not concerned with the ethics of mind reading, but she can, she can pe- read people's minds with ease. She doesn't have to break a sweat. She doesn't have to do anything. Uh, she's just reading everyone's minds. And then she's looking up on the computer and she sees, she's looking up missing kid reports. And then she finds little Jacob Tremblay. He, he went missing. That's the one I've been looking for. And so now she's going to like use her mind to try and track figure him. out yeah. what happened to him. And so she, just by looking at his missing person's photo, she like connects to his memories. Remember, he's dead now and his soul has been sucked up by shining vampires. And so she can see his memories enough to remember what it was like to be him being taken in the van to this place. In enough detail that she can find the exact name of the little abandoned uh, industrial yard where they killed him. Yeah. So let's. Shh. I just want to make that super super clear. She's like, oh, she she wakes up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, in a cold sweat because she can feel the pain of a shining kid that she's never met dying hundreds of miles away, and then based on looking at a photo of him, she can retrace his memories in order to get a detailed picturesque view of the name of the place where they are so she can track them down later. Super easy, barely an inconvenience. That's exactly exactly right. right. Yeah, she does it without even without even breaking a sweat. She barely even blinks an eye. She like twitches a little bit. She That's is it. so in control of her shining f- uh, faculties and she is like the shiniest. She's the shiniest. She's the brightest diamond you've ever seen. So now she knows exactly where to go. And then, oh God. And then she goes over to the window and she presses up against the window. And then like the whole house tilts. Oh, but, right. Yeah. The house tilts and she's like holding onto the window up and maybe. And then it. suddenly she's in a grocery store and suddenly she's in the mind of Rose the Hat in a grocery store. And Rose the Hat's like, what's going on? Then she's, Rose the Hat sees Abra's reflection in, in, the, in the grocery store refrigerator. And she's like, oh, hello there. And then we cut back to, Rose, uh, to Abra, who's in her house. And her eyes are glazed over because that's a thing that happens now in The Shining. Your eyes like go white as if you're just, you're just Storm from X-Men. Yeah. So just more <laughs> X-Men bullshit. She's she's gone super shining now. She's yeah. in super shining. She's she's so shiny now. And uh, but she doesn't realize Rose... so she's shining at Rose the Hat figuring out where she is, right? But she doesn't notice yeah. Rose the Hat noticing her at all. No. And then Rose the Hat's like hand comes behind uh Abra's head and she's like get out, get out, get out. And that like sends Rose the Hat flying in the grocery store it like breaks the glass it explodes sensor. all the orange juice and the milk in that one free yeah. uh, refrigerator sends rose the hat flying and her hat flies off her head first She's off little... why is she in a grocery store i well when she's up on the on the on the roof of her like winnebago doing the meditation stuff she has like wine and cheese and things like that they're they're definitely it's not like a vampire where they don't eat normal things. It seems like they're going with the hedonism angle. You know, they get to live forever. They get to live forever and do whatever they want. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, where they they drink and eat fine dining and stuff like that and food. They have a trailer because, with a fucking porcelain bathtub with marble. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't sustain them, but they do it anyway because they just love the taste. That seems to be the implication, though it's never really made clear. So she gets thrown through the grocery store because they had a brief psychic connection and Abra's like, no, get out. And um, uh, Abra's dad is downstairs and like all the lights go off and everything shakes and like, nope, we don't really get any follow up on that. He, he, uh, he's want... just like, nope. He's lived with her long enough that anytime weird shit happens, he just pre- like, I like to imagine that he just pretends it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this movie has the gall to to portray her parents as if they don't really know what's going on. With Abra, which is just insane. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no fucking way. Every single time she just as much so much as sneezes, something in the house goes haywire, right? There's mm-hmm. spoons all over the ceiling. The lights yes. all shut down. And they just kind of like. <sighs> yeah. Like what's going through the char- those two characters minds when this happens, right? Like, are they just 
Are they living in fear of their daughter? Do they think that, like, if they bring it up, she's going to reveal herself to be fucking Beelzebub or some shit? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know. Um, Family Guy giant squid scene. That's actually, like, a really... It's actually, like, a really good uh, a good analogy. Do you know that one? No. There's just a giant, like... They, they, there's a giant squid at the breakfast table that just keeps knocking stuff over, and they just like, oh, that's weird. I, I don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, we also see that, that Danny Torrance, who was at an AA meeting, uh, got knocked over by that and has a bloody nose. So they're all just telepathically connected, and they all feel everything the other feels, which is really cool and super exciting. Um there's Rose also the a part in the grocery store where it's like the the grocery store clerk try or the person who works there tries to pick up Rose the Hat's hat and Rose the Hat freaks out and like screams at her, No, 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 no and then As runs if over the, the source of her power, but that never goes anywhere. Yeah, they just, just that that she just really nowhere. likes her hat. It's it's her identity now. You can't take it. Don't it's not a it. phase. <laughs> <laughs> so Rose the Hat's like, wow, she's even more shinier than I even thought last time when I told you that she's even more shinier than I thought, which really cool. Definitely couldn't have cut some of these scenes out. No, no siree. Uh, anyway, she gets dropped off at, at school by her parents, but instead of going to school, she goes to meet up with Danny. She takes a bus or something, and she, she meets up with Danny in a park, and she's like tries to speak to him telepathically, and he's like, let's use our normal voices, please. Which yeah. honestly, I found kind of funny. I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, shut up, you stupid kid. So then they're like, uh, you know, they, they, they have their equivalent of the scene with Dick Halloran and Danny in the original, but it's worse in every way, as you might imagine. Um, she's like, I found you. And he's like, how'd you find me? It was like GPS, but with my head. Great. So she just found him. He could literally just have like a psychic GPS tracker on him. Yeah. So uh, this is going to get more and more apparent. Well, it's it's this... crazy because why would he why would he be so surprised that she could find him if she can send him messages to his bedroom? Um. Yeah. I I, I guess there's a difference between like having a psychic connection and you can communicate with people at a distance and being able to literally physically track them like you have a GPS on them. I think I, that's. I mean, I guess, but you'd you'd have to like. You're having a, a psychic conversation through a chalkboard in his bedroom. It's not like you're talking to him it directly in his head. Mm -hmm. You're you're putting yeah. messages on a physical wall that you have. You you would think you'd have to know where that yes. is, right? I don't know why they make it a thing in this movie that they communicate in writing first and then only eventually communicate telepathically as voices in their heads. I don't know why. I, I yeah. really don't know what they mean by that at all. But anyway, she's like, I found you because I can GPS track you. And this is going to become more and more clear. She is the most shiniest that has ever shined. She's, <laughs> she's the shiniest diamond you you ever seen. Oh, boy, howdy. I tell you what. <laughs> she sure is the best. Um, she sure sparkles. And, and uh, yeah, I think really there's no better succinct way of saying it. This girl's a Mary Sue. I'm the shining. Gets, you got to deal with it. Unironically. Yeah. Yeah. And it gets worse and it gets worse. Like this isn't, this isn't even the half of it, but like she's incredibly good at all this stuff. She doesn't need to be taught how to do it. She's already incredible. She can use it like an active force ability. You know, remember in the shining when like hardly anyone even knew they had it. And at most they could like Danny could have a seizure and send a message all the way across the country at like risk killing him to do that. Yeah. Well, now it's like, she doesn't have to break a sweat. She's never really in any danger. I'm, I'm fast forwarding now, but she's going to, she's going to beat Rose the hat with ease. It's crazy. Multiple times. Not even just, Multiple not times. even just once. She just Multiple absolutely times. fucking annihilates Rose the hat. Mm hmm. It's it's unreal, man. Like they, the fact that he, I mean, I'm sure he did realize it when he was writing it. I, I'm sure the book is like this as well because you know she predicted fucking nine eleven. So of course, of course, she's got to be. Well, okay. So the obvious thing to do if you're gonna write a if you're gonna set something in this world where people have psychic powers 
and you want to try to write someone who's the most powerful person, obviously, obviously what you would do if you wanted to have an interesting and compelling story is you would have it be that they can't control it. Obviously. Yeah, that's yeah. It's the easiest fucking thing in the world to realize. No, but she's incredibly good at controlling it. So bad. It's so bad. She's such an insufferable character too. And like the, the, the kid is not a very good actor. She's an insufferable character. She's never really in any danger because she's more powerful than the villain and has more control of her powers than the villain and bests her at basically every turn. She's kind of smug sometimes. And I find that <laughs> just like adding insult to injury. It's so, uh, it's so good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so bad. It's excellent. That it's, is the word. It, I mean. It's uh, Danny Torrance in the multiverse and, of madness. And, and, you know and ironically, I mean? it's, it's, it's Captain Marvel-esque in that like, this is made even more explicit in the director's cut. Cause there's a few more extra lines to this, but she says something to the effect of, I try not to shine anymore because my parents look at me weird. They don't, they don't like make eye contact with me. I think they're scared of me when I shine, so I try not to do it anymore, right? Okay. And and there's uh, and it, but it gets worse because then she says and she's talking to Danny and she says, "Oh, you've had the same thing. You try not to shine anymore. Oh, she wouldn't look at you either." She implies that Wendy had trouble looking at at Danny because she was scared well, of him. Oh my God! Oh no! That's in the director's Mike. cut. Fucking the Flanagan got Mike fucking Flanagan, dude. There we go. Oh, he did it. Let's make it let's 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 make it crystal clear here. What Mike Flanagan did in his director's cut that he wishes could have been in the final cut, but he had to cut it for time, supposedly, is that Wendy was scared of Danny and his shining abilities and like wouldn't look him in the eye because she was secretly frightened of him. Add that to the fact that um, he wasn't speaking anymore after The Shining to undo his arc at the end of the movie. Like in the midst of the, the like all the worst stuff that's happening in the original movie, Wendy is looking right, looking Danny right in the face when he's like, "Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance," which is really scary. Like, can you imagine being a parent and dealing with that? Yeah, it's terrifying. Kid, imagine but being she's a looking... parent and your kid. She looks right at Danny and she re she jumps up to grab him when he's standing right in front of her with a knife in his hand, yeah. looking her dead in the eye, going "Red she Ram, hugs him. Red Ram," and she hugs. She hugs him. him. Yeah, she she she's scared. She's scared and worried for him, but she's not afraid of him. That was never a thing that happened. And this movie, oh my god! So the the director's cut. This is all cut out of the theatrical cut, but her line saying, oh, she wouldn't look at you either. I was like, oh, that's terrible. But like, I mean, like, I, I don't know what she's basing that on. Well, in the director's cut, we then cut to a flashback, even though I thought we were done with the flashbacks. All right, we cut to a flashback and there's a scene of them sitting on the couch watching cartoons. She's looking at Danny. Little kid Danny. This is after the events of the original movie. She's looking at Danny. Danny lo looks over at her and she looks away. To avoid eye contact with him. Oh, <laughs> oh my fucking I, I God, can't even dude. tell you how much Holy that annoys me. Holy shit. So it's, we're not even just doing character assassination of, like, Dick Halloran. We're yes. doing character assassination of Wendy now, too. Like, the character that she has, being that she's a concerned mother. Who... Yeah. Now she's scared of her own child. Because he he shines, even though that was never a thing she did ever. Because she's a very kind of loving, understanding person. Because yeah, she's a you know she's to the to the worst extent that she's not a good mother. It's because she doesn't recognize the danger in Jack, and she makes excuses for him, right? Yeah, but well, like, yeah, yeah. She's learned her lesson after that, surely. But like, there was nothing else about her parenting that was especially bad. You know, she was a good, she played with her kid and she was nice to him and all that sort of stuff, gave him attention and love and all that. And like really cared about him and fought to protect him at the risk of her own life and all that sort of stuff. And now she's like, oh, I'm, I'm scared of you because of your power. I can't even look at you, which I hate that. I'm glad that was cut out of the theatrical cut, but it's telling to me that he put it in the director's cut because clearly he thinks that or wants that to be true. That's really annoying. But the reason I went down this tangent to begin with is because Abra, her parents just don't understand her, you know? And her real arc is, is she needs to just be her full self 
and her amazing self and not worry about hiding her light else under a bushel. Other, yeah. yeah. Don't hide your light under a bushel. That's the whole arc she has to go through. She doesn't have to learn how to control her powers. She doesn't have to overcome her fears because she's not even really afraid of Rose the Hat. She like 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 snarky quips Rose the Hat several times. She she gives her oh. that smug, arrogant look. Like jumping ahead a little bit when they have their confrontation mm-hmm. in the maze. She's just like giving her this smug look the whole time. Like, yeah, you, know, you can't touch me. <laughs> like, if, if if the whole thing was that she was really, really powerful, but, like, really afraid, because why wouldn't you be? There's these, like, quasi-immortal vampire demons that are trying to kill you and other children. That's really scary. You could just let her be afraid of it, and that would do a whole lot to help. Yeah. She's not even afraid of it, really. Is it fu- God, dude, this movie is fucking pathetic. <laughs> It's really bad. It's it's an anti character. Yeah, and she she, she tries to talk to him, and she's like, "We well, gotta help me find this kid. If I can get his glove, then I can track them because that's how it works. Because the the fat one stole his glove. She found so. Rose the hat, no problem in the grocery store earlier. I don't understand why she needs the yeah, glove. and she found Danny with no problem. So I don't know why she needs, but apparently she needs to go to where he was buried, such that she can. Well, they need, they, yeah. yeah, they need to go, they need to go to where he was buried. Danny and his, and his AA buddy need I to go. I guess to prove that it's happening, because they doubt it for no reason? Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that where we go next? Do we go next to Baseball Boy's, uh, ex, exhumation to finding his body? Uh, not quite. Before we do that, well, first he's like, you know, just go home, you know? Oh yeah, like, hide like they're hide. they're gonna try and just hide, you know, because he's because he's a coward and he's got the his, his his he's the only one with an arc. He's got to learn to like not be a coward and try to do the right thing. And it's like, oh, is that who he was? Was he a coward? Was he? It, right, yeah, thanks. that's what that's what Danny was when he uh, outsmarted his father. <laughs> yeah, or like put that ghost in a in a box with ease like, he like literally five from... minutes after he was told how to do it yeah yeah so he next we see he's a he's an adult he's going he's at the hospice cat walks into a room he's like cat why are you going in there that room's empty your wires must be crossed more says it dialogue. fucking out loud to dude i like yep i hate it when they do that mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like who's that for that's just for me that's just for the audience mm-hmm. Couldn't have shown me that in any way, shape, or form. You couldn't have figured out a way to show me that the room was empty, that the cat was going into. Really, Mike? You couldn't. So he goes in there. Oh, but it's not empty. At first, he's like, "Oh my god, it's a ghost!" So he like pulls out a box, like he's gonna put him in a box, and he's like, "Don't put black man in a box." Uh, he he's like, "I'm Scott Man Crothers." Surprise! And he's like, "Oh man, I thought you were one of the ghosts." Uh, and so they, they're like, I haven't seen you in years. Yeah, the, um, my conscience has been silent for years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> his his role to Danny and where he is, he, he implies something in the director's cut, like, or maybe it's the theatrical too, I don't actually remember, where he says something to the effect of like, and you're not going to see much of me anymore because like this world is just a dream within a dream to me now implying that he spends most of his days in like an actual heaven. heaven world and just like pops in here to be like hey by the way don't forget to be a good person oh thanks scatman crothers like you know okay real real quick i just want to jump back to the scene where danny gives abra the advice of like just you know just go home stop trying to track the dangerous predators down and live your life right like just go and <laughs> do that right i remember like i was sitting there thinking, i was like yeah that's good fucking advice. Don't poke your head above ground and risk uh, getting bringing the serial killer cult down upon you. Just go and live your life. You don't like and she treats him like a coward for giving her decent advice on how to preserve her life. You know, no, you this is a superhero movie now. Remember, this is this is lame X-Men. So now it's like, oh, you got to fight and do the right thing. Yeah, because that's the kind of story we're doing now. Um. Uh, uh, so 
he's like, I'm, you know, oh, oh I remember what I was going to say. Sorry. Getting a little frazzled, a little fried here. Okay. Um, there, I saw a video a while back that was about the like magical black man trope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it really annoyed me, not because it's not a trope that exists to varying degrees of like okayness to insultingness. It's definitely a thing. But this movie, uh, this video had the gall to imply that Scatman Crothers in the first movie is just another lame example of the wise black man, magical black man trope. And it's like, okay, first of all, bitch, everyone in this, like, mo of this story has The Shining. They're all magical, right? And he's just a good person. Like, what is wrong with him being a wise man who helps this main character? Like, what just drives me crazy? Yeah, well... Yeah, no, that I mean that's fucking that's fucking ridiculous. He's not just and, some uh, he's not just some magical black man that I mean he isn't no. he is in, he is in this movie in the though. book. And he is in he this, is movie, in this yeah. movie. Like he 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 doesn't feel like a character anymore. Really, he's just there to tell to, he's just there to be his conscience and doesn't really have a character. Like he had a character in the original. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, he's he, not an he active him, agent in this story. He gave him good advice. Now, Stephen King does tend to use the black characters in his stories to sort of just explain away the metaphysics of whatever's going on. Um, and I, I think that, you know, a broken clock tends to be right twice a day kind of thing with him. So, like, he hits mm -hmm. it with a few of them, right? Like, yeah. John Coffey in The Green Mile is a great character. Uh, yes, I like him, too. Dick Halloran in The Shining is a great character, right? Every now and then, like I mean, uh, the guy from It Two, the the one black character in It Two, I didn't see that. It, he's the one who just like happened to stumble on all the metaphysical properties of Pennywise, and he just happens to know how to defeat him. <laughs> when he wasn't yeah. the bookish one from before, that was the fat kid. But that we're yeah, gonna see. You that's know. a lame version of it, where he's yeah. just a plot device, and he's he's kind of a plot device in this movie because he he just comes here to be like. Hey, you gotta go help this kid. You know, you can't just run away from your problems. You gotta go fight. He's like, okay, thanks, Scatman Crothers. I Bye really, I, I, if you hadn't shown up, Scatman, I probably would have just left her to die. Thank you. So, and then we get like probably the one of the most cringe scenes in the whole movie. Rose the Hat is still trying to track down um, uh, uh, Abra, and so. She she goes on like a astral journey. Yeah, she, to her. she goes on the astral plane. Yeah, she like she lifts off off her Winnebago thing and goes flying through the air, and we see her hovering over the the, the world at night. And the scene goes on for so long, and it's all like kind of lame special effects where she's just kind of floating through the air, and possibly she finally gets to her house and she like zoops in through the window and it's like why are we messing with gravity what's the point of any of this like why couldn't she just appear there she gets to abra's room and abra's asleep in the bed and instead of going over there to be like i don't know can she kill her remotely i don't know i don't even no, know no, what she because no because i don't even think she's actually like well, she's not there she's not, she's as, yeah she's not there so there. she can't just kill her remotely she's she's psychicking into her mind where Abra has fucking file boxes. Like, uh, uh, how old is she again? She's like in middle school. She's, she's in, in middle. middle school. She's in middle school. But like somehow okay, her well, her version of storing memories is file boxes old from the eighties. Like, yeah. So for one, she's a fucking zoomer. She wouldn't have file cabinets for her like mind palace or whatever we're doing. Um, second of all, like. She she's has all this training and sort of like having her mind be have like her her mind palace. Like, has she had memory training? Like, what what are we doing right now? And also, Rose the Hat's like, oh, she goes up to a cabinet and the cabinet says me is an Abra. So she's like, oh, oh looky here. <laughs> so she goes sifting through files with no obvious names on them. And then she gets her hand stuck in the cabinet and it's stuck there and it's like peeling her skin off. And she's like, ah, ah, she's screaming. And then Abra's behind her wearing like a blue wig and has no eyes. And she's like, aha, I got the best of you. Yeah. And then she jumps. I trapped you. <laughs> I trapped and then you. She, she jumps into Rose the Hat's mind, which is like a more old school Oxford, like university library. 
and she gets whatever information she needs. She just rifles through a bunch of like Rolodexes at super speed in there while Uh Rose the Hat is like screaming. Uh, like, and you're trying to pull her hand out of the file cabinet that's, you know, shut on her hand. So, once again, Abra got the best of the villain in literally... With ease, and is, like, gloating about it, and like, haha, I got you, I bested you. And she got, I guess she got where they are so they can go find her. Like, that's what she got from that. And Rose the Hat comes back, and she's like, she was in my mind. No one's ever done that before. <laughs> And it's like, what? Okay, so you're wow, pretty I, pathetic. I was so intimidated by this villain before uh, when she freaked out about somebody trying to touch her hat. And now it's ruined, Jamie. Now it's ruined because she's kind of like a whimpering, pathetic little cretin who doesn't understand, like who doesn't rally in the face of diversity. She just goes back and like... Diversity, like, oh. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, isn't that what I said? You said diversity. She, oh. she rallies in the face of diversity. <laughs> that too. <laughs> that too. Uh, next we see uh, 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 Lurch. He's dying. And we see him cycling, which means he like go, turns old and then dies really quickly, turns into steam. And they're all sad for a second, but then they all eat his. So they're cannibalizing, I guess. And they eat his steam. Yeah, because, yeah, which again, we're going to get to this, but like that one little girl lasted them fucking 30 years off of the steam. Mm-hmm. But somehow uh, they're out of food now. Yep, they're just out. Like, how often do they need to eat? It seems like every other day almost, with the, like, given the speed. <laughs> yeah, that they, like how they show it. <laughs> like, that they're constantly looking for a new mark. It's like. <laughs> Do they do anything but hunt shiny? Like, maybe that's why there's no steamy people left. Is Is they're just killing them all? Yeah. That would be more interesting, at least. If they're like, you know, we've been eating them too frequently. Like, we're killing them all off. They're not, like, replenishing or whatever. That's, I don't know. It's better than uh, if, uh, goddamn Netflix and chills. Um, (laughs) So then. It's those damn interwebs, I tell you what. Danny goes to his, his friend who got him the apartment. He's like. Uh, I'm not going to explain to you what's happening. I just need you to come with me. And he says, okay, well, I, I do trust you because we both have The Shining. And so <laughs> they go on a long road trip all the way out to Iowa to see if the girl was right about the kid's remains being there. And, and I guess they're going to also bury his remains more properly. They there's uh, I'm fast forwarding. Eventually they get to the place and they do find his remains there. Uh, there's nothing in the effect of like contacting the family or the police or anything. They just bury him and move on. It's like, I, man, I, guys, I, there yeah. are people out there who probably know this kid and are wondering where he is and what happened to them. And, but they're just like, their logic is like, oh, well, it's no use going to the police because uh, the uh, the true not the, the the vampire people they're they're well connected and rich, so it's no use. They have no so, like, idea if that's true. No. I just want like they don't know that he at just, all. He They're just says nothing. that to mm-hmm. as an excuse for not going to the cops. Yep, it's an excuse to not involve the cops because they would clutter the story. What he should really say is, if they have mind control powers, if they bring the police in, they could just overpower them with ease. You know what I mean? Yeah, That's but do they know say. that they have mind control powers yet? Um, I don't think Danny knows that. No, but moment. they don't know that they're rich and connected either. No, it's you're right. More, it's just lame social commentary, like the kind that's just rife in the fall of the House of Usher. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of really cringe, like class-based social commentary in that. So this is just like, oh well, they're like immortal vampires, so they like own the police or whatever. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Fine, so sure. they go on a long road trip. Abra doesn't come with them, but she's like psychically in the car with them. That's a thing she can do. And then so they finally get there, and they're digging up his body and. <laughs> Oh the 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 friend goes on this monologue, a typical Mike Flanagan monologue. He just starts talking. He's like, "Oh, you know, like so." They start they're digging in the the area where Abra told them to dig, and they start yeah. smelling something. And the buddy starts going, "You know, I used to hunt deer, and one time I smelled this awful, awful smell out when I was out in the woods." And I went back a few times and I smelled it every time. And eventually I ended up finding this buck that was like skinned in the tree and it was rotting. This is that same smell. It smells like rot. 
Like, you could have just said, I know what rot smells like, dude. I didn't <laughs> need this whole anything. ass backstory for it's you. A, like... it's, it's, so, it's, it's such a nothing burger, right? Because, I mean, you did a funny version of it. I, I, I'm going to say really quick what he did actually say. Okay. Yes. It was, which is like, I was hunting once. I shot a buck. I didn't quite kill it, so I was tracking it. And I, I, I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. Eventually, days later, I was hunting in a different spot. And I smelled something awful, and it was the buck I shot earlier, and it was rotting. This is that same smell. That's oh my god, dude! That's actually. And then he says, and then he says, and and then he says, I never hunted again since then. It's like, um, okay. I feel like this is like a a liberal who's never held a gun's idea of like hunting. (laughs) What? That, that's at, like that that's actually even funnier than the version that i did honestly yeah like that's so well, fucking like, lame he tells this non sequitur of a story about this one time with he, anything. like about how yeah. badly he sucks at hunting right yeah <laughs> and then he just yeah. goes yeah I'll, yeah i know what rot smells like and i never hunted again since and it's like cool bro i didn't care about any of that so and then they're like, oh, th- he's like, I, that's the smell of rot. And they keep digging and they're like, oh, my God, there's a dead body down here. Like they're surprised. And uh, no, like, he see- does. He goes, he says, oh, my God. Oh, like they, they, they're overwhelmed by the smell. He goes, they didn't even bury him deep. And then jo- like a couple seconds later, he he goes, they buried him shallow. He, yeah. Y- you said the same Dialogue. thing twice. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. didn't even bury him deep. They buried, they buried him, him shallow. shallow. Might, like, that makes I, it worse somehow, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. So we've learned that Abra wasn't making it up, though I have no idea, based on what we know about her, that we had any well, reason like, to doubt this at any point. But now uh, uh, his friend is on board. It's like, oh my God, these people killed children. The guy's like... Like, they killed children. He's like, they're not even people. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I'm sort of I'm sort of torn by lines like that. Because I'm like, okay, if you want to say, like... Well, first of all, these are literal monsters. I'm not sure they are people. But second of all, like, people kill children, too. And it's pretty terrible. Like... Yeah. I mean, I, I know you're you're trying to find a very, like, harsh way of saying that these are, like, monsters. And I get it. But, like, when you're like, oh, these aren't, like... People don't do stuff like that. And I'm like, ooh, I yeah, hate right. to break it to you, but people do stuff uh, like that. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's not it's not important. But then, so they're like, okay, well, now we've learned. Casey Anthony that... would like a word. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God, what a fucking monster that woman is. So we've learned that, uh, yep, he was killed. We got the, so baseball. We got the baseball glove, Abra. Can you find them now? It's like, oh, I could have found them before. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, we just so, drove, so I just went on we, a road trip they, to Iowa for Dan, you, they drive all the way back from Iowa after going all the way there just to see that yes, there is a dead body here. I don't know why they ever doubted it again. Danny drives all the way back to somewhere in New England. And he comes up and he's uh well but well before this, Danny's like, okay, you need to tell your parents what's going on. Show them. Show them what like you saw. She's like, okay. And then he shows up at her house and the dad's like, are you Danny? You son of a bitch. You need to stay away from my daughter. Treating him like he's like a sex pervert who's been chatting (laughs) with her online or something. Which was kind of funny. To be fair, Um, he is sort of the Stephen King stand-in for this movie, so uh, fair. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't want Stephen King near my children either. And he's like, uh, um, he says, Abra, you were supposed to show him. And she's like, sorry, I didn't. It's like, "You, you little bitch. And she's like, is, her dad's like not really paying attention to what they're saying. He's like, you need to get the hell out of here. And so she like shows him with no warning or no like anticipation or build up or any way of like prepare yourself for this. Just projects the images of this kid's brutal, horrific death into her dad's brain, like with no warning, just to be like, no, see, look, I, it is real. I'm not making it up. And the poor dad, he's like pouring himself a drink with his hands shaking because it's like, yeah, yeah that's, that's how scared up. the kid should be. The kid should be this scared by all these things happening. But instead, the dad's the only one who's scared. Ugh, it's so stupid. So like they've shown the dad what happened. So now he believes them, quote unquote. And they're like, we need to stop this Um because they're going to kill more kids. They're coming after me now. They're, they're trying to kill more shiners. 
and he's like, why don't we call the police? And this is when they're like, no, they're connected to the, the police are in on it. <laughs> they're part of it. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, like, like, Lily conspiracy from Morty. it's, like, it's like Lily from devs. It's like Lily from devs. It's like, no, they're in on it. Um, <laughs> you think you can trust the police? They, you got to uh, stop the, thinking of these people like a weird, like a weird hedonistic hippie cult and think of them more like the mob. <laughs> what if they're in on it? Um, and so they, they tell the dad what's going on and they're like, no, they hatch a plan. You, this plan is the worst. I hate this plan so much. So the plan is to be like, oh, well, they're clearly, they're on their way. They're clearly coming after Abby. So, uh, sorry, Abra. So what they're going to do is like, okay, Abra, you, you're going to use your psychic powers to concentrate really hard. And by that mean, I, I just mean like, close your eyes. You know, it doesn't actually look like it's exerting her much. You're gonna, you're gonna Meditate psychically, you're gonna psychically pretend like you're coming with us to this random spot in the woods where we're gonna lay a trap for those pesky uh, shining demons. And so I was like, you gotta pretend you're with us for as long as you can. And like this, this, yeah. this plan is revealed afterwards. We don't get it in the moment. If we got it in the moment, uh, you might expect the dad to be like, um, this sounds like a retarded plan. What are we doing? <laughs> but he, d but so <laughs> like pretend you're with us, but it's actually going to be a trap. So they set a trap in the woods. Uh, so the, 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 the true not think that Abra is going to be in the spot in the woods. And so they come up and they think she's there and uh snake bite, fuck her whatever her name is she she puts a syringe into abra like oh that was surprisingly easy and then oh my god it was a stuffed rabbit it wasn't abra oh these are just parlor tricks and they're looking around and then danny and friend have rifles the, the guy's hunting rifles that he hasn't used since that trip i guess and they're shooting from the woods and they're just picking them off like one by one they just kill like Almost all of them. Yeah, they just like with every they just every single bullets. filthy, dirty, stinking hippie is now gone. Pretty much, they're all dead. And Rose is Rose the Hat screaming at this point. She's like because yes, she's psychically monitoring this from afar. And as they're dying, she's screaming, "Get out of there! Get out of there!" Yeah. <laughs> and then they yeah, all start she's, dying. Yeah, she's treating it like, "Oh, all my beloved friends and family are dying." And it's like, a, it's funny. Based on the way they keep cutting back to her going, no! uh, so that's pretty funny. And so they just kill almost all of them. They kill all of them except for Sna the, the one we know by name. Uh, yeah. So all those other ones who are part of this cult, they're all demons. We never see them use their psychic powers once. It's not clear how they're useful. Yeah, they're, none of the rest would, of them use psychic powers at all. You would think if this was like an evil cult that's willing to kill children to live forever, you think that they might be more like ruthless you think they might they might be more cutthroat about like who gets to be in their club and whether they're earning their keep around here and maybe we kill them if we're hungry you know like villains might yeah but instead they're like actually a family and they all love each other and they're all po totally fine with killing children by the way but they're like really sad when they when they, when die they, yeah. oh sorry they're, they're willing to keep useless ones who are just more hungry mouths to feed around even though they don't do anything and so yeah well, and even though they're running consistently low on food they're they're willing to keep the ones who you know have no speaking lines <laughs> just to fill yep. out just to fill out numbers in the shot um but so they kill every single one of them with ease pretty much perfect headshots every single time except to the named character that one they miss for some reason uh, and mm -hmm. as she's dying, fading away into a, a steam demon, she pulls the old Call of Duty lobby. Wait, 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 oh. wait, 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 hold on. Sorry. It, it's, there's a little something before it that I find funny. So uh, she goes into the RV and then all the other ones are dead. And so they're approaching the RV, but not very cautiously. And like she pokes her head out of the RV and he's like, he pulls up his gun. He's like, oh, shit, I forgot to reload. And she just goes up to him and says, like, you're feeling sleepy. So she's mind controlling Danny. So clearly she's more powerful than Danny. And she's like, you're going to sleep. And he's like starting to fall asleep. But then the friend comes around, flanks her from the back and shoots her. And then she starts cycling. And then uh, what happens to you? Uh, she lo she pulls the old Modern Warfare 2 lobby on him and gives him the old kill yourself. Uh, and he just does it immediately. <laughs> so the one time. And he's like, no, stay worked. away from her. And she goes, as she's dying, she goes, kill yourself. Kill yourself. Goes, he goes, he doesn't say anything, but he's basically like, oh, fuck. 
<laughs> yeah. So he oh, okay. Just, like, <laughs> points the gun under his chin and kills himself. <laughs> so that that guy's dead. Brains out. He's just so. gone. Danny did nothing to help. Like he didn't try to no. use his own shining power to nope. stop it. Maybe I don't know. No, nope. he didn't. He didn't even try really. Uh, meanwhile, back at the farm, uh, uh, Craw Daddy comes up and because he he didn't fall for the trap for some reason, he understood that uh, Abra was really at at her home with her dad. So she goes there and kills the dad and kidnaps Abra. So now the villains have Abra. They killed uh, the friend, uh, Danny, Danny's friend that helped him out and everything. His only, I think he says his best friend at one point. Yeah, he, he didn't have many other friends. So he killed <laughs> his best friend. The girl's dad is dead, and the girl's been kidnapped. All because Danny had the bright idea to be like, oh, why don't you psychically pretend to come with us? We'll lay a trap and kill a bunch of them. Meanwhile, we'll just leave you at home out in the open, unprotected with your poor dad who has no psychic abilities or any way of handling any of this and just leave you wide open to be kidnapped and your dad killed. Is, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is this is the character assassination of Danny. It's not that he was a fuck up and an alcoholic. It's that he's a fucking moron. It's he not gets... that he let the mother and her child die and didn't call and didn't call the cops or anything. I mean, we, yeah. we began there, honestly. Yes, but he just lets... He gets both of these people killed with a stupid plan. It'd be much better off if they just laid in wait. If they all went together to the woods or something, they could still could have shot most of them. You know what I mean? Like yeah. It's, uh, if yeah, they had, it's, if they had, plan. if they had gone together to the woods, Crawdaddy would have had to come to the woods too, and they could have shot him there as well. Solved yeah, that problem. These, yeah. So um, it's a stupid plan. It gets the dad killed, and Danny never really faces any faces up to that. Never has to deal with that. The fact that he got his friend killed, and that he got the little girl's dad killed. In the end, Abra never um, even seems phased by the fact, really, that her dad honestly, is dead. No, and that's part of her being just a total anti character. She's she's never really heartbroken that her dad dies, not even once. And at the end, instead of having some sort of accountability for Danny for, like, getting him killed, at least he could, like, apologize or something to the mom. He never talks to the mom. All we really get of that is Abra at the very end saying, you know, life goes on, so daddy's in a good place. I know that because reasons. Therefore, it's not really all that bad that he's dead. That's basically the implication at the end of the movie. It's terrible. Yeah. He's just discarded from the movie. This poor dad who's just trying to take care of his daughter because Danny's an incompetent idiot. So that's fun. So now now Abra's kidnapped, but she's been injected with a drug that makes her not her her shining's weak. Um, yeah, she, because she that's can't just shine. They have. That's the thing they have, and Danny's like, I gotta find a way to get to Abby, but she's not responding to my psychic phone calls. <laughs> um, and so he's like, let me just concentrate real hard. And so all he does is concentrate really hard. And now he's inside of Abra's mind and kind of controlling her. Even though her shining was supposed to be weakened by all these drugs, it, he can just come into her body with these like it's nothing. And then he is talking as Abra to Crawdaddy in the van. And he's like taunting him and being really like petty and like making fun of him. And I'm like, what are you what are you doing? What are you accomplishing here? And then he's like, oh, I understand. You live forever. Of course, it makes sense that you don't wear your seatbelt. And then he uses his psychic mind powers remotely, puppeteering Abba, to crash the van and kill Crawdaddy. <laughs> Abba. <laughs> Abba, fucking Abba. whatever. It's been, it's been seven and a half I, hours. I know. Okay. I just, it's so funny. Like, we're cycling through so many names for this stupid fucking character. Like, Ab Abby. It's a, Abba. it's a dumb name, regardless. Like, yeah, yeah. Abra, Abby, Abra, Abba. Who cares? Yeah. So, so Jesus even though Christ. she's had, she's had, she's been given drugs that diminish her psychic abilities he can still come in to her body and he can use just fucking possess her, her body he can do whatever he wants at any time why couldn't he fucking do that what like he why, why can, didn't he just possess his buddy's body and stop him from pulling the trigger well because he's he's powerful enough to do everything i just described as cartoonish as it is but he's not more powerful than snakebite abby which is why he was just falling asleep when she said sleep so i thought he was dr sleep also so that's kind of ironic i guess my one weakness sleep <laughs> <laughs> oh so, fuck cycling sorry cycling is the term they give 
when um when when these immortal quasi immortal people are dying, they just like they get old really quickly and they call it cycling for some reason. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't get it. Just use drones for fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah. That would be pretty funny. Um so yeah, he he remote puppeteers Abba even though she's on drugs and kills um kills Crawdaddy. And then as she's walk oh god. He just fucking... He just this... launches him out of the fucking yeah, because he's not wearing a seatbelt. Oh, yeah, that's the thing I wanted to touch on. So they're like, oh, you live forever. Of course it makes sense that you're arrogant and wouldn't wear a seatbelt. It's like they're not they're not impenetrable to damage. It's like they're not... No, they, they don't <sighs> seem any more resistant to damage no, than any they normal person. <laughs> like, you think if you want to live forever that you would be even more careful, not less, you idiot. Yeah. The, the, the... <sighs> Mike Flanagan, you dolt. That doesn't make any sense. If if they were like that, that would only make sense if they're like Bruce Willis in Unbreakable. You know, like he probably wouldn't wear a seatbelt because he'll be fine. Yeah, or like <laughs> like in like in the first X Men movie, right? Wolverine mm-hmm. has this exact same thing happen to him in the first X Men movie, where he gets launched out of the fucking windshield, but he stands back up and he heals, right? And we are about to see that they do sort of have a healing power when they eat steam like when rebecca ferguson eats yeah. all the rest of the steam or all of the wound the rest of the wound on her hand from her psychic battle with abby that mm-hmm. begins to heal like she's fucking wolverine or something like that so i guess the idea is that the more steam they consume they're introducing it now right the more steam yeah. they consume the more powerful their evil psychic powers are yes yep and so they didn't yeah, th- so, none of them thought to do that before going into battle. She didn't think to like let any of them get a hit before going into battle with the strongest psychic she's ever faced down. <laughs> no, she didn't, did she? That's pretty funny. Oh, but later when when it's like, "Oh shit, we're sending in the cavalry now." She when she, for the final battle, she'll eat a whole bunch of steam all at once only to not be any more powerful than she already was and get bested by the main character with ease. So that's cool. Um no, but <laughs> so, so yeah, you would think someone who is trying to live forever uh, would be more paranoid about danger and stuff like that, especially if any car accident could kill them at any time. I'm surprised they drive at all. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like especially because driving is one of the most dangerous things you do in day to day life. Yeah, you would think you would, especially. Uh, who cares? So stupid. So and then now that she's walking alone. Even though she should still be on psychic drugs, uh, she she's walking and she sees Rose the Hat on the street, and she's like, "I've been looking for you, my pretty, or whatever she says. I don't it doesn't matter." <laughs> Something like that. Ab, Ab, Abra just puts on a smug "I'm better than you" face and walks right through her, and she disappears into a cloud of cloud of smoke like she's a ghost. And she's like, "Oh, I'll show you, bitch child." It's she like she's thought, that's right. She said of... she calls her bitch child. It's like, yes. "All right, bitch child, let's play." Cracks knuckles. Jesus yeah. Christ. And so it's like, <laughs> okay, if if Abra is just kind of arrogant at this point, surely what we're going to need to do in the next bit of the movie is really make Rose the Hat the most intimidating she's ever been, right? No, we're just going to do the key, the same fucking thing every time where she's not afraid of Rose the Hat at all, and she just bests her at every opportunity. And is kind of smug and like, haha, I'm better than you about it. She's not scared. She's not... It's so bad. So Danny meets up with Abra, who, at a motel, he drove all the way out to wherever she was at this point, uh, however far the kidnapper had taken him. So Danny's been driving all over the place. I don't, I don't know if he's had some five-hour energies or what. <laughs> Better hope he doesn't fall asleep at the wheel. He, he got some drive. Turkish amphetamines from a trucker at a rest stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, been, he's been hitting his own supply of steam in the background. Um, <laughs> so he's with Abra, and she's, he's like, are you okay? And it's like, where are we going? Well, first of all, wow. she's she's like, where are we she, going? Abra gets a call from her mom. Oh yeah, she Abra gets a, gets a call Oh, I forgot mom, about this. She gets a call from her mother. Missing. It's like, where are you? Where are missing. you? Have you remember, been kidnapped? Oh Jesus, remember, your father's dead, Abra. <laughs> it's yeah, it's like you just said. It's it's even worse. So her mom calls. It's night where she is at 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 their house, and she's like, 
Oh my god, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Are you okay? Remember, her dad is dead in their living room right now. And she's like, where are you? Are you okay? What's happened? What Have you been kidnapped? What's happened? And Abra just says, I love you. Hangs up the phone. and Throws, then throws the, the phone, phone out, out the of the window of the moving car. I f- this bitch has no fucking regard for her own for her parents. Mother. Her mother. No, it's insane. It's insane. You remember when we were doing the first movie like four hours ago and Danny's whole thing, like he picks up the knife to warn his mother that Jack is coming to murder them. Mm -hmm. You remember that? You remember when the kid gave a shit about. Yeah. (sighs) Oh, my God. It's like this is it's really hitting me right now. Like Mm -hmm. right as we're about to get to the one real connecting thread between the movies. Exactly how far we have strayed from talking about <laughs> the shining right yes. now yeah didn't rose get the glove from the ella gerald's um oh i don't know what that means i didn't i didn't quite get that reference i'm gonna keep going so um she throws the phone out the window why so they can't track her i guess like she really doesn't want She's so desperate for the police not to get involved. I don't understand. <laughs> she throws the phone out the window like, I won't be needing this anymore. And she's like, when this is all over, you'll tell my mom I'm safe, okay? And it's like, what is happening? Just tell your, tell your mother that yourself. She doesn't it give just, a shit, but it, she's not. But she's just, she looks a little sad. She's not like distraught that her dad's dead. She doesn't care about her grieving mother who's worried sick about her. She's just like, I need to follow Danny. And where is Danny going? Well, Danny's like, we're going to Colorado. And she's like, <laughs> Colorado? Why? And he's like, well, remember that place I told you about where all those things happened to me? The place that shines? We're going there. And she's like, isn't it dangerous? You said it was dangerous. And he's like, yeah. Well, if it's dangerous for people like us, I imagine it's dangerous for them, too. Bam, 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 bam. And then we get the little sting. And we get the fucking helicopter shot, and it sucks. <laughs> They're driving. Yeah. So, so uh, hold on. Uh, I, I I need to linger on the fact that well, what the fuck is he basing that on? He's just decided that oh the, the 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 overlook needs souls. It's hungry. It's starving. If we go there, it'll be dangerous. But I imagine it'll be dangerous for Rose the Hat too. Why? Carnivores don't usually eat other carnivores, for the record. Um. It, you know they do all the uh, he doesn't know this right but the other psych like when the psychic vampires die they give off the steam right mm-hmm. he so doesn't know he that, doesn't know yeah. that he has no way of knowing that so like we know that it's probably like it, yeah sure it's probably it'll probably work right like yeah you know like, how vampires don't eat, eat other vampires because they don't sustain them because they're not living things <laughs> Yeah, this that's would not be gonna, like that's oh, not going to be gotta, a thing in this movie, dude. <laughs> it's like it's like well, we, like we're we're running from this vampire that's trying to kill us. Where where should we go in order to defeat this super powerful vampire? I don't know if we can defeat them ourselves. Obviously, you can, dude. Have you seen Abra? She's OP as fuck. But setting that aside, she's like, well, we're being chased by a dangerous vampire. Uh, in order to beat this vampire, we'll need to go somewhere that's really... I mean, surely another vampire's nest would be dangerous for us, but it might also be dangerous for them. Like, you are basing that on fucking nothing. Well, like, I think this is where it starts to draw the difference between the vampire, the psychic vampires and the ghosts. Like, they're clearly two different entities. Right? So, uh, yeah, this movie, this movie will make it explicit that it thinks the ghosts in the original The Shining are, are just like vampires like the true not but dead that's the only difference they feed on people even though they never did that in the original hmm weird it, it's almost like that concept is ported from the novel and didn't make it to the cut of the movie that we all loved yeah it's very very dumb and this is a very stupid decision it's a very reckless decision considering the last stupid idea you had got two people killed you would think you would think at least he'd be like, listen, this is going to be really dangerous. And I know last time I I, I, I fucked up, but you got to trust like you got to trust me on this something. Right. Like you would do no, something. He like doesn't that. he doesn't view it as a fuck up. Not really. It was just he, no, got, he, he, he just got outplayed. <laughs> he should. So they, he absolutely should. But he doesn't. They go all the way to Colorado just to go to the Overlook. 
They drive up Sidewinder Road, which it's in the middle of winter, by the way. It's all covered in snow. Remember how we talked in the original movie about how they make so clear, so explicit that uh, the reason the Overlook shuts down at all in the first place during the winter is because it's you can't get there. The whole the reason winter. that The Shining even happens is because they can't bring people up the road during the winter to take care of the hotel. So they bring you to the hotel before the roads close and you just have to wait it out. Right. And the only way to get there in an emergency is with something like a snowcat. Well, you see, in this movie, they just drive up there in a Camry. So that's cool. A Toyota Camry made it all the way up there in the middle of winter. Yeah, and like there's feet of snow on the ground, like to be clear. They go up to the Overlook Hotel. Oh, and now it's all dark and spooky. As I said before, kind of undermining what made the original unique by turning it into generic horror slop. We have now come to the hotel and he says it's too dangerous for you to go inside i'm gonna go inside because i have to wake the building up whatever the fuck that means you wait here and keep an eye on the road you should be able to see rose the hat coming when you see her give me a, a warning signal let me know if she's coming so he goes inside and he when he walks through the hotel the lights just turn on as he passes them as if like he's lighting it with his shine yawn cringe stupid so he's <laughs> and <laughs> and like i mean it just wouldn't it have been more unsettling wouldn't you have wouldn't you think that if they pulled up to this to the rundown version the dark version of the overlook right when he goes inside wouldn't it have been more unsettling for it to just look like it did before yeah that would be something i thought they closed this place down but it seems to be up and running that would be more uncanny that would be more in keeping with what was unnerving and uncomfortable and spooky about the original movie. But no, in this it's one, like, it's just everything is the sickly orange color. There's dust and cobwebs everywhere and rock on mold, the walls. Black mold and whatever else. And so he goes down to the boiler room. He turns on the boilers. He's heating up the hotel. He's walking around. He finds himself in the, the staff quarters where they were staying in the original movie. He goes, oh my god, look, it's the door with the axe hole still in it. Oh my god, this is just like a trip down memory lane. Am I right, guys? He puts his face in the axe hole. Yeah, he puts his face in the axe hole like, just <laughs> so we can have the same shot from The Shining, because remember The Shining? Um, and, and so I, I know a lot of people, their, what they, their conclusion about this movie was that Oh, you know, the other stuff was interesting, but then the last act, there's kind of like a studio-mandated like member berries thing. And it's like, this did not, this was not a studio mandated thing. This was like part of Mike Flanagan's pitch. This is his idea. This yeah, is what he well, wanted to because do. in the, in the Dr. Sleep book, so at the end of the Shining mm -hmm. book, the overlook explodes because they've overloaded the boiler uh, and, and let it, you know, go crazy. And Jack basically goes and allows it to explode with him still inside to ensure that it blows up sacrificing himself and redeeming himself for all the things that he had done because he wasn't mm -hmm. really in control right so the the overlook doesn't exist anymore in the doctor sleep book but they still drive to the ruins of the overlook anyway for god only knows what reason at the end of the book so the only yeah. change here is that in order to keep it more congruent with what happened in the original movie the hotel is just still standing yes so, like, yeah, to, just to make that, like, really, really clear, Stephen King himself in Doctor Sleep was like, oh, the, the finale, this big psychic mind battle needs to take place at the ruins of the Overlook in a field for no reason. So, like, the, that level of we got to go back to the Overlook was right there from the very beginning. So it's not, it wasn't just a studio mandate, like, oh, we got to tack on a, like, remember the Shining thing at the end. I mean, they definitely do remember the Shining, but I, I don't want to let Mike Flanagan off the hook and, and pretend like it was just Warner Brothers who forced him to do it. You know what I'm saying? No, absolutely not. <laughs> we, so he, he sees Red Rum. Oh, no, he puts his face in the door just like Jack did, even though he didn't see that happen. <laughs> That's fine. He's uh, he's wandering through. He finally he finds the gold ballroom. Oh, my goodness. He walks up there and there's already a glass just sitting there waiting for him. And he looks at the bartender and it's someone dressed like Lloyd, but who looks 
kind of like a cheap, we have Jack Nicholson at home. <laughs> the spirit <laughs> Halloween Jack Nicholson from <laughs> The Shining. Jack it's Elliot from E.T. dressed yes. as Jack Nicholson. And it like I cannot emphasize enough to you how fucking goofy this clown looks in this. Like, he looks so, so unlike Jack Nicholson. I oh god, and he has he none doesn't of the do energy. A good job either. He, he doesn't have any of the energy or charisma. No, so he, he just stands there with his double chins, kind of staring at Danny. It's oh, it's awful. And they only man. shoot him from the side because they're really trying to hide how much it doesn't look like Jack Nicholson. And like, if you're just clearly, they're not trying to have him act like Jack Nicholson, or else he would be much more high energy and, and like over the top. You know what I mean? He'd be more dramatic. He'd be more animated but he's not they're like why bother even trying to get someone that looked like him i guess i don't know he doesn't do a good job none of the quick flashbacks to recreated scenes from original film were necessary true let alone meaningful it seems like flanagan had zero faith in his audience i don't know what his motivation was other than like oh remember like i don't know if it's a distrust in the audience being able to pick up on it or like he thought it'd be fun to recreate some of those scenes I wouldn't be surprised if it was the latter, that he was just like, oh, well, I mean, it'd be cool to rebuild some of the, we're, we're rebuilding these sets. Maybe we can recreate some of those scenes that might be fun to do. I'm not really sure why he did it, but they're not meaningful. They don't add anything like th these quick cuts to like the actor that they've replaced Wendy with and like, uh, like screaming as he tries to come through the door or Danny riding around on a tricycle. Like we haven't added anything with any of them. So yeah. not really sure why they're there. If anything, if anything, it's it's there to sort of like establish that it's the same thing that you knew before, just a little different. You know, like this time it's yeah. a little bit more like the book, right? Because one of the lines yeah. that this this fat looking Jack Nicholson <laughs> is saying mm -hmm. uh, to Danny that he talks about how the whiskey is medicine, which is his line from the book. Ah, oh, come and take your medicine, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so like. Yeah, that there. And, you know, the worst so, part is that, like, I don't even... Th he has Timothy Hutton in his back pocket, right? Like, it, he's was in Haunting of Hill House. He played Hugh Crane. And that guy, you know, kind of looks a little more like Jack Nicholson than Elliot, for like, the Elliot character from E.T. does, right? That maybe. guy. Maybe. Yeah, he could have found someone else. This guy, Elliot, from E.T., is in so many Flanagan things, and I'm never especially impressed with him. I thought he was a plank of wood in Hill House as the dad. Very yeah. uncompelling. So yeah, so but well, yeah, in terms of in, for the in amount terms of, for the amount that they show him, sorry for the amount that they show him on screen in the Jack Nicholson costume, I don't understand why they didn't just default to CGI. I'm yeah, yeah I'm glad they didn't because a deep fake would have been worse. But um, <laughs> but anyway, so he doesn't look like Jack really. He doesn't act like Jack. Um, there's a couple lines he says that don't really feel like Jack from the original movie, but we'll give it some credit. There's a, they do seem to under the other points in the movie. They're like, no, there was still good in him. They're trying to undo what Kubrick's movie did and kind of go back to the original. Uh, sorry, the novel that is the novel's portrayal, the Stephen King's idea of who Jack was. But there is a line in this scene that does make me feel like I remember watching it in the theater. Like, okay, that felt like. The character from the original movie. Um, I want to. I want to fast forward to that line. They have a little conversation. The guy playing Jack Nicholson uh, is dressed like Lloyd, and his he's claiming to be Lloyd, kind of like a cheap knockoff of Delbert Grady, first pretending not to be the caretaker. You know. Yeah. Um, but there's a line. I'm going to fast forward to it, where he says, um, "If you don't mind my saying, Mister Torrance, you seem put upon." He says, Put upon, he says, ain't that the way? Man just living his life, trying to do his work. He gets put upon, pulled into other people's problems. I see it all the time, if you don't mind my saying. Um, and then, hold on. Do, 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 do. Uh, it continues in a second. Where? Oh, damn, I lost it. There's a lot in between. There's a part. Okay, when he's talking about the medicine, clearly that's the line from the original. Um... 
He says, medicine is what it is. Bonafide cure-all. Depression, stress, remorse, failure wipes it all away. The mind is a blackboard, and this is the eraser. That feels very much like Stephen King's The Shining. But then he says, a man tries. He provides, but he's surrounded by mouths that eat and scream and cry and nag. So he asks for one thing, just one thing for him, to warm him up, to take the sting out of those days out of... To take the sting out of those days of the mouths, eating and eating and eating everything he makes, everything he has, and a family, a wife, a kid, those mouths eat time. They eat your days on earth. They just gobble them up. It's enough to make a man sick. And this is the medicine. That, I'm like, okay, that is kind of more accurate to Jack Nicholson's character. Not how he says it, not how he's acting, but the idea that he resents his family, like eating away at his life. I'm like, okay. No, that's good. That that, that is in the novel, though. That that is the kind of stuff that comes out in the novel. Okay, no, but but yeah. I mean, but I mean, it can it can be a little bit both, and maybe the only no, no, reason I, it's here is because it's both. But I do think the like, oh, like a family or just mouths eating away at your life, that feels like Jack Nicholson's <laughs> version of family, yeah. not the guy who secretly loves his family, but he's just you know struggling with anger issues. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, and that it's interesting because, like, obviously there was some good stuff in there that Kubrick latched on to and was like, no, see, this is what the story is about. Not that. So, no. not, I can imagine his copy of The Shining was just full of red ink, just scratching things out. <laughs> like, no, no, this is not it. Nope, 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 no. Nope. This is what we're keeping. Right. Um, but yeah. So, like, that's one of the problems that I have is that, like, there's all that that is in the novel, present in the novel. But then there's also a lot of the other stuff where it's it, Stephen King clearly wants to believe that that's not him right like it's not Mm -hmm. that's not who he is that's you know alcoholics are alcoholics like jack they're good people down deep down right like it's just uh the 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 evils of the place and the alcohol's talking yeah but like man the part where he's like a family are just mouths eating away at your life and eating away at your time and ruining what you could have been it's like that's a little deeper than the alcoholism, buddy. Yeah, that's that's what that's more of what I'm I'm that's, that's what I'm here that, for. <laughs> like ego driven, like kind of malignant narcissism that that is brought into full view and made more prominent in the movie. That's, that, what I that's the Jack Torrance I, I, uh, I am exactly. here for. That's the Jack I knew. So there's there's little moments where I'm like, okay, that's that's good though. I like that. Um so they have their little conversation. Uh, there's there's another line some people seem to like, but I, I don't quite find anything especially interesting about it. But Danny, right before he goes on the thing about medicine, Danny says, man takes a drink, a drink takes a drink, then drink takes a man. Ain't it so, Dad? I'm like, okay, we're doing a little bit with the whole, you know, alcoholism thing, but it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't feel meaningful to me because nothing in this movie was about his journey to sobriety. It just seems like window dressing. Yeah. It, I mean, surely, it's, like, I think it was it's mentioned before in chat. It was mentioned in, before in chat uh, by someone who said that, like, the interesting idea for him, I think it was Fed Zeppelin who said uh, something to the effect of, like, well, it's interesting about, like, the, the, the flaws and, and sort of trauma and things we inherit from our family and our parents that are kind of hard to get rid of. And that seems to be part of what this story is about. And I'm like, yes, in theory. In 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 pap- on paper, yes, but in practice, that's barely what this movie is about. You know what I mean? It's it's forgotten. It's been forgotten since the scene where he got his chip, and yes. this is the only time that it has come back up. Yeah, so at the, best, the hasn't, it hasn't it hasn't been narratively important for him to come back and face his past and face his father. That hasn't been part of what's bringing him here at all. He's only here because he thinks mechanically this will be dangerous to Rose the Hat, which is just stupid. That's the only reason he's here. If this was motivated by a character decision to, like, you know, come back to the place where it all started and, like, he needed to come to terms with his father face to face, so to speak, that would be a more interesting conclusion to his story. But as it is, it's like... I know it's the, it's it's like it's the idea of an interesting story, not the story itself. And so it's a little underwhelming, I think, especially because the guy pretending to be Jack just doesn't act like him. He at just all. doesn't. He doesn't have it, you know. Jack no, Nicholson have... had so, has something. 
you know, yes. and Elliot does not. <laughs> then Abra comes in like, Rose the Hat's here. We gotta, we gotta go. Rose the Hat's like, oh, what a strange place this. She, what, what a strange place this is. She walks around. She sees blood gushing from the elevator. Remember that? Uh, but then she walks right past it because she's like, oh, I'm, I'm unfazed by it. And it's like, cool. Something that was like iconic and scary and surreal and strange before. Now it's like, hi, remember that? Oh, but Rose the Hat, she's not afraid of such things. Like, cool. Why are we doing this at all? Yeah. Why is the, the why is the hotel still showing off the blood elevator? Like, <laughs> like we get it, dude. <laughs> it, it, well, it's interesting because it was that was Danny's vision from his shining. Well, Wendy, Wendy's the one who sees it though. At the end, yeah, yeah. But the and Danny, first, like, it's weird. The first yeah. person who who saw it, it was Danny's dream, right? Like, it was, yeah. Wendy ends up seeing it at the end, and we, you know, based on her latent ability to shine, maybe, or the the fact that Jack and Danny are both kind of like gone wild with their sight. We, we we there's a mon- multitude of reasons that maybe she's seeing all this stuff happen. But either way, like. It was specific to that scenario, right? Like it, mm-hmm. it was specific to the Torrance's stay at the Overlook. I don't understand why the hotel is just repeating the same thing for Rose. Like, remember, remember it, remember the blood elevator. I I remember. Ooh, I do remember. I remember it. Yeah. This is the, like the sum total of all these things. Like the awful, like non-character Mary Sue, prodigy child, the member Barry fest. That ends the movie, the like character assassination of legacy characters, like all these things together. It's like, I think this is actually in the running for one of the worst legacy sequels of all time. It's kind of funny that they did to The Shining essentially what has been done to Star Wars in many (laughs) of the same respects. Like we're making old characters miserable now and like making them not heroic anymore. And like now we have a new character and she's even more powerful than before. And it's like, well, we're just doing Star Wars, but in the Shining skin. It's so lame. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 such, it's so incredible that in this era of filmmaking, there's been so much of this. Like, they literally can't help it. It's wild. Yeah. Um, so Rose the Hat shows up, and now we're in the Colorado Lounge. Remember that? Um, and she's like, like uh, they're like, they're, they're up on the stairs, and, and, and Jack's, uh, not Jack, Danny's got an axe and he's like, oh, time for the big showdown. And she's like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to get you. And then Danny's like, I don't like you don't seem afraid that you should be more because you don't know where you're standing. And she's like, I'm sorry, who the fuck are you? Which is really funny. Yeah. She doesn't say who the fuck are you? But honestly, her response is a little like, it's funny. It's, it's like, a little flippant. She's kind of just like, and you are <laughs> like, like, but it's a good reaction because she should be like. Wait, who the fuck are you? Um, which is pretty funny. But then then we do some coping where the writer kind of lampshades the problem. They're like, oh, why? Like, oh, you're the one who killed all my friends. Oh, my God. You're you're Danny Torrance. How have I not noticed you before? How did I like you have a lot of shining in you? How did I notice? How did I not notice you 20 years ago? And the movie just doesn't answer that question because it doesn't have a good answer to that question. It knows that it's a question it should answer, but it just doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. It's a good question for another time, essentially. And so Rose the Hat's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight you now. And Danny and Abra are like, all right, it's time to start the psychic mind battle. And their eyes go white because they're X-Men now. And they, they, they concentrate real hard. And now Rose is in the hedge maze. And she's like, oh, clever girl. You've, your tricks have gotten better. And then she runs into Abra in the hedge maze, who's got this stupid smug look on her face the whole time because nothing is scary or tense for her because she's perfect and amazing and wonderful. And so she's facing off against Rose, but she keeps like slashing her knees. And I'm like, I don't know why she's not going for the neck. What is she even doing? But is, it, this, is, is, this like... a, is it affecting her at all in real? Because it affected her before where she degloved her hand, right? In real life, yeah. you know, it degloved her real hand. But is this affecting her at all? She's like hamstringing her, but she's sta- she's still standing. She can still move, right? 
Like, is this doing anything apart from distracting her? Why doesn't Average just kill her? Why is there a box sneaking up behind Rose the Hat right now? Why is that the plan? That's like, I'm walking you through my me watching the scene right now. You know, it's like, what, yes. is, what is going on? What is the plan here? Why is she's standing, he... She's standing across from Ab, Abra, who is like, he keeps like magically teleporting behind her in this psychic dream space and slashing at her kneecaps instead of trying to do more damage even though she just appears to be annoyed by it because this is all like psychic. So is any of this happening? Who knows? And then she finally gets Abra for no reason. It's like, it's like, because we don't understand the rules. It's like, oh, now I have the better of you. And it's like, how, how did that happen? Who cares? She grabs Abra by the neck and she's like, I'm going to get you. Oh wait, unless this isn't your mind and you're just the bait. And there's a box sneaking up on her. Like, like it's Danny going, I'm going to put you in the box. Ah, I'm gonna push you in the box. Oh shit! You 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 caught we gotta on. Do it. I gotta push the box up nice and slow so she doesn't notice what's happening. And then she butts out and she's like, "Enough!" Because this is all stupid nonsense now. And she, we're back out of the dream. Abra has run away, and Danny's there with the axe. And Rose comes up, and we're doing the thing, walking up the stairs again, but gender reversed, essentially. Yeah. And she's walking up, and she's like, "I'm gonna get you," and we're shooting it like that scene you like, but worse. And then um, <laughs> Danny keeps <laughs> and Danny keeps doing this thing where he like he keeps switching his hand for the axe. Yeah. Like, are you a righty or a lefty? What are you doing? Pick and, one and swing the fucking thing, dude. He's like he's got it in his right hand, and then he switches to his left. It's like that's not that's not how that's not how you use an axe. That's no. <laughs> And he, she keeps getting closer and closer, and she's saying things I don't remember. It's not important. And then eventually he swings the axe at her. It, like, hits her in the shoulder, but, like, not hard enough to go very deep in. And she's like, ow. And she pulls it out and then hits Danny with it. Like, before they just get killed by gunshots like normal people, but now suddenly she can take an axe to the shoulder. She has, like, so, so she doesn't use her... Okay. I need to rewind because Rose the Hat is supposed to be the super scary, super strong psychic lady. And she's going after Abra, who's got a lot of power, too. But Rose the Hat, remember, she just she just took a whole bunch of like the equivalent of steroids right before this battle. She took all the steam they had in canisters and ate it all at once. And she's like, finally, it's time to show these fuckers who's boss. And then her way of beating Danny was to just grab the axe out of his hand and hit him with it. Like she just like. <laughs> It has nothing to do with psychic powers. She's not even supposed to have extra strength. But then she goes up to Danny and she's like, I'm going to suck the steam out of you. And so she's like pressing into his axe wound and going, ah, and steam's coming out of him. Because in this movie, people release steam when they die, but also they release steam as they're dying, even if they don't end up dying. I don't quite understand it, but here we are. Yeah, so steam, pain in steam, general <laughs> releases shining from you. I guess. I guess. So every time you stub your toe, <laughs> it's and, shining a little yeah. little wop comes out of your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be pretty funny. Like you're losing the ability to shine every time you, <laughs> you accidentally hurt yourself. So she's sucking the soul out of Danny like she's a Death Eater. And it's coming out. But instead of instead of being like clear blue, like everyone else's, his is a little cloudy. And she's like, you taste like whiskey. And I'm like, OK, we're paying lip service to character development here. And then... Um, he's like, she's like, what's going on in your mind? What are those boxes? Huh? What you got more surprises for me? And somehow with his mind, he unleashes the boxes that he's been keeping all of the shining ghosts in. And they all randomly on they all the, the actors wearing the skin suits of the shining ghosts. You remember from the first movie, like the bath lady, and Delbert Grady and the twins just appear and they all have cloudy eyes now because that's what it means to have the shining is to have cloudy eyes now because this is stupid. Um, they appear behind Rose the Hat and they're like, ah, we're here now. We're going to get you because we're ghosts and we want to consume you. Remember from the original movie how that's a thing we did? Oh, you don't remember that? Well, that's a thing we do now, so get used to it. And so <laughs> they like put their hands inside her face skin and like suck her steam out of her. And that's the end of Rose the Hat. So yep. all Danny had to do was like bring her here. Even it didn't but need to be he, here. Why did he? Why did he need to bring her to the Overlook to unleash the fucking ghost? He didn't. 
Because they showed up at his apartment in Colorado when he was a baby. The bath lady was just in some random bath on the third floor of that Section 8 housing they were living in. You know, like, why couldn't he have just done it there? Why couldn't he have done it anywhere? It, 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 he could have. They didn't he need to come here. There's no point. No, no he just, because literally they were following him around, so he could have just opened those boxes, because they're all trapped in his mind, remember? <laughs> so he unleashes them, and they kill Rose the Hat with ease, because she's an awful, awful villain, one of the worst I've ever seen. She gets routinely bested by, a like, a smug, stupid child constantly what an awful villain like what an awful villain with a stupid fucking hat (laughs) so perhaps worth mentioning that this like i've seen some people who think the only thing that sucks about dr sleep is that it's a bad sequel to the movie because it's like well it's trying to be more like the original novels in the book it's like well i hope i fucking hope that dr sleep rose the hat the novel like she's actually competent because she's awful in this. It's terrible. It has nothing to do with being a sequel. This is one of the worst villains I've ever seen. Just terrible. And she's fucking there's useless. Scene, what does she do? One, she, she kills killed one kid. Two kids, but yes, but she's one on then, screen. Yeah, it's it's really bad. She just gets nerfed instantly, and it totally like there's no fucking there's no tension at all in like the back half of this movie. It's just terrible. Now the tension that Rose the Hat is just dead. She's gone now. Big bad, wasted instantly. It's like, oh, all these all these ghosts are coming after Danny. And they just, instead of killing Danny, they possess Danny for no reason. <laughs> because Meanwhile, we have to make it like the novel to make Stephen King like our movie. <laughs> here's a pro tip. If Stephen King likes your adaptation of one of his books, it's probably not very good. <laughs> That's, you know what? That's my thought. If Stephen so King Aberth- likes your work, it's probably... It's- oh, God. There was a movie that came out on Hulu, this horror movie called uh, No One Will Save You. And Stephen King was like, oh, I highly recommend it. It's really good. They don't make movies like this anymore. I watched it and it was terrible. Terrible. He has awful taste. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are nearing the end. Yes. So let's, let's, let's push ahead. Abra's walking through. Oh, she sees the girls now, but she's not scared. She's just like, whoa, that's weird. There's a... There's twins there because she's a terrible actress. She's walking around, then she sees Danny and he's got an axe. And oh no, he's possessed by ghosts. So we got to run away from them. And she's running away. She runs into room 237, runs into Danny. And we do the same thing that Stephen King has the gall to do in the Shining novel because we're just doing the end of the Shining novel now. And it's just as stupid as I imagined it was when I read the plot synopsis. Danny comes in, he's trying to kill Abba because he's possessed by ghosts who want to kill her. And then right when he has her cornered, he's like, he suddenly wakes up and comes to, and he's like, uh, never mind. I don't actually want to kill you. You got to get out of here, by the way. I'm going to blow this. The the demons don't know it, but I'm going to blow this whole place up. You got to get out of here. So she runs away, and then he gets repossessed and goes back to being like, I'm a monster. And and he's got a limp now because Rose the Hat hit him in the leg with an axe. So yeah, he's got a limp now he's like limping. Jack. Yeah, and so he goes down to the boiler room as a possessed demon and then can't do anything about it and just stands there and watches as they explode. And then he sees a vision of his mom and she's looking right at him. And this is gone from the theatrical cut, but this is the resolution to the she won't look me in the eyes thing. In the oh, so cut. it just, that's bizarre. Because when that, when she showed up, at the end there, I was like, why the fuck is she here? Like, yeah, he had nothing to resolve with her. She's just suddenly here. Where has again. she been this whole movie? Like, why didn't he... He doesn't... She must, I assumed she must be dead, but he just doesn't even... Like, we don't even find out what happened with her. He's just a... Like, we cut to, you know, his life as an adult, and he's just a drug addict wandering mm-hmm. the streets, fuck it, fucking moms and clapping bombs. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I like it. Keep going. <laughs> and yeah, like Wendy's just disappeared. She's gone out of the narrative for the well, rest. She of the died at one point. Right. But like right. he does, he does, we don't even. So then no, she shows but... up at the end when it's about to blow up out of nowhere. That there's been in the theatrical version. There's been no conflict. No, if it's... anything, it should be Jack. 
almost because that's the only one that the movie pretends like he had to have a resolution with even though he didn't anyway abra watches the hotel burn down and then she's talking to the ghost of danny in her bedroom and she's like it was dying and i could hear it scream like it was like it was a thing that was dying like i think it was like a person i'm like oh, okay cool and she's like uh you know, he's like, by the way, you need to just can't hide your light under a bushel. You got to you got to shine and not care what happens anymore. And then she or the, and then he leaves because he wasn't really there, just like the Calorin wasn't really there in the beginning of the movie. The mom comes in like, hey, you all right there, kiddo? We missed you at dinner. And I'm like, OK, first of all, I don't know what this like new age parenting is, but like you don't force your kid to come eat dinner with you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I... Who knows, anyway, man? Whatever. This we also missed you at dinner. Like, how did she get back? We just skip over how she gets how she gets back yes. from the overlook. The the yes, because she was alone. If she doesn't know how to drive, she's a middle schooler, and she was just in the middle of Colorado, fucking in the nowhere woods. in the winter. She was in the uh, most isolated place in the like, <laughs> dangerously so. Oh, and, just... they gl- and they they gloss it all. They gloss over that. Don't even uh, this this movie sucks. This movie sucks and the writing is awful. Shame on you, Mike Flanagan. So she's just, she's just back now. And the mom, there's been no, there's no consideration for the fact that the dad died or that Danny had anything to do with that. The girl has never had an emotional moment with the mom about the dad dying or how she left or what happened to her or where she was. We fast forwarded to now. Everything's cool. And the mom is just normal again. She's like, hey, how you doing, kiddo? You doing okay? She's like, yeah, I'm doing fine. She's like, you know what? Actually, um, I just want to let you know that uh, we, we go on after. Mom's like, what? It's like, after, after death, we go on. I, I don't know much of anything, but I know that. I know that we go on after. So dad, he's in a better place now. And the mom, because she's not a character, just kind of smiles and says, thanks. Thanks, honey. Leaves. A ghost is a wish you make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's awful. It's so bad. And then the, the the ending is that she turns around right before she goes down to to I don't know hang out with the mom downstairs or something. She's like, "I'll be down in just a second. She looks in the bathroom, and then the old spooky bathtub lady is in her bathtub now. Even oh, though I thought no. they all were, de- thought they were all destroyed in the fire. I guess not. She <laughs> she goes into the bathroom with the the spooky lady. I guess to put her in a box or something. And as the camera turns around and she's closing the door, she's got a little smirk on her face. What is that? Like, what is that ending? And then we cut to black and that's the end of the movie. She and goes, they have these the ghosts don't know who they're messing with. And then it cuts to black and it ends, yeah. It cuts to black and then it has the gall to play Midnight, the Stars, and You. And it's many times rewatching this movie again in preparation for the stream. I had like the like, how dare you stand where he stood kind of moments. <laughs> And playing that song at the end, like, you haven't fucking earned this. No. How dare you? No. This is, this is a bastardization of, like, rewatch, I rewatched this first this year before rewatching The Shining, which usually Mm -hmm. I rewatch The Shining at least twice a year, you know? (laughs) It's one of my favorite movies, too, right? Like, I, it's, I really like this movie. Uh, And I, watching this, you know, like, and see, seeing what they do, I'm like, this this feels so far removed from anything that the original movie attempted to achieve or stand for. And it, it's just like it's it's all gone. It's the shallowest possible sequel that you could po- that you could do to this. Mm-hmm. I, and I, oh, it's terrible. It's honestly it's probably the worst thing you could have done. As a sequel to The Shining, it's hard to imagine something worse. It's really bad. And um, even like even if you tried to make it stand alone, right? Which you mm-hmm. you probably can't because of the like the sheer no. fact that most of what draws you into the movie is The Shining imagery. But if you tried to make it stand alone as just like a, a separate story about steamy psychic vampires, it's it's still it's just still bad. bad. It's really bad. Yes. One of the worst villains, one of the worst like main characters in the little girl. Just terrible. So that's that's Dr. Sleep. I wanna I we, we talked through our discussion, we talked quite a bit about the characters. We talked quite a bit about the plot. We talked about about the world building, 
right? Yeah. We covered a lot of, you know, what what this world is like and how it's different from ours and how the, both movies do a better or worse <clears throat> job of making that clear. I want to talk a little bit about the themes as we wrap it up. We, if we return okay. to the good film that we started talking about eight hours ago, The Shining, <laughs> is the, there's a, there's... It's it's it, what is that movie? It's well, there's a lot you could say thematically, depending on how fine tooth a comb you use to go through it. But in broad strokes, it's about like the horrors of the family. It's about the horror of realizing, like like your your parent is like that a doesn't love you and is actually like it's like the slow l- reveal of just how much of a monster someone is. Yeah, and you've like coming to terms with that like or or dying you know like facing up to that there's 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 all sorts of this stuff like psychological jungian stuff you could talk about where like your subconscious ev- like evil wishes and desires you know like coming out and taking over you and allowing them to possess you and the horrors that can come about from that um you know, there's there's yeah. all sorts of stuff you could talk about with with like the psychic energy and stuff like that, and intuition and gut instinct and stuff like that. It, it's like it's, it's, it's a, very thematically rich. It's almost hard to know where to start because there's so many different layers. The way you could look at it, one of the simplest ways I think you could probably describe it is it's about a deranged man torturing his family because he resents them and the horrors that that kind of brings on right Mm -hmm. it's it's the horrors that can come from like selfishness and like narcissism and like resentment stuff like that and among other things it's about it's about what it means to be a writer you know there's that whole level to the story too like what it means to be a writer like what it means to like because essentially what he does instead of right he likes the idea of writing he likes the respect that comes from being a writer he likes the romantic idea of like an Ernest Hemingway type who like go travels around and goes to like, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that sort of thing. Like, but when it comes to actually writing, he doesn't, he doesn't write anything and he just like creates a horror story for his family by torturing them instead of actually writing anything. There's that angle of it. You know, you can, you can talk about if you want to go really in depth, you could talk about as uh, I think Rob Ager. I, I already forget his name, Roger, maybe. He's talking about, you know, with like the gold ballroom having some similarities to like the whole idea of the yeah. gold standard and stuff like that. And you can draw that to like the people who have been in this hotel before. And there's so many different levels to it, depending on like how how detailed you want to get. There's like the whole there's parallels to to myths and fairy tales and things like that. There's there's a lot of labyrinthy sort of things. Yeah, you know, like the Minotaur. Yeah, yeah, like the, the, min- the min- Minotaurs. Yeah, it, well, there's fairy tale stuff in there. You know, the the cartoon stuff. There's there's alcoholism, obviously. There's mm-hmm. there's all kinds of there's all kinds of stuff that you could find. I would I would it's I would so be much better at talking. All, yes, it, it's very rich and dense with symbolism. I'd be much better at picking through it. If if we started this eight hours ago, but I'm yeah. I'm, I'm a little fried now. But yeah, I'm, 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 to say for now is that this is maybe one of the more rich symbolic movies I've seen. I think like there's so much to look into, like with some that's kind of like weird and enigmatic and esoteric and ambiguous in terms of its symbolism. Some other things that are very straightforward, but like there's just so much to talk about and peel back, especially the psychological stuff. I find that kind of way of approaching the film most interesting. Um, And I mentioned this, I kind of signposted this hours and hours ago now that like with The Shining, you can interpret things psychologically or you can interpret things as if they're ghosts and they're like different ways of kind of making both of those fit. Whereas Dr. Sleep, there's no psychological interpretation of anything that's happening here. There's not even a character arc for Abra. You know, I mean, there's not really there's a character barely arc a character arc on screen for Danny. Yes. It doesn't even really happen. It, it, like, it takes place within that first 30 mm-hmm. minutes. And then as soon as we hit eight years later and he's getting his chip, all of the character work is gone. What, uh, what would you say? Like, okay, because if we, if we talked about The Shining, we could talk about what 
uh, Delbert Grady represents as sort of like the most malicious, like subconscious desires for violence and resentment he has towards his family who like that's the part of him that has the ability to shine that's the part that's terrorizing his family while he's asleep and when he has that conversation with him in the bathroom it's, it's like a conversation about like you're the caretaker you're the waking personality you're the ego right you know but he's trying to communicate to him like you know you're gonna have to he's trying to these 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 desires are coming forth and he's having a conversation directly with his subconscious when he's in that red bathroom and there's a lot you can pull apart about what that says about him as a character because it's it's very he's very rich he's very well developed as a character i would say meanwhile in doctor sleep uh what does rose the hat represent in the story for our main characters in their journey a speed bump <laughs> i mean you can make an argument that she represents, you know, like a, a, a forbode. No, I don't even know. Like she, Abra's never challenged by her. Danny has no, no idea who she even is, right? You like know, you, would, you would think if she's if she's a sort of representation, you could say of like hedonistic, selfish desire. Like she's drinking. She's you know she's taken like living a luxurious life of delicacies and indulgence to the extreme to the point that she's willing to kill children in order to live a sort of decadent lifestyle forever. Yeah. You would think having some interaction with Danny over that would be interesting. Like what if, what if it was something where like she tries to manipulate Danny into joining them? And then that's a question of like whether he's giving into his desires like his alcoholism you know there's none yeah, of that really the only like we've got the representation of like somebody who's so hedonistic and so addicted to being alive that she's willing to kill children to do so and the natural enemy of that type of person a child who is in charge of their own agency from the get-go that's and basically them. that's not that's nothing it's that's awful. that's the conflict is my natural <laughs> enemy the child like there's there's nothing in doctor there. sleep all doctor sleep really has in terms of thematic material that's worth anything at all is that danny is having some parallels in his life that parallel his father they don't affect the main conflict of the story even a little bit so they just feel like window dressing but the idea that like oh his his struggle parallels his dad's a little bit is kind of there and the the trauma and he inherited from the original movie has had an effect on him in his life yep that's really it that, that's all we that's got like there's not much you could really say about that like abra has no thematic character stuff at all none whatsoever rose the hat it doesn't have any at all. I mean, we use you know, the phrase like, like with some of Mike Flanagan's dialogue, and we've do, we've said this quite a few times, I think, with his dialogue and all of his different shows. A lot of it ends up being a big nothing burger by the end mm -hmm. of it. That's what this movie feels like to me. It's surface like, level. It, there's nothing. There's really nothing here. Like, yeah, it this happened. It's long. Yeah. It just there's <laughs> nothing. There's yeah, nothing. Whereas... I mean, this is this is related to to the character stuff too. But if we think about like each of their journeys and how what happens to them like relates thematically to their journey, like Wendy is is a meek, uh, like abused, battered housewife who's slowly has to slowly realize just how much of a monster she's living with for the sake of her survival and Danny's, and like she has to. That's her character arc is to sort of like finally realize just how much of a threat he is and do something about it in order to try and save them. You know, like Danny yeah. is, is dealing with, he's, he's got this ability that he doesn't quite understand these sort of gut instincts to try and tell him things. And he has this gut instinct about his dad in this place that they're going. He doesn't like it. He doesn't quite know how to listen to his instinct. And he keeps seeing all these terrible things. And of, and like, Eventually, he just gets so traumatized by the abuse of his father that he just retreats into himself and kind of like his waking personality disappears and he just lets the that gut instinct take over him for a while until eventually, like, in trying to, to you know, 
trying to survive, he like uses his wits instead of his psychic abilities to to outsmart his dad, and then he reunites with his mom. Like all that stuff is yeah. really good. There's like uh, character stuff here, and Jack Jack is is someone who is yeah. I don't know. I I'm going in circles a little bit, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I, it's just on every level. <laughs> What a surprise! On every level, a Kubrick film is better than a Flanagan one. Like that's just, that's just yeah. where. Uh, eight hours later, eight and a half hours later, I think we've arrived at the correct I conclusion. We, I think we've solved the mystery. Uh, God, I, that's a bit I, about the themes. I wish I had more mental energy to talk about some of the thematic stuff. We talked about a lot of it as we went. But yeah, it, it, there's so much to talk about. It's almost a conversation in and of itself. But I'm just, I'm fried. Uh, I, I suppose I'm, that about wraps it up. Uh, Doctor Sleep, it's no good. It's it's one of the worst legacy sequels I've seen to one of the best movies I've ever seen. And what a shame. And yeah. Shining, what a, what a what an incredible film. There's Go so rewatch The Shining about. again, everybody. Yeah, it's yeah, totally, it. it's absolutely worth it. You will not regret it. It's pretty great. Uh, and anyway. Nanya, uh, I I remember liking oculus when i saw it the first time i have not seen it since it came out every other mike flanagan uh series or film that i've seen has not been worth the time for me i i just can't bring myself to get past episode one of fall of the house of usher i thought it might be interesting i was gonna give it a chance and then i saw the first episode and i said nope Yeah, by all accounts, well, no, sorry, not by all accounts, by accounts of people who I generally respect the opinions of, Bly Manor is his best work. So if you were to try to give him the fairest shake, I think that would be a place to start. You didn't finish that one, did you? No, I did not. I got really, really frustrated with all the long monologues. Yeah, I see. I just, I hate that style too. I'm not a fan of it. Not a fan. Some people like it, and hey, if they're having fun, good for them. But, uh, not a fan of the style. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that was The Shining and Doctor Sleep, eight and a half Ooh, hours boy. later. Thank, some of you have been here the whole time or close you to it. You all are and, champions, uh, troopers. You're champions. Thank you so much for joining us. This is definitely the longest stream we've had so far. Yeah. It was a doozy. I am going to go to sleep now. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll keep you posted. Sleep. We're going we're gonna to try and stream more regularly in general. Um, I don't know if we'll do another one next week because Hugh's busy with IRL stuff. I'm busy but with moving and trips. Maybe the week after we might, we might do a stream about Killers of the Flower Moon. Might try to see if we can get a guest or two. I would like to. I sat, through that, I sat through that movie. I would like to talk about it, please. <laughs> okay i'll allow it so let's let's talk we'll talk about killers of the flower moon sometime soon see if we can't get a, a couple interesting guests to join us for that conversation uh until next time thank you again for joining us thank you and very much we'll everyone. see you we'll see you around the bend toodaloo sweet dreams i love you bye bye uh...